Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars to you and your family. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Hijacker. There are many people throughout the nation who hear the statistics of the current crime wave, statistics like the one which tells that there is a major crime committed in this country every 20 seconds, who shake their heads and give as their opinion the theory that nothing is being done to stop the criminal. Nothing could be further from the truth. What those people must realize is that the number of law enforcement officers is limited, and in that limitation, the criminal enjoys an initial advantage. There is, according to the latest survey made by your FBI, approximately 130,000 police officers in the country, or one to every thousand people. Obviously, it is impossible for that one law enforcement officer to keep a watch on a thousand people. For that reason, the wonder is not that there are as many crimes as there are. The wonder is that there aren't more. Tonight's file opens in a small furnished apartment in the midtown section of an eastern city. It is early evening, and Marge and Jean Wheeler have just finished dinner. Where are you going? I got my cigarettes. You might help me with the dishes, you know. Leave them till later. Then you'll be too tired to help me. Want a cigarette? No, thanks. What's the matter with you tonight? Every time I've said anything, you've yapped at me. I had lunch with Ann and Ruthie today. Oh, you got loaded. I only had two drinks. I'll get with it. What's eating you? Ruthie was wearing a new mink coat today. Uh Uh-huh. Ann had a diamond bracelet that must have cost Harry $5,000. Well, so what? Why should that make you sore? Because I felt like a poor relation. I don't get it. They sat there. And they boasted about how great their husbands are doing. How do you think I felt? Well, I don't think I'm doing so bad. I'm making close to $10,000 a year now, and it's steady. $10,000 a year. Harry makes that in one night. Well, let him make it his way. I'll make it in mine. Haven't you got any ambition? Well, sure. You and Harry and George all started out together. You're as good as they are. I want to see you do as good as them. Honey, Harry sticks up a bank maybe twice a year, and he lives on that the rest of the time. I couldn't do that. Why not? Because I don't like guns. If I walked into a bank with a gun and stood in front of all those people, I'd I'd feel foolish. All right. Do what George does. George is a hijacker. You need a gun for that, too. I just want to go along my own easy way with little stock market swindles and let everybody else live their own lives. Sure. Sure, let everybody live their own lives. What about mine? Doing my own cleaning, my own cooking, making my own clothes? I'm sick of it. You better make dough. Big dough. And make it fast. But I No buts about it. There's only one way to do it, and that's with a gun. You got one. Use it. Marge, I love you and I'd do anything to make you happy, but I can't use that gun on a job. That's final. Look, if you don't go out and steal something big inside of the next month, I'm leaving you. And that's final, too. Hey, Gene. Gene. 
Oh, hello, Eddie. And since when have you been a nature lover? I could ask you the same question. Oh, I come out to the park every day. I come to pee- feed the pigeons. You ever do it? No. <laughs> They're just like people. Some of them are stupid and some of them are smart. You see that black one down there? Uh-huh. He's a real larceny bum. Watch what happens when I throw this handful of peanuts. He wind up with the biggest ones. <laughs> you see that, Gene? What a beautiful feet. Yeah. Well, what's the matter with you, kid? Yeah, kind of down. I am. Well, what's wrong? It's Marge. Your wife? Yeah, she's beefing. Says I gotta hit a jackpot. Well, what's wrong with the touch you got? It's not big enough for her. She wants me to use a gun. Well, why don't you? Oh, I can't, Eddie. I I just can't, that's all. <laughs> Stop worrying. She'll forget it by tomorrow. No, no, she's serious. She's going to leave me if I don't do something. Well, if she wants to go that bad, let her go. I don't want her to go. Well, then... Maybe there's a way out. That's what I've been trying to think of. I've been digging over every dodge I ever heard about. Gene, I got it. What? Listen, you got any money stashed away? Yeah. I, I mean that Marge don't know about Oh, yeah, yeah, about, uh, about 1500 Well, that's perfect. Why? You know the Dawson Finance Company? You mean the place at Broadway and 38? Yeah, that's it. I'm going to stick it up tonight. What's that got to do with me? Well, I've worked joints like this before. I usually score for about a G, 1500 So what? So you go home tonight after midnight with 1500 Give it to Marge and tell her you've done the job. Oh, she won't believe me. Oh, tell her to look in the papers tomorrow morning. The story will be there. She's got to go for it. Well, she might. I believe me, it's a cinch. I hate to go for the 1500 It'll be worth it. Yeah, yeah, if it works. It'll work. Hey, look, hand me those peanuts, will you? Pigeons are getting hungry. Yeah, Marge. Well, where have you been? It's after one o'clock. You said you... Oh, no, no, take it easy, honey. I got a surprise for you. What? What does that look like? A gun. What does this look like? Gene, where did you get all that dough? I pulled the stick up. What? Now, you asked me to use a gun, so I did. Uh, I can't believe it. How much did you get? A little over 1500 Where'd you do the job? Dawson Finance Company, Broadway and 38th. You did it all by yourself? Of course. Well, I must say, this is a surprise. I didn't think you'd ever do it, Gene. I'm proud of you, honey. Well, show it, will you? What do you mean? I'm tired. I had a tough night. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, uh, where are the evening papers? Right here, honey. Now, let's have them, will you? Sure. And I'm hungry, Marge. I'd like a sandwich and a bottle of beer. Sure, sure. I'll fix something right away. Anything else, dear? A little quiet. I want to read my papers. At 2.30 that morning, Special Agent Jim Taylor returned to the local FBI field office to meet Agent Ben Adams. Hi, Ben. Oh, hi, Jim. Sorry I had to wake you. No, it's all right. Boss wanted to get started on this case right away before it got cold. Well, what's it about, Jim? Hold up. The Dawson Finance Company. It's a loan outfit up on Broadway and 38th Street. It was held up about 11.30 tonight. How'd we get in on a holdup? Well, the bandit entered the building by telling the elevator operator he was an FBI man. I see. He then went up to the finance company office on the 11th floor, entered with a pass key, and slugged Mr. Dawson. Well, sounds like it might have been an inside job. Well, I thought of that, Ben, but Dawson wasn't killed. He was only slugged. Now, if the bandit had been someone Dawson knew, I don't think he'd left him alive to give us an identification when he comes to. Well, that's true. Where's Dawson now? He's at emergency hospital. Did you get anything down at his office? No, not very much. Oh, I did pick up this page from the building register. Mm-hmm. This is the one the bandit signed. Mm-hmm. It's lucky it's the only signature on the page. Yeah, I thought we might get some prints off it. I'm going to send it over to the lab. I'll ask them to call you as soon as they've gotten anything. Where are you headed for? I'm going over to the hospital. I want to be around whenever Dawson comes to. Jane. Jane, wake up. Oh. Come on, get up. Oh, go away. Let me sleep. I'm tired. Get up. What do you want? Look at this. What? The morning paper. There's a big story about the stick-up on the front page. There is? What do they say? 
Where's the rest of it? The rest of what? The rest of the money from the stick-up. What are you talking about? The paper says the job was good for 22000 Why? You heard me. They had the same story on the radio this morning. Oh. Where's the rest of the dough? I haven't got it. Quit stalling. I'm not stalling, You got 22000 on the job. You gave me 1500 That makes you 20500 shy. Now, where is it? Marge, I got a confession to make. Well? I didn't do the job. What? Eddie Perkins did it. Wait a minute. What do you take me no, for? I swear to you, Eddie did the job. He told me about it in advance so I could make you think I did it. You're lying. Marge, I just did it to make you happy. There's only one way you can make me happy. Get me the rest of that 22000 Yeah, but If I you don't, don't, I'm walking out of here and I'm not coming back. Anything come back from the lab, Ben? Yeah, they tried to smoke up some prints off that building register, oh. but none of them came up good enough to work on. Uh, that's too bad. I hope you had better luck at the hospital. Oh, little. I finally got in to see Dawson. How is he? He'll recover. He's got a nasty scalp wound, but it's not too serious. Could he give you anything? No, not much. When the bandit entered the office, he was wearing a brown handkerchief over his face as a mask. Uh -huh. Did he recognize the bandit's general physical setup as anyone who worked for him? Oh, he's only got women working in the office. Oh. So I went back down to his office after I spoke to him. He thought there might be some prints of the bandit on the cash box. The mm -hmm. bandit was the last one to handle it. Were there any? Well, the box was covered with prints, but it was impossible to pick out any distinct ones. We did get one break, though. Yeah? Got this handkerchief here. Oh, is that the one the bandit wore? Yeah, that's it. Where'd you find it? Oh, one of the cleaning women on the 11th floor found it in a closet about an hour ago. Mm. I took it back up to the hospital and Dawson identified it. Yeah, I see, Jim. That was a laundry mark on this handkerchief. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Now our job is to find out whose laundry mark it is. Okay, Gene. Hello, Eddie. Oh, hi, Gene. Come on in. What are you doing up this early? Oh, I got another rhubarb going with Marge. Well, what are you waking me up for? Because it's all your fault. My fault? Yeah. How did I get into this thing? It's that job you did. The one last night? Yeah. I went home and told Marge I did it, and I gave her the 1500 like you said. Then this morning, she sees the papers, and she wants the rest of the 22 Gs. Oh. Well, I, I'm sorry, Gene. I didn't know I was going to get that much. Well, that don't help me any. Marge thinks I got the dough, and I'm holding out on her. Uh, look, Gene, I'll tell you the real story and square the rap for you. That won't work, Eddie. Why not? I already tried it. You told her I did the job? That's right. She didn't believe me. Well. Wow. Oh, you got me in an awful jam, Eddie. I was only trying to help you. This could break up my marriage. Well, what do you want me to do? Give me the 22,000. What? I want the 22 G's. Are you out of your mind? Eddie, I gotta get that money to Marge. Now look, get out of here, will you? It's the only way I can square myself. Will you blow? I can't, Eddie. I can't leave here without the money. Now come on, give it to me. Over my dead body. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now let's devote a minute to social security. Twelve, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars. That's what your social security rights can be equivalent to, depending on your age, salary, and family situation. Considering those values, it will pay you to look into the special service on social security offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This service consists of three steps. First step. Full information. Your Equitable Society representative is ready to give you a complete and accurate picture of Social Security as it applies to you and your family. He'll tell you whether you're a fully insured worker or only currently insured, and what difference this will make in benefits you would receive. Or, if you're nearing retirement age, he'll tell you what kind of work you could do and still be eligible for Social Security payments. Why be uninformed or misinformed when thousands of dollars may be at stake? See your equitable representative soon. Second step, an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. Social Security Administration recommends that you make these checkups regularly. They prevent errors being made in your account. 
And the easiest way to check your account is to get the special form from your equitable representative, a form approved by the Social Security Administration. Once you've determined your standing under Social Security, you're ready to benefit from the last step of this free service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. Yes, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. In other words, he'll give you an analysis to show how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future of freedom from money worries. There's no charge for this service. See your Equitable Society representative immediately. All right, care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Henpecked Hijacker. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates the fact that although criminals may use different avenues of approach to gain their illegal ends, the common influence motivating them is avarice, sheer, unadulterated, overwhelming greed. It is that greed which makes every criminal a parasite of our society. And in this case, as in biology, it is possible for the parasites to prove fatal unless we do something and do it quickly to prevent the number of criminals from multiplying as rapidly as they have been. We give our law enforcement agencies no chance to stop the crime wave. Those agencies have certain restrictions as to the number of men they employ, and it has been shown that a city can be so deluged with criminals that the law has no chance of being enforced, that the criminals become a law unto themselves. What is true of a city can be true of a state or of a nation, And for that reason, the time for action is now. Action on your part to help fight the never-ending war against crime. Tonight's file continues as Special Agents Taylor and Adams drive through city traffic. Slow down, Jim. There's our laundry. Mm -hmm, I see it. Hey, Ben, we're really lucky. We haven't got a place to park. Yeah. You want to slide out this side? Yeah, I might as well. well. The switchboard really did a job locating this laundry so fast. Yeah, those operators really cut loose once they get a job to do. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, man. Good morning. Good morning. Something I could do for you? Oh, I'm Mr. Taylor from the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh, yes, Mr. Taylor. I'm Mr. Merrick. How are you, sir? This is Mr. Adams from our office. How do you Merrick, do? Merrick, how are you? This is the handkerchief our office told you about, Mr. Merrick. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, this is our laundry, Mark. Do you know who it belongs to? Yes, but I don't know his name. This belongs to a man who brings his laundry in every week, himself. I see. Can you tell us what he looks like? Yes, he's about 35, six foot tall, about 200 pounds. He's got black hair and he's got a blue star tattooed on the back of his left hand. Well, that's a pretty complete description, Mr. Merrick. Mr. Adams, all my life I've been reading stories in the papers about the police. They come to a laundry to find out whose laundry mark it is and always it's the same thing. They never get a good description. That's right. I made up my mind a long time ago that I would study my customers. And if the police ever asked the Merrick laundry for a description, the Merrick laundry would be ready. Well, I wish there were more people as conscientious as that, Mr. Merrick. Oh, by the way, where do you deliver this man's laundry? I don't deliver it, Mr. Taylor. He picks up his clean package when he brings in his dirty stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he lives? No, I don't. All I know is that he lives in a hotel around here. How do you know that, Mr. Merrick? Because the first time he brought in his laundry, he told me that his hotel did his shirts once, and they ruined three brand new ones. Well, he sounds like a very careful dresser. Oh, he is. Has he got any laundry with you now? Yes, he's got a package ready to be picked up. Fine. May we see it, please? Oh, certainly. It's uh, right here under the counter. Yeah. When will I pick out the right box? Ah, yes. Here it is. Here you are, gentlemen. Yes, he is a careful dresser, Ben. Mm-hmm. Every one of these shirts come from Merchant and Thompson up on 50th Street. Yes, they're very expensive shirts, Mr. Taylor. Ben, you've got the notes on that description that Mr. Merrick gave us, haven't you? Yes, Jim. Well, look, why don't you run back to the office, see if you can find anybody in our files answering that description, huh? Okay, Jim. While you're doing that, I'll go by Merchant and Thompson and see if they can tell me who they made these shirts for. (laughs) 
Marge! Marge! What is it? Where are you? In the living room. In the living room. In the living room. What's the matter with you? What do you mean, what's the matter with me? Jean, you've been drinking. No kidding. You're drunk. So pose I am. Now, don't you talk that way to me. I'll talk to you any way I want. And you know why? Because I'm rich. You're rich. We're both rich. Now, look at this. Money, 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 money. So I was right. You did do that job. No, Eddie did the job. Then where did you get the money? I took it from Eddie. I hit him over the head. I hit him over the head and I took it. Gene, that's wonderful. I figured you'd think that way. What do you mean? Well, sweetheart, for your information, Eddie Perkins is my friend. I should say he was my friend. So what? I had a slugger guy. Maybe kill him for all I know and all the pleas oh, you. Oh, shut up, Gene. Give me the money. You ain't getting it. What? I made up my mind in the saloon. You ain't getting one penny. Now listen, you Gene. You listen. Now, for weeks now I've been here and do this, Gene, or I'll leave you. Do that, Gene, or I'll leave you. Well, here's a switch for you, kid. I want you to go. What? Yeah, you heard me. Now pack your bags and get out of here. Special Agent Adams. Hello, Ben. Oh, hiya, Jim. Where are you? I'm over at the shirt makers. The shirts were made for a thief named Eddie Perkins. Oh, I don't think I know him. He's got a long record. Was a hold-up man? Yeah, his last couple of arrests have been for armed robbery. Oh, did you get anything? Uh, no, Jim, not yet. The file room's still working on the description. Uh, I see. Have you got an address on Eddie Perkins at the store, Jim? Well, they're getting it for me now. Oh, well, uh, do you think I ought to get a warrant for Perkins' arrest before I leave the office? Yeah, it's a good idea. We'll, uh... Oh, excuse me, Ben. Thank you, sir. Ben, I've got Perkins' address. It's the Central Good. Hotel. Yeah. Meet you there in 15 minutes in the lobby. Ben, I got here sooner than I expected, so I went on upstairs. Did you find Perkins? No, he wasn't in, but I got enough evidence to prove that he did the job. Yeah, what would you find? Well, there were a half a dozen money bags from the Dawson Finance Company strewn all over the room. That's enough. And there was a fresh blood stain on the rug. How did that get there? I checked with Dr. Phillips. He's the house physician. He said he treated Perkins. For what? Head wound. When? About a half an hour ago. Well, was the head wound bad enough to prevent him from traveling? No, Ben, it wasn't. <laughs> Sounds like he's taken off of the loop. Well, I don't think so. Not according to the doctor's story. He says that Perkins was blazing mad and kept mumbling something about having been robbed. Yeah? Well, where did he go from the doctor's office? I don't know. But there's a doorman here at the hotel. The clerk has sent for him. The doctor have anything else, Jim? Well, he told me that he'd treated Perkins before and that he remembered that blue star that Mr. Merrick told us about that's tattooed on the back of his left hand. Yeah. Well, did the doctor know what Perkins' business was? No. No, he was quite surprised when I told him. Teller? Uh, yes, that's right. I'm the doorman. Oh, Yes. Uh, tell me, did you see Mr. Perkins leave about a uh, half hour ago? Hey, yes, sir. I got him a cab. Would you have any idea where he was going? Well, I only heard him tell the hacky he wanted to go to Midtown Village. Uh -huh. That's a pretty big development, Jim. Yes, I know. There are 18 apartment houses there, and I think there are 60 apartments in every building. Yeah, but I think we can find Perkins if he's still there. Can I be of any more help to you, gentlemen? Yes, would you get us a cab, please? Ben, we're going to Midtown Village ourselves. Haven't you started to pack yet? Oh, Jean. Don't give me that. How can you do this to me? It's real easy. Oh. Jean. What is it? Why are you making me go away? You know why. I can't believe that's the real reason. You found another girl. That's why you're acting like this, isn't it? No. Then how could you be so cruel? Well, look, this was your idea in the first place. What do you mean? Going away. You've been threatening to do it right along. Oh, Jean, I was wrong. I don't want to go. Now, look. Please I... listen to me. Let me stay, honey. I'll never say I'll leave you again, honest. Well... Please. Uh... Who's that? Probably the cab I called for you. Tell him to go away, honey. Please. Well, okay. Hello, smart boy. Eddie! Step back. Eddie Perkins. That's right, Marge. But I thought you were... Dead, maybe? 
Now, that's how my pal here left Look, me. Look, Eddie, I can explain. I don't want any explanations. I want my dough. I know. I'm giving it back to you. What? I'm giving him back his money, Mark. Wait a minute. What about that mink coat and that jewelry? I thought we settled all that. How? We just made up, remember? That had nothing to do with the $22,000. i am not... some other time, You keep you? out of this. Gene, if you give him back that money, I'm leaving you. Now, look. I mean I... It. Wait a minute, both of you. I have a gun here. See it? This gun calls for money. Hey. Drop that gun, Perkins. Cover him, Ben. Right. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Well, thank heavens. You got here just in time to save us from being robbed of $22,000. Really? Where is it? Show it to him, Gene. You hear me? Okay. Here's some of it. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, Jim. Check the serial numbers on these bills with the ones that Dawson gave us, will you? Right. What does that mean? I think it should tell us who was really robbed of the 22000 Eddie Perkins was convicted for violation of the federal impersonation statute. He was then turned over to local authorities for prosecution for robbery. Gene and Marge Wheeler were also turned over to local authorities for obtaining under false pretense and robbery. Special Agent Taylor was pretty certain that Eddie Perkins could be traced at Midtown Village with ease because the doctor at the hotel who had treated him mentioned that he had bandaged Perkins' head. Once at Midtown Village, it was, as Taylor had guessed, simple to find out where the man with the bandaged head had gone and to follow that rather wide trail. And thus was your FBI able once again to close a case with a conviction and to close it within a matter of hours after the initial crime was reported. True, that meant working all night and most of the next day, but no special agent is a clock watcher. He works as your FBI has trained him to work, 24 hours a day if need be, and around the clock again, if that will help him do his job. His job of fighting incessant warfare against America's army of criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of this special service by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatizes the most venal crime in the federal statutes. Its subject, kidnapping. Its title, Operation Ransom. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Operation Ransom on This Is Your FBI. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you are a homeowner or a prospective home buyer, tonight may be an important night. Tonight, the Equitable Society has an interesting message for you about America's finest plan for home ownership, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. This is one of the Equitable Society's most worthwhile services, a money-saving, home-saving plan, because it combines a low-interest-rate mortgage with special life insurance to protect the home. So listen carefully 14 minutes from now for full details on the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Prospectors. Those who read their morning papers and shrug their shoulders when they see a story about escaped convicts or a daring crime, just because that crime did not happen very close to where they live. What they don't realize, and what your FBI constantly strives to impress upon everyone, is that any crime anywhere in the nation affects you, whether you live next door to the criminal or 3,000 miles away. It affects you because that criminal has attempted to break a law and escape unpunished. And if he should be successful, it would make it that much easier for the next criminal to do the same thing. Crime is an epidemic. And unless every citizen is aware of his stake in the war against it, unless every citizen makes up his mind that this is his war, then progress in combating it will be all but impossible. It takes no great effort to understand what that would mean. What a defeat in fighting the crime wave would do to every institution in the land. Every institution and every person, with no exceptions. Tonight's file opens in a general store in a small town in one of our western states. Two men, unshaven and dust-covered, have just entered. The proprietor greets them. Something I can do for you, gents? Yeah. Yeah, we want some help. What kind? Well, we got a map here, and uh, we'd like to find out how to get up into this section. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, up on Tomorrow Hill, eh? That's not what it's marked on the map. No, but we call it Tomorrow Hill because the flowers bloom up there the day before they do anyplace else. Well, you men strangers around here? Uh-huh. Just got into town. We're not going to be staying very long. Now, look... This map don't show any road up to that place. The map's right. You see, this line goes halfway up. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's as far as the road goes. From that road head, it's about uh, six miles to where you've got marked. How do we get up there? Horses. If you're going hunting, I suggest this spot uh, over here. Get more We're not going hunting, mister. We're looking for gold. Oh. We'll need some supplies and horses. You need a guide if you're stranger. We don't need no guide. All we want is for you to tell us the way. Well, when do you figure I'm going up there? Today. Well, if you can wait, I'd advise it. Why? There's a bad brush fire on the other side of Tomorrow Hill. They're just about getting it under control. We'll take our chances. Okay. Uh, how long do you figure on staying up there? Why? Just want to make sure you take along enough supplies. Oh, fix us up about ten days' worth. <laughs> you figure on finding that gold real quick? Maybe we will. Well, you fellas run along and come back here in an hour. I'll have your packs all made up at that time and on horses. Okay. Come on. Let's go get some coffee in that diner. I'm hungry. You're always... Everybody looks for gold. That afternoon, in the nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Gene Butler. Gene, have you finished that report on the Wilson case? I just sent it through, Jim. Did you want to see it? No, I was asking because we've got something that just came in that's quite similar. More escaped prisoners? Yes. These three broke out of the Blaineville County Jail a couple of hours ago. (laughs) Probably got out with a nail file. Did you ever see that prison? No, but I was about to when this message came through. 
We had a detainer on all three of them. Wow. One of them had already been rap- apprehended, a man named Williams. He was found on the outskirts of Blaineville with a bad bullet wound. Where is he now? He's in the hospital. He's unconscious but alive. Before he passed out, he said that the other two men who escaped with him, Pete Shelby and a stubby Lucas, double-crossed him. That doesn't sound logical, Jim. Why would they work and escape with him and then shoot him? Oh, I checked on that. Williams and Lucas committed a payroll robbery together. A few days after the robbery, they were apprehended and convicted. Yes? But the loot from the job was never recovered. Williams claims that they were on their way to get it. Oh. He says he drew a map of the area where the money is buried. When he finished the map, Selby shot him and took the map. Was Williams able to tell where they were headed? Yes, he said they were going first to a town called Hamilton. Uh, That's one I never heard of. I looked it up. It's a little place in the foothills of the mountains. They're not going to be easy to find if they're headed up into those mountains, Jim. Yeah, I know. Well, I think the first thing to do is check with the Hamilton police, find out if either Shelby or Lucas has been around town. You want me to put the request through? Yes, will you, Jean? I'll go down to the file room and check through the records. What? Let's, uh, take it easy, huh? Look, I don't like riding these horses any better than you do. Easy, baby. Oh. The sooner we get there, the sooner we get on. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. How come you and William Stash should go way up there anyway? They chased us up here. We knew we were going to get caught, so we buried it. Oh. I wonder how he is. Williams? Yeah. He should be dead. I still don't know why you shot him. I told you. To make it a two-way cut. Just don't try to make it a one-way, Pete. There wouldn't be no point in that. Whoa, whoa. Easy, baby. Easy. You're the only guy who knows where the dough is buried. I mean after we get the dough. Well, let's get the dough first, huh? Hey, do you smell that? What? Something burning. No. Well, I do. The guy in the store that said there was a fire up here, didn't he? Ah, he said it was way over on the other side of the mountain. It could be coming this way. Well, stop worrying about everything, will you? Maybe it's good for me. Maybe if Williams had worried, he'd be here now. I'm going to keep on worrying till I'm out of here with that dough. Gene, I just got a call from the marshal at Hamilton. Shelby and Lucas put in an appearance up there right on schedule. Did he make the arrest? No, but the time he checked, they'd been there and gone. Oh. I've been studying a map of that section, Jim, just in case we had to go up there. Brother, that's a rugged country. Yeah, I know. They're going to be tough to flush out. Oh, the marshal said they went into a general store and asked for directions to a place called Tomorrow Hill. Let's see that map of yours, huh? Okay, here. Uh, let's see from the marshal's description. It should be about... Yeah, right here. See? Uh-huh. The forest is thick through there. Now, we've got one break, though. At least we know how they're going up the mountain. Why? Is there only one trail? No, but the marshal told me that the man in the general store marked their map for them, and he told the marshal which route he marked. Well, that's a break. I also asked the marshal whether there was any chance of heading them off. He said there was. How? Well, there's a clearing up near the top of Tomorrow Hill, and we can land up there with an auto gyro. Then work our way down the trail and meet them coming up. That's it. Well, come on. We can't catch them staying here. Let's get to Hamilton. <laughs> Marshal, how soon should that auto gyro be here? Oh, well, any time now. It's on its way over from Suttertown. You use gyros much up here? No, I don't, but the Forest Service does when it's fighting a fire. As a matter of fact, that's where that gyro's coming from. Oh, that's right. We heard about that brush fire just before we left. It's better than a brush fire now. It's spread considerably. It must be mean babies when they get out of control. They're always out of control, Jim. Right until the last spark is out. What do you think the chances are of getting in and out of that hill are, Marshal? Well, there's... Pretty good fire break on top, and unless they get a bad wind and a crown fire, you should be safe enough. A crown fire? Yeah, that's when the fire spreads on treetops without ever touching the ground. Oh, I see. Oh, say, by the way, which one of you is going in, you or your partner? I am. Well, do you know that kind of country? Oh, I worked as a guide one summer while I was in school. Uh, this cabin that we've got marked on the map, Marshal, uh, this is the place that I'll head for first. Yes, they might stop there. It's the only cabin in the whole hill. Well, if they don't, I'll just start working my way on down. Okay. As soon as you find them, we'll send the gyro back up to take all of you out. Oh, swell. Oh, here it comes. Here comes the gyro. I'll get you that portable transmitter. You Fine, I can use it. 
Oh, in fact, I'll call you on it as soon as I reach the cabin. Right. Hey, uh, Marshal. Yes? If you get a chance to talk to that weatherman, will you tell him to turn that fire around the other way? Hey, Stubby. Yeah? Do you remember any of this? Does it look like anything you've seen before? No. What'd you do, come up here blindfolded? All I remember is trees. Ah, that's a help. According to this map, we should be right by the cabin. Well, we better be. It's really getting smoky around here. The fire's getting closer, Pete. Look, forget about the fire. We got more important things. Hey. Hey, look. What? There's a cabin in through them trees. Yeah. Does it look like the place where you stashed the dough? Uh-huh. It is the place. Come on. Come on, let's go. Come on, baby. Go. Get up. Come on. What a break, huh, Pete? Yeah. I never thought we'd find it this easy. Where? Where's the stuff buried? Inside the cabin. You remember exactly where? Sure. Okay. Uh, let's get off here. Whoa. 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 Uh. Well, it looks like we got here just in time. Why, what do you mean? The smoke's really moving in. Oh, uh, we won't be here long enough to have trouble with that. Here we are. Come on. Okay. Now, where's the stuff? It's in the tin box under that floorboard. All we need is a Put couple your hands of... up, Andrew. Uh, do as I say. Go on, get them up. That's better. What is this? A stick-up? No. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Where'd you come from? Never mind that. Just stand still. I ain't carrying a gun. Oh, but your friend is. This should prove to be the weapon that was used to shoot Williams. They found Williams? Yes. Still alive. That's how you got here, huh? That's right. Now, you two just stand where you are while I arrange some transportation. Station X-47 to X-193... Station X-47 to X-193. Come in, X-47. Gene? Yes, Jim? I've got Shelby and Lucas up here at the cabin. You can send the gyro back. Jim, your zone is ceiling zero. Huh? There's no chance of a gyro coming in for you. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI protects American citizens in American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan that has made it possible for thousands of homeowners to phone their wives like this. Darling, listen to this. We don't need to worry how we're going to meet those doctor bills and our mortgage payments, both coming due next week. We can use the cash fund in our Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. And that's exactly why the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan provides this cash fund. It's a nest egg to use when sickness or unemployment threaten home security. You see, this money-saving, home-saving Equitable Plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with special life insurance protection. Thanks to the life insurance element, the special cash fund is built up. It's always ready for use in emergencies. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. In addition, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan protects the home against the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%. And there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's file, The Curious Prospectors. Of all 
the words in any language. Probably the oldest is the word fire, for it goes back to the very beginning of recorded time. Down through the ages, man has come to know something about fire, has come to put it to his own uses in many instances, and yet has also come to realize that there are times when fire is his master. Today, any good student of forestry can show you black marks in the woods that point to a gigantic fire that burned as long ago as the year 1400, even before the discovery of the continent. And yet, despite all that experience in fighting fires, despite the experience of generation after generation, man today still tastes defeat in his battle against a blazing forest. No one can tell which way the wind will turn, which way the fire will jump, Which flame will leap the highest? Because every fire is a brand new adventure. Every fire makes its own rules. And thus, this battle of man against the fire is the most primitive warfare of all. And pits man against an opponent he has never conquered yet. An opponent called nature. Tonight's file continues at the cabin on Tomorrow Hill. Jim, did you hear my report on the gyro that it can't come in? Yes, Gene, but I don't understand it. Visibility was fine when I landed here less than an hour ago. I know it was, but there was a down canyon wind at the other side of the hill there. It shifted, and that clearing you landed in is covered with smoke from the fire. Oh, I see. You'll just have to make it out the best way you can, Jim. Well, Shelby and Lucas have a couple of horses. I can use one and put both of them on the other one. That cabin is six and a half miles from the nearest roadhead. So we'll drive up as far as we can and wait for you. Okay. We'll start immediately. I'll take that trail that Shelby and Lucas used. That's closed off by now, Jim. The only trail open is the one marked number 3838 on your map. Just a minute, Gene. Yeah. Yeah, I got it, Gene. Okay. I'll take 38 all the way down. We're leading you now. All right, you two. Come on, we've got to get moving. What about the money? I dug it up before you arrived. All right, come on, let's get out of the horses. You think we'll make it? You know as much as I do. Come on, Shelby, start moving. Okay. Now we're going to have to follow the... Hey, look. What? The horses. They're gone. Any news, Gene? Yes, Marshal, and most of it's bad. What happened? Jim called. He surprised both Shelby and Lucas in the cabin. Trouble? Not with them, but the clearing closed in and the gyro couldn't go back and pick them up. Jim was going to come down trail 38 on the two horses Shelby and Lucas used going up. Well, that's not a bad trail. They haven't got the horses. Jim called back and said they'd run away. This is bad, Gene. If that fire starts jumping, they might not be able to use 38 for the last two miles. Is there any other way down to the roadhead? No, no trail, but if Jim uses his compass, he might be able to beat the fire. You don't sound very optimistic. Well, there's a weatherman over at the Forest Service, Gene, and by his figures, the wind that's driving the fire down Tomorrow Hill is going to get stronger. If it does, they might not have time to get out of there on foot. That part of the forest is thick with Douglas firs, and they're all dry. Is there any chance at all of getting in there any place with a gyro? No, not a prayer. There's a blanket of smoke over the ridge now so thick you can't see the sun through it. Is the road still open? It was when I left the Forest Service, but that won't get us within five miles of Taylor. Well, let's drive up there and get as close as we possibly can. (coughs) This stuff is thick. I can hardly walk. Watch your step going through there. You think we'll get out? Sure we will. Look at that smoke. Well, the smoke's getting heavier, Shelby, but it's not getting any harder. That probably means the fire isn't getting any closer to us. Keep going. We can, we can make it if we just keep up this pace. You, you know where we are? Approximately. Keep going, will you? We've still got over two miles to go to that roadhead. We just keep right on this point on the compass. Oh, oh. What is it? Ah, get up, Stubby. Come on. I can't. What's the matter, Lucas? My ankle. I turned it good. Come on, let's leave him. No. You stay where you are, Shelby. Uh... Come on, Lucas. What are we going to oh, do? Look at it here. Oh. We're going to give him a hand. Huh? Yeah, now, come on. Uh, Grab his right arm. I'll take his left. We'll never get out of here with him. Take that other arm and left. Oh. Uh, come on. Uh, there you go, Lucas. Come on. How does it feel? 
I can't stand on it. Well, throw an arm around Shelby's shoulder. That's it. I'll put your other arm around mine. All right. There. All right, come on. Well, this is where they're setting up the new fire line, Gene. Can't get any closer than this. What do they want with a tractor way up here? Well, they can clear a fire line ten times as fast with a tractor as they can with men alone. Those cats dig in. I see. Look at that tree flare up out there. That flame must have shot up 50 feet. Well, let's hope we don't see a crown fire. If we do, you'll really see some high flames. Is there much danger of one? There's always danger of a crown fire. Oh, with these fir trees... Well, I hope they don't have to light those back fires. What do you mean? When they build a fire line like this, they light this end and try to make it burn back and meet the oncoming fire. That way it burns itself out because it's got no place to go. But Jim is in there with his two prisoners. Well, they're not going to light the back fire unless they absolutely have to. But if the flame gets past this line, you know, it'll probably go right through the whole town of Hamilton. Ah. Oh. Look at that crown fire. Look at it go. Gene, that's right across the line that Taylor was coming down. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm afraid so. And I'm also afraid the trail is closed off. That probably means they can't get through. <laughs> that fire is right behind us. Save your breath. We're going to need it. Come on, Lucas. Come on. See if we can get up again, will you? I'll try. Come on. Come on. Look, let's run for we it. We can't leave him here. He'll be burned to death. What do I care about him? I'm worrying about myself. I'm going back up the hill. There isn't a chance up that way. I'm going to try it. Come back here, you fool. You'll never get through. Yes, I will. Tell me, come back here. Yes. Help me up, will you? Yeah, come on. Oh. Give me your hand. Oh. <laughs> Why didn't you shoot him? I threw my bullets away. Back up the trail. Live ammunition isn't safe to carry in a fire. Anyway, he won't go far. Come on. Put your arm on my shoulder. All right, we'll start moving again. But there's a fire all around us. That fire in front just started. Maybe it's still got some holes in it. Come on. We can't walk right into the fire. I'm not walking into it. I'm looking for something. I think I see it. What? That black spot in there, beyond the flames. It's been burned already. If we can get there, we've got a chance. Hang on. Come on, let's go. Okay. Get down, Mr. Get down! Slap those spikes out. Let's get free. Get down as close to the ground as you can. There's a little air under the smoke. It's hot. Well, it's hotter out in those flames. Stop talking, will you? If we get lucky, we've got a chance to live. Lucas. Huh? What? Take a deep breath. Huh? That's cool air. Yeah. You stand up now. Let me try. Well, yeah, just about. All right, come on. It's a big burned out patch further down. But there's still a little, little fires down there. Maybe they'll make a big fire again. And things only burn once, Lucas. Come on. This is our only chance. Be careful with that ankle. I haven't got the strength to carry you again. Okay. I'll do my best. Wait a minute. Hold it. I thought I heard something. It's Jean. Jean! Jean, up here! Here, Jean! Up here! We're safe, huh? Yeah. Lucas, I don't know why we're here, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure glad I remembered how to pray. Bert Stubby Lucas was returned to prison and served out the remainder of his sentence. With the finding of the body of Pete Shelby, this case from the files of your FBI was closed. But there is more to this evening's case than the moral that crime does not pay. Further investigation by the Forest Service...
showed that this fire began when an unthinking camper neglected to put his fire out. The terrible toll taken by fire in this country last year reached the staggering sum of $700 million in money and the irreplaceable total of 11,000 lives. There's a fire started in the United States every 20 seconds throughout the day and night. And the indicting fact is that more than 85% of those fires are started because of one thing, carelessness. This is the beginning of the outdoor season throughout the nation. Some of you soon will be starting on camping trips, on picnics, or on vacation jaunts that will take you outdoors. To you, we address this message. 100% of the fires started because of carelessness could have been prevented. Be careful with lighted cigarettes. Don't leave picnic fires unattended. Use fires if you wish, but never forget that while fire can be an important friend, while it can keep you warm and help supply you with a hot meal, it is also a treacherous enemy, and it can be deadly. If you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest-rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story concerning America's number one crime problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title... Little Tough Guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Little Tough Guy on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Attention all homeowners. Please have pencil and paper handy to make notes. In about 13 minutes, the Equitable Society will give full information on its assured home ownership plan. This Equitable plan is a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver. One of the finest services ever offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. So be ready with a pencil, for you'll surely want to jot down the address for getting further information on the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Unhappy Medium. There's 
there's no telling how much money is mulcted from the general public throughout the year. But it is safe to say that the figure is well over a million dollars a week. That is a stunning fact. And as if to make the situation worse, it is an accompanying fact that for the most part, the victims chosen by the swindlers are those who can least afford the loss. They prey on the old, the weak, the confused. And they ransack as completely as any set of victorious Nazis looted the shops and homes of conquered countries. There is no geographical center for swindlers because they are, by reason of their business, nomadic people. They wander, they stop, they swindle, and then they wander again. Their base of operations is in their unusually facile minds. And their swindles range from the ludicrous to the brilliant. But whatever their plan of attack might be, they always have a common cause. To get your money. Tonight's file opens in the large living room of a house located in a western city. A stern-faced woman sits on one of the many wooden camp stools scattered around the room. The door opens, and her husband enters. Where have you been? Working. With a racing form in your pocket? I just bought it on the way home. Did you put that ad in the papers? Sure, it's on the streets already. What'd you say in it? Yeah, got a copy of it right here. Yeah, let me see it. Sure. Lays out nice, huh? Uh, Madame Roberto, reader and advisor. Are you in trouble or doubt, worried about business, love, health, or family affairs, or anything pertaining to the welfare of your life? How do you like that pertaining no to? No matter yeah. what Class, your huh? problems may be, I can help you. Call and consult me for reliable advice. Well, does that say it? It's not bad. Where is, uh, Madame Roberto? I'm in here trying on the new costume. Oh. Hey, Elsie, do you want to fix the top hook? I can't reach it. Now turn around. <sighs> How's it look? Very good. Let's put the turban on, see how the whole thing looks. Oh, wait a minute. Don't put that turban on yet. The earphone's gone underneath. Oh, yeah. Al, would you move the crystal ball closer to the closet? The other night the wire was so tight I couldn't turn my head. I wouldn't mention the other night if I were you. Elsie, it wasn't my fault that the earphones went out of order and I couldn't hear you. Besides, why did Al cue me when the phones went out? How did I know they weren't working? She's got the mic in that closet and you've got the phones on your head. I can't hear anybody but myself. That must be pretty dull. Very funny. Elsie, when are we going to leave this town? Leave? Well, we just barely got here. You've been promising me we'd go to Hollywood. Oh, stop with that Hollywood all the time. Well, what about my career? How am I ever going to get to be a star if I don't get to Hollywood? Look, Peggy, we can't quit here. I got 12 prospects lined up. Maybe we get some new ones from this ad. You got anything on the prospect? Yeah. There's all the dope I could get on them. Hey, do I have to remember all of that? No, Elsie will have it in the closet. You just listen. Come on, we better start rehearsing this stuff. Well, when are they coming? Post time is 8.30 tonight. It'll be a semi-private meeting like the last one. Now, put on those earphones. Let's get to work. Now, Madam Roberto, I have here on these sheets of paper the questions that are most bothersome to these people. Tear them up, please, and throw them away. Yes, madam. Now, through the power she alone possesses, Madame Roberta will peer into the mysterious crystal ball and answer your questions. I am studying, but it is difficult. Keep talking, kid. I hear voices, but they are far away. Some of you people are not holding hands in a chain the way the madam instructed you. I'm going over the questions. Ah, They're all stiff so far. I must have help from you if you want me to answer your problems. Here's a good one. Mrs. H.L. I see some letters forming. They are spelling out Mrs. H.L. That's me. Has the madam any message for Mrs. H.L.? Have her stay after the meeting. I have a message for Mrs. H.L. Will Mrs. H.L. please come up to the front of the room? Oh, yes, surely. Mm-hmm. She's ready to be taken. Hook her good. I am Mrs. H.L. What is your message, Madame Roberto? I... I cannot reveal it here. It is too personal. Oh. Please remain after the others have gone. Oh, thank you, Madame. Bless you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, take the hand of the person seated next to you and form the chain again. Madame Roberto, do you have any further messages? Peggy, 
brush the rest of them off fast. Let's get to work on the sucker. Meanwhile, in that same city, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is walking over to the desk of Agent Stan Kimball. Hello, Stan. Hi, Jim. When did you get into town? About 15 minutes ago. Well, I didn't know you were being transferred out here. Oh, I haven't been. I've been chasing and just missing three swindlers for a couple of months now. Every time I close in on them, I find they've just left town. (laughs) I know the feeling. But don't look so discouraged. You'll catch up to them. We'll catch up to them, you mean. Huh? Yeah, your agent in charge just assigned you to work with me. Well, how about filling me in on the background? Okay. Well, this little trio was wanted in five states for larceny, conspiracy to defraud, illegal fortune-telling, and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. One of them, and Al Watson, he's done time twice. What for? Swindling both times. His wife, Elsie, she was acquitted each time for lack of evidence. Uh-huh. Now, in this new setup they've been using in the last few months, they have a young blonde girl working with them. She uses the name of Peggy Garvey. Ah, uh, you think they're here, eh? I'm pretty sure they are. The ticket seller at the station in Albuquerque remembered selling them three tickets from there to here. Well, one trouble with trying to find a fortune teller here is that there are a couple of hundred of them spread over the city. Well, we've got pretty good descriptions on them. Stan, let's get an alarm. Maybe the local police can help us tack them down. Al? Yeah. Well, where have you been? Oh, doing some checking up. Well, you've been gone long enough. A thing like this takes time. I found out what I wanted, though. This Mrs. Lincoln has a hefty gob of dough. Good. Let's get back to work, then. We can't keep the old slob waiting too long. Peggy. Yeah. Look, I want you to play this like you're already in Hollywood. And this is your screen test. I will. Now, do you remember everything I told you? I think so. All you gotta do is remember. It's like Hollywood. Okay. I'll be in the next room. Al, you go get Mrs. Lincoln. I'll see you later. Okay, Peggy. All right. Mrs. Lincoln? Yes? Come right this way. Madam Roberta will see you now. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to have made you wait this long, but Madam Roberta has been concentrating. I understand. Madam Roberta, do you have any message for this troubled person? I am listening to the voices in the air. Queen of the occult, what do those voices tell you? They say that this troubled person has suffered some terrible misfortunes. Oh, that's true. So true. They tell me that there is someone who wishes you great evil. Yes. Yes, I know who that is. They say this person who wishes you great evil has put a hex on you and your possessions. I knew it. Madam Roberto... Is there any way in which this troubled one can be delivered from the curse of her hex? I am listening. The voices say that if you will bring all your possessions to me, I will be able to deliver you from the hex. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But this must be done within the single turning of the earth. The matter means that if the hex is to be taken off, it must be done by tomorrow. At the latest. Yes, I see. The voices say you are to bring to me all of your cash. Because that, too, is hex. Oh, I will. I have spoken. Mrs. Lincoln, you can go home and sleep tight. By tomorrow night this time, you'll have no more money troubles. Stan, I ran into a little luck. Oh? Huh? The Adams Costume Company here in town sold one of our little trio a robe and a turban, but the trail ends there. Didn't they get any address at all? No, Mrs. Watson, or whatever name they're using now, came in, picked the stuff up. No alterations, no deposits, no nothing. Oh, I hope this isn't another close, but no cigar deal. Well, that isn't all. The police located the taxi diver at the railroad station who picked them up the night they arrived here. Where did he take them? To the Central Hotel, but they're not there anymore. Well, they couldn't work the swindle out of a hotel room. No, my guess is they found a house and rented it. That's always been there, pattern. Jim, let's call on all the fortune tellers alphabetically. Well, I wish we didn't have to take that much time, but I guess that's about the only thing to do. Okay, let's get that list we made up and start calling. <laughs> I'm 
right here. Oh. Well, what's been happening? The Lincoln Dane came here about an hour ago. She had all the stuff with her. The cash, too? Yeah, $7,000 worth of it. Hey. Has she been in there with Peggy for a whole hour? Yeah. What's going on? I don't know. I've been waiting for them to break it up. Stick your head in and give Peggy the sign. I don't want to disturb the deal. Look, she don't know enough to ad-lib this long. Look, but honey... Do as I say, Al. Stick your head in there. Okay. Mrs. Lincoln? Please. Where is Madame Roberto? She went out that other door. She told me to meditate. She said I must have absolute quiet. Oh, sure. You go ahead, Mrs. Lincoln. Keep meditating. Peggy isn't there. What? She left Mrs. Lincoln, went out the back door. She must have gone to her room. Come on, let's check on that. She, she should have stayed with the customer. There's something funny about this. What do you mean? Well, why should she leave the old dame? Maybe she ran out of words. Well, let's find out. There's no one in here. Are you sure? Well, do you think I'm blind? Hey, look. What? Wait. Here's a note on the bed. Let's see it. Wait till I read it. You read it now. You please read it. Well, well, what does it say? What does it say? She took Mrs. Lincoln 7000 and went to Hollywood. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection to make sure a moving man will never come to your home and say, Gee, lady, seems like only yesterday we moved you and Mr. Wilson into this swell little house, and now I gotta move you out. Pretty tough on you. First you lose a good husband, and now you lose your home. Of course it's tough. Nothing tougher. And that's why the Equitable Life Assurance Society created its assured home ownership plan. This money saving, home saving plan combines a low cost first mortgage with life insurance to give you twofold protection against the two greatest dangers in home mortgages. The first danger is the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage if the owner dies. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. The second hazard in home mortgages is hard times. The Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan protects against that, too. During the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, his home, and its location qualify him for an equitable assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Unhappy Medium. It is an axiom among those who do not know the habits or characteristics of criminals that there is honor among thieves. As illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, nothing could be further from the truth. Thieves, and especially swindlers, recognize no such thing as honor, because to recognize it would be to admit that there is such a thing as a code of ethics, as a set of rules by which human beings were better able to live with each other. The swindler cannot allow himself the luxury of a conscience. And without that, there is no such thing as honor. Any thief would willingly and anxiously steal, lie, cheat, or even murder, no matter who it hurt, so long as he gained from the criminal act. And that is as true of female thieves as it is of men. For the motto of criminals of both sexes is the same. That motto is, He who steals and runs away lives to steal another day. Tonight's file continues as the two FBI special agents get out of their car in front of the swindler's house. 
This is the place, all right, Stan. Look, they even have a sign on the front lawn. Well, all this occult hokum is perfectly legal in this town. Hope they're still here. Oh, they probably will be. I don't think they suspect we're this close to them. You never know about this trio. They make their score quick and then move on. Hey, look. Front door's open. Yeah. Have you got the warrant? Yeah. Come on, let's walk in. They're here. They're being pretty quiet. Well, come on, we better look around. Let's try this room first. Huh? Okay. Hold it. Someone's sitting in the chair by the window. Pardon me. Oh, please be quiet. I'm meditating. Oh, I, I see. We're, we're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want here? Have you seen a man and a woman about 45 and a young blonde girl about 21 or 2? Oh, you mean Professor Williams and Madame Roberto? I think so, yes. Uh, where are they, please? Well, Madame Roberto is in her room. She's concentrating. On what? On removing some evil spirits from my money. Ma'am, I think we'd better start at the beginning and get your whole story. <laughs> Where have you been? I just went back to talk to the hostess. Hmm. You even table hop on planes. I wanted to find out when we get to Hollywood. Sit down. When we get there, you'll know it. Well, there's one good thing about all this. What? Once we get to Hollywood, we shouldn't have too much trouble finding her. How do you figure that? Well, she'll look for a job. Acting. We can nail her that way. Hmm. If you hadn't encouraged that acting, we wouldn't be trying to nail her at all. Are you going to start that again? Well, you're the one who told her she had talent. <laughs> you had her right away to that acting school. That fixed everything. I did it because we needed her. To run off with 7000 Elsie, we'll get the dough back. I'll get it back. And I'm keeping it. From now on, I'm treasurer. Well, don't I get nothing? <laughs> yeah. You meditate. <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln, when did you first hear of this Madame Roberto? There was an ad in the newspaper. I see. What uh, What did this ad say? It said that Madame Roberto would help people to solve their problems. Mm-hmm. And you answered it? That's right. Mm. Why are you asking me all of these questions? Because I'm afraid you've been the victim of a group of swindlers. What? Yes, yeah, sir. There's yeah. nobody else in the house. I've looked through every room. Do you find anything that might give us a lead? I didn't look for any clues to tell the truth. I just went from room to room to see if there was anybody around. Oh, I'm sure that you'll find you're mistaken, sir. About there being swindlers, I mean. Oh, Mrs. Lincoln, are those papers in front of you uh, yours? Why, yes. This is the deed to my house. And these are stock certificates I own. And these are my war bonds. Why did you bring them here? Madame Roberta was freeing them from evil spirits. Uh, Is that all you brought? No. No, I brought $7,000 in cash, which Madame Roberta was removing the hex from also. Uh, How long ago did she start doing that, Mrs. Lincoln? Why, Why, she left here about an hour ago to take the money back to her room. She said she could work better there. And uh, she left you here to uh, meditate? That's right. Mrs. Lincoln, it looks like you've been swindled out of your money. Oh, no. We'll try to get it back for you. Stan, I think the first thing to do is start searching this place. See if we can find any lead on where they've gone. Elsie. Well, where have you been now? Down in the lobby. What were you doing down there? Did you think Peggy was going to come over and meet you? We'll find her. We'd better. If we don't, this hotel don't get paid. Look, I know just what to do. This doll wants to be an actress, right? Right. Okay, then. She's got to sign with this central casting place or with an agent if she wants a job. Mm Mm-hmm. And if she's not there, we'll check on some of those hotels for actresses. She'd be likely to live in one of them places. Well, why don't you get on the phone and call up? I did. Any luck? No, but I don't think she'd be stupid enough to use her own name. Well, that's true. Well, what are you going to do, then? Go to every place in person? We'll have to. We'll make up a list of places to check. We'll each take half. Come on. She must have had her bags packed by the time Mrs. Lincoln arrived. Sure looks that way. What's this? Hey, here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? 
Uh, Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. <laughs> Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Huh? Mm-hmm. Just circulars, though. There's a batch of envelopes. Wait a minute. These are addressed to the girl. Peggy Garvey? Yeah. Stan, look at these addresses. Albuquerque comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. <laughs> Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Looks like... Correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Just circulars, though. There's a batch of... Jim, the girl's closet is empty. She must have had her bags packed by the time Mrs. Lincoln arrived. Sure looks that way. What's this? Hey, here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? Uh, Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. <laughs> Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Looks like... Correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Just circulars, though. Here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? Dear Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. (laughs) Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, Wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Huh? Mm-hmm. Just circulars, though. There's a batch of envelopes. Wait a minute. These are addressed to the girl. Peggy Garvey? Yeah. Stan, look at these addresses. Albuquerque, Denver, Kansas City. Hey, these are all the places they've been before places where I've just missed them. Uh, anything in the envelopes? Um, no. Oh, but they're all from the same outfit, the International School of Dramatic Art. There's one, two, seven envelopes. Let's look in the other room, Jim. Maybe we can find a better lead there. Oh, uh, wait, Stan. I don't know if we need a better lead. Let's find a phone. I've got an idea. Well, where have you been this time? I'm sorry, honey. I thought you said meet you on the other corner. I said in front of the drugstore. Oh, come on. <sighs> you told me it never rains in California. You want me to put in a fix with the weather? I want you to take me to Peggy. Where'd you find her? Where does she live? Right in that apartment house. Mm-hmm. I didn't even have enough money to buy an umbrella. You'll have enough in a couple of minutes. Look, are you taking bows? It took you two weeks to find her. This is a big place, you know. Here, this is the joint. Go ahead. You know what apartment she lives in? Yeah, right here on the ground floor, 117. Down this way. 11, 13. Here it is, 117. Just a minute. Out of the way, you little crook. Elsie! Out of the way. Didn't think we'd find you, huh? Al, we didn't come here for conversation. We want our money. Come on, Peggy, get it up. I don't know to what you are referring. Huh? I said, I don't know to what you are referring. Look, whatever you're eating, swallow it. We can't understand you. That's diction. Diction? We don't care what you call it. Just come up with that 7,000. I don't know what the you... The 7,000 you took from old lady Lincoln. Now, where is it? I'm using it. I need it for my career. Al, case those dresser drawers. Okay. Get away from them drawers. <laughs> 
Let's shift the tension out of her. Hey, look, keep away from there. That's my money, and hey, I... Here it is, right on top. Look, looks like most of it's here, too. Hey, don't you touch that money. Don't bother counting it. We'll do that back at the hotel. Let's get out of here. Okay. Hey, wait, you can't leave me with any... Step back inside. Uh, Go on, both of you. Who are you, mister? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got warrants here for the arrest of all three of you. You've got nothing on us. My guess is we've got enough for you to serve long terms in a federal penitentiary. Well, honey, <laughs> now you'll know where I've been. Watson and his wife, Elsie, were tried, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years in prison for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. Their young confederate, Peggy Garvey, was given a five-year sentence and then placed on probation. And thus, your FBI ended the careers of three greedy swindlers. The clue which led the two special agents to the apartment in Hollywood came from the International School of Dramatic Art. Special Agent Taylor reasoned that since the young blonde had gone to the trouble of notifying the school of her previous changes of address, she might do the same thing again. Within a week, the school received the change of address and notified the local FBI field office, which relayed the information. And so, once again, it was not a brilliant stroke of inspiration which closed a file successfully for your FBI, because those inspirations come far apart. And the reputation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is too solid to have been based on hunches. It was hard work which closed this case. Hard work in searching diligently and then following every clue to the logical conclusion. A conclusion which ultimately led to the stamping of a word across this particular file. The single important word, convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An unusual story revealing the cunning tactics of an elusive murderer. Its subject, extortion. Its title, Student of Violence. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Student of Violence on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members 
are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an equitable education fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Wrong Way Shakedown. Above the entrance to the post office in New York City, there stands the slogan, Neither snow nor rain nor gloom of night stays these carriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And while that is true of postmen everywhere, it is likewise true of almost every government employee. No member of your FBI knows where his next assignment will take him, into what jeopardy it will place him, or under what conditions he will have to work. But that does not deter him. For he knows that crime can and does take place anywhere and amongst all types of people. Sometimes those crimes are long planned and intricately carried out. And sometimes they are committed almost on the spur of the moment. There are more of the latter type because most criminals are not people of intelligence or character. They are more likely to be insensible opportunists who look only for the smallest of openings before they strike. Tonight's file opens on the lawn of an exclusive summer resort. Three people, an elderly lady and two younger men, are just finishing a furious game of croquet. Go ahead, Wilbur. It's your shot. I know. If you don't hit your mother's ball, the game is as good as over. I'm aware of that. Uh, Here goes. (laughs) He missed. Go ahead, Mrs. Wheeler. It's your shot. All I have to do is hit the stake with my ball. That's right. Well... Let's try it. Excellent, Mother. <laughs> Good shot. You're the champ, Mrs. Wheeler. That's the first time I ever played croquet. <laughs> Congratulations, Mrs. Wheeler. Thank you, dear. How do you feel? Oh, all tuckered out, dear. Mother, I think we'd better go up and have a cup of tea. That's a good idea, Wilbur. Would you two join us? Oh, not me. I'm going up and take a shower after all that exercise. But we'll see you in the dining room. Oh, that'll be nice. Maybe we can eat together. Mrs. Wheeler, my wife doesn't allow me to make dates with strange women. Oh, <laughs> <you will. laughs> we'll say goodbye for now. Then. We'll see you later. Okay, so long. <laughs> Bill. Bill, you're overdoing it. They're gone. Oh. Well, how'd you make out? I think I hit the jackpot. What did you get on them? Well, I looked in her purse and couldn't get anything. But when Wilbur hung his coat over the chair I was sitting on, I came up with a real interesting letter. What kind of letter? A guy's being blackmailed. That goon? Uh Uh-huh. The letter told the whole story. He stole a diamond ring at the Hotel Central in Madison, Missouri. He's being shaken for $2,500. Well, I always say you never know where your next buck is coming from. What do you mean? Well, if he's being blackmailed, honey, we're getting in the act, too. Meanwhile, in the nearby local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Keith Johnson. Keith, it's never going to get cool again, is it? I don't think so. And the paper says we're due for more of the same tomorrow. Yeah. Say, Jim, what's this new case we're on all about? Extortion? We just finished with one extortion case. Well, that's why they gave us this one. What have we got so far? Not much. We don't have a description. We don't have a sample of the extortioner's handwriting, and we don't know where the extortioner is now. Dandy. Yeah, What's the operation? Well, it seems there was a reunion of the class of 28 of Madison University. A few of the old grads went out and celebrated pretty strenuously. Among them, one Mr. Rollins. Nothing will strain as much as trying to hold on to an old memory. Well, they found that out. The next morning, the house detective at the hotel knocked on the door of Mr. Rollins' room. I see. He said that there was a valuable diamond ring missing from the next room, and he also said they had a report that Rollins had wandered into that room the night before by uh, mistake. What did Rollins say? Well, he actually didn't remember, and he had such a terrible hangover that he couldn't do any arguing. (laughs) Those 45-year-olds never learned that they can't drink that way anymore. Yeah. 
Well, the detective pretended to search the room, and in the pocket of Roland's tuxedo, he found the missing ring. Oh. At least he claimed that's where he found it. Then when he said he might be able to straighten everything out, Rollins was only too happy to let him try. Uh Uh-huh. Well, after Rollins got home, he got a threatening letter asking him for $2,500. From the house detective? That's right. And he decided to pay. He was instructed to leave the money behind a statue in the park on 7th Street. Well, how did we happen to find out all about this, Jim? Rollins ran into one of the men who was out with him that night, a Harry Sheridan. They compared notes and found out that they'd each paid $2,500 to the same man and for stealing the same ring. Have you been able to get any list of the alumni who attended the class reunion? Yeah. Yeah, I've got it right here. Good. I also checked with the Central Hotel in Madison, Missouri, and as you've probably already guessed, the extortioner wasn't really the house detective. I didn't think so. Let's split this sheet of names in half, Keith, and start making some phone calls. Uh, yes, Mother? Something bothering you, dear? Well, uh, is it something in one of those letters they sent up from the desk? Mother, I'm trying to remember something. Well, maybe I can help you, dear. You're right about my being bothered, and it is by one of those letters. Yeah, I knew it. The person who wrote it to me wants $5,000. What? From you? Yes. Why, that's shocking. Well, it's blackmail, Mother. The letter states... I know all about the diamond ring you stole at the Hotel Central in Madison, Missouri. Who signed the letter, Wilma? There's no signature. I bet I know who sent it to you. Who? That man we've been playing croquet with, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks? You had the other letter in your coat pocket, and your coat was hanging over a chair when we were playing. But he was with us all the time. Well, his wife was sitting in that chair. She must have taken the letter out and read it. Why, that... That's terrible, Mother. What do we do about it? Well, I'm afraid the only thing we can do is answer the letter, dear. Sit down, Wilbur. We'll write him a reply. Is that you, Bill? Baby. Call the man and order that mink. You got an answer. It was under the shrubs out back, just like I ordered it. And he's going to pay? Five Gs. Oh, wonderful. (laughs) Could any of your other husbands have figured it out this fast? hmm? Oh, none of them. That's why I've stayed married to you for two whole years. (laughs) (laughs) Honey, what's the next move? I've got to contact him in a little while. What for? I'll tell him where to leave the moo. Oh, where will that be? Well, I haven't decided yet. Uh, How about that lifeguard's platform down at the beach? There won't be anybody close to that once it gets dark. Hmm. That'll be okay. I'll contact him right now. Keith, how'd you make out on your half of the Class 28? I haven't gotten anything so far. I just found another victim. The same racket? That's right. A man named Albie Scott. How long ago did he get his letter? A week ago, and he paid off on Tuesday night. Could he give any description of this winner? No. No, apparently all of the victims had such hangovers the morning of the shakedown, they didn't pay much attention. And that's the only time any of them ever saw the extortioner. After that first call, he conducted his business by mail and by phone. How about the letter that was written to Scott? Has he still got it? No, he burned it the way the others did. Yeah, I guess it's a little too much to expect any of them would keep that kind of letter on file. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, where do we go from here? Well, I've been thinking about that. I I think I may have an angle on this case. We can use one. Rollins and Sheridan, victims one and two... We're out partying together while they were at that reunion. Uh-huh. Well, I asked Scott who he'd been out with. He said that he and an old chum had spent most of their time together. Hey, I think I see what you mean. And said old chum might be number four on their list. That's right. Did Scott have his address? He did, and I called, but they said he'd gone to Crestview Harbor. I called there. They said he was away on a fishing trip, but I think he just didn't want to answer the phone. Why? Well, maybe he's gotten his letter and doesn't want the law stepping in and giving him any publicity. You might be right. I just spoke to the boss about it. He gave us an okay to go out there. If our man is on a fishing trip, he probably won't be gone too long. When do we leave? Well, we catch the plane within an hour. Marge, Marge. What is it? Come here. How'd you do, honey? I'm a hero. That's what I am. Get a load of this green stuff. Here. Peek through here. Hey, you didn't open the package down at the beach. I just wanted to make sure they didn't fill this with old newspaper clippings. Oh, honey. Lay it out on the floor. The money? Yeah. I want to run barefoot over it. 
Who is it? It's me, Mr. Brooks. Wilbur. Oh. Mother's with me. Are you ready for dinner? We had a date, you know. What did we do? You think they suspect anything? No. How could they? I'll put the money away. You let them in. Okay. Well, good evening, good evening. Good evening. Come right in. Go right ahead, Mother. Thank you. Well, where's your wife, Mr. Brooks? Oh, she's in the bedroom. She's uh, dressing for dinner. Oh? Uh, Marge, the wheelers are here. Just a minute. I missed our croquet game today. Well, I had some business to attend to this afternoon. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, no, that's all right. We're really not very hungry. Shall we have a drink first? I think we should discuss something first. What's that? The $5,000 you collected this afternoon. What? Uh, my mother is referring to the money that was left for you on the beach. Why, well, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no point in covering, Bill. Obviously, they know you wrote the letter. We not only know he wrote the letter, we want the money. You mean you're reneging? You want us to expose your son as a thief? My son isn't a thief, Mrs. Brooks. You see, we never paid that money. What? Uh, uh, that letter you took out of my coat, Mrs. Brooks, wasn't sent to me. What do you mean? Uh, that was a letter Mother had written for me to mail to a, a contributor we have here in Crestview Harbor. Wait a minute. You mean you were shaking somebody down? That's right, young man. Well, you stupid... But you've been very helpful to us. We were able to send him your letter instead of taking the risk of sending ours. You what? And you also spared us the rather dangerous task of picking up the package of money. Why, you... Now, please, let us have the 5000 Oh, no. Even when I back up my request with this? Oh, she has a gun. I think I should caution you both. She's quite expert with it. Well, thank you, Wilbur. Now, where's the money? Well, answer me. What'd you do with it, Marge? In the bedroom, under the bed. Now, Wilbur, go fetch it, please. Yes, Mother. And look around while you're in there. See if you see anything that might be of sentimental value. I will, Mother. This is a great little idea you had. Oh, lay off. You have a perfect right to criticize him, young lady. He handled this whole affair rather clumsily. Look, you keep out of this. Young man, I'm just saying this for your own good. I hate to criticize, but you really haven't any talent for this business at all. Listen, I... have the money, Mother. Oh, fine. I also found some jewelry that belonged to them. Good boy. My jewelry. Now take those curtain sashes, tie the people up, put them in the closet, and we can have our dinner. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. A few weeks from now, on scores of elm-shaded campuses, the bells of our colleges will call the sons and daughters of America to the most valuable experience of their lives. I say valuable experience advisedly. Did you know that the average college graduate earned $72,000 more during his working years than the average American? $72,000 more than the men who don't go to college. Well, that's a lot of money. You're right, Stan, it is. There's a close tie-up between earning and learning. And that's why a father who really has his heart in his children's future doesn't leave their education to chance. He makes sure that they'll go to college. He makes sure with an equitable education fund. Well, I've got a little savings account for my boy's education. An equitable education fund goes a lot farther than that, Stan. It's a complete plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it gives you these three advantages. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, say, that sounds good. Whom do I see about it? A representative of the Equitable Society? Right, Stan. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, from the moment you sign for an educational fund with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, you can be sure that when the college bells ring in 1960 or 1965, your boy or girl will hear them and will be ready to answer the call. Now back to tonight's file, 
The Wrong Way Shakedown. There are no available figures on the money that was garnered in the past 12 months from your fellow Americans by those vicious criminals who practice blackmail. That statement will always be true. Because the statistics are impossible to gather without the cooperation of those who have been victimized. By the very nature of the crime, though, if the extortion victims were willing to report their payments to the police, they would have gone to the police in the first place. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, one criminal attempted extortion from another. But that does not mean that you, as a law-abiding citizen, may not be the next victim. If that should happen to you... There is only one thing for you to do. Go to your telephone, call the operator, tell her, please get me the police. Tonight's file continues in the closet of the hotel room occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. They've been battering at the door since Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler left them there. Oh, this is great. We get ourselves untied and we still can't get out. Don't come to me with your troubles. Ah, you're a big help. I didn't think geniuses needed any help. How did I know they were larceny bums? Because you're the smartest husband I ever had, remember? Ah, I wish I was the smartest ex-husband you ever had. I got half your action. Oh, shut up. I'm going to try this door again. Ah, it's giving a little. I never thought I'd grow old in a closet. Ah, don't worry. We'll get out of here. You better find those two when we do. I want my jewelry back. Oh, you keep talking like this was all my fault. Like I found the letter in Wilbur's coat. Oh, now I shouldn't have found the letter. Oh. Uh, that does it. Now let's call the desk and see if they're gone. Oh, sure they're gone. You think they're waiting for us? Go down to the lobby and see if you can find out where they went. Okay. And don't come back until you do. Keith, our guest was right. You mean you found the fourth victim? Uh Uh-huh. His name is John Mason. He was at home when I got there, and he said he refused our call because he didn't want the publicity. Oh, then he's gotten a letter, too. Not only gotten a letter, but paid. And they tapped him for 5000 instead of the usual 2500 Well, I guess they thought he could stand it a little better. He wants us to drop the case, forget all about it. Oh, sure. Let whoever did it go right on blackmailing somebody else. Hey, we got one break with Mason, though. At least he still had the letter. Did he give it to you? Mm Mm-hmm. Here it is. Take a look at it. Hey, that's a pretty distinctive handwriting. Yeah, that's why I think it might be a break. If this person never wrote anything else we have on file, the lab ought to be able to find it pretty quickly. You want me to send it through? Yeah, will you, Keith? Sure. Uh, Before you do, have a photostat made so we can use it around here. Use it for what, Jim? Well, I thought we'd check the hotel registers here in Crestview Harbor, see if anybody's handwriting checks for that. Good idea. I'll have the photostat back as soon as I can. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to check the hotels. They did check out. Naturally. But nobody knows where they went. Did you try the transportation desk? Uh Uh-huh. He had a telegram in his pocket when I went through it. I'm trying to remember where it was from. What kind of a telegram? It was from a hotel confirming a reservation. Well, think of it, girl. Think of it. I've been trying. Look, maybe this will help you. Was the hotel in Chicago? No. New York? No. San Francisco? I've got it. It was San Francisco? No, but it was the San Carlos Hotel. What city? That I don't know. Oh. Wait a minute. There's a book downstairs with the names of every hotel in the country. I'm going to get it, and we'll just call every San Carlos Hotel we find until we come to the right one. Special Agent Johnson. Oh, Keith, Jim. I'm over at the Harbor Inn. I found that same handwriting on the register. You couldn't miss it. The lab found out who it was, too. It's Bill Bentley. It's what? That's right, Jim, the check passer. Well, he's registered here as Bill Brooks. Oh, that's an old alias of his. Oh. He's never mixed up in anything except bad checks, to the best of my knowledge. Well, that's all he's ever been arrested for. Oh. 
you know, this case gets tougher instead of easier as we go along. Yeah. Does anybody know where Brooks went when he checked out? No, but his room hasn't been cleared out yet. The manager's going to let me go through it. You want me help? Yeah, I'll pick up a warrant for Brooks and his wife. Okay. And Keith, just in case they were working with anyone else, pick up a John Doe warrant, too. Will do. I'll see you over here as soon as you can make it. <laughs> Mother. Hmm? Oh, yes, son? Oh, I- I'm sorry. Were you sleeping? No. No, I've just been sitting here reminiscing. Do you know this was the first town your father was arrested in? Really? Yes. And I'm sorry to say it was because he didn't perform his routine properly. Oh. That's why it's important, Wilbur, to always keep practicing. Keep going over and over the job that you're to do. Well, it does get tiresome, Mother. I know, but it saves trouble. Now, now let's hear you go through your performance once more. Oh, uh, Mother. Well, come on, now. Oh, oh very well. I-, I knock on the door. When the party opens it, I walk in and say, uh, Mr. Jones, I'm the house detective here. Uh, more firmly, Wilbur. Uh, yes, Mother. <clears throat> I'm the house detective here. There's been a serious charge made against you. That's better. Uh, The party in the next room claims he saw you walk in there last night. Mm -hmm. There's a very valuable ring missing from that room. I'm afraid I'm going to have to search your room. Fine, son. Now describe what you do. I I search the room. Mm -hmm. Then I palm the ring and find it in the gentleman's suit. Correct. Well, one thing, Mother... I do have trouble palming the ring. Well, that's why you have to keep practicing. That's what your father did. He eventually became so proficient he could palm a trunk. Mother, I've always meant to ask you, is this ring the same one that Dad used? Yes, son, it is. <laughs> I'd venture to say that ring has been to more class reunions than the Dean of Harvard. <laughs> I got those warrants, Jim. Oh, good. Find anything up in Brooks' room? No, but I did find out there's a Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler mixed up in this somewhere. Where do they fit in? I don't know that yet. But when I didn't find anything in Brooks' room, I found out that Brooks had been looking frantically for either of the Wheelers. Were they staying here, too? Yeah, they checked out a little while before the Brooks did. I went up to Mrs. Wheeler's room, and in the wastebasket, I found the paper that Mr. Mason had used to wrap the extortion money in. Well, that sure ties them in, Jim. Yeah. And now I wish we could find out how. No lead on where the wheelers went either, is there? No, neither couple left any forwarding address. Well, they're probably not traveling together. Brooks was around looking for Wheeler. No. no, but I'm not so sure that if we can find one, we won't find the other pretty close. What do you think we ought to do first? Well, the switchboard here is getting up all the telephone slips on every call that Brooks and Wheeler made. Let's go back there and see if we can get anything out of them. <laughs> Uh, yes, Mother. Someone at the door, dear. Would you see who it is, dear? Probably the tailor bringing back my suit. Well, it's nice to find you home. Uh, Step back and let a lady in. Uh, Mother, it's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. Well, well, imagine that. Well, you know what we came for. And this time I've got the gun. Oh, so I see. Come on, just lay that money you took in my damp little fist. And don't forget my jewelry. Oh, but... But we haven't got it. Now, ain't that a shame? But it's true. Well, what happened? Did a big bad man come and take your money away? No. We deposited it in the bank. We always keep our money there. Oh, you do? Why, certainly. You've got to be very careful these days. There's so many dishonest people around. Tell whoever that is to go away. But it's the tailor with my suit. Okay. Open the door a little bit and take the suit. But if you make any crack about what's going on, I'll shoot your mother so fast you'll never hear her hit the floor. I won't say anything. You won't have to hear her say anything. Drop that gun, Mrs. Brooks. What? Drop it! Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. I've been a long trip to get all four of you. Oh, you don't want us, officer. It's them. Oh, no, Mrs. Wheeler. We want you and your son, too. Now, come on. All of you. Mrs. Wheeler, her son Wilbur Wheeler, and William and Marjorie Brooks were tried, convicted, and sentenced to five years in prison on charges of extortion. 
the telephone slips which the two special agents examined at the Harbor Inn switchboard revealed that Bill Brooks had telephoned the San Carlos Hotel in eight different cities and that at the last one he had located Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler. From that point on, it was just a matter of getting to the hotel in time to apprehend the four of them. And thus, your FBI aided in the conviction of another group of criminals. Aided in their convictions, but did not obtain those sentences because that is not the work of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI apprehends criminals, but the job of convicting them belongs to another branch of the Department of Justice. That procedure is followed out because of the fact that no one, least of all the members of the Bureau, wants your FBI to be anything but a fact-finding agency. An agency which has won the reputation of living up to the words which form their motto, F for fidelity, B for bravery, and I for integrity. FBI. Fidelity. Bravery. Integrity. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now one final question on the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, my boy has just celebrated his first birthday. Is that too young to start one of those plans for him? On the contrary. The sooner you start, the lower the yearly cost will be. Why is that? Because you have more years over which to spread the total amount required to send your boy to college. So why not get in touch with your Equitable Society representative? Look him up soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case concerning the curious trail of stolen jewelry that led across three states. Its subject, Interstate Theft. Its title, The Telltale Bracelet. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Telltale Bracelet on This Is Your FBI. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly, among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Telltale Bracelet. The summer vacation period is drawing to a close. 
and throughout the nation, businessmen are getting ready for the fall season. Americans earn their daily bread in an endless variety of ways, and in almost every one of those pursuits, there is a seasonal fluctuation. But there is at least one business in the United States which does not depend for its revenue on any such variable circumstances as the weather. That business is crime. Criminals are reaping a tremendous harvest in this country. To tell you one figure out of the welter gathered by your FBI will not tell you the whole story. But it may give you some idea of the magnitude of criminal operations in the United States in the past 12 months. In that time, criminals stole property valued at a total of more than $113 million, or almost $10 million a month. Of that amount, more than $9 million represented the value of stolen jewelry, a sum which puts jewel theft into the category of big business. This would be a somber report if the theft of jewels was diminishing. The shocking fact that it is rising, and the end is nowhere in sight. Tonight's file opens in a small neighborhood theater in a Connecticut city. It is early afternoon. In a shabby dressing room of this playhouse, Jay and Ruth Brooks, a comedy team, are making up for the first of their daily performances. Ruth? Yeah? Did I tell you what I told the manager about this dressing room? No. I walk right up to him and I said, Piermont, who's got top billing on this bill? He says, you and your wife have. So I said, well, I'm glad you recognize that by having our dressing room fixed. And he says, what do you mean fixed? I says, you put a fresh coat of dirt on the walls. <laughs> well, come on, kid, laugh it up. What's the matter? That joke is too true. This is such a crumby place. Oh, Ruthie, we needed a day to break in the new routines. Besides, we're getting top billing, ain't we? That all helps for what I got in mind. Oh, what's that? That story I showed you in Variety, about television. You know, how they need class acts like ours? Is that what it says in Variety? Sure. They figure it just like I do. They figure that television has got to have a... Jay. And a... What? Listen. That's the music for the three balls of fire. That means they're on. I thought you spoke to the manager about them. I did. I said to him, Piermont, how can you expect us to get any last following the strip tease act? What did he say? Well, what could he say? We're the headliners, ain't we? Top villain? Why are we still following them? Well, look, Piermont couldn't re-routine the bill on such short notice. But after this first show, he'll put them on behind us. Why couldn't he do oh, it now? Oh, honey, forget it, will you? We got important things to think about. There may be television scouts out front. Oh. Well, how do I look? Sensational. Like the bracelet? Where'd you get it? I borrowed it from Edna. Yeah, well, that's kind of junky. But leave it on. Come on. Let's get out on stage. Do you think there'll really be television scouts out there? Sure. Oh, I hope I remember the new routine. Well, what if you don't? Remember me? <laughs> Ad lib Sam. Oh, but I'm not oh, as good as... stop worrying. Come on. Let's go down now and murder the people. Edna. Edna. That you, Tommy? Yeah. Be right with you. Uh, look, honey, I, I can't stay long. I thought we were going out. Well, we were, but uh, something's happened. Uh, look, come here, will you? What is it? What's the matter? Edna, uh, first of all, I want you to know I ain't an Indian giver. When I give somebody a present, it's a present for them to keep. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But um, something's come up on that last stuff I gave you. Oh, you mean the bracelet? Yeah, and the two rings. Well? Well... To tell you the truth, Edna, that, that stuff didn't belong to me. I, I I borrowed it. You borrowed junk like that? That ain't junk. The bracelet and those two rings happen to be worth about 12 G's. Are you kidding? No. Who'd you borrow it from? Eddie Marshall. The racket guy? Yeah. Oh, why'd he lend it to you? Well, he didn't actually lend it. He, uh, he gave it to me to hold for him when he got picked up by the cops. Huh? So you play the big guy and give it to me. Well, Edna, at the time, I figured you could keep it. Why? Well, Marshall figured to be convicted and get ten years. Somehow he beat the rap. Now he's loose and I got word he wants to see me. So be a good kid and let me have it back, huh? I haven't got it. What? 
not here. Well, where is it? I loaned it to a friend of mine. Oh. Ruth Brooks. The, the little vaudeville dame? Yeah. Well, go and get it right back. I can't. Why not? Jack went out of town. Where? I don't know. Oh, fine. Look, now this marshal's a real bad guy. Well, why didn't you think of that when you gave me the present? Oh, stop, will you? We've got to find this Brooks dame and find her fast. I have to get that stuff back tonight. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approached by Agent Leo Schuyler. Oh, Jim, that's probably the message hmm? I left for you. Oh, hi, Leo. I just missed you when you went out for lunch. I went out a little early, Leo. I wanted to stop by police headquarters. On the Madison case? No, the supervisor got a call this morning from one of the detectives down at headquarters about some stolen jewelry. Well, that's the case I've been assigned to work on with you. Oh, good. Uh, can you fill me in on the background? Well, I don't know too much about it myself yet, but I'll give you everything we've got. Okay. A woman named Mrs. Jenkins in Philadelphia had some jewelry stolen a couple of months ago. Uh huh. She used to live in New York, and she still reads the New York papers pretty regularly. One of the papers had a picture of a society girl and a boyfriend dancing at one of the local nightclubs. Yes. Well, behind them in the picture is another couple. The girl's back is to the camera, so we don't know who she is. But on her wrist is a bracelet that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. How does she know it's hers, Jeff? Because it was designed exclusively for her, and it's supposed to be the only one of its kind. I see. The face of the man, the one who's dancing with the girl, is very distinguishable. Well, maybe somebody around the nightclub knows who he is. Well, I called the nightclub press agent. He came into the office. He's there every night, and he said he'd never seen the man before. Hmm. Well, maybe one of the waiters knows him. Yeah, it's possible. I'm having a couple of the prints of the picture blown up. Will you take one of them over to the club, Leo? Check with the waiters and the captains? Sure. I'll stay here and go over the files. I want to see if they can tell us the identity of the man in the picture. Me, me, me. <coughs> me, da, ha, 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 me, ha. Uh, who's there? Me, who else? Oh, uh-huh. I thought maybe it was Piermont, the manager. Figured he might be coming back to apologize. For what? Oh, for the run-in I had with him. Where you been all this time? There was a phone call for me out in the box office. You knew that's where I went. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was it? It was Edna Gilmer. She was calling long distance from New York. Well, what did she want? It was about that bracelet and those rings she loaned me. She wants them back. She's sending her boyfriend, Tommy, up here for them tonight. Well, why all the hurry? She said her boyfriend, Tommy, was mad at her because she wasn't wearing the stuff. Uh, why don't he stop trying to be Humphrey Bogart? Jay, why'd you have a run-in with Mr. Piermont? Oh, it was about making us follow them three balls of fire. Wouldn't he change us? Uh, not at first. What do you mean? Well, he tried to wiggle out of it. He had some phony excuse about us not getting enough laughs the first show. We didn't get many. Well, that's because there wasn't many customers. That's what I told the guy. I said, you get us some customers, we'll get you the laughs. You notice how the musicians went for us, don't you? They were screaming. There were only three of them. Well, who cares how many? Those Petrilla guys are help. Oh, brother, and they're plenty help, too. They love this smart material. Look, how many times do I have to tell you, honey? This is a class act. We're building it for television, not the yokels in this town. Now, come on, hurry up and change. We're on in ten minutes. <laughs> Jim. Yes, Leo? I went to that nightclub. No one could identify the man in the picture. Oh, I called you at the club, but you'd already left. We found out who he is. Oh, good. His picture turned up in the files. He's a petty larceny thief named Tom Wells. Oh, he shouldn't be too tough to find. Oh, not if he's still in town. He may have gone under, though, when the picture appeared in the paper. That's true. In any event, we've sent out a new alarm on him. Oh, here, I... I've got his record here. Have you had a chance to study it? Yeah, and I can't see how he could have been mixed up in the jewel robbery. You said he was a thief, didn't you? Yes, but he's never been arrested for stealing jewelry. I, I think this Jenkins job is a little out of his league. Why? Well, three of his arrests have been for booking policy numbers. And all the rest here are for peddling punch boards to high school kids. But there's no denying that the bracelet in this picture is the one that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. Oh, it's true enough. The jeweler who made the bracelet for Mrs. Jenkins positively identified it. Jim, I assume the police have already checked on the address Wells gave them when he was last arrested. Yeah, yeah, they have. It's a roaming house, and Wells did not return there after he served his time. The only thing to do now, Leo, is hope we get an answer on that alarm. Oh, 
Jay. Why? I just can't seem to get this break right. Well, you better not fool around with it anymore now, honey. We're on in a few minutes. On again so soon? Uh Uh-huh. We were just off an hour ago. How many shows are we doing here a day? Six. Six? Well, we get a break because we're headliners. The other acts are doing seven. That's on weekdays. Of course, on Sundays you can't tell. Jay. Huh? Do you hear that? Uh, Yeah. That's the music for them striptease dames. Thought we were supposed to be on ahead of them. Yeah, that's what that Piermont told me. How do you like that guy? No wonder Vaudeville is dead. That's probably him with another bum excuse. Yeah. Come in. Ruth Brooks in here. Oh, hi, Edna. Oh, come in. Thanks. Oh, Jay, you remember Edna. Yeah, sure. Hi. I'd ask you to sit down, Edna, except there ain't another chair. If we had another chair, where'd we put it? On my shoulders? Oh, no, Jay. Uh, I'm fed up with the way we've been treated around here. Gee, I didn't expect you, Edna. I thought your boyfriend was coming to see us. I decided to come myself. How'd you know where we were playing? Called up your agent. Look, have you got the bracelet and the rings? Oh, yeah, sure. Could I have them, honey? Oh, they're not here. Huh? I went back to the hotel after the last show. I left them there. Oh, well, let's go over and get them. Okay. Right after this show. Look, I haven't got time to wait. Let's go now. She can't go now, Edna. We're almost on. She's got to. I can't wait. Why not? I, uh, well, if you must know, that bracelet and those rings are real. What? Yeah. Yeah, they're worth 12000 Oh, my. I gotta get them in a hurry. Does Tommy want them back? He isn't interested in them anymore. Tommy was killed this afternoon. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Soon, from hundreds of well-loved college halls, the bells will ring out to welcome nearly two and a half million young Americans. But what about the boys and girls who are forced by fate to turn a deaf ear to the college bells? Many of them with excellent records in high school. Youngsters well qualified for college, but who for one reason or another won't get the chance. Believe me, Mr. Keating, they're never going to say that of my boy. I've made certain that he'll have the money to go, regardless of what happens to me. After hearing you talk about an equitable education fund last week, I got in touch with my equitable society representative and signed up. Fine, Norman. You'll never regret that move, and neither will that boy of yours. For members of this audience who didn't hear this program last week, I'll repeat some of the advantages of an equitable education fund as offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. First... You start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's what sold me, Mr. Keating. That's why I decided to see my Equitable Society representative. And I earnestly urge every forethoughtful father or mother to do likewise, or to send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, once you set up an Equitable Education Fund, you can be sure that when the college bells are ringing for the class of 1958 or 65, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to tonight's file, The Telltale Bracelet. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI gives ample illustration of the basic inherent difference between the criminal and the decent citizen. The decent citizen, upon finding himself in possession of something that does not rightfully belong to him, makes every attempt to see that the property is returned to its owner. The criminal, on the other hand, has no such impulse. The decent citizen is one who recognizes the temptation of easy gain for what it is and has the strength to resist. The criminal likewise recognizes the temptation, 
and succumbs because the emotion which rules his every move is greed. To the criminal, getting something for nothing is the only important thing, for it is the keystone upon which his entire world is built. What is consuming greed and his overpowering egomania prevent the criminal from knowing is that getting something for nothing is an impossibility and that you always pay for what you get. Another thing the criminal never learns until too late is that the price to him is always high, often his very life. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Jim. Oh, Jim. Yes, Leo. <laughs> I just about given up on you. Oh, I'm sorry, Leo. I should have called. I've been down at the morgue. On what? The police reported a killing this afternoon. It turned out to be our missing suspect, Tommy Wells. Oh. What happened? Well, the coroner said Wells had been beaten to death at his hotel with a blunt instrument. Possibly the butt of a gun. Any leads? No. No, nothing so far. Well, it's not going to be easy to find out who that girl in the picture was now. Oh, I think I know her. Really? Yeah, there were three pictures of the same girl in Wells' room at the hotel. In every one of the pictures, she's wearing her hair in an upsweep. That's the way the girl in the newspaper picture was wearing her hair, too. Yeah, I know. I checked around the hotel, and the bell captain told me this was the only girl he ever saw Wells with. Did he know who the girl is? No, but the pictures were all made by the black and white studios. I took them down there, and they identified the girl as Edna Gilmer. Oh. Did they know where Miss Gilmer lives? Yes, they gave me her address, but when I checked, I found out she'd left town. She's gone to Hartford, Connecticut, according to her landlady. Well, Jim, we know her name, and we know what she looks like. I don't think we'll have too much trouble finding her. I hope not. I've already notified the police up there to be on the lookout for her. What do we do now, Jim? As soon as we get an okay, we go to Hartford. <laughs> Edna, did I hear you right? Did you say that Tommy was killed? Yeah. How? Oh. He was beaten to death. By who? I think it was a man named Eddie Marshall. Well, who's he? A racket guy. Why did he kill Tommy? On account of the jewelry. What? It belonged to Marshall. Tommy had no right to give it to me. Oh. Are the police looking for Marshall? I don't know. Well, didn't you tell them about him? No. Why not? That's their business. Oh, but Edna... Look, we're wasting time. Let's go to the hotel and get the bracelet and rings. Oh, we told you, Edna, we're due on stage. Edna, what do you plan to do with the stuff when you get it? Turn it over to the police? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, then, what's the hurry? I... Uh, look, I might as well tell you something. Eddie Marshall is smart to the fact that I know where the jewelry is. So? There's also a very good chance that he followed me up here to Hartford. You mean... Followed you here to us? Yes. When he finds out that you've got the stuff, you're in it too. Oh. So if you want to be in the clear, let's get over to your hotel. You're on. We're on, he said. Yeah. What'll we do? We do with the act. Now, wait a minute. We've got to, Edna. Come on, Ruth. We'll sure get a lot of laughs this show. Stop the music. What's the matter now? A very funny thing happened to me tonight while I was on my way to the theater. It did? What's that? Ran into an old friend of mine. He said to me, Jay, I have never been so happy in my life. My wife's an angel. And what did you say to him? I said, you're lucky. <laughs> Mine's still alive. Stop the music. Uh, what did you do that for? I wanted to tell you something. I got a letter from my mother. She said there's only one way to make sure of having your husband home on Sunday. How? Shoot him Saturday night. Yuck, 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 yuck. Oh, what a dog that was. Should we take a bow? Yeah, we'd better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brother, I'm glad that one's over. What do we do now, Jay? About what? That gangster. Oh, honey, don't worry about him. But Edna said he probably followed her here. Oh, she's just guessing about him. Come on, let's go to the dressing room. She might be guessing right, Jay. Look, tell you what we'll do. We go back to the hotel. 
Get the jewelry. Then take Edna down to the police station and explain the whole thing. Suppose Edna's gone. Then we'll take the jewelry down to the police ourselves. Go ahead, honey. Okay. Well, Edna, I got the whole thing figured out. We go to the hotel, get the jewelry, then we go to the police station. You ain't huh? going no place. Edna, who's he? That's Eddie Marshall. <laughs> Leo, Leo, over here. All right, Jim. Oh, brother, I'm tired. Any luck, Leo? I'm afraid not, Jim. What did you cover? Just about all of Hartford. No. I checked the railroad station, bus depots, cab driving. Yeah, how about the airport? No luck there, either. You know, she probably drove up here. Yeah. How did you make out of the hotel check? I didn't do any better than you did. This hotel was the last one on our list. Mm. What do we do now, Jim? Well, let's reconstruct this thing. Huh? Okay. I think it's safe to assume that she was coming here to Hartford for a specific reason, to see someone. Yes. Now, she's not staying at a hotel, so it's probable that her visit here is going to be a short one. Which makes it that much harder. There are about 200,000 people in Hartford, Jim. And she did come to visit someone, we have a pretty wide choice. Yeah, but the field is narrower than that. Don't forget her landlady did tell us she came up here to see someone named Brooks. We've called every Brooks in the phone book. Yeah. yeah. You know, if we only knew her motive for coming here... Leo... Why should an out-of-work chorus girl who comes from Council Bluffs, Iowa, suddenly leave New York for Hartford, Connecticut, and then disappear? Mm. Well, Jim, if we could... Hey, go... wait a minute. What? I know one angle we haven't explored. Come on. Where are you going? Over to the newsstand. We're buying a Hartford paper. So, this is Mr. Marshall. That's right. Well, uh, pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Marshall. Uh, you ever have any relatives in Vaudeville? Used to be an act called... Marshall I ain't Kirk interested. And... Look, Mr. Marshall, this dressing room's kind of small. And we got to change I all. just want one thing. What's that? Jewelry. A bracelet and two rings. Well, we don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Marshall. He knows you got them. Oh. Where are they? They're over at the hotel. All right, let's go over there. Oh, we we can't go like this. Why not? With his zoot coat and these funny shoes? <laughs> Gee, I, I don't want people laughing at me. Nobody will laugh at you, brother. I know, I just seen you right. What do you mean by that? Look, I got a gun here. I don't care what you got. Were you panning the act? Mac, I'm warning you. Jay Doozy says. Honey, he's knocking the act. He's going to use the gun, Jay. No, he isn't. Ah. Let it fall, Marshal. Go on. Drop it, I said. Uh. Well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. <gasps> we were looking for Miss Gilmer here. Her landlady told us that she'd come to Hartford to see a Mrs. Brooks. You were difficult to locate until we figured that because she's in show business, she might be visiting somebody in a theater here, so... We bought the local paper and looked at the amusement page to see what was playing. And you saw our name. That's right, in the ad for this theater. You see, Ruth, that's what I've been telling you. That's how important top billing is. Eddie Marshall was turned over to local authorities, prosecuted, convicted and sentenced to be executed for the murder of Tom Wells. And thus, your FBI closed another case. Closed another case and thereby solved two crimes, the Philadelphia jewel theft and the murder of Tom Wells. It is not an uncommon occurrence for the special agents of your FBI to solve more than one crime with one arrest, because it is an axiom among law enforcement officers that one crime invariably leads to another. Sometimes those early crimes are minor, but however trivial they may appear to be, and however far from you they may occur, they affect you directly. They affect you because the commission of every crime is an attack against law and order. And should those attacks ever prove to be overwhelming, it would mean an end to your personal liberties and to every shred of your security. That is why the battle against crime, a battle which your FBI fights 24 hours a day, is your battle too.
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now I have just 25 seconds to answer one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, suppose I start one of those funds for my daughter. Then, when she gets to be 18, she gets married instead of going to college. What happens then? That's strictly up to you. The money is yours. You can use it to pay for your daughter's trousseau and wedding or for any purpose you see fit. So, no matter what happens, it's a good idea to see your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The exciting account of a relentless search for an international killer. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Great Deception. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Great Deception on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly, among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Great Deception. That there is an unprecedented crime wave engulfing the nation at the present time is an indisputable fact. The reasons for that crime wave are many and varied, and the ripples of that wave touch your daily life wherever you live or wherever you work. Some years ago, when we were fighting a war for our survival, we seemed to understand that if there existed anywhere in the world any brand of tyranny, if in one isolated spot the freedom of human beings was threatened then ours, too, was likewise threatened. That was an accepted fact, because the truth of it was proven. It is an equally solid fact that any crime anywhere in the world affects you. It affects not only your daily life, but it also affects the nation. For it is written in stone on the facade of the building which houses the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington, D.C., that no free government can survive that is not based on the supremacy of the law. And if the day should ever come when crimes can be committed with impunity, then the freedom of the nation, your freedom, will be gone forever.
Tonight's file opens in the living room of a nicely furnished home located in the suburb of a large eastern city. It is mid-afternoon. One of the occupants of this dwelling, Mrs. Peter Clayton, is arranging flowers in a vase as the front door opens. Elizabeth! Peter! Hello, my oh, dear. Oh, Peter, darling. Oh, darling. Oh, my, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy to have you home. I looked for you at the airport. Oh, I was furious about that. I didn't get your wire until ten minutes ago. Well, I sent it when we landed at Newfoundland. Newfoundland? Well, I certainly should have gotten it. You know, I have a good mind to call those people. Oh, forget it, darling. Oh. Don't you want to hear about the trip? Oh, of course. How is Paris? Well, I'm too tired to go into all of the details now, but I'm afraid the trip was a failure. Well, what do you mean? What happened? It's a long story. Come on upstairs. I'll tell you about it. All right, dear. Well, at least the trip was successful in one way. You did put on some weight. What makes you say that? Oh, that suit you're wearing. It's tight on you. I bought this suit in New York at one o'clock. Today? Uh Uh-huh. But why? Why did you need another suit? Well, I couldn't very well come out here in an army uniform. Oh, Peter, what are you talking about? What were you doing with an army uniform? I wore it to get out of France. But where did you get it? Off the body of a soldier I killed. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bob Hudson. You very busy, Bob? No, Jim. I just got to read this report on the Lester case. Why, right, what's up? Oh, I was in to see the SAC. He wants us to work together on something that's just come in. Hmm, fine. What kind of a case is it? Oh, uh, we're not sure. I'd better give you this thing the way the SAC gave it to me, huh? Okay, Jim, shoot. An unidentified man was found dead in a garage in Paris. Paris, France? That's right. From his clothes, the Paris police were able to guess that he was an American. All of the clothes were from stores in this country. I see. The Paris newspapers ran a picture of this unidentified dead American in the hope that somebody might be able to let them know who he was. Uh Well, the day the picture appeared in the papers, a major in the United States Army recognized the person, identified him as a deserter. Well, how do we get in on this, Jim? Oh, I'll come to that, Bob. The Army airmailed the fingerprints of the dead man to Signal Corps headquarters in Washington. They sent the prince over to IDENT to confirm the major's identification. Well, now, let me see if I understand all the facts so far. Okay. A man is found dead in a Paris garage, mm. and we have identified the prince as belonging to an army deserter. That's right. Now, what's the rest of the story? Well, the Paris police, in checking every possible lead, came across something that puzzled them. The dead American's name was George A. Perry. His uh, army serial number was... Uh, uh, 12060514. And the Paris police found that a sergeant, George A. Perry, with that same serial number, returned to this country on an army plane from Paris yesterday. Well, well, how could that happen? Well, that's what had them puzzled. They checked the army orders, which were on file at the airport in Paris. They found out they were counterfeit. Have we got a copy of those orders? Not yet, but we're getting a copy of them. Also, the uh, civilian clothes that were found on the dead soldier. Well, what do you make of this whole thing, Jim? Well, Bob, I think it's probable that whoever murdered Perry switched clothes with him. Forged those orders and then came home in Perry's uniform. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, technically, we're looking for this man, not for murder, but on a charge of illegal wearing of the uniform. That's right, Bob. Have we got any idea what this man we're looking for looks like? No, none yet. Well, what do you think we ought to do first, then, Jim? I've already called the airport here. I've got a list of the people who returned on that plane from Paris from them. How about addresses? They were all Army personnel, so locating them shouldn't be too difficult. At least a couple of them should remember what he looked like. Uh Uh-huh. Then we'll send the description down to Washington, let them check the general appearance file, and send us as many pictures as they have. Oh, that'll work if the killer's a known desperate criminal. That's right. Jim, when do you want to start checking the passengers on that plane? Right now, Bob. Here, let's split this list in half and start making some phone calls. coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. Well, it's so long since I've seen an American paper, I'd much rather read. Peter? Yes, dear? Can I consult you on a few engagements? <laughs> All right, dear. The Shelleys want us Thursday night for cocktails. Now, what'll I tell them? Tell them we'll be there. Oh, good. Now, the Flippins want us for dinner on Saturday. Well, I'm not too sure about that. I may be tied up Saturday. On the Paris business? No, darling. That book is closed. Oh, I hope that's true. What do you mean? 
I hope you're in the clear. Elizabeth, I've told you a dozen times, no one can possibly connect me with the killing. But you were that sergeant's partner, weren't you? Well, a very silent partner. But, Peter, when they investigate his death, they're bound to find out about his black market operation. Well, it still won't lead to me. Yes, but, Peter, you Look, said... I will have some more coffee now, dear. And as for dinner at the Flippins, tell them we accept. <laughs> Jim. Yes, Bob? We just received a report from the Paris police. Oh, what is it? Well, they conducted a further investigation on that army deserter's activities. Oh, what'd they find? Well, he was a pretty active figure in the black market. Oh. He was also believed to have a partner, a man who had come from America to superintend his operations. Sort of an efficiency expert? That's it. Paris police have any idea who that man might be? No. Uh, how have you been making out with the plane passengers? Well, I showed them all the pictures Washington sent to us out of the general appearance file. Any luck? Yes, three of the passengers all picked this picture here. Hmm. Yeah, they say this is the man who came back on the plane with them. Who is he? His name is Peter Caldwell. Well, we got a record on him? Yeah, but I don't know how much good it'll do us. Well, why not? Well, for one thing, Caldwell's arrest record doesn't show anything since 1939. In addition to that, we're not even sure what his name is. What do you mean, Jim? Well, he's been arrested under the names Calhoun, Carroll, Carlson, Crawford, Clinton, and Crenshaw. Oh, I see. So I think it's pretty obvious that he's using some name now other than Peter Caldwell. Mm -hmm. However, we can assume that he's here in town. Why? Well, here is clothes. They were all bought here. Are those the clothes he put on the dead soldier? Yeah, they just arrived from Paris. Any identification? No, none on the suit, but... Here, Bob, take a look at these shoes. Oh. They're custom made. Now, take a look at these marks inside the tongue here on the left shoe. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't mean anything to me, Jim. Well, custom shoemakers, Bob, have their own method of marking shoes. So I think we'd better take these to one of the custom shoemakers here in town. Where do you want to start? Well, there's a bootmaker right down on the next block. I'm going over and see him. If he can tell us who made these shoes, we might find the murderer. <laughs> I didn't expect you'd still be home. I thought you were going to the office. I changed my mind. I phoned instead. Is something wrong? Yeah. What is it? I was informed I had a caller at my office. He was from the FBI. Oh. Talked to my secretary, asked questions. About Paris? Yes. And they must suspect. That's right. And you were so sure they didn't know? Yes. What are you going to do, Peter? I'm just trying to think that out. It's a little difficult. Somehow you never realize a thing like this could happen to you. Have you spoken to your lawyer? Well, hardly. Well, why not? He would certainly Elizabeth, be... Elizabeth, my lawyer knows me as a legitimate businessman. I don't think he'd be much help on a murder charge. Well, then who can you turn to? No one. Oh, but darling, that means everything we've built up for nine years. Our friends, our home, our respectability. They're all gone. That's right, dear. Oh, I'm afraid there's only one solution. Peter, what do you mean? You know what I mean. There's only one way out. And I'm going to take it. Turn in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Very soon now, millions of eager young Americans will answer the summons of the college bells, ringing in a new academic year, years that most men consider the happiest of their lives. But college years are not only happy years, they're profitable ones too. It's a fact that higher education means higher income. Actually, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. Think that over, Bob. Well, naturally, I want my boy to get a college education, Mr. Keating. But it seems kind of early to start worrying about it now. He's just halfway through grammar school. That's where you're wrong, Bob. The sooner you begin planning your boy's college education, the better chance he'll have of getting it. So, the sooner you get the facts about an equitable education fund, the better. 
Well, what sort of fund is that, Mr. Keating? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this Equitable Plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, say, Mr. Keating, whom do I see about starting one of these plans? An equitable society representative, I suppose. Right, Bob. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Above all, don't delay. Start an equitable education fund right away to make sure that when the college bells ring out, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to the FBI file, The Great Deception. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI again illustrates the important fact that there is no geography in crime. A criminal operates when and where he finds the proper accumulation of evil. That may be on the other side of the world, or it may be across the street from where you listen to this program. That is one of the reasons why the Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in bringing you this series of programs, so that you, the law-abiding citizen, may know that crime can come anywhere at any time. Your FBI does not want you to be constantly suspicious of everyone or anything, but it does want you to be alert. In the words of Director J. Edgar Hoover, wherever law and order break down, there you will find public indifference. And wherever law and order break down, there you will also find the FBI. But public indifference can do more to aid the criminal than your FBI can do to harm him. For that reason, it is important to you individually and to the nation as a whole that all of you bend your every effort in aiding the forces of law and order to conquer the current crime wave. Without you, that crime wave cannot be conquered. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Bob, we're making progress. I've covered a lot of ground since this morning. I see you've still got Caldwell's shoes. Yeah, I went over to the bootmakers on the next block after I left here. He recognized the shoes. You mean he made them? No, but he said they looked to him like shoes that were turned out by a custom shoemaker named Hampton. Uh-huh. So I went over to Hampton's shop. I found out this pair of shoes was made for one of their customers. Hmm, did they tell you his name? It's a Peter Clayton. He's a regular customer. Then they had his address. No, the records show that he'd always picked up his shoes. He's never had them delivered. Then we're stymied again. Not this time, Bob. I played a hunch. I had the office check passports for me. They found that a Peter Clayton had been issued a passport with a visa for France. That was a good hunch, Jim. The French embassy showed me Clayton's request. His stationery had a Broadway address on it. It was Clayton's office, so I went there. Did you see him? No, he wasn't in, but I spoke to his secretary and got his home address. Where does he live? At North Centerville. I called the office here for help, and the place is now under surveillance. Well, that's about an hour's ride out in the island, isn't it? It is by train, but we can make it a little quicker than that in the car. I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sergeant Fulton out in North Centerville. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I have a report for you. Fine, let's have it. One of our patrolmen called to report a minute ago. Part of his detail is the 12th Street Bridge. Yes. He reported that someone jumped off the bridge and committed suicide. It was Peter Clayton. Right over here, Mr. Taylor. This is where the man jumped. How do you know that, officer? Well, this is where I found his clothes in the suicide note. No, I see. You, uh, you didn't see him go off the bridge, did you? No, I didn't. Did you, uh, just stumble onto his effects? Oh, no, I was told to come here by headquarters. Oh? They received a phone call from a man who said he happened to be passing by and saw someone jump in the river. Tell me, do you know where this man called from? 
Yeah, a place at the end of the bridge. Joe's Diner. It's open all night. I see. What did you do with Clayton's effects? I brought them to his wife, and she said the clothes belonged to him. Mm-hmm. What was her reaction? She read the note and collapsed. I see. Officer, how far is uh, Clayton's house from here? Oh, just a few blocks down the road. Thanks. I think I'll get over and interview the widow. Just a minute. Mrs. Clayton? Yes. Are you from the police? I'm a special agent of the FBI, Mrs. Clayton. Oh. Here are my credentials. Please come in. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry to have to bother you at a time like they, that. Have they found anything yet? But... No, ma'am. Mrs. Clayton, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor. Yes, yeah, surely. What is it you want? Do you still have the note that the police brought you? The note Peter wrote? Yes, ma'am. It's there, on the table. Oh. May I have it, please? Will you return it? Yes, yes, surely. Mr. Taylor? Yes? The things the police told me about my husband, are they true? I'm afraid so, yes. Uh, I just can't conceive it. As far as I knew, well, he was just in a regular business. I understand. Well, I think I'll be going now. Thank you, Mrs. Clayton, for your courtesy. Hello? Hello, Peter. Elizabeth, where are you calling from? I'm in a phone booth in the drugstore. Ah, how's it working? Better than you even thought it would. Fine. The man from the FBI was at the house. Oh, what did he want? He wanted to get the suicide note you left on the bridge. Did he give any special reason? No. Uh Uh-huh. Did you let him have it? Yes. Did he sound convinced about my death? Completely. You're in the clear. Only temporarily, I'm afraid. Now, what do you mean? Well, when my body isn't found, they'll get suspicious. But inasmuch as this was just a delaying action, we'll now have plenty of time to really disappear. How long do you want me to stay here? How soon can you get away? Any time. Hire a car and chauffeur and drive right up. You have the directions. Yes. Is the hotel crowded? You don't think I'd come here if it was. This is a winter resort. It's out of season. In fact, it's a perfect spot for a man who has just committed suicide. <laughs> Jim, hmm? have you finished your report on the Clayton case yet? No, Bob. I've been busy most of the day. You been assigned to a new case yet? No, not yet. Jim, will you go along with me on something? What is it? Will you hold back the Clayton report for a little while? <laughs> You're a little suspicious of that one, too. Yes. I went over Clayton's record last night. He just doesn't seem to be the kind of a man who commits suicide. Well, that's the same conclusion I've come to. Then I guess I won't look too foolish when I tell you that I spent most of the day at the morgue. There's been no trace of Clayton's body. Makes our theory look even better. Uh Uh-huh. I spent most of my time today at the lab. I had the handwriting experts check the suicide note and the signature on those forged army orders. It's their opinion they were both written by the same man. With that evidence, they could convict Clayton on a murder charge. Yes, if he's alive. Excuse me. Special Agent Hudson. This is Sergeant Fulton up in North Centerville. Is Mr. Taylor in? Just a moment. It's Sergeant Fulton for you, Jim. Oh, yeah. I had the suicide note delivered to him so he could return it to Mrs. Clayton. Thanks, Bob. Hello, Sergeant. I went out to return that suicide note, Mr. Taylor, as soon as your messenger gave it to me. Mrs. Clayton is still hysterical? I don't know. She was gone. What? A neighbor said she left an hour ago with luggage. I don't like that. Sergeant, uh, wait for us at her house. We'll be right out. Bob, Mrs. Clayton left her home this morning, complete with luggage. Uh-oh. Come on, we better drive out there and find out where she went. Bob, I've just finished talking to the neighbor who told the sergeant she saw Mrs. Clayton leave. According to her, Mrs. Clayton was picked up by a car and chauffeur. Well, it wasn't her own car. I checked. Theirs are still in the garage. Oh, it's a friend's car. I don't think it is, Bob. Not with a chauffeur. I have a hunch it was rented. Oh, but there's no place in North Centerville where you can rent a car and a chauffeur. No, but there are plenty of those places in town. Let's get back to the office and start checking. I 
found the place, Bob. It's the Ajax Auto Rental Service. Did they know where she was going? No, but they did say she rented a car for 12 hours, starting at 10.30 this morning. Well, it could be that her trip would take six hours each way. Yeah. That means the chauffeur won't be back until 10.30 tonight. It also means we've got seven and a half hours to sit here and wait. Jim, we've got to assume now that she's on her way to meet her husband. Now, the only thing we can do until we hear from that chauffeur is send out another alarm over the wire on Clayton. No, sir. No, sir, we can do more than that. You just reminded me of something. Well, what's that? We've still got Clayton's picture, haven't we? Well, surely. Why? I've got an idea. Let's get that picture and take a little ride. More coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. <laughs> I've missed that these past few days. Why? You're saying I'm not eating much breakfast. Well, it's true. You always read your paper. Well, you always keep talking. <laughs> All that's missing now is our engagements for the week. Oh, heavens. What? I just remembered. I never canceled our dinner engagement with the Flippins. Darling, inasmuch as I'm presumably at the bottom of the river, I think they'll understand. Peter. Yes, dear. When are we leaving this hotel? You just arrived. Is it safe for us to stay here? Mm, temporarily, yes. After all, I changed my name, my appearance. That's true. Peter, I still think I should write to them. Who? The Flippins. After all, I'm not at the bottom of the river. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, probably valet service. I called them. Will you let them in, dear? I'll get my dress. Okay. Yes? Hello, Mr. Clayton. I'm uh, afraid you have the wrong room. My name is Cameron. It's been a number of things before that. We're special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here for the arrest of you and your wife. It can't prove anything. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to prove that you didn't commit suicide, and neither did that soldier in Paris. <laughs> Peter Clayton, before being extradited, was turned over to local authorities who wanted him on a swindling charge. These authorities sentenced him to life imprisonment. His wife, Elizabeth, was given a five-year sentence in state court on charges of conspiracy. The suspicions entertained by the two special agents of your FBI that Peter Clayton had not actually committed suicide were investigated and found to be true. Special Agent Taylor learned from the policeman who had gotten a telephone call reporting the suicide that the call had come from Joe's Diner, an all-night lunchroom located near the bridge. When Taylor went to the diner and showed Peter Clayton's picture to the counterman, he identified Clayton as the man who had made the telephone call reporting the suicide. Armed with the knowledge that Clayton was still alive, Taylor then proceeded to the address supplied by the auto rental service, the address to which they had taken Mrs. Clayton. And thus, a murder committed some 3,500 miles away... A wanton murder that took place in Paris was solved through the cooperation of the Paris Surette, of the local police of North Centerville, and of your FBI. Cooperation that today makes the Federal Bureau of Investigation part of an international force which is fighting the criminals of the world every hour of every day. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Uh, Mr. Keating, how old should a child be when you start one of these plans for him? Any age, from one week old on up. Remember, the younger the child is when you start his Equitable Education Fund, the lower the yearly cost is to you, because you spread the total amount over more years. So the sooner you act, the better. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative right away. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case history of the operations of a group of female bandits. Its subject, robbery. Its title... 
deadlier than the nail. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Deadlier than the mail on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly, among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, Deadlier Than the Mail. Keeping a record of America's army of criminals is an overwhelming job. To give you some idea of the enormity of the task... It is only necessary to tell you that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has on file in Washington, D.C., in its criminal fingerprints files, the prints of more than seven and a half million Americans who possess arrest records. Stop for a moment and think of what that figure means. Purely in terms of statistics, that means more than one in every 19 people in the United States. If you believe that those figures will be of interest only to those who have daily contact with known criminals, you are mistaken. This current crime wave can affect everything you hold dear, including your personal freedom. That is true because the basis of your freedom, your individual share of our national liberty, is based upon our common regard and respect for the law. For that reason, it should be your selfish motive to aid yourself by doing your part in helping to end the current crime wave. Tonight's file opens on the main thoroughfare of a large eastern city. It is mid-afternoon. A tall, attractive girl is walking along the crowded sidewalk when she hears someone call her name. Huh? Claire! Oh, hi, Betty. Hi. Well, for goodness sakes, what are you doing in town? I just came in a few weeks ago. Oh, well, you busy right now? Uh Uh-uh. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Okay. I was thinking about you the other day. What have you been doing, Betty? Oh, I'm still married to those three soldiers. You're married to three soldiers? Yeah. Oh, that's patriotic. It ain't very profitable, though. Gee, the way prices are these days. Mm. The three allotment checks don't pay expenses. Hold it, honey. Wait for the light. Oh. Betty, how would you like to get some action? Doing what? I'm working for Helen Webster at the Hi-Hat Club. Hostess? Yeah. Want me to see if she can use another girl? No. All you have to do is sit around and drink with the customers. But suppose you don't like them. Honey, were you in love with all the soldiers you married? I was very fond of every one of them. Can we cross now? Mm-hmm. Claire, how am 
much does Helen pay you? Seventy-five a week and a percentage. Oh, that ain't bad. Want me to tell her about you? Do you get to meet many interesting people? Sure. Want me to talk to her? Okay. Maybe I'll get to meet some new husbands. A few days later, at the local FBI field office, policewoman Sally Russell has just come in to see Special Agent Jim Taylor. Hello, Sally. Hello, Jim. Uh, sit down, won't you? Thanks. SAC just called and said you were on your way in here. He thought you might be the one who could give me some help. The FBI is always ready to help a fair damsel in distress. <laughs> Why, thank you, kind sir. <laughs> now, what's your trouble, Sally? There's been a series of robberies of couples who were in parked cars. Have you read about them in the papers? Mm. They've labeled them Lover's Lane stick-ups. No, no, I haven't seen any of the local papers recently, Sally. I just got back from working on a case upstate. Well, they've been pretty much up in arms. Oh, uh-huh. Running editorials again? Denouncing the police commissioner? Worse than that. They've implied that every one of us on the force is just letting these stick-ups happen without doing anything about them. Well, they should know better than that. Well, tell me, have you gotten any descriptions of the hold-up men? No. They all wear masks. Oh. Besides, all of the male victims seem to have been drinking so heavily that they don't remember much. I assume these male victims had girls with them. Yes, but we haven't found any of the girls. How could that happen? None of the victims knew the girl he was with. Each of them claims he picked up his female companion. Well, have you got a list of the places where they met? We don't need a list, Jim. Why not? In every case, the victim picked his girl up at Helen Webster's nightclub. Helen Webster. Webster. That name name sounds familiar. She runs a hi-hat club. Oh. You probably remember her name because she was in trouble for clipping servicemen during the war. Yes, yes, I do, Sally. Well, has anybody confronted Helen Webster with this evidence? Yes, my inspector went to see her yesterday. What'd she say? She was obviously prepared for the visit. She claims she's running a legitimate nightclub and that it's impossible for her to stop her customers from mingling. Could any of the girls be identified by the victims? No. The memories were too clouded with drink. Hmm. Sally, I assume the SAC explained to you that there's nothing we can do about this situation unless it violates one of the federal statutes over which we have jurisdiction. Yes, he did, Jim. Okay. I'm afraid Webster is too smart to do anything like that. But I think you might help me identify one of the girls involved. Be glad to. We have a record on her. What's her name? I'm not sure. Take a look at the checks in this envelope. Okay. The U.S. government allotment checks made out to uh, three different people. That's right. There was a stick-up last night out by the lake. This envelope with the three checks in it was found near where the car was parked. I see. It's possible that a girl who was picked up at Helen Webster's dropped that envelope. I'd like you to find out what you can about those allotments. I'll send them down to Washington immediately, Sally. And as soon as I get any word, I'll call you. If I'm not at headquarters, you can probably find me at the Hi-Hat Club. How come? I've been assigned to wear an evening gown and get a job as a hostess at the place. You what? If all goes well, starting tonight, I'll be a pickup girl. Helen, did you send for me? Yes, ma'am. I want to talk to you. Oh? Sounds like a beef. It is. What's with that girl you brought here? Betty? Yeah. What's the matter with her? She's your friend, don't you know? Well, she's not very bright, if that's what you mean. Claire, you know I usually have every girl who works here start out just being a hostess. Mm -hmm. I made an exception in her case because of your recommendation. You mean letting her go out with customers? Yeah. What did she do wrong? She got out of the car with a guy just before the stick-up. You mean when they parked? Yeah. You want to see me? Yeah, come in. Hi, Claire. Betty, Helen tells me when you parked with that guy last night, you both left the car. That's right. You were told to stay in a car when you parked. But it was such a nice night, and Joey said, let's take a walk, so what can I say? Joey? My date. He was an awful nice fella. Al had to look for you for five minutes before he could stick you up. Well, I meant to come right back, but my purse fell open, and it took time to pick things up in the dark. Look, young lady, I got a big investment here. Oh, I know that. By the middle of November, Fort Hopkins is going to be filled with young 19-year-old soldiers. There's a bundle to be made off them, and I intend to make it. You should. But I won't if I get thrown a curve by a stupid slob like you. Oh. I'm awful sorry I did what I did, Miss Webster, honest. That's a help. I promise you I won't do nothing like that again, ever. I know she means that, Helen. Well, give her another chance, huh? Okay. Oh, gee, that's awful nice of you, Miss Webster. From now on, I'm going to be the smartest slob in the place. Hi, 
Jim. Oh, hello, Sally. Any news for a working girl? I just finished reading a report from Washington. Came in this morning's mail. On the allotment check? That's right. What did it say? The lab examined the endorsements on the previous checks that had been paid on those three allotments. Mm-hmm. The handwriting experts of the document section say that all three endorsements were written by the same person. Now we're getting someplace. Oh, we've already opened up a file on this case. This constitutes a fraud against the government. Comes under our jurisdiction. Fine. Then we can work together. Say, uh, how's the pickup business? Well, I've only been there one night. Oh, how are you doing? Better than I thought I would. I ran into a girl, a fellow worker. She's a little on the dumb side. Oh? She's practically admitted to me that she's working for Helen Webster. Fine. What's her name? Betty Grant. At least that's the name she uses there. Oh, I uh, may have something to report myself pretty soon. Like what? I'm having the three husbands from those allotment checks contacted. Where are they? They're all still in the service. Mm. I'm trying to see whether any of them can furnish us with a picture of his wife. Oh, that would be a big help. It's going to take a little while, though. They're all overseas. Oh. Meanwhile, I'm going to take an artist with me and make the rounds of the places where she cashed the previous checks. I'm going to have him make a composite picture from the various descriptions that we got. Good idea. As soon as the artist completes it, Sally, I'll come to the club and show it to you. Is this stool taken? No, it isn't. Mind if I sit here? Not at all. Thanks. Buy a drink? Mm, as soon as I finish this one. Like to dance? Okay. Fine, let's. Come on. I'm glad to get away from that bar. You didn't look very bored. You're not allowed to. Miss Webster doesn't like it. Uh-huh. You know something? I never knew police women dance this well. Is that a compliment? It certainly is. And why are we stopping so soon? There's an empty table. Come on, let's occupy it. Oh, I knew this wouldn't last. Well, Sally, I've got that composite picture we were talking about. With you? Yeah. Yeah, sit here. Thanks. Here's the picture. Hmm. It's a good likeness. You know her? That's the girl I was telling you about. The blonde who calls herself Betty Grant. Is she around here now? Let me see. Hmm. No, I guess not. Can you find out where she went? Might be dangerous asking questions. She'll be back in a little while anyway. How do you know that? That's the pattern. Oh, I see. You want to wait around for her? No. No, I have something to do down at police headquarters. Sally, she's the key figure in this case. If we get her, we also get Miss Webster. So give me a ring at headquarters the minute she comes in. Just a minute. Gee, I was afraid you wouldn't be home this being your night off and all. Can I come in? Yeah, sure, come on. Oh, boy, am I tired. You got a pan of hot water? Why? I want to soak my feet. I never walked so much in my whole life. Walked? Where? To the bus. What bus? The bus to Glendale Park. Then I took a trolley. After the trolley, I took a ferry across the river. And what then are you I t- talking about? How I got here to your place. I finally took a cab from the ferry. Look, and... Betty. Will you start from the beginning? Where have you been? Out in the country. How did you get there? In a car. Whose car? Well, it belongs to a fellow I picked up at the club. Oh, now I get it. You're on your way to a stick-up. That's right. Why did you have to walk home? Because the stick-up never happened. Didn't Al show up? Oh, yeah, he was there. He stuck a gun in the car, just like he always does. Did the sucker grab the gun from him? No, the policeman did that. What policeman? The one who came up behind Al. Did Al get caught? Well, I got out of the car and ran, so I really couldn't say. But I think he did. Why? The policeman shot him. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Next week, from hundreds of famous and well-loved campuses, the bells of our colleges will be calling to young America. Nearly two and a half million boys and girls will respond to the call of those bells. There's a boy in our town who won't answer that bell. Name of Tom Barton. 
Head of his class last June in high school, a natural for college. But his dad died last spring. And now he's had to go to work to help support his mother and his three younger brothers and sisters. Every time I hear a story like that, I'm more firmly convinced than ever that the Equitable Education Fund is one of the finest of all the services performed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. What do you mean, an Equitable Education Fund? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, that's the answer to my problem, Mr. Keating. Guess I'd better see a man from the Equitable Society right away. Good idea, Ned. Get in touch with an Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, to start an Equitable Education Fund right away is to make certain that when the college bells of the future ring out, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to tonight's FBI file, Deadlier Than the Mail. It seems safe to say that there are very few people who are happy to see the foreign affairs of our nation in such a condition as to make it necessary for the young men of our country again to be donning uniforms. However, as you have seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there are at least some to whom the current call to colors presents an opportunity for personal gain. That there will be cheating and robbing of these youngsters is not a deterrent. For in the curious lexicon of the criminal, there is no such word as decency. The criminal is an opportunist, taking advantage of every circumstance which mitigates in his favor. Unfortunately, no law enforcement agency can prevent these crimes from being committed. All they can do is investigate afterwards and attempt to apprehend the criminal. However, you who are listening to this program can do something to help prevent the commission of such crimes. In fact, you are almost the only ones who can prevent them. Your course will not be easy because there is no ready way to recognize the criminal, either physically or mentally. If there were, the current crime wave would not be the national concern it is today. Many of you are willing and anxious to help fight that crime wave. If you are one, it is only fair to tell you that your job will not be part-time because the price of freedom from crime is... Eternal Vigilance. Tonight's file continues at local police headquarters. Jim, I've been looking for you. Uh, Sally. Sally, what are you doing here? I was invited to leave the club. By whom? Ellen Webster. Oh? What did she say? She gave it to me straight. She said one of her customers told her I was a policewoman. How did the customer know that? Because I arrested him about three months ago. Uh, I see. Oh, well, uh, by the way, that Grant girl never did come back. Oh, I think I have an explanation for that. There's been another stick-up. Happened about an hour ago, and the FBI is in on this one. How come? It occurred on a government reservation. What's the story on? Same pattern. Man and girl in parked car, bandit holds them up. Only this time, he didn't get away with it. Well, what happened? A patrol car was cruising in the vicinity, saw the stick-up, and moved in. Any arrest? Yes, they got the gunman. And was Betty Grant the girl? Well, from the description the victim gave us, I think she was. I gather she wasn't picked up. No, she jumped out of the car and disappeared. Where's the gunman? He's over at Memorial Hospital. He's unconscious. Was anyone able to talk to him? No, but we have an agent in his room, hoping he'll come, too. Has this man been identified? Yes, he's a petty larceny hoodlum named Al Nelson. Sally, tell me, what's the pattern with these girls? Do they return to the Hyatt Club after a stick-up? No, I believe so. Well, that means that Betty Grant could be there right now. Yes. Oh, I wish I was still welcome there. Well, never mind about being welcome. 
I've got warrants here in my pocket for the arrest of Betty Grant and Helen Webster. Let's go see if we can serve them. doing there? Well, there was some trouble, and Claire asked me to call and tell you about it. What kind of trouble? Shooting. What? Where? At the place you sent me. You mean Al shot your date? No, the cops shot Al. What cops? Right after Al came up to the car, the cops came. Where's Al now? I don't know. The cops took him. How'd you get away? When Al and the cops started to make all of that noise, I ran. Was Al dead? No. Well, that's bad. What? If he's not dead, he might talk and ruin the whole setup. Miss Webster, I called you to tell you I'm never coming back to the club again. You say you're at Claire's? Yeah. Is she there? Yeah. What's that address? Um, 262 North Main. 260. All right, I'll be right over. Webster now. I'll get it. Is Betty still here? Yeah, come on in. Hello, Miss Webster. I knew I shouldn't have given you that second chance. Well, see, you're not going to blame those cops on me, are you? Helen, I don't think it was Betty's fault. I'm not so sure about that. Betty, did you tell a dark brunette girl in a white evening gown where you were going? I didn't tell anybody where I was going. Did you tell her anything? I talked to her at the bar for a little while. Who is this girl you're talking about? She's a new girl who's working as a hostess. Found out tonight she was a policewoman. Oh, dandy. When you were at the bar with her, Betty, what did you talk about? I don't remember. I knew she was a new girl here, and well, I was just being friendly. Betty, I think you better get out of town. Why? I'll get you a job with a friend of mine in Pittsburgh. Oh, I've never been in Pittsburgh. I'll call Fred and have him drive you there. Oh, I don't mind taking the train. I don't want you around any railroad station. Al may have talked. But, Helen, if Al talks, what happens to you? If the cops don't find Betty, they got no case against me. Oh, I see. Where's the phone, Claire? I want to call Fred. The sooner we get Betty out of town, the better. <laughs> I just spoke to the bartender. Did he know where Helen Webster went? Yes, she got a phone call and went to see Betty Grant. She must have heard about the arrest of Al Nelson. The bartender still thinks I'm one of the girls who works here. Hey, that's fine. I wonder if he knows where Betty Grant lives. I asked him. He doesn't. Uh Anyone else around here who might have that information? I don't think so. I checked with some of the other girls and the doorman. Couldn't give me a thing. Of course, you know, it's possible she isn't even at home. Miss Webster could have just had a date to meet her someplace. Do you say you talked to the doorman? Yes. Did he see Miss Webster leave? Yes, she took a cab. Well, he could have overheard her give the address to the cab driver. I checked that too, Jim. And? He said she had an address written down on a sheet of paper when she came out. He didn't hear her tell the cab driver anything. Uh, well, does he remember which cab she took? No. All right, at least it's just about where we started. And time may be running out. You mean for Betty Grant? Yes. While you were asking questions, I called Memorial Hospital. Al Nelson died about 20 minutes ago. Oh, that's bad. So Betty Grant is really our only witness now. If Helen Webster can get her out of the way, we'll have trouble proving a case. Do you know where Miss Webster got that phone call? The bartender said she got it in her office. In her office. Where's that? Through that door in the rear. Hmm. Helen Webster had that address written down. Let's go have a look in her office. Without knowing it, she might have left a copy for us. Claire. Hmm? I might as well tell you so you won't start screaming. Tell me what? When Fred comes up here, he's going to give it to your friend in the next room. But you said you were going to get her a job in Pittsburgh. I don't like to see anybody get killed, Claire, but this girl's a menace. This thing tonight wasn't her fault. 
Whose fault is it if she talks to a policewoman? But that policewoman even had you fooled. I didn't tell her anything. Your friend did. Look, you can't do this, Helen. No. You'll never get away with it. Why not? Because I'm not going to see her killed. If Fred shoots her, I'll go to the cops myself. Thanks for telling me. I'll talk to Fred about you, too. Oh, is that my chauffeur, Miss Webster? Uh, yeah, dear. Get your coat. Coming. That's Helen Webster, Jim. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I have a warrant here for your arrest. What? Well, what are you talking about? We'll find out, lady. Oh, hi, Sally. Betty, she's a cop, don't you remember? Oh. The blonde girl is Betty Grant, Jim. The other girl works for Helen, too. Okay. How did you know we were here? We examined the pad on which Miss Webster wrote this address. She wrote heavily enough to indent the next couple of pages with a very legible impression. Oh. Sally, it's getting late. I think we'd better get this trio down to headquarters. Helen Webster was tried in federal court for robbery on a government reservation and given a 20-year sentence. Betty Grant received a five-year sentence for violation of the Veterans Dependency Act. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was closed successfully because of two things. The first was the close cooperation of your FBI and a local police force. Cooperation without which your FBI would be unable to have built the spectacular record for success which it now enjoys. The second factor which helped bring this case to a conclusion was the indented writing Special Agent Taylor found on the pad next to Helen Webster's telephone. Anyone could have found the pad, but knowing how to read indented writing is a skill which has taught every special agent as a part of the course he takes to prepare for his job. And thus, the criminal careers of these women were halted. Each year, the number of women arrested grows larger, and in the past 12 months, almost 10% more women were arrested than in any other year on record. To make the distaff side of the crime picture even darker, almost 50% of the women arrested had previous arrest records. Most of these crimes were local in nature so that you, the listener, can make a real contribution toward the control of crime in your neighborhood. You can do that by seeing to it that you have a strong local police force. If that result is achieved, your FBI will feel very well repaid for having cooperated in bringing you this program tonight. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now we have time for one more quick question on the Equitable Education Fund. Have you got one, Ned? Yes, Mr. Keating. Suppose I start a fund for that boy of mine now. Then when he's 17, he decides he doesn't want any more education. And what happens then? Well, the fund is always your money, Ned. If your boy votes against going to college, you can use the proceeds of the fund in any way you see fit. The really important thing is to start one soon. Get in touch with your equitable representative without delay. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A dramatic depiction of the operations of a professional killer. Its subject... Flight to Avoid Prosecution. Its title, The Innocent Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Fugitive on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly, among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Innocent Fugitive. The mind of man is an elastic thing, and nowhere is that flexibility better illustrated than in the endless variety of crimes he commits every day. In every 24-hour period, there are more than 4,000 major crimes committed somewhere in these United States. Those crimes range from armed robbery to murder. Some of those crimes are comparatively new, but murder, the deliberate killing of a human being with malice aforethought, is as old as the history of the world. In fact, one of the most despicable characters in America's current legion of criminals is a throwback to the very earliest days of recorded time. In that era, rulers hired their soldiers, soldiers who were available to the nation which paid them best. They were called mercenaries. Today, their 20th century criminal counterpart is likewise a member of no organization. He, too, is available to the highest bidder. His job is to murder for money. Tonight's file opens in a lavish apartment located in the downtown section of a Midwestern city. It is evening. In the living room of this sweet Arthur White, prominent local citizen, is showing home movies to a friend. Ah, Hey, see that, Ed? That's the lake where we went fishing. You catch anything? (laughs) You just keep your eye on the screen and you'll see. How about another drink, Ed? No, thanks. Ah, there's the boat we used. You see it? Yeah, it's a beauty, huh? Is that you? Huh? Oh, no, 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 no. That fellow was my guide. Oh. Yeah, there's me now. See? Mm Mm-hmm. You ask about fish. Just look at those rainbow trout. Who caught them? I did. That's a legal limit up there. You're not allowed to catch any more. You know me, I always stick by the rules. Mm-hmm. Hey, look. Look, there's Freddy waving at the camera. Hello, Freddy. Uh, say, Mr. White. <laughs> uh, yeah? Is this what you brought me up here to see? Uh, no, no, no. We're coming to that right now. Okay. Uh-huh. Now, here we are. Now, look at that place closely. That house? Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure that's where he is. That's where who is? John Williams. Who's he? The man I want you to kill. The next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of Agent Glenn Peters. Hello, Glenn. Hi, Jim. Hey, when'd you get in? I signed in this morning. Well, the SAC told me you were coming. Hey, where you been? Well, I was in Salt Lake City for a while, and I moved out to the San Francisco office. Uh. I understand we're working together, Jim. What's the case? Well, I'd better start at the beginning, huh? Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear of a man named John Williams? No, not that I know of. Three and a half years ago, he was the local city treasurer. 
one morning, he disappeared. With city funds? Uh, that's right. When his books were examined, it was found that they were $80,000 short. Well, isn't the city bonded against a loss like that? Yes, yes, they are. Well, how do we get in on a local case, Jim? Well, when Williams couldn't be found, the police requested us to cooperate with him. We sent out a flyer on Williams and found out that he'd taken a plane to El Paso, Texas. From there, he went across the border into Mexico. That was the last trace we had of him. Well, how about the Mexican police? At our request, they started to search at Juarez for Williams, but all they could find was that he had left Juarez by car. What did he do? Buy a car in Mexico? No. No, according to their report, someone was waiting for him at Juarez, and they drove away, down south, together. You say that that was three and a half years ago. Yeah, that's right. Well, how come we're suddenly getting active on the case again? We got a report from the immigration department that a plane was taken from an airport in Mexico. Flown across the border to an airfield in this country where it was abandoned. Mm -hmm. Now, upon examining this plane, immigration officials found a thermos jug in a the cockpit. They wrapped it carefully, sent it on to Washington for a fingerprint examination. Mm -hmm. Now, fingerprints proved to be those of John Williams. Well, any idea where he could be headed? Not yet, Glenn. But let's go through the record, see if we can get some kind of a lead. Easy, Ed. This is the place. Okay. Yeah, stop right here. Uh, looks like we'll have to run for it. Uh -huh. Okay, here we go. Uh, <sighs> haven't done this in years. Got spoiled in the city. Too many comforts. I'll still take them. <laughs> You're not much of a country boy, are you, Ed? Uh... Uh, you know, when I was a kid, Ed, nights like this, we'd stay out for hours, just feeling that soft summer rain. Yes? Hello, Betty. What? It's me, Arthur White. Oh, oh of course. Hello, Arthur. I, <laughs> I, I didn't know who it was standing there in the dark. Come in. Thank you, thank you. You mind if my chauffeur comes in, too? Of course not. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, yes, sir. I hope you don't mind this intrusion, Betty. Why, Arthur? I was you... on my way to the lake to do some fishing when this storm came up, so I said to Edward here, I've got a good friend in the neighborhood. Maybe we can impose on her for an hour or so until it stops raining. It's no imposition. You know that, Arthur. <laughs> and take off that coat. It's soaking wet. Well, I guess maybe I should. It's that. I've got a dry one in my bag in the car. Edward, uh, would you get it for me, please? Yes, sir. Here, let me have your coat. All right. Oh, yeah. here we are. I'll just put it right over here. <laughs> There. Ah. Betty, this place looks lovely. Thank you. You know, I envy you this country life. I do enjoy it. <laughs> you heard from John recently? Well, not for a couple of months. Well, that's a fine way for a man to treat his sister. Well, he never writes very much. How about you? Do you write him often? I try to write about once a week. Uh-huh. Uh, send him this the next time you write him. With my regards. Thank you, Arthur. You've certainly been nice to John, giving me money all the time to send him. <laughs> After all, he was a member of my organization. A good friend, too. You've certainly proven that. <laughs> when did John write last? Well, just two months ago, on my birthday. Did he say anything about wanting to see you again? No. Anything about coming back to the States? No. Are you sure, Betty? Yes, of course. Look, Arthur, you sit down here and make yourself comfortable. I'll go out and make you some hot tea. Uh -huh. And a couple of sandwiches, maybe, too? <laughs> fine, Betty, fine. <laughs> Who's there? It's me, John. Oh. Don't turn on the light. I heard a car pull into the driveway a little while ago. Who's here, Betty? Arthur White. Oh, he must have heard that I came back. He doesn't know that you're here. How do you know? Because he gave me a hundred dollars to mail to you. Well, that might be one of his tricks. Maybe. What's he doing here? He said he was just passing by when the storm came up. He was on his way to go fishing. I don't trust him, Betty. Where is he now? Down the hall in the guest room, changing his wet clothes. His uh, chauffeur's with him. Chauffeur? Yes. Well, that's not so good. Well, what do you mean? Arthur's always used that chauffeur's uniform to disguise one of his thugs. Oh. What'll we do? Nothing. 
Shall I call the police? You can't, Betty. You know that. But, John, you told me that you could prove your innocence. I'm not until I get a written statement from a girl named Peggy Dawson. Who's she? Arthur White's ex-girlfriend, the one I told you about. Oh, yes. The one who sent me word in Mexico that White framed me. Well, when can you get that statement? She said she'd be here tonight, a little after midnight. But if she sees him here, she may change her mind about talking. John, she can't. Betty, Arthur has methods of persuading people. Then... What can we do? You go down to the living room. Yes? Watch for this Dawson girl and head her off. All right. And above all, stay clear of that chauffeur. Hey, uh, Jim, I sent out those flyers on John Williams. Oh, thanks, Clayton. I'm sorry to say that I don't have much to report. You get anything more from the Mexican police? Yes, uh, the chief called. They're covering every lead, but they still haven't found anything. Uh, You know, in going through William's record, I I found he had a sister named Elizabeth. I went over to where she was living at the time of the trial, but she moved without leaving any forwarding address. I see. I did learn, however, that she owned a half interest in a freight warehouse. Here in town? Yeah. So I stopped in there on my way back to the office. How'd you make out? She sold out her interest about a year ago when she got married. Oh. You know, Glenn, if we could find Elizabeth Williams... I'm pretty sure we could find her brother. I'm inclined to agree. Have you sent out any alarm on her? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, one thing bothers me about the records on this case. What's that? When the local police were investigating the original crime, they seemed to have met with some interference. What kind? Arthur White, political boss of this town. He apparently had pressure applied in saying to it that the city's investigation was ended. Well, Jim, how much do you know about this, White? Oh, I know a lot of things about him, Glenn. He's mixed up with mobs, Mm -hmm. but he's pretty clever about concealing it. He's been an obstructionist in our path quite a few times, but we've never been able to definitely link him to any of the crimes. Well, it sounds like we'd be doing the taxpayers a real favor if we could prove that Williams came back to this country to see White. You know, that's what I was thinking too, Glenn. I think I'll go over and have a talk with Mr. White. Come in. Well, Ed, I thought I'd lost you. I've been busy. Listen to this thing, Ed. You know what that is? It's that new stuff called bebop. <laughs> it's quite the rage these days for the younger set. I got a report for you. Oh? You've been casing the whole house. From the outside? Yeah. Your friend is in the corner room down the hall. Well, that's welcome news. How'd you find out? I climbed up a tree in the front yard and looked in the window. <laughs> Edward, you are a diligent man. Uh, what was my friend doing? Just getting into bed. I see. Well, I always say there's no time like the present. Strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> I always say that, too. You mean you want me to go in there now? That's right. <laughs> I think a gun will make too much noise. Yes, I agree with you. Have you a knife? Yeah. Well, <laughs> then use it, my boy. Use it. Okay. I think you'll find that you've only stabbed my pillow. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Right now, the bells of our colleges are ringing. Thousands of Americans of college age are answering the call. But what about those who do not go to college? What difference does that make in their lives? They are destined, on the average, to earn $72,000 less during their working years than the average college graduate. Yes, that's the price for not going to college. $72,000. Say, those kids of mine are going to college. If it takes the last cent I have to my name. You needn't do that, Sid, if you start an equitable education fund right now. Did you say an equitable education fund? Yes. It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, 
You start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's what I need, Mr. Keating. I'm going to see someone from the Equitable Society. Right, Sid. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And remember, with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, you can be sure that when the college bells ring out in 1960 or 1965, your boy or girl will be ready to answer the call. Now back to the FBI file, The Innocent Fugitive. In regard to tonight's program, we bring you a message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover says, and I quote, Tonight's case adapted from the files of your FBI is not to be regarded as an indictment of our political system. Our country lives by that system and has prospered by it. In the final analysis, our greatest men, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and all such national figures, were in politics. However, there is a sharp line of demarcation between the man in politics working always in the best interests of the citizen and the politician who thinks only about his job. Much of today's crime problem can be traced to the latter... The political hanger-on who wants a job as head of a police department for what he can get out of it. The crooked or ignorant vote-getter. The legislator who impedes law enforcement for private or political reasons is the type to which I refer. They are enemies of America and of every man in politics. You and I, the citizens of America, must see to it that politics is concerned with principles and careers. That every local government is run by men and women whose honorable intention it is to serve their fellow citizens. Tonight's file continues in the darkened bedroom of John Williams. Just stay where you are, mister. I have a gun here. I'm not moving. Well, see that you don't. And keep your hands up while I see what other weapons you're carrying. I ain't. I'll find that out myself. Okay. Satisfied? Turn around. Sit on the bed. Okay. Now, first of all, I want you to know one thing. Inasmuch as you came up here to kill me, I haven't any qualms at all about killing you. You understand? Yeah. You can walk out of here alive or be carried out dead. It's up to you. Up to me? How? I want you to go back and tell Arthur White you did your job. Huh? Tell him you killed me. Why? What's your angle? That's my business. Mister, I don't play any games where I don't know the score. You're in no position to make any demands. Can I have a couple of minutes to think it over? Sure. Thanks. Glenn. Hmm? Ready to take a trip? Where to, Jim? Lakeview Hills. Well, that's right near where Williams landed that plane, isn't it? That's right. What makes you think he's still up there? A couple of things I learned while I was out. What were they? Well, when I left here, I went over to Arthur White's apartment. Was he annoyed at being disturbed this late at night? No, he wasn't there. Well, who'd you talk to? To his houseboy. Mm -hmm. When I showed him my credentials, he told me that White and another man had gone to visit someone about an hour ago. Pretty late at night to be visiting, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. He also described the other man, and from the description, it's Ed Franklin. Ed Franklin. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought he was in jail for the murder of a policeman a few years ago. Well, it seems that Mr. Franklin has friends. He's been paroled. Jim, what do you have to do around here to be ineligible for parole? I'm sure, I don't know. Oh, the houseboy also told me that Arthur White and Franklin were going to visit this friend at Lakeview Hills. Then he is meeting Williams. Looks that way. Our job now is to get up there and find them together. If we can do that, he'll have a pretty tough time explaining his way out. Yeah, but Jim, Lakeview Hills is a pretty big community. They might be meeting any place up there. Oh, I just received a report on William's sister. She's living in Lakeview Hills. Well, then all we have to do is locate her house. Yeah, but it's not going to be that easy. 
She married a year ago, and the report didn't uncover her new name. However, let's go up there and see what we can find on the spot. Well, you had enough time to think? Yeah. What's your decision? I never double-crossed anybody in my life. I'm not going to start now. John, dear, I... Oh. It's all right, Betty. What happened? Mr. White's chauffeur came in here thinking I was in bed. But I was waiting for him. Oh. He seems to have a curious code of honor. I don't understand. I want him to go back and tell White I'm dead. And he refuses to do it. Some guys are double-crosses and some guys ain't. Now, look. Do you think Arthur White would be this loyal to you? He got me my parole. Uh, probably so you could do this job for him. White would double-cross his best friend. I know. I was his best friend. And he framed me. Are you kidding? White told me you ran away with $80,000 of the city's money. I didn't run away because of that 80000 One night out at a roadhouse, White threw a party. There were a lot of us there. I got pretty drunk and got into a fight with the man. This man fell down, hit his head on the floor, and a doctor who was there pronounced him dead. So you ran away because you had a murder rap going against you. Well, that's what I thought when I left. And that's what White wanted me to think. But the man I hit wasn't dead. The doctor was a phony. White wanted to get John out of the country. Why? Well, then he could take anything he wanted from the city treasury and make it look as if I had taken it and absconded. Huh? Why don't you go to the cops? Because he couldn't prove that the man he struck was still alive without the help of a girl named Peggy Dawson. Who's she? She knows the man I allegedly killed. She's coming here tonight to give me a written statement. Oh. Sounds like trouble for White. It is. He's going to jail. And unless you do as I asked, you're going with him. Now, what do you say? Mister, you just made a deal. No, you didn't. Huh? Drop that gun, John. Drop it. <laughs> Now, why don't we all go down to the living room and wait for Peggy Dawson? Elaine, I just phoned the office. They've been doing a further check on William's sister. Well? All they got is that she married a man from a place near here called Jamestown. Could they get his name? No, no, they couldn't. Well, when were they married? About a year ago, in Jamestown. Well, that means we'll have to go over there and search all those marriage licenses that have been issued in the last year. Well, the office called Jamestown. They won't open their license bureau until tomorrow morning. Can we wait that long? I'm afraid not. The meeting between White and Williams will undoubtedly be over by then. Mm. Then White goes back to town and he's done something again that we can't prove. Well, that means we've got to locate them tonight. That's right. Jim, Lakeview Hills is much too big to start a house-to-house canvas. Yeah, there's no question about that. Even with the help of the local police, we couldn't do it under a couple of days. Yeah, I know. I know, I... Hey, wait a minute. Let's go back to that telephone, Glenn. Well, this is just like old times, huh, John? All of us sitting together in front of the fire. Uh, I miss those good old days. You mean you'd like to frame me again, huh? Why, John, I I don't know what you're talking about. You'll find out soon enough. How's that? When that girl gets here. Oh, you mean Peggy. Yes. She has definite proof that you framed John. So I gathered from what I heard when I eavesdropped upstairs. That was just before Ed here decided to play on your team. Look, I wasn't going to double-cross you. I heard different. That was just a routine. What else could I do? He had a gun. We'll debate that later. Now let's get back to Peggy's story, shall we, John? You've already heard it. I'd like to fill in a few details, though, that you don't even know. They concern the man you killed. Well? I don't think he'll be much help to you. He is alive, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He's alive. But unfortunately for you, he has a past, a prison record. I had him paroled from prison. He's quite grateful for that. I think he'll show his gratitude by doing whatever I say. We'll still have the word of that girl. But she won't be talking. Yes, she will. From the grave, John? What do you mean? She's coming here tonight, isn't she? I'm going to give Ed here a chance to redeem himself. You mean kill her? (laughs) Well, bluntly, yes. John, you've got to do something. 
You've got to keep that girl from coming here. A little late, aren't you? Let her in, Ed. Okay. No, no, don't. Stand back, you... Huh? Let me have that gun, Mr. White. What? what? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh, oh. Well, I'm glad to give you the gun. Here. Uh, I'm certainly happy you men got here when you did. I, I stopped at this farmhouse to ask directions, and that man there pulled a gun on me. Luckily, Little I was... Why? Able... I think I know what happened here. That's why we brought warrants for the arrest of you, Williams, as well as Mr. White. But John is innocent. He can prove it. If he can, I'm sure he'll be released. Is it all right if I go? I'm Mr. White's chauffeur. Yes. Yes, you can go. You can go with the rest of us, Franklin. We've got a big car outside, big enough to take us all to headquarters. John Williams was cleared of all charges and the city made restitution. Arthur White was turned over to local authorities and sentenced to a long prison term on charges of bribery. Ed Franklin's parole was revoked and he was returned to prison. The last telephone call that Special Agent Jim Taylor made was to the editor of the local newspaper, the Jamestown Record. He gave that gentleman the facts and asked him to check the files of the newspaper in an effort to locate the marriage notice of Elizabeth Williams. Upon checking, the editor found that Miss Williams had married a man named Martin Leroy and that she was now a widow. With that information, Special Agents Taylor and Peters located the residence leased by Mrs. Leroy and apprehended Arthur White and Ed Franklin. Thus, your FBI once more was instrumental not only in apprehending a criminal but in helping to prove the innocence of an accused man. The files of your FBI are replete with cases of similarly innocent men being cleared, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation points with pride to those cases, for they are constant living proof of the lengths to which every special agent is trained to go to protect your personal liberty. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Sid, I've got just a few seconds to answer your question on the Equitable Education Fund. Uh, Mr. Keating, is there any special amount you have to sign up for when you start one of these funds? No, Sid. The amount is strictly up to you, whatever you feel you can afford. Your Equitable Society representative will work out a plan that's tailor-made for your income and the educational requirements for your family. So, why not plan to see him soon? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of two thieves that a dead man helped to convict. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Unknown Voice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unknown Voice on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States... and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Unknown Voice. There are many serious crimes that violate the 120 different statutes under the jurisdiction of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It is a matter of record and of performance that the members of your FBI work as hard to apprehend one type of criminal as another. But in addition to being law enforcement officers, special agents are human beings with the same set of emotions as any decent citizen. And so it is not surprising that the two most venal crimes kidnapping and extortion are investigated not only with a trained mind, but with the sympathetic heart. Most crimes have a suddenness to them. The criminal determines when he will commit them, he commits them, and they are over. Not so, though, with kidnapping and extortion. They are crimes of torture, for the victim of no other crime knows the terror, the constant nerve-shattering terror that comes with waiting for the kidnapper's next ransom note or the extortioner's next telephone call. Hours become eternities, and under the unrelenting pressure, one thing becomes certain. Something has to give. Tonight's file opens in a hotel room located in the downtown district of a large western city. A well-dressed gray-haired man sits reading the morning paper. Just a minute. Hello, Claude. Come in. Sorry I'm late. I left the house in plenty of time to get here all right by the time the bus Let's came along. Let's get down to business. Very well, Claude, glad to. Did you bring the money? No. Huh? I said no. Why not? I've changed my mind. Then why did you go to all the trouble of getting up this meeting? I wanted to tell you to your face that I'm not the kind of a man who can be blackmailed. Very nice attitude, Claude. Very nice. I know that you said in your left letter you sent me that that if I didn't pay, you'd kill me. That's right. But I'm a good judge of men, and you haven't got the courage to kill anybody. Maybe yes, maybe no. You also said you'd go to the papers and tell them what you know about me. Want me to? If you wish, yes. Don't believe you. Then carry out your threat. Go to them. See what happens. Claude, if you really made up your mind not to pay, you'd have gone to the police and had them waiting here for me. Look, I'm not going to pay you a nickel. Now you can get out of here. I'd rather hear you talk, Claude. I said get out. I never want to see you again. Mind if I smoke? Didn't you hear me? Don't get so excited. I've asked you to leave this room. I don't want to listen to any more of your rotten talk. Do you hear me? Why don't you call the police? If you force me to, I will. I'm not going to stand for another... (gasps) Claude. Claude. A short time later, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor and Agent Paul Morrison are sitting in a small office listening to a record. Mind if I smoke? Didn't you hear me? Don't get so excited. I've asked you to leave this room. I don't want to listen to any more of your rotten talk. Do you hear me? Why don't you call the police? If you force me to, I will. I'm not going to stand for another... What? What? That's it, Paul. That's the record we found on the dictaphone that Claude Adams planted in the hotel room. You can see now why he had a heart attack. You certainly can. Unfortunately, he's the only one who could have given us an ident on the extortioner. Well, somebody else must have seen him at the hotel. Oh, I've spoken to everybody who was on the front desk this morning, to every bellboy, maid, and elevator operator. They couldn't give me a thing. 
If Adams had only mentioned the extortioner's name once during the conversation, we'd have something to work on. Uh, I know. Jim, why would a man who owns a mansion like the one Adams lived in hire a hotel room? When I interviewed his wife, I asked her about that. What did she say? She said that her husband insisted that he had some business he wanted to transact in absolute privacy. I see. Hey, Paul, my watch right? What? Is it really five after twelve? Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, what? Mrs. Adams said she was coming up here at twelve o'clock. Come on, let's get back to my desk, huh? Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. You know, apparently, Paul, whoever came up to the hotel room knew Adams pretty well. Certainly sounded that way. And yet we've let every one of Adams' friends and key employees listen to that record. None of them can identify that voice. Uh, has Mrs. Adams heard it yet? Yes, I played it for her at her home early this morning. She didn't know who the man was either. Must have been pretty tough for her to listen to that record. Yeah, yeah, it was. That's why she wanted a couple hours rest before she came up here. Yeah, I see. Hey, there she is. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Oh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Adams. Oh, uh, Mrs. Adams, this is Agent Morrison. How Mr. Major, Mr. Adams. I'm afraid we still have no word for you on who the extortioner was, Mrs. Adams. Is there anything I can do to help you? Well, yes. You see, we think it's very possible that whoever was trying to blackmail your husband might turn to you now. So there is one way you could help us. How? If either of these people should contact you, please call us immediately. Oh, I will. I will. Oh, that's fine. Now, Mrs. Adams, I I think you'd best go back home and get some more rest. If you like, I'll walk you to your car. Yeah. Well, where have you been all day? Uh, walking around. I thought you went to see Mr. Adams this morning to get that money. I did. Well? Uh, will you cover those cages, Annie? Those birds of yours make me very nervous. First, let me see the money. I didn't get any. Why not? He keeled over and died while we were talking. What? Adams just up and died. What caused it? Heart attack, I suppose. That's great. I warned him not to get excited, but he, he just wouldn't listen to me. You see, Annie, he had a terrible... Oh, shut no up! No control of him. I said shut up! Huh? You've done it again, haven't you? What? You've plumbered another one. Now, look, Annie, could I help it if the man dies a natural death? Yes. Are you serious? You should have collected from him weeks ago. Annie, I did it the best way I could. And that's what's wrong with it. You got no complaint? No complaint? Living in this broken-down flat... Always wearing last year's clothes. Now, don't start that again. This was going to be the big one. Well, it was. But like all the others, it never happened. Yeah, things aren't too bad, Annie. I, I can always go back to the plant and get my job back. That doesn't get us out of here. Oh, I, I know. Then I'm going to think of something that will. Jim, I hope you had better luck than I did. Nothing at the bank, huh? No, I went over every cancel check and cash withdrawal, and Adam's secretary explained every item. Well, I guess that means that Adams hadn't paid anything before. Not unless it was a long time ago. We went over his business and personal checks for the past six years. Well, I found out something about the extortioner. Oh? Uh-huh. I don't know how much it'll help us, but he comes from New England. How do you know that? While you were out, I listened to the record again. I, I thought I noticed something about the man's accent. I see. So I called Joe Harrison in to listen to it. He used to be a professor of speech at State University before he became a special agent. Huh, I didn't know that. I didn't either, but it was in the vocation and avocation file. Well, how did Joe know the man came from New England? Well, he told me, but, well, frankly, it was a little too complicated for me to remember. I see. It has to do with things like the primary accents being placed on the first syllable in certain words, the New England A being flatter and having a nasal quality. Okay, I'll, I'll take his word for it. Did he tell you anything else about the man? Yes, he said it uh, sounded to him as if the blackmailer was in his late 50s, early 60s. Making him approximately the same age as Mr. Adams. That's right. Uh, It's beginning to look like another one of those heavy cases. Yeah, I'll be surprised if it isn't. Where do we go from here, Jim? I think the only thing to do now is trace Adams' background. That's an angle. I'd like to find out if Adams was ever in New England, and if he was, what he did while he was there. Well, maybe somebody down at his office might know. That's right, they might. Paul, why don't you check down there? I'll go over and see Mrs. Adams. Okay. We'll meet back here and start building the biography. Annie! What is it? About the canaries. Well? Is there any way they can be told that they don't have to sing all the time? I like to hear them sing. Oh. 
Oh, well, I'm going over to the plant this morning and see about my job. You may not have to. Why not? We might still get that money from Adams. How can we do that? I wrote Mrs. Adams a letter last night. Annie, he's dead. She isn't. I don't get it. Well, if it was going to be worth $10,000 to him to keep his name out of the papers, I figured it ought to be worth that much to her. Keep the dead man's name pure. Oh. I'll find out right now whether she's going to pay or not. What did you say in the letter? About the same thing you had me write in that first letter. I told her what we knew about her husband. How you and he had... Hello? Hello, Mrs. Adams. This is the lady who wrote you the letter. Oh. Mrs. Adams? Yes? Oh, I thought you hung up. No. No, I'm still here. Have you made up your mind yet? You mustn't go to the newspapers. That's easy to arrange. I have the money for you. Good. Wrap it in a sheet of newspaper. Yes. And leave it at the foot of the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the park. When? In an hour. All right. And I'm warning you, no tricks. I, I understand. I'm coming for the money alone. If I don't return home within an hour, my husband will see to it that Claude Adams' name is on every front page in the city. Paul, I think I found the reason for the extortion. What was it, Jim? It took a lot of checking, but I found that in 1916, Claude Adams was arrested in Denver. What for? Grand larceny. He was convicted and sent to prison. Did Mrs. Adams tell you that? No. No, but I got to thinking, and I, I, I kind of figured that maybe he was eligible for the first World War draft, so I played the hunch. Actually, I, I was forced to play it. I didn't have any other lead to work on. <laughs> Pretty good hunch. <laughs> yeah, they look good when they work out, don't they? <laughs> Uh, how long was Adams in jail? Until the spring of 1923. Well, according to what I found out at his office, he came here in 23. That's right. I guess he decided he'd had enough of prison, and when he got here, he went it straight. Oh, too bad he couldn't have lived to enjoy his fortune. Yeah, he sure is. You know, I wonder if he had a... No, oh, pardon me, Paul. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Mrs. Adams. Did you call me? Yes, yes, I did, Mrs. Adams. Have you found out who that man is? No, not yet, Mrs. Adams, but I think I may have found out why your husband was being blackmailed. But I don't understand it, Mr. Taylor. My husband conducted his business in a perfectly legitimate manner, and our home life was above reproach. Well, I think this matter goes back quite a number of years. But, Mr. Taylor, Claude and I were married for 21 years, and I know that there was nothing he had to hide. Did um, Mr. Adams ever tell you about any trouble he had in Denver? Denver? Mm-hmm. Uh, Claude was never in Denver in his life. Oh, I'm afraid he was, Mrs. Adams. You, you see, in checking back to find a motive for the blackmailing, we learned that Mr. Adams had been in jail in Colorado. Oh. We got that information from the official record. You don't have to let anyone else know about it, do you? No. No, of course not. This entire matter is confidential. I, I know you've gone to a lot of trouble, Mr. Taylor, but I wish you'd forget about the whole affair. Well, I'm afraid that's going to be a little difficult now, Mrs. Adams. You... Pardon me, Mrs. Adams. Yes, Paul. Paul, will you yes. take it, please? Oh, sure, Jim. As I was saying, Mrs. Adams, I think it would be a little difficult to withdraw from the case at this time. But the case is finished. I see. After all, my husband is dead. Well, it's not finished as far as we're concerned. But they can't blackmail him now. Please, please do me that favor, Mr. Taylor. Well, I'll have to talk to my superiors before I can promise you anything. All right. After I've spoken to them, why, then I'll get in touch with you. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Taylor. Goodbye, Mrs. Adams. Huh. That's kind of funny. What's that, sir? She seems to resent our having learned that her husband was once in prison. She wants us to drop the case. Well, I think that phone call I took explains why. What do you mean, Paul? That call was from the bank. Huh? I think that guess you made before about the blackmailers making her their new target was right. Oh, why? According to the bank, she came in less than an hour ago and withdrew $10,000 in cash. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. From scores of ivy covered towers, the bells of our colleges have summoned young America back to the lecture halls and libraries. Now, for a moment, let's forget the current crop of college students and consider the boys and girls who will be members of the class of 1959 or 65 or 69. Jim, 
How about that boy of yours? What class will he be in? Well, the class of 66 or 67, I guess, Mr. Keating. Boy, that'll be a great day for me when he enters my old college. If that's the way you feel, Jim, why not make sure that your son really does get the chance to go to your college? Make sure by starting an equitable education fund right now. An equitable education fund? Yes. Well, what's that? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, it, it makes sense to me. I suppose the man to see is an equitable society representative. Right, Jim. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's the way to make sure that... When the college bells are ringing for the class of 1959 or 65, your boy or girl will be there to answer the call. Now back to the FBI file, The Unknown Voice. The Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in bringing this series of crime prevention programs to you for a number of reasons. The long-range purpose of your FBI is to tell you what part you can play in the never-ending war against crime. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI offers an illustration of a service that could have been rendered in that war. If Mr. Adams had done what it was his duty to do, his duty not only to himself but to his fellow citizens, he probably would have saved his own life. And he certainly would have prevented the blackmailing of his wife after his death. What neither Mr. nor Mrs. Adams realized, and it is a common mistake among blackmail victims, is that no blackmailer is ever satisfied. The more he gets, the more he demands as his next payment. In a situation like the one you have witnessed tonight, indeed in any situation in which you know a criminal to be involved, your duty is the same as Mr. Adams's was. It is a simple one. Pick up your telephone and call your local police. Tonight's file continues in the shabby apartment of Tom and Annie Williams. Tom. Yes, dear. What time is it? Almost 11 o'clock. Well, I better get going. For the money? Yes. Uh, Annie, don't you think that's a job I should do? No. Why not? I want to make sure we collect. Well, that's not fair. That's how it's going to be. Uh. Think she said time to get the money? Well, if she hasn't, I'll wait on one of the benches near the statue. I can wait a couple of minutes for ten thousand. I just hope she isn't leading you into a trap. She wouldn't dare. She'll be afraid not to pay. Hand me my purse, will you? Yeah, sure. Now you wait right here, Tom. Yeah, I will. Then. Oh, and while I'm gone, don't forget to feed the canaries. <laughs> Paul, you were right. Oh, did you see Mrs. Adams? Yes, she finally admitted the blackmailers had contacted her. The instructions you gave her right here in this office couldn't have been any more specific. I know, I know. That's what makes me so annoyed. Well, she had them in, right in the palm of her hand. We could have arrested them and closed this file. It's a little too late for that now, Paul. They've already gotten their money. Frankly, I, I can't feel any too sorry for her. No, I can't either. She certainly doesn't deserve to have us go on working and trying to recover her money. What do you have to do around here to have people cooperate with you? Sure, I don't know. Apparently, she doesn't realize that she's only made a down payment. I told her they'll be back next week for more money. She took a lot of convincing, but she finally agreed that we were right and that she would cooperate with us. Well, she'll have to prove it before I believe her. I think she will. She gave me this letter. I'm sending it to the lab along with the letter that Mr. Adams got. They look to me as if they're written by the same person, I think. Yes, they do. Even if they turn out to have been written by the same woman, we still don't know very much. We know that it's a man and a woman, maybe a man and wife. Mm -hmm. That the man comes from New England. That's not much to show for all our work. Well, what do we do next, Jim? Wait for the lab to send back a report. But in the meantime, let's keep checking on Adams' back. Tom? Tom, 
I got it. Good work, Annie. Ten thousand dollars. Did you open the package? Yeah, it's real. Wonderful. Why did you cover those canary cages? Huh? Oh, the poor little fellas, they were bothered by the light. Uncover them. But they were... You heard me! Uncover my canaries! Okay. Oh, you poor darlings. Tom, don't ever do that again. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Can I, can I see the money? Yeah. There. There you are. Beautiful. I never thought we'd see this. You wouldn't have if I hadn't gotten that idea. Annie, I'm not taking any credit away from you. Oh, I stopped by on the way home and picked up these pamphlets. What are they? Travel pamphlets. We're taking a trip. Kind of sudden, isn't it? That's right. You could have at least consulted me. Don't you want to take a trip? You can stay home here, you know, if you like. Might be more fun for me being alone on a boat. Uh, no, Annie, you'd know I'd love to go. And in fact, I'd go any place just to get rid of these canaries. Oh, Paul, I found another piece of the puzzle while you were out. Oh, where does this one fit, Jim? Well, the first thing that came in was the report from the lab. There were no latent fingerprints on the letter. But the lab said both letters were definitely written by the same woman. Well, that's kind of a small piece. Yeah, it merely confirms what we thought. But the big piece came when I called the prison in Colorado where Adams had done his time. What'd you call them for, Jim? Well, come on. Let's walk down to the teletype room. Right. I'll tell you the rest on the way. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to find out how many men who were in jail with Adams came from New England. Say, I never thought of that. A blackmailer could have easily been in jail with him. Yeah. Well, the warden checked back through the records and found there were seven prisoners from New England serving time, coincidentally, with Adams. I wired Washington and gave them all seven names. Well, let's hope we get a break with this angle. Yeah. Well, Charlie. Yes, sir. Has anything come in for me from Washington? Yes, sir. It just came in. Oh, I just want to bring it over to your desk. Here it is. Thanks, Charlie. Well, this helps a little, Paul. What does it say? Two of the seven are back in jail. Two are dead, and the report on the other three is whereabouts unknown. Let's get to work and try to find out where those three men are. <laughs> Paul, if it's not one of these three suspects, I don't know where we'll turn. No, nope. I doubt the blackmailers would be stupid enough to get in touch with Mrs. Adams again. That'd be a little too convenient for us. Better type for you, Mr. Taylor. Oh, thanks, Charlie. It's from Cleveland, Paul. One of the suspects, George Jackson, owns a grocery there. That clears him. One down and two to go. <laughs> Special Agent Taylor speaking. This is Miss Hollinger at the switchboard, Mr. Taylor. I have a message for you. Yes, Miss Hollinger. What is it? The Detroit office called while you were busy on the phone and left this message for you. Harvey Fulton works for a plumbing supply house there. He has not been out of the city for a year. Thank you, Miss Hollinger. Well, Paul, that takes care of suspect number two. Two down and one to go. <laughs> Paul, grab your hat. Why, Jim, where are we going? I just spoke to the warden in Denver again. He told me that Tom Williams, who was the seventh man from New England, worked in the engraving shop in prison and was an engraver by trade. Well, how does that help us? You know that big engraving plant out on 27th Street? Yeah. I just spoke to them. They said that a Tom Williams worked there. Now, come on, let's go. Hey, big crowd out today. Well, sure. A lot of people are going to get on that boat. I hope the ocean don't get too rough. Oh, don't worry about that. Oh, I'm not worrying about it. I'm just hoping. We got pills you can take if you feel sick. Oh, that's good. I just hope the canaries are happy with Mrs. Angelo. You take good care of them now. Did you call up and tell them to stop delivering the papers? I told you twice I called up. I also called up about the milk. Well, come on. We might as well go up onto the boat. What about our bags? The man said he'd put them in our rooms, didn't he? Yeah, oh, yeah, that, that's right. Tip the porter out of the pocket money I gave you. Yes, sir. Let me know when you run short, and I'll give you some more. Yes, sir. Oh, get this man here wants our tickets. Hold this package while I look at my purse. Yes, Annie. I'm afraid you two won't be making this trip. Huh? Why not, mister? I paid for these tickets. Yes, but unfortunately for you, you paid for them with money you got from Mrs. Adams. She had it marked? That's right. Shut up, Tom. Who are you, mister? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got a warrant here for the arrest of you and your husband. Where are you taking us? Downtown. And don't look so badly about missing this trip. Why not? You'll both be taking another trip pretty soon, with the government paying the fare for two one-way tickets. So 
Tom and Annie Williams were tried and convicted for a violation of the federal extortion statute. Each was sentenced to a 10-year term. Tom Williams is a fairly common name, but the two special agents of your FBI knew that the Tom Williams who had been in prison in Denver and the Tom Williams who had worked at the engraving plant were one and the same man. His employment record at the plant showed that he had quit the week before, but it also showed that his birthplace and date of birth checked exactly with the information in the Denver prison records. When the special agents found that Mr. and Mrs. Williams had fled from their apartment, they checked all transportation agencies. One of them revealed that a Mr. and Mrs. Williams had purchased space on a steamship for Alaska and had paid for it in cash. Waiting for them to arrive at the pier was a simple matter. But then, as you have seen, that is the only thing about tonight's case from the files of your FBI that was simple. Thus, your FBI not only ended the careers of two blackmailers, but also ensured the fact that the knowledge that he was an ex-convict would remain buried with the man we have called... Claude Adams. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now here's the proud father of a two-weeks-old boy. He has a question about the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, that kid's as bright as a dollar. He's going to be head of his class in 1969. But how long should I wait before I start an equitable education fund for him? Don't wait a day, Jim. The earlier you start an equitable education fund in your child's life, the lower the cost per year will be. So why not plan to see your equitable society representative soon? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case exposing the intricate manipulations of a long-sought fugitive. Its subject, Crime on the High Seas. Its title, The Phantom Mine. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The director was Sid Goodman. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Phantom Mine on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Phantom Mine.
many of us know the type of person who would be willing to pay more for an article in the black market than he would be willing to pay for the same article if he were able to buy it legitimately across the counter. That type of person is always looking for an angle, for a connection through whom he may be able for a little while longer to put off the ignominy of going to work. There is nothing such a person detests more than the idea and the practice of a day's wage for a day's work. Those people are known as operators, and even when they continue for years to be small operators, they never lose hope that one day, through some miracle, they will become Mr. Big Shot. In their eyes, a big shot is anyone who does not have to work for a living, but who makes his money through lying, cheating, or killing. There are those who have pictured the swindler as a criminal in kid gloves, who wanted only money, and who abhorred the type of criminal operation in which lives are lost. Such a picture is a sentimental caricature, because the truth is that to the criminal, whatever his type of crime may be, no one's life is important except his own. Tonight's file opens aboard an old freighter which is tied up to a dock along the waterfront of a large eastern city. It is early afternoon. A bright sun is shining, but below decks on this rusting tramp, dampness and gloom prevail. Sheltered by this atmosphere, a man moves silently, stealthily along a grimy corridor. Then... Looking furtively about, he enters the engine room and moves swiftly to one of the engines. He stands examining it intently, unmindful of the quiet approach of footsteps. What are you doing? Huh? I asked you what you were doing. Well, I, I, I was... Uh, Who are uh, you? One of the wipers. I'm the engineer of the ship. i never seen you. I just signed on, sir. What's your name? Louis Jackson, sir. What were you trying to do to that engine? Oh, nothing, sir. Look, may I go now, sir? What's I... that in your hand? Uh, just a brush, sir. Let me see it. What for? I smell kerosene. I think it comes from that brush. Now, let me see it. No. Then there is kerosene on it. So what if there is? Come on. I'm taking you to the captain. Okay. Good afternoon, Captain. Good afternoon, Mr. Metcalf. Captain, I hate to trouble you, but I've got to report this man. Uh, Won't you just signed on? Yes, sir. Now, what's your report, Mr. Metcalf? Well, I was down in the engine room a while ago. This man came sneaking in. He didn't see me. He went over to one of the engines. Started a fool with it when I called out to him. Yes? He refused to tell me why he was there. Then I discovered he had a brush in his hand. The brush was soaked with kerosene. I see. I haven't looked at my engines yet, Captain. I don't know whether they're damaged or not. Well, let me know as soon as you inspect them. Yes, sir. Now, do you wish to press charges against him? That's up to you, sir. Well, I'll question him. You go examine the engines. Leave the man here with me. Yes, sir. And thanks for being that alert, Mr. Metcalf. You're welcome, sir. Well? Well, what? That was pretty stupid, don't you think? Letting him nail me, you mean? Yes. From now on, Louis, keep away from that engine room till we get to sea. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of Agent Tom Allen. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Jim. I thought you were in court today testifying in that Dexter case. There wasn't any need for me to testify. Dexter changed his plea to guilty. Oh, glad that file's closed. Yeah, so am I. But it looks as if we've got one to work on now that's going to be just as tough. You? That's right. Just came in as I got back from court. The SAC assigned it to us. Well, what's the story? It seems a man named Rafael Fernando went to the United States Consul in Barcelona, Spain. He confessed that he'd been an accomplice in a fraudulent bankruptcy. In Barcelona? No, in Chicago. Well, the Consul took Fernando's story and sent it back to the State Department in Washington. They, in turn, sent it over to the Bureau. Well, how does it get to this office? Well, it was sent to the Chicago field office first, and they conducted an investigation on it. Well, how long ago did this bankruptcy take place? Fourteen months ago. In Chicago? That's right. 
Uh, it's probably given everybody connected with it a pretty good chance to scatter. That's what the Chicago investigation showed. You see, the bankruptcy originally took place when Fernando, a partner in the firm, allegedly absconded with $250,000 and then fled to Spain. Have you read the Fernando confession? Yes, it's here in the file. I just finished reading it. Does Fernando explain why he waited 14 months before he finally decided to confess? Yes, his partner in bankruptcy was a man named William Gilbert. Fernando says that all he ever got out of it was transportation back to his home in Barcelona. I see. He says that Gilbert promised to send him $50,000, but that he never sent him anything at all. So this man Gilbert took all the money while Fernando took the blame. That's it. That still doesn't explain how we happen to wind up with the case in this office. Oh, the uh, Chicago office started to search for Gilbert. They learned that he'd changed his name and was headed for here. They didn't find out whether he intended to set himself up in business here, did they, Jim? No. According to everything they could find out, he was headed here to buy a liberty ship. Well. Chicago also said that Gilbert had not only changed his name, but that he was very adept at changing his appearance. Mm. This makes the Dexter case look like high school stuff. It's not going to be easy, I'll give you that. Well, let's go to work and see what we can find. Captain. Oh, hello, Mr. Grant. How does everything look? Yeah, your ship is in tip-top shape, Mr. Grant. You ready to sail tomorrow night? Yes, sir. When do you expect to do the job? Oh, when we're a few miles offshore. You've made all preparations. Uh, Louis put a charge of powder under one of the floorboards in the engine room. It'll blow a hole in the side of this ship big enough to walk through. Splendid. And just to make sure, after we sail, I'll have him paint the floor down there with kerosene. And you've got your story straight? Sure, After she sinks, I say we ran into a floating mine. That'll stand up. And take every precaution, Captain. Those insurance companies investigate every angle in a case like this. What do you collect from them, Mr. Grant? One hundred and seventy-five thousand. And the boat stood you a hundred and twenty thousand? That's right. (laughs) Sounds like we're going to make a good night's pay. Tom, you want to walk with me down to the teletype room? Are you expecting something, Jim? Mm-hmm. Come on. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. The SAC spoke to the Chicago office a little while ago. They said they'd have something for us on the Gilbert bankruptcy. They say what it was? No, no, they didn't. They did say they had located Gilbert's ex-girlfriend, though. She was coming into the office there to answer some questions for them. I hope she can give us more of a lead than we've been able to get so far. Mm-hmm. I checked every hotel in town today. Nobody answering the description Chicago gave us on Gilbert has checked in recently. Oh, he's been in town. I found out that much. How? Oh. Well, you know that list of offices I got from the U.S. Maritime Commission? Oh, you mean that list that came in yesterday afternoon? That's the one. Well, I called the men who have been conducting the sales. I found that they remembered a man of that description bidding on Liberty ships here six weeks ago. Well, did he buy one? No, no, he didn't. That's too bad. That would have been an easy way to trace him. Uh-huh. Then, three days after he left here, he tried to buy one in Boston, but he didn't have enough money to get one there either. They've, uh, they've got those sales someplace about every week, haven't they, Jim? Uh, just about. Go ahead. Well, I checked every one of them. He attended every sale there was up to about two weeks ago. Did he buy a ship at that one? No. Now, all of a sudden, he stopped showing up. I wonder why. Yeah, maybe he found a ship someplace, huh? Why do you suppose he's so anxious to get a ship? I don't know, Chuck. Nothing in his background that would indicate he was interested in smuggling. No. Look, there's your message now, Chuck. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tom, this might be the break we're waiting for. What is it? Gilbert's ex-girl says that he's living here now, under the name of Harry Grant. Captain? Hello, Mr. Metcalf. You know I shouldn't bother you this late, Captain, but this could wait. Yes, what is it? Well, you remember the episode with the wiper yesterday? Yes. I have something further to report. On him? Yes. I just couldn't help this, Captain. I've harbored a suspicion against him ever since I caught him in the engine room. So? I kept thinking about it all day today. And a couple of minutes ago, I went to his locker. You did what? I went to his locker and I opened it. Well? I found some black powder and some fuses. Explosives? That's right, Captain. 
What in the world in would... In my opinion, Captain, it can indicate only one thing. He aims to sabotage the ship. Yes. It certainly appears that way, doesn't it? Have you any idea where the man is now? No, well, sir, I haven't. But we can certainly... Captain, everything... Oh. Oh, excuse me, sir. Well, Captain... Will you question him, or shall I? Look, I've got to see you alone, sir. We have something important to discuss with you, Jackson. I'll handle him, Mr. Metcalf. You go back to your quarters. But you need the evidence against him, Captain. I took it from his locker. I have it right here. Captain, you better get rid of this guy. Oh, see, here. You better talk respectfully. Please go, Mr. Metcalf. But I can't leave without... I heard what he said. Get out. Hey... What is this? Metcalf, I've asked you to go to your quarters. Captain, are you taking his side? Do as I say. Are you in favor of his... Louis, why did you do that? Because that charge is going off any second. And he's been through your locker. He found some powder and fuses. Now he'll know I'm mixed up in this, too. That can mean we lose... There it is. What happens now? When the report comes in, I'll alert all members of the crew to stand by to abandon ship. What happens with Metcalf? We well, leave him here. He uh, liked the ship so much, we'll let him go down with it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Already, the bells of our colleges have called nearly two and a half million eager young Americans back to their books and classrooms to be given one of the greatest advantages of all, a college education. There's a boy in our block who'd give anything to answer that bell. Brightest kid you ever met. All his life he's planned on college, then law school. But it's all washed up now. His dad's last illness wiped out the family savings. Now that boy's had to go to work to help support his two younger brothers. It's a shame his father never heard of an equitable education fund. What's that? An equitable education fund is a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Now, here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's exactly the plan I've been looking for, Mr. Keating. I think I'll see my Equitable Society representative first thing tomorrow. That's the thing to do. See an Equitable Society representative as soon as possible. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, from the moment you set up an Equitable Education Fund, you make sure that when the college bells ring for your boy or girl, they will be ready to answer the call. Now back to the FBI file, The Phantom Mine. The crime being committed in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is a serious one, but it is only one of the more than 5,000 major crimes committed every day in the United States. Your FBI cooperates in bringing this series of official radio programs to you because it wants to acquaint you with the ways of the criminal so that you, as an individual, will be better able to cope with every particular type of lawbreaker. Your FBI does this because it has a responsibility to you, a responsibility which involves fighting America's army of criminals to the best of its ability. But you, the individual citizen, also have a responsibility. It is up to you, if you wish to see the crime wave conquered, to see to it that you have a strong local police force and that that local police force is adequately paid. Money saved by cutting police protection or by not allowing local policemen to earn a living wage is not in the long run money saved. For where protection is inadequate, crime increases. In one major city in the United States, a city of well over a million population, A survey determined that more than 50% of the local police were so poorly paid that they were in constant debt. A companion survey showed that crime this year in that city 
has risen more than 50%. Your local policeman's life is at stake when he puts on his uniform. It is your duty to see to it that while he risks that life, he is paid a living wage. Tonight's file continues in a waterfront house that is occupied by Mr. Grant, owner of the scuttled ship. He is just greeting a visitor. Welcome home, Captain. It's good to see you. Well, have you got a drink? I need one. Sure. Here. Now, I'll take it straight, thanks. Very well. And I'll join you. Let's drink to the SS Marion Green. The best ship I ever skipped. And the best one I ever owned. <laughs> <laughs> well, where's Louis? Didn't he come with you? He'll be here. He was in the other boat. They're probably still asking them the same questions they asked me. Who asked you any questions? The Coast Guard. They picked us up. After the ship went down? Sure. We rode for about an hour before they sighted us. What kind of questions did they ask you? Where was I at the time of the explosion, whether I saw anything, stuff like that. Anybody in the crew suspicious that it wasn't an accident? Yes. Metcalf, chief engineer. What did he find out? That Louis had explosives. How did you deal with him? Louis knocked him out. We left him in the cabin after the ship went under. Oh. oh. Hello? Hello, Mr. Grant. Oh, uh, that's right. Well, this is Louis, Mr. Grant. Did the captain come in yet? Yes, he just got here a couple of minutes ago. Where are you? I'm still downtown. The Coast Guard just let us go. Were they suspicious? No, but they will be. What? What do you mean? Did the captain tell you about the engineer, Metcalf? Yes. Well, he's still alive. I thought he went down with the ship. So did I, but when we were rowing away, we... We heard somebody yelling for help. It was Metcalf, so we picked him up. Well, what did you do that for? Well, what could I do? There was 14 other guys in the boat. What did Metcalf say when he saw you? Didn't have a chance to say anything. As soon as we pulled him into the boat, he passed out. Where is he now? At emergency hospital. Hmm. Listen to me, Louie, and get this straight. Yes, Mr. Grant, what is it? Get into that hospital and get to Metcalf. <laughs> This is a tough one. I thought you had the right answer when you got that list of new registrations on all boats. If Grant bought a boat in the last two months, it must be one of the boats on this list. I agree with you there, Jim, but we've checked almost every one of those names. All but three. And they're all owned by corporations. Now, this first one, the SS Dorothy Drew, was owned by a corporation in Santa Monica, California. Now, the Los Angeles office is checking on that one for us. With a two-hour difference in time, we might not get an answer until tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, but there's nothing we can do about that, son. The second ship... The SS Marion Green is owned by the Black and White Corporation. I can't check on them until tomorrow morning either. Oh, I did get some details on the SS Marion Green, though. What were they? Well, she's a 4,000-ton freighter, equipped as a lumber carrier. She can carry about two and a half million feet of lumber. Did you find out what the Black and White Corporation paid for her? Yes, they paid 105,000. The last owner said that the Black and White Corporation would have to spend about $15,000 in repairs to make her seaworthy again. It's a pretty good buy. There aren't many 4,000 tonners around you can pick up for 120,000. I know. Now, the ABC Handling Corporation owns the third ship. That's the SS Edith Summers. There doesn't seem to be any way of finding out anything about them until tomorrow either. Well, maybe we ought to call it a night, Jim, and get a fresh start in the morning. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I don't suppose there's much else to do. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hey, hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Dr. Elliot over at the emergency hospital. Yes, Doctor. Anything I can do for you? Well, I called police headquarters to report this, and they told me to call the FBI. I've just treated a man named Joe Medcalf for shock. He came to for a little while and explained that he was in a shipwreck, but that the wreck was no accident. Now, let me get the facts on this straight, Dr. Elliott. This uh, Mr. Metcalf claims that there was a deliberate scuttling of the ship that he was on. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Did he tell you the name of the ship? Why, yes, he did. It was the SS Marion Green. Thank you for calling, Dr. Elliott. I'll be right over to talk to Mr. Metcalf. What time is it, Captain? A little after four. Louis called over an hour ago. Why haven't we heard from him? I don't know. I can't wait around much more. I've got things to do, Mr. Grant. Things to take care of. Now, I suppose you pay me off and I'll be getting along. Pay you? For what? The job I did. Captain, I'd like to point out to you that there's a man named Metcalf who, by your own admission, may jam up this whole deal. So? The deal's jammed up. I don't collect from the insurance companies. And if I don't collect, Captain, neither do you. Now, just a minute. 
I made a deal with you to sink a ship. Well, right now, that ship's at the bottom of the ocean. That was only part of the deal. The most important phase of it was making it appear to be an accident. That you didn't deliver. Look, can I help it if Louis messed things up? It was your responsibility. You hired him, Mr. Grant. Captain, that has nothing to do with... Who is it? Me, Louis. Oh. Hello, Mr. Grant. Hello, Captain. Uh, Where do you want me to put your chief engineer? What's the matter, Jim? You look beat. I'm getting a little tired of these wild goose chases. What happened this time? Well, I got over to the hospital. My doctor took me up to talk to Metcalf. Well, don't tell me he changed his story. Worse than that, Tom, he was gone. He was... Well, how could that happen? A friend came in and took him out. He told the nurse he was a shipmate of Metcalf's. Did the doctor tell you what Metcalf said while he was conscious? Yes. He said he was the engineer aboard the SS Marion Green. You know, it's probably the boat that Grant bought. Did Metcalf's story explain why he bought it? Yes, from what Metcalf told the doctor, the SS Marion Green was purposely scuttled. And I think we'll find that that ship was very heavily insured. Metcalf's the only one, then, who could prevent Grant from collecting on that insurance. That's it. So the shipmate who came to the hospital and got Metcalf out must be one of Grant's men. I would think so. You know, I hate to think of the treatment they'll give him. We've checked every possible record, Jim. Every boarding house, every hotel, every rental listed at the real estate board. There isn't a single Harry Grant on any of those lists. Oh, Metcalf gave this waterproof pouch to Dr. Elliott before he passed out again. Oh. Said there were some papers in it that he got out of a drawer in the captain's cabin just before he jumped off the ship. For Metcalf's sake, I hope there's something in here that'll tell us where Grant is. Hey, you take half and I'll take half. I'll take these. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem to be anything here, Jim, except some paid Wait bills. Wait a minute. I think I've got something, Tom. Listen yeah. to this. It's a yeah. note to the captain saying I'll come aboard about 10 o'clock to discuss final plans with you. And it's signed with the initials H.G. Standing for Harry Grant. I should think so. There's no return address on the envelope. It's very common stationary, too, Jim. There wouldn't be any chance of tracing the purchaser of this stuff. No. No, That's right. I think we might find out where Mr. Grant sent this from, though. Let's get a classified telephone directory. I think he's coming, too. Oh. You better stop hitting him, Louie. Oh. Why, you, you afraid I'll hurt him? No, we want to talk to him. The Metcalf. Metcalf, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, well, good. Captain. Good, and answer a few questions. Do you remember being at the hospital? Uh-huh. Did you talk to anybody at the hospital? Uh-huh. What did you say to him? I told him all about you and the wiper. And blowing up the ship. Oh, uh. How do we handle this, Mr. Grant? There's a way. Metcalf is the only one who actually saw Louis in the engine room, isn't he? That's right. Well, what's that got to do with it? Then he's the only one that can prove anything. You forget about the doctor at the hospital. You blab as sure as you're born. And what do you think my lawyer will say to him on the stand? I don't know. He'll say, Doctor, isn't it possible that a man of Mr. Metcalf's age might get hysterical and delirious after an accident like that? The doctor will have to say yes, and that will be all there is to it. I see. That means that if Metcalf is dead and can't be found, the insurance company has to pay. Well, I don't carry a gun. Louis does, don't you, Louis? Well, I lost mine when the ship went down. You'll find one in that top drawer. Get it and take care of him. Okay. Is it loaded? Try it and find out. You're not trying anything. What? What is this? Call it. Special agents of the FBI. Well, Metcalf's still alive, Jim. Good, Tom. What are you two doing here? We came here to serve warrants for arrest on the three of you. Uh, what are the charges? Conspiracy to defraud. See here, that's a serious charge to make without any proof. I think we've got enough proof on that charge. And when we get back to headquarters, we'll add another charge against all of you. Attempted murder. Harry Grant, Captain Spencer, and Louis Jackson were all tried in a federal court and convicted on both charges. They are now serving long terms in the federal penitentiary. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was solved because Special Agent Jim Taylor noticed that there was no stamp on the envelope containing the note found among the captain's papers. He therefore reasoned that it had been delivered by some messenger. A check of the messenger services listed in the classified telephone directory revealed that one of those services had been summoned by Mr. Grant 
to deliver the note to Captain Spencer aboard the SS Marion Green. A further check of the delivery slip showed that the note had been sent from number 415 Ocean Avenue, and it was at that address that Special Agents Taylor and Allen located the three criminals. What was even more important than the capture of the criminal triumvirate was the fact that your FBI was able to save the life of an innocent person. And thus, once more, your FBI, by the speed of its investigative procedure, succeeded in performing its double function of protecting not only your property, but your lives. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Joe, I understand there's one thing you'd like to clear up about an equitable education fund. Yes, Mr. Keating. Are these funds flexible? Can they be increased later if I can afford it? They certainly can. Many young fathers start with an equitable education fund that would pay part of a boy or girl's way through college. Then, as the family income goes up, the amount of the education fund is increased. Your equitable representative will be glad to show you just how it's done. Look him up soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An authentic record of the operations of one of the cunningest of the criminal breed, the confidence man. Its subject, fraud. Its title... The Atomic Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. The director, Sid Goodman. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Atomic Swindle on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business, on which so many of the Equitable Society's nearly four million members depend. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to people who personally own some part of the business enterprise in which they are employed. For such owners, this commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Two Wise Men. In the past six months, there have been almost 380,000 fingerprint arrest records added to the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An addition which brings the number of such fingerprint records to the staggering total of seven and a half million. That figure, seven and a half million, can be said quickly, can be rolled off the tongue and forgotten just as quickly. 
But your FBI asks you to stop for a moment and to realize what that figure represents. These cards represent seven and a half million people who have been arrested in the United States. Since we have slightly more than 140 million people in the country, it means that one out of every 18 among us has an arrest record. Your FBI implores you to do everything that you can to help fight the crime wave. Lest the next survey show that the figure has risen beyond its present high record. And we find ourselves literally engulfed in every type of crime, from larceny to murder. Tonight's file opens in a small Midwestern town. It is early morning. Two men, one old, one young, are hard at work digging a hole with pick and shovel. What's the matter, Billy Boy? Hey, this is this is kind of rugged. For a young fella like you? Why, your Uncle Andy and me do this kind of work all the time. Yeah, I know. I know. Come on, boy, get to digging. I wish Uncle Andy was here now. What? I said I wish Uncle Andy was here now instead of me. <laughs> Once we agree, son, so do I. You know, he'd be here, too, if his back wasn't all twisted up with rheumatism. Hey, tell me something, will you? Yeah, what's that? Why do you old guys always do everything the hard way? What do you mean? Well, why can't you use one of them drills on this hole? You could do the whole job ten times quicker. Billy, you think me and your uncle are pretty old-fashioned, don't you? Yeah. I thought so. Well, let me tell you something, son. There's a lot you could learn from our old-fashioned ways. Huh. Like what, for instance? Like what we're doing right now. Oh? Uh-huh. There's plenty of quick ways to do this same job. I'll grant you that. But once we're inside this bank, we can blow the fort and take the money without anybody ever knowing we're doing it. The next day, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor picks up Agent Carl Perry in front of the railroad station. Yo, Carl. Oh, Carl, over here. Oh, hello, Jim. Hi. Come on, hop in. Oh, thanks. Of course. Good to see you. Well, I must say this is service, being met at the station. <laughs> Look, I didn't come down here to drive you back to the office. I just wanted to save us some time. Why, what's the rush? We've been assigned to work together on a case that just came in. Oh, good. What's it all about? Well, there was a bank burglary in Centerville early this morning. Two men got into the bank by tunneling under the back of the building. Mm, any leads? Well, we get more than leads, Carl. We know who did it. Already? Oh. Well, the robbers parked a car a block away from the bank in front of a home occupied by some people named Duncan. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Duncan looked out the window and copied down the number on the license plate so he could make a complaint about it. And his complaint turned out to be an asset. That's right. Oh, good boy. Car was found abandoned this morning at a tourist cabin out on Route 81. We got some fingerprints out of it. Turned out to belong to a man named Roy Lyons. I don't think I know that name. Oh, that's no reason why you should, Carl. From his record, he's been a petty larceny thief for about 45 years. Well, how old is he? 63. He was working with a boy of 19. How do you know that? Well, we found a jacket inside the bank that had an eyeglass case in one of the pockets. The case was initial WOC. Oh, uh, lights changed, Jim. Oh, yeah. Well, we went through Roy Lyons' arrest record. Found out he was picked up a year ago with a boy named William O. Caldwell. Well, that certainly ties in. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's safe to assume it's the same boy. We'll know in a little while, though, for sure. Why? Well, we're headed for the tourist camp where the robber's car was found abandoned. Oh? I've got pictures of Lyons and Caldwell in my pocket. Carl, if they make positive identification at the tourist camp, we can start our search from there. Yes, Roy? Care for a little more cocoa? Oh, not, not right now, thanks. Oh, my back. Rheumatism's really acting up. Huh? Uh, yes, I wish my nephew would get back with that mustard plaster. Uh, you all done counting the money? Uh-huh. How much? 
$1,237.50. Not a bad night's work. Too bad you couldn't have been with us. Well, I, I wasn't exactly idle. What do you mean, Andy? I wrote some letters. What kind of letters? Uh, do you remember that sucker list I had in the trunk? Which one? Men over 60. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's the one we never knew how to use. I figured a way to put it to work. Well, good boy, Andy. How'd you do it? Well, we've been accumulating a lot of coins along with the paper money. It's tough for us to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. That's why I sent out the letters. We're starting a club. What kind of a club? One of them old age clubs. Oh. I'll be president. Good. You be treasurer. Fine. Uh, what's the uh, aims of the club? We're charging a dollar to join and a quarter a week dues. That way, nobody will be suspicious if we get a couple of hundred dollars in silver. Well, that's a real idea, Andy. Well, I'm glad that... Oh, 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 darn that back. Can I get you something? Oh, no. Oh, where's Billy with the plaster? I told him to hurry. Uh... Andy, I'm afraid that boy does just as he pleases. Uh, how was he on the job last night? Mm, kind of fresh. I uh, don't like to say this, Andy, but he's getting a little too big for his britches. How do you mean... He's been flashing money around, being a big shot. That could get us in trouble. It sure could. Oh, I'll have a talk with the boy as soon as he gets here. Uh, but let me have some of that cocoa. Carl, I wish something would come in on that alarm on the old man and the boy. If they remained in the immediate neighborhood, I think they'd have been spotted by now. Yeah, I'm afraid they've gotten to wherever they were going, though. If these alarms don't produce results in the first five hours, they usually don't produce at all. Jim, if we could only get some kind of a lead that would tell us which way they headed when they left the tourist cabin. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to let this one go for a little while. You mean just quit on it? No, not exactly. While you were calling police headquarters, I went in to talk to the SAC. About what? About attacking this problem from an entirely new angle. Well, what's that? Well, there was a bank burglary about ten days ago over at Midland Falls. The same method of entering the bank was used in both cases. Mm, I didn't know that. Well, the bank at Midland Falls was not covered by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's why we haven't been in on it up to now. Oh, I see. I think the same pair probably robbed both banks. Mm, that's a safe speculation, Jim. Well, the SAC has given us permission to work on the Midland Falls burglary because... Well, solving that one would automatically solve the other case for us, too. Well, what do we do first, Jim? Well, Midland Falls is only about 65 miles from here. Let's drive up there first thing in the morning. How does your back feel now, Andy? Still miserable, Roy. Oh. I was thinking we might go back to work tomorrow night. I got a bank all picked out for us. Where? Well, coming home from Centerville the other night, we went through a little place called Bowling Green. They've got the prettiest little bank there you ever saw. I remember Bowling Green. Got arrested there once. Uh, did you stop and uh, look the bank over? No need to. There's a vacant lot next door. Fine. Think that pipe's out, Andy. Well, hand me the tobacco, will you? Yeah, sure. Here. Hi. Well, where have you been? Out. Thought you went to get your poor uncle a back plaster. I forgot. Uh, Billy, you've been forgetting too many things here lately. Mostly your manners. You've now, been... look, I don't want to hear any long-winded lectures. I'm fed up with those routines. Is that a fact? Yes. And I came home here specially to tell you that. They must be spiking the grape juice down at the pool. Huh, very funny. You're talking mighty big, son. Uh, it's time I did. I've been kicked around by you two just long enough. What do you mean, kicked around? I've been doing 50% of the work. For 50% of the work, I want 50% of the money. Look, son, we brought you into this combination strictly as an apprentice. Uh, that is right. And we tried to teach you all we know. Huh. What do you think I could learn from old-fashioned jokers like you? Oh. Ah, you're 50 years behind the times, both of you. Then why do you work for us? I'm not after tonight. But before I pull out, there's a... 
One thing we got to get straight. What's that? The payoff from last night. I want half. Yeah, you may want half, son, but you ain't getting it. I got a gun here that says I am. Well. Now, where'd you put the money? Put that gun away, son. It might go off and scare all of us. Look, I'm on the level about this. Uh, Roy, I believe he is. Now, get me that money. Uh, you better do as he says, Roy. Uh, very well. <laughs> oh, good work, Roy. Get his gun. Right. Oh, well, what happened? Pull the rug out from under you, that's all. <laughs> that's one of them old-fashioned things you was complaining about. <laughs> Come on, Andy. Let's tie him up. We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. We are in the office of Mr. Edward Bradshaw, president of a successful metal parts business in New England. Harry Summers, our executive vice president, takes complete charge of personnel, purchasing, and manufacturing. George Gibbon is our sales manager. He knows all our customers. He brings in the business. Sounds like two pretty valuable men to me. Yes, they certainly are. If we lost either one, it would take months to replace them. And that's what used to keep me lying awake at night, trying to figure out what I'd do if either one of them should die. Well, you don't look like a worried man to me now, Mr. Bradshaw. I'm not. I got the answer from an Equitable Society business insurance specialist. His suggestion was $50,000 worth of insurance on the lives of each of these two key men, payable to the company. That would tide you over the period while you're looking around for a replacement. Right. And it would help pay for the replacement when we found him. I look on this life insurance on our key men as a safeguard for the security of every man and woman who works for us. No question about it, that Equitable Society business insurance specialist certainly took a load off my mind. Right, Mr. Bradshaw. And now let me extend an invitation from the Equitable Society to the businessmen in this radio audience. An Equitable Society business insurance specialist will be glad to sit down with you and your associates. He's fully qualified by experience and training to work out a plan that's sound in every detail and tailor-made for your business. Have your secretary call the nearest Equitable office and ask for the manager or dictate a brief note to the home office of the Equitable Society in New York City. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Two Wise Men. The attitude of the young man in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is too widespread to require any explanation. It is almost one of the prerequisites of youth that they think they know how to do things better than those who are older. And, as you have seen, that attitude is as true among criminals as among law-abiding citizens. The young man you have met, unfortunately, is representative of the dominant age group among those who have been arrested since the first of this year. According to the FBI survey mentioned earlier in this program, the highest frequency of arrests occurred in the 21, 22, 23, and 19-year-old groups in that order. The age group 50 and over, represented tonight by the two old men, was not far behind in this newest survey. Between them, those age groups combined to produce a total of approximately one-third of all recorded arrests. Many of the youngsters, those in the 19 to 23 bracket, are yesterday's juvenile delinquents. The boys of that age group are still young enough to be saved. Indeed, they must be saved. For if society should fail them entirely, they will soon cease to be yesterday's juvenile delinquents. Instead, they will be tomorrow's hardened criminals. <laughs> Tonight, 
Tonight's file continues late the next afternoon in a room at police headquarters in Midland Falls. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Carl. I just got back here, Jim. Oh, how'd you make out? Well, after I left you, I went to the bank. Uh-huh. They couldn't give us much information, which we didn't already have. But I did get this, uh, this nail puller. No? From whom? From Mr. Crawford at the bank. It was left in the vaults the night of the burglary. Oh. Let me take a look at that, huh? Mm-hmm. Name stamped on it. It's pretty well rubbed out, though. I put it under black light and read it. It says oh. uh, E.G. Bentley and Company Lumber. What's well, a local company? Did you mm-hmm. call them? Uh, yes, but they haven't given away any of these nail pullers for over ten years. Well, that takes care of the possibility of tracing it directly, then. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll fit in later on. How did you make out? Well, the local police and I interviewed every person in Midland Falls. <laughs> no wonder you've been gone all day. Yeah. After comparing notes, I found that the car used in the burglary here was a stolen 1946 black Buick convertible. Mm-hmm. Checking on the license number, I learned the car was stolen from a private garage at Newton Center on September 19th. 19th? Well, that was ten days before the bank here was burglarized. That's right. Oh, any prints found in the car? Yes. Yes, prints identified as those of Lyons and of Corwell. That figured. In examining the car after it had been abandoned, a large jack, the kind they use on tractors, was found in it. Was the car stolen from a farmer, Jim? No. No, that's why I think they probably stole the jack somewhere else. Carl, hand me that map over there, will you? Oh, sure. Here you are. Oh, let's spread it out now. Hold it down there. Huh? You bet. Now, here, Carl. Hmm? If you were to take this territory in here, mm-hmm. on the east and the south of Midland Falls, mm-hmm. I'd take the west and the north. We could interview every farmer around here and see if we can find out where that jack came from. Okay. When we're finished, let's meet back here. You know something, Roy? What? Maybe we should have stayed home and answered our mail. We'd have made more money that way. On the old age club, you mean? Yeah. The letters are flocking in. Why did you dangle at those fellas to make it sound so good? I told them we'd ask the government for a dollar a week for every year they've been alive. That means I'd get $63 a week. That's right. If I was sure of getting that, I wouldn't be driving to Bowling Green in the dead of night to rob a bank. (laughs) That is a good point. Andy. What? Have you made up your mind yet about what you're going to do with young Billy? No. It ain't going to be practical to keep him tied up in the bedroom too long. I know. What would you do if you was me? (laughs) That's easy. I'd kill him. Carl. Carl, I came up lucky. I found the farmer the jack was stolen from. Oh, Good. He said that an old man and a young boy in a 1946 black Buick convertible stopped at his farm on September 29th. Well, wasn't that the day of the burglary here? That's right. He said they came to his farm and wanted to borrow a jack so they could change a tire. Was he sure that it was Lyons and Caldwell? Yes, yes. He positively identified both pictures. Oh, they also stole that nail puller from his tool chest. Well, we've certainly got enough evidence now. Yeah, but that hasn't stopped them. They committed another burglary last night on a federally insured bank. What? Yeah, they employed their same modus operandi on a bank in Bowling Green. Well, they didn't waste much time. Yeah, I know. That's one of the reasons we'd better catch them in a hurry. Carl, let's see where we stand, huh? Take a look at the map. Okay. Now, over here, approximately 55 miles from Midland Falls is Newton Center. That's right. The car that was used to burglarize the bank in Midland Falls on September 29th was stolen from Newton Center 10 days earlier on September 19th. Uh-huh. Now, this farm where the jack and the nail puller was stolen is... Here. That's about six miles due west of Midland Falls. Oh, huh. Now, that means two things, Carl. First, Lyons and Corwell came into Midland Falls from the west. They were at this farm on the day of the big burglary. How? Oh, correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, from Newton Center to this farm is approximately 49 miles. That's right. Now, if they were fleeing from Newton Center after stealing the car, they certainly would have covered more distance than 49 miles in 10 days. I'll buy that. Well, and Carl, I think we can assume that during the period between the stealing of the car and the burglarizing in the Midland Falls Bank, they live somewhere in between. Oh, well, Jim, it'll be a big job checking every house in that 50-mile stretch. Yeah, I know that, Carl, but if they stopped at the farm to fix a flat, they might very well have had some other trouble with that tire. 
Maybe. I think what we ought to do now is start checking every gas station between that farm and Newton Center. No luck here, Carl. We've covered 25 miles already. Yeah, I know that. They couldn't have had too much trouble with that tire. Any chance they use another road, Jim? There is no other road between Newton Center and Midland Falls. So let's go, Carl. We've got to keep trying. No luck here either. Only nine more miles to Newton Center, Jim. Yeah, maybe we're betting on a dead horse. It doesn't even look like they stopped at any of these places for gas, let alone tire repair. Well, Jim, there can't be too many more gas stations. We only need one, Carl. Let's go. Carl, we hit the jackpot. You mean they were in here? Yes, on September 26th. Well, that's a week after the car was stolen. That's right. The attendants said they lived somewhere in this immediate neighborhood. I think there's a way to find their exact address. Come on, let's drive into the nearest town before the store is closed. Who's that? It's me, Andy. Oh, where have you been? Just took a little walk. Thought I'd leave you alone so you could make up your mind. About what? Your nephew. Oh, that was real thoughtful of you, Roy. Well, after all, the boy is your flesh and blood. I knew it'd be hard for you to decide. You made up your mind yet? Uh huh. What did you decide? Don't see any way out but to kill him. Oh. But, Andy, I. Don't want you to do it. Huh? You're too old to start killing anyone now. Oh, I'm not going to. I call that young fellow Green. He does that type of work, you know. I've heard he's a nice, polite young fellow. Yes, I, I like throwing a boy like that whatever work I can. This will be good experience for him, too. When did he say he'd be able to take care of it? We promised he'd be over later this evening. Oh, why? Uh, did you mail those letters while you were out? Uh-huh. And I picked up this batch from the box. My goodness. Club is certainly growing. We're getting a lot of money from this. I know, but that's not our money. It belongs to the members. It wouldn't be very honest uh, of us to touch it. Oh, I guess that's the young man who's going to take care of my nephew. Well, I'll go let him in. Uh, thanks, Roy. Are you Mr. Green? No, I'm Mr. Taylor. Your name is Roy Lyons. That's right. How did you know? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. We've got warrants here for the arrest of you and William O. Caldwell, Carl. Yeah. See if Caldwell has any place in the apartment. Right, Jim. Uh, Mr. Green, bring a friend to help him, Roy. Uh, no, Andy. These men are from the FBI. Oh? Looking for Billy? I'm looking for all of you. Now, come along with me. Andy Spencer received a 50-year sentence for bank burglary, and Roy Lyons and Bill Caldwell received 25 years each. Once the two special agents of your FBI were able to determine in what vicinity the trio of bank burglars resided, they were able to use an earlier clue, the eyeglass case bearing the initials W.O.C. The optician in that particular neighborhood identified the eyeglass case as having been delivered to William O. Caldwell, and he supplied young Caldwell's address. Caldwell's subsequent confession closed the files on all three bank burglaries. And thus, your FBI was able to prevent the further looting of banks in which you have your money deposited by this calculating trio. Tonight's case illustrates to what length the special agents of your FBI will go in protecting your property. For in this investigation, in a period of 72 hours, they interviewed not only every resident of Midland Falls, and that included every man, woman, and child, but also every farmer in the territory for six miles around Midland Falls. And then, every gas station attendant along a main highway for a distance of 55 miles. That is hard work. But the special agents of your FBI have been trained to realize that the only way to investigate a crime is to do it thoroughly. And in almost every case, that means hard work. More hard work. And still more. Until the criminal is caught.
In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business, from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payrolls. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a trained business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story exposing the clever hoax perpetrated by a trio of expert con men. Its subject, fraud. Its title, The Gridiron Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Gridiron Swindle on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, all over the country, telephones have been ringing. Equitable Society representatives calling up fathers and mothers, telling about the coming announcement from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes? Phil, this is Joe. You know, your Equitable Society representative. Yes, Joe. How goes it? Oh, fine. I just wanted to suggest that you make a point of listening to the middle commercial of This Is Your FBI tonight. The Equitable Society has just published a new and enlarged edition of their famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Listen to that middle commercial, and you'll find out how to get the new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Unwilling Hostess. Webster's Dictionary defines a criminal as one who is guilty of an offense against morality or the public welfare. And that definition is correct as far as it goes. But there are other things which must be added if the criminal is to be defined fully and truly. One of these is that the criminal is basically a moral isolationist, living alone in his own small world and having no conception of his need for other human beings or any sense of responsibility toward his fellow men. His utter lack of feelings, his constant disregard of the essential dignity of every individual, is what makes him a criminal. And it is important that everyone understand that point. 
It is impossible to know the real meaning of the word criminal without realizing that to him, other people do not exist so that they may enjoy themselves in a fruitful pursuit of happiness. To him, other people exist merely to serve when he chooses as his next victim. Tonight's file opens in the living room of a home located in a well-to-do suburban section of a large eastern city. One of the occupants of this dwelling, a Mrs. Anderson, is just answering the front doorbell. Just a minute. Mrs. Anderson? That's right. I called you on the phone before. Oh, oh, yes. Please come in. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can put up with an untidy living room. This is our maid's day off. I've just about finished making the bed. <laughs> I understand. Uh, will you sit right over there? Thank you. Uh, would you like some coffee? I just had breakfast, thanks. Oh. <laughs> I- I'm terribly sorry, but I've forgotten your name. Clinton. Ruth Clinton. Oh, oh yes, Mrs. Clinton. Now I remember. You mentioned something on the phone about a new community center. Wasn't that it? That's what I told you when I called. But you can get that. I don't understand. I used that as an excuse for you to invite me here. But why? I was sent here to talk to you. Who sent you? My husband. Walter Clinton. Remember him? Think hard. I don't know anybody with that name. Look, honey, quit stalling. Mrs. Clinton, I'm afraid you'll have to leave. Walter thought you might say that, so uh, he asked me to show you these newspaper clippings. Uh Uh-uh, wait. I'll hold them. You just look. See this one, um, your picture? Where did you get those? I told you, Walter gave them to me. Gee, honey. You know, you haven't changed much. What do you want? Walter's in trouble. He needs some help. Walter's been in trouble all of his life. And he wants to see you right away. That's impossible. Look, you wouldn't want him to show these clippings to your husband, would you? He wouldn't say Honey, you know Walter better than that. All right. I'll see you. Well... I'll call him and have him come right over. Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is reading a wanted notice when Special Agent Dick Madison approaches his desk. Hello, Jim. Hmm? Oh, hi, Dick. Boss said to check with you. Oh? Oh, I guess he was talking about this thing here, Dick. I don't know that there's very much we can do right now, though. Well, what's the offense? Well, apparently there are two charges. One of them is extortion, the other one is murder. That sounds big. What's the story? An elderly man named George Russell was found dead in a cove in his home. Where was this, Jim? Up at a town called Hamilton. That's about uh, 100 miles north of here. I see. Russell was quite wealthy. When his body was found and showed signs of a bad beating, the police thought that robbery was committed. What made them change their minds? The old man had a safe in his bedroom that didn't show any signs of having been tampered with. I see. Well, how do we get him in the case, Jim? Well, the police called us when they found some extortion notes. One of them contained a threat to kill the old man if he didn't pay. Oh. There were three notes in all, and all of them were signed with the name Charlie. Well, how old were they? All of them were fairly recent. Was there any indication that Russell had paid anything? Well, the local police had been going over his bank account. They found that he'd been making systematic withdrawals of cash for the past few months. I see. The last one of the notes they found was on the stationery of a hotel in Hamilton. The police checked, but no one by the name of Charlie was registered there. This thing is full of dead ends. Now, they did get something from the hotel, though. What was that? Well, they sent the hotel register to our handwriting experts to see if they could find the signature that was in the same handwriting as the extortion notes. How did they make out? They found a Mr. Thomas Norton who was writing matches the notes. Norton had been living there with his wife. Had been living there? Yes. When the police checked, they found that Norton had left. Despite the fact that his rent was paid up for two weeks in advance. That sounds fairly suspicious. Any leads on him? No, nothing yet. We've sent the extortion notes on to Washington to have them checked against the writings of known extortionists. But so far, we haven't gotten any report. With a note signed Charlie and the hotel register signed Thomas Norton, we may have somebody with a lot of aliases on our hands. Mm-hmm. What do we do now? Well, the only thing we can do now is wait for Washington to give us some kind of a lead on that handwriting. <laughs> the door, honey. I think it's Walter. Very well. If there's anybody else, don't let them in. Hello, Libby. It's good to see you again. Uh, well, ain't you asking me in? Come in, Walter. 
Thanks, honey. Now, let me have a look at you. Oh, sugar, you ain't changed a bit. You're lovely. Just lovely. Save the charm, Walter. But, Ruthie, I'm just greeting an old friend. Whatever you call it, you're wasting your time. Look, would you mind telling me now what you both want? Why you came here? Well, it's sort of a social visit in a way. It's been so many years since I've seen you, honey. I just got a big yen to sit down and talk over old times. I'm afraid that wouldn't interest me. Sugar. After all the fun we used to have together. Please tell me what you want. Why, Libby, you're just being downright rude. Walter, get to the point. Okay. Libby, baby, me and Ruth have been doing an awful lot of traveling lately. Quit traveling all around the country. So? So we figured it's time we settle down for a while. And after talking it over, we decided to settle down with you. What? I know it sounds forward, sugar, but we're moving in. What? You can't. Why not? Well, my husband. Your husband and your kid went away on a hunting trip. That's why we came here. How did you know that? Oh, we know all about you. You see, I made it my business to keep track of you, sugar, no matter where I was. I knew when your husband bought this lovely house. I knew when your son was born. Everything. Why did you bother to keep up with me? Oh, it's a habit of mine. Some folks collect stamps, but I collect people. Oh, the difference is, I use the people I collect. Well, you can't use me. I refuse to let you stay here. I want your boat to leave at once. And what about these clippings, honey? You want your husband to see them? Well, answer, sugar. Do you? No. Then I guess we stay. Ruthie, have you ever tasted real fried chicken? No. Well, then I'll bet you if we coax a little, Libby will go out in the kitchen and cook us up a nice old-fashioned southern dinner. Want a little more coffee, Ruthie? No, thanks. <laughs> Was I lying about that chicken? No. It was okay. You hear that, Libby? Yes. Well, look, please, sugar, when somebody praises you like that. Leave me alone. Oh, lay off her. I ain't picking on her. She's just touchy. <clears throat> you know, she never used to be like that. Once upon a time, she used to just love every word I said. She's really crazy about me. That's not true. I was a silly high school kid who thought it was romantic to go around with you. But, sugar, you used to spend all your time with me. Why'd you do that? I, I didn't know any better. <laughs> Ruthie, you know, Libby wouldn't let me go out alone, even when I was going to stick up a gas station. I didn't know you were going to hold up that man that night. <laughs> Sugar, you told that same story to the judge, and even that nice old man didn't believe well, it. Well, it was true. <laughs> yeah, but we got newspaper clippings that say different. <laughs> That's what got us in here, remember? Yes. How come you never told your husband about this? Ruthie, I explained that to you before we came. Libby always was quite a lady. And she always was proud. In fact, the thing she's proudest of is that she's a lady. Now, nobody like that would want her husband to know that she was once a jailbird. Right, sugar? I'm going upstairs. Wait a minute. What is it? Where do me and Ruthie sleep? Upstairs. First bedroom on the left. Okay. Good night, Libby. Sweet dreams, honey. Dick, I think we've got something to work on now. What came in? A couple of things. The first one was a report from the handwriting department at Washington. Did they identify the notes? Yes, it was an extortionist named Walter Clinton. At least that was the name he used the last time he was arrested. Then we were right about the string of aliases. <laughs> yes, we were. I've got his record here. It shows that he's been arrested under 13 different names. How does he happen to be running around loose if he's been arrested that many times? It's the same old story, an easy state parole board. He sounds like a fine one to get a parole. Well, he got one. I don't know how. And it cost George Russell his life. Yeah. Oh, Jim, hmm? you said before that two things had come up. What's the other one? Oh, there was a car stolen in Hamilton the day that Clinton and his wife left the hotel up there. The car was parked around the corner from the hotel the last time the owner saw it. And that's the car that Clinton traveled in? That's it. Across the state line. It was found abandoned in, uh, this morning here in town. That means he's probably still around someplace. The local police are checking every hotel and rooming house in the city. If he's in any of them, we'll find him. Has any check been made at the transportation terminals? Yes, they've all been supplied with pictures of Clinton. Good. So if Clinton and his wife try to move out of town now, the odds are pretty much against them. Have we got any description on Mrs. Clinton? Only a very general one. 
He's the one we'll have to call her. Well, what do you think we ought to do, Jim? Well, I don't think there's very much we can do right now, Dick. I think maybe we ought to go home, get some sleep, so we can start fresh in the morning. I'll meet you here at 8 o'clock. <laughs> What is it? Just seeing if you were sleeping yet. I'm not. Real nice here, ain't it? Look, don't worry about Libby. She'll warm up to us after a while. You just remember why we came here, will you? What do you mean? Keep your mind on your business. Honey, are you angry with Walter? Just quit trying to make character with her. Oh, sugar. Don't oh, sugar me. I'm just trying to make the whole thing easier for you. Excuse me, please. Yes, Sugar, what is it? My husband just telephoned. You'll have to get off. Why? They're coming home. When? They, they started to drive back tonight. Where'd they call from? Uh, the Hartsville. Where? It's about 300 miles from here up in the mountains. Oh, well, then there's no hurry. They won't be back too quick. They'll be here tomorrow night. You'll have to go first thing in the morning. Very well. But I thought you said we were going to stay here for a while. Not when we're not bothered. You really do. Yeah. But there'll be a slight charge. What are you talking about? Well, I think maybe you'd like to have those Clifton's. Wouldn't you? Oh, yes. Okay. You can have them, honey. For $10,000. $10,000? Walter, I haven't got that kind of money. Well, then go sell your jewelry. Go get it from the bank. Go any place. Just get the money. Now, honey, you go get yourself a good night's sleep. Tomorrow's going to be a big day for all of us. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Bill, have you got a minute to take a look at this new equitable society chart? Why, sure. Oh, it's that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers you were talking about last week. Right. The new and revised edition of the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I understand it's designed to show me just how much income my wife and kids would need to live on... If I should die. That's it, Phil. You'll know within a dollar or two how much money would be required to keep them well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. And what's more, with the help of this equitable society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you've finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? I'm not sure I know just what you mean by that. The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. You don't have to tell me anymore, Mr. Keating. Just tell me where I can buy one of those fact-finding charts. Well, they're not for sale, Phil. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unwilling Hostess. Nearly 5,000 major crimes committed every day in the United States. Many of them fall into the category of crimes against property. Those crimes include arson and burglary and auto theft. The other classification is known as crimes against the person. These include murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, and extortion. Of all the crimes committed... Perhaps the most vicious, the most basically cruel, is extortion. Because it affects not only the personal safety of the victim, but also his mind. It traps the victim in a terrible vice from which escape is possible two ways, neither of which are attractive. The first and most obvious is to pay the extortioner, and possibly thus to invite a lifetime of further extortion. 
The other way to escape, and the only logical way, is to do what the victim in tonight's case from the files of your FBI should have done. That infallible means of escape is to call your local police. Like your FBI, they have a remedy for extortion. But that remedy cannot be applied without the cooperation of you, the victim. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Morning, Jim. Morning, Dick. I've been waiting for you. What's up? I got a call at home early this morning from Lieutenant Bell of a local police. What did he want? A watch belonging to George Russell turned up in a pawn shop. Here? Yeah. When? This morning. Did you talk to the pawnbroker? Yes, yes. Well, who turned in the watch? Pawnbroker remembered the man, and from the description, it was Walter Clinton. But that report that came in on the missing watch said it had Russell's name on the case. Mm-hmm. How could Clinton pawn it? Well, according to the pawnbroker, Clinton identified himself as Russell and showed him an old credit card of Russell. He must have taken that when he killed the old man. I guess so. I checked on the pawn shop. It's legitimate. This is the first time any stolen goods have ever turned up there. I see. When was it pawned? Yesterday morning. Sounds like Clinton is still in town. He is. Lieutenant Bell just called again a few minutes ago. The police have located Clinton's hideout. Where is it? He and his wife have a furnished room over at 411 North Chester Street. Let's pick up a search warrant, Dick, and get over there. did sleep. Hmm, like an innocent babe. Well, Sugar, have you figured out how to get hold of that $10,000? Yes. How are you going to do it? I'm selling my jewelry. Why, you sweet child. I... I still matter to you, don't I? The only thing that matters is getting you out of here. Now, you can't fool me, Sugar. Go away, please. You look so pretty this morning, Libby. Fresh as a do-dip rose. Leave me alone. Now, sugar. Break it up. Uh, huh? Keep your hands off that dame. Ruth, what are you so angry about? What do you think? I think you're jealous. You just penned a business. But it was. Libby's going to go downtown and sell her jewelry. Is that right? Yes. When are you going? Right now. Ruth, you're going into town, too. What for? To get us some railroad tickets to New York. And, honey, you better get us on different trains, too. Just in case anybody's looking for the two of us together. Okay. Now, scat. Go on, scat, scat, both of you. And as soon as you're finished, you come right home. I'll have a candle in the window. Here's the room, Dick, number 11. I'll unlock it. Not very vague, is it? No. Shouldn't take us too long to go over it. I wonder where they stayed last night. Well, if Clinton's following his usual pattern, he's got an extortion victim here, too. It's amazing the number of people he's been able to get money from. Don't forget we don't know about all of them. Don't forget that half of the extortion victims don't report it. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Then the kind of false pride that keeps them from reporting it doesn't make much sense either. No, I guess not. Well, nothing in this bureau. Jim, I have take a hunch. here. This might be something. That phone book? Yes, it was laying open in this place. Take a look at those page numbers. 32 and 35. There's a page missing. Mm-hmm. Just might be that the new victim's name is on that page, Dick. We could check and see. It means going through about 800 names, Jim. I know. Let's get back to the office and start calling. <laughs> Makes 15 for me. How many get done, Dick? Well, well, that leaves approximately 775 to go. Clinton can get to California and back by the time we finish these. Uh, worst part of it is that even if we're right about this page having the victim's name on it, he might not admit it if we call him. I've been thinking about that myself. I guess. Special Agent Taylor. Hello. Hello. I called the police and they told me to call you. Yes? I understand you're looking for a man named Walter Clinton. Dick, check this call. Yes, ma'am, we are. He's going to be on the 614 train out of here tonight for New York. 614, and uh, how do you know that, ma'am? Never mind how I know. I'm telling you he'll be on that train. Do you want his space number? Uh, Yes, please. He'll have compartment B on train number 21. 
Apartment B, train number 21. I see, and uh, may I ask uh, who this is? I'm just a citizen who wants to see justice done. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very commendable of you, ma'am. You'll we be sure to have someone at the station to arrest them. Oh, Thank yes, uh, we will. Fine, goodbye. Uh, Hello. Dick, I hope they were able to trace that. I talked as long as I could before she hung up. Our operator's calling me right back. Good. She said Clinton was going to be on the 614 in New York. Is that the space on the train she gave you? That's right. Special Agent Madison. Well, I see. Thank you very much. Well? I'm afraid it's not going to be too much help, Jim. That call was made from a pay station. Where's the phone located? In a drugstore at Main and 48th. It might be more help than you think, Dick. Let's see that page out of the phone book. That you, Libby? Yes. I'm in the living room, sugar. Did you get the money? Yes, I have it right here. Ten thousand? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're an angel. Let's have it, sugar. Here you are. You know, I was beginning to worry about you. Little old Ruthie's been home for almost an hour. Where is she? She's upstairs. She had a headache. Oh, it's some aspirin. Call her down. I want you both to leave at once. You don't have to call. I'm here. Look here, Ruthie. Forgot the money. Well, I'd like those clippings. Why, sure, honey. You're entitled to them. You get what you pay for. I'll let you have them just as soon as I finish counting this green stuff. Walter, uh, maybe you better let me carry that. The money? Yes. What for? Well, in case you get picked up. Uh-uh. Why not? I peeked in your bag while you were out. You what? Mm-hmm. I saw that you bought a ticket for me to New York and one for you for California. Hmm. Looks like you were going to take the money and hang me up. Right, Ruthie? Of course I... You're lying, Ruthie. <coughs> Ain't you, sugar? <coughs> Ain't you? <coughs> what? Who are you? I'm from the FBI. The maid let me in the back way. There's another agent out in front. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be at the train. No, you call the FBI. Yeah, you should have called us, Clinton. We traced the call to a drugstore on the corner. But how did you know he was in this house? He tore a page out of the phone book that has your name on it. There are only three names on either side of that page within two miles of that drugstore, so we checked those three first. All right, come on, Clinton. And uh, you too, Mrs. Clinton. Let's not keep my partner waiting too long. <laughs> Walter Clinton was sentenced to 10 years for violation of the extortion statutes, after which he was turned over to local authorities to face charges of murder. His wife, Ruth, was sentenced to a six-year term in a federal penitentiary. With those convictions, your FBI was able to close another case involving murder and extortion, two of the most serious crimes in the federal code of law. But these crimes, and others like them will continue to be committed so long as the general public retains its present apathy regarding the very serious and dangerous rising tide of lawlessness. You, the decent citizen listening to this program tonight, can do something about this if you want to take the trouble. The biggest step you could take in the right direction would be to join with your fellow citizens in seeing to it that you have a strong and alert and, above all, a politically unhampered local police force. Your FBI will always be available as a final bastion against crime. But your first line of defense against the criminal army in America today is in your hometown. And the stronger you make your local police, the better your protection will be. That is the job you can do if you want to help in fighting America's rising tide of lawlessness. moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to all the fathers and mothers in our audience who want to get copies of the new and enlarged edition of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers just published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I believe you said that this chart is not for sale. That's right, Phil. You can't buy it. It's free. 
And the man who'll be glad to see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case describing one of the vilest of rackets. Its subject, Black Market Babies. Its title, The Mercenary Mother. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mercenary Mother on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. It can happen to you tonight. You're sitting right where you are now, listening to this program, and suddenly... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to this equitable program last week and heard about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative brought me a copy, so naturally I know that this is your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Mercenary Mother. The current crime wave in the United States, a wave which is proceeding at the unprecedented rate of nearly 5,000 major crimes every day, is composed of an infinite variety of illegal actions. Behind every one of these crimes, there is a reason, a reason which might be revenge or passion or just ordinary greed. Whatever the rational explanation might be, the underlying motive in many cases is easily understandable. Not that any crime, however minor, can in any sense be condoned. But there are times in the lives of men when the pressures of society and their own basic weaknesses drive them to break the law or to take that law into their own hands. However, there is one breed of criminal for whom there can be no possible excuse and on whose behalf not a single word can be said, for his crime is vicious and venal. He is the criminal you are about to meet. Tonight's file opens in a shabby corner saloon located in one of the poorer districts of a large Midwestern city. Seated at a table toward the rear is a thin, tired-looking man holding his head in his hands and gazing at the drink in front of him. Another customer approaches the table. <laughs> hello, hello, Peter, my boy. Oh, hello, Count. Well, you you seem to be engaged in serious thoughts. Yeah, I am. 
I'm in a jackpot. Uh, perhaps we can arrive at some solution, Peter. Do you mind if I sit down? No, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, how is your charming wife? Okay, I guess. You guess? Don't tell me there's trouble at all. By off, Count. Don't worry, I have no desire to pry into your personal affairs, Peter. You know that. Okay, forget it. It merely seemed to me that I might be of more solace to you than whiskey. I got trouble, Count. Oh, Peter, you know me well enough to know that if there's anything I can do... Nobody can help. I have performed some astounding feats in my time, Peter. Have you got a red-headed kid? <laughs> well, I, I don't happen to have one on me, but I'm sure there must be one available. Well, that's what I need, sir. Are you serious? Yeah. Well, uh, what would you do with one if you found it? Well, Marion figured out a new racket. She got a list of rich families who want to adopt a kid. We're acting like the middleman. I see. We did fine with a kid last week, but now we got a customer who wants a redhead. Why? I don't know. But she won't take no other kind. <laughs> Peter... You're a very fortunate young man. Me? Why? Uh, it's purely a coincidence, of course, but uh, I happen to know of a child who is redheaded and who can be purchased quite uh, reasonably. Are you Levelin? Most assuredly. I know its mother. When would you like delivery? When can you talk to her? Uh, I'll speak to her this evening, if you like. Okay, go ahead and make a deal. Uh, how much should I offer? Uh, how much do you want for yourself? Uh, my commission should be, oh, uh, let us say a hundred. Well, uh, okay. Splendid. Uh, offer the dame one fifty. Uh, suppose she wants more than that. Oh, can't. I can't afford to spend more for a baby. I'm not getting this kid for pleasure. Babies are my business. I understand perfectly, Peter. I shall call on you tomorrow at noon. <laughs> Marion. What? Can I have another cup of coffee? What's the matter with you? I got a terrible hangover. If you didn't get drunk last night, you wouldn't have a hangover. Ah, that's the first thing you said today that I agree with. You were supposed to be working yesterday. Well, I was working. You sent me out to find a red-headed kid, didn't you? I didn't ask you to find him in a saloon. Well, I got the kid. You what? Yeah, I hired the count to get one for us. The count? That old fool. He knew where he could get a red-headed kid for a hundred and a half. I don't believe it. Honest. I promised him a hundred for swinging the deal. Why should we have to cut him in? Marion, we're going to get a thousand for the kid. Answer the door! Okay. Good morning, Peter. Hi, Count. Come on in. Good morning, Marion. How'd you make out, Count? Splendidly. I closed the transaction within an hour after you had commissioned me. Where's the kid? Upon uh, 78th Street. When can you get him? Immediately. I could have gotten a little tight last night if I'd wanted to. Well, why didn't you? Peter said that I could spend as much as $150 for the child. Wasn't that enough? Uh, yes. Well, then why didn't you get the kid and bring him down here? Unfortunately, I didn't happen to have $150. Can you get the kid now if I give you the dough? I shall deliver the child to you within an hour after the money is deposited with me. Okay. Where will I get my purse? Have you seen a kid? No, but Mrs. Price, uh, that's the child's mother, has assured me that he's a splendid physical specimen. Good work, Count. Oh, it was nothing, really. Okay, Count. Here's a hundred and a half. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, hate to bring this matter up, Marion, but... Uh, but what? What? <sighs> I have something coming, you know. He means his hundred. You get that when we get the kid. That's very fair of you. I'll be back in a jiffy with a bouncing baby boy. A short while later in the local FBI field office... Special Agent Jim Taylor is greeting a friend of his, Sergeant Ray Kimberley of the local police. All of a chair, eh? Thanks, Jim. Keeping you busy? Yes, that's what I want to see your agent in charge about. Oh, what have you got? Well, I'm not sure it's an FBI job, but he asked me to check with you in case it turns out to be. Mm. Kidnapping. Kidnapping? When? Where? Right here in town. 7th Avenue and 78th Street. I know that district. It's full of cheap tenements. Yeah, that's right. Who was kidnapped? A baby named Martha Price. Mrs. Price called us less than an hour ago. Oh. Any motive? Well, it couldn't have been ransom. Most of the families up there can buy, barely buy enough food. Yet the child's only eight and a half months old. He couldn't have walked out by himself. Any alarm been sent out yet? Yes. Ray, what's the story on the family? 
Well, it seems that Mr. and Mrs. Price were divorced shortly after the baby was born. Mm. The court awarded her the custody of the child. Well, then it's barely possible that Mr. Price did the kidnapping himself. Is he in town? Well, I don't know, Jim. Well, I'll have the office check on that, okay? Yeah. Uh, you been to see Mrs. Price yet? No, I thought you and I'd take her on up there together. Fine, let's go. <laughs> What do you want? Who are you talking to? When? On the phone. Oh, that was Joe Green. What did he want? He located some kids, and he thought we might want to buy them. How does he know we're in the market for kids? I saw him last night. Oh, I guess I told him. Why didn't you take an ad in the paper? Oh, lay off, will you? What time is it? It's, uh, 3.20. Why? Your friend, the Count, has been gone over an hour. Well, maybe the kid's old lady wasn't home. I got a hundred and a half invested in this deal. I ain't interested in maybe. Relax. Let him come up with a red-headed kid and I'll relax. Open the door! Okay. Hiya, Cap. You got the kid, huh? Yes, yes, I have him. He's apparently wired for sound. Well, come on. Bring him in. Thank you. Hey, look, Marion, he's got the kid. Let me take a look at him. Hey, he ain't got no blankets on him. He must be cold. No, no, he's a hearty little fellow. Hey, wait, we got a baby blanket around here. I'll get it for him. Uh, get something that will make him stop crying. I'll take care of that. Oh. I'll give him some of this medicine we've used before on other kids. That should keep him quiet. It's the blanket. Wait a minute. I'm giving him some medicine. Okay. There. That's it. <laughs> now, look at that. The little creature is calming down. Yeah, I guess he likes her. He's starting Why, with it. Why, you chowderhead. You stupid, broken-down has-been. My good lady, are you addressing me? I am. What's the matter, Marion? Look under the baby's cap. Take a look at the kid's hair. It's as black as your mustache. Oh, dear, so it is. I, I had no idea the little fellow's hair was black. I told you, Count. You remember I said we needed a red-headed kid? Well, I thought this little chap's hair would be red. Why? Well, I've seen his mother at the saloon on the west side on frequent occasions, and uh, she has red hair. Oh. I, I assume the child would have red hair, too. Count, didn't you ever think maybe the old lady dyed her hair? Hardly. Look. You go back to that dame and get us back a hundred and a half. Wait. Before I resort to such a drastic measure, I have a suggestion. What? Assuming that the child's mother did dye her hair, what is there to prevent us from doing the same to the child? Hey, that's a good idea. Great. Brilliant. Look, you stupid idiot. With a kid's hair, you can spot a dye job a mile away. Now take him back. <laughs> Here's the car, Ray. Go ahead, Jim. Slide in this way. Okay, thanks. All right, I didn't mention anything about that phone call I got up there because I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Price. I figured that. With the office calling me, they located Mr. Price. He's out on the West Coast. Now we can drop him as a suspect. I think the story Mrs. Price told us was nothing but lies, Jim. Yeah, I agree with you. I wonder what she's hiding. I don't know, Ray. That uh, neighbor you spoke to, she said she saw a tall, middle-aged man leave with the child? Yeah, that's right. Well, any more specifics on his description? Ah, she was pretty vague. She did give me a fill-in on Mrs. Price, though. Said she spends most of her time in saloons. Yeah, I'd have guessed that. Well, the lights changed, Jim. Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I wish they'd pass a law that no unescorted women could go into a saloon. A law like that would put half the places in this neighborhood out of business. Make our job a lot easier. If we knew what the tall man really looked like, we might find him in one of these saloons. Well, at least we got a picture of the baby. I'll have the office make copies and send them out. Okay, Jim. Then we'll just have to wait for a break, Ray. As soon as we get one, we go back to work. <laughs> What is this? What do you want? That kid the Count brought down here. Didn't he say his name was Price? That he was in 78th Street? That's right. What about it? He never bought that kid. Huh? He snatched him. What? 
It was just on the radio. The cops were out looking for the kid and for a tall man one of the neighbors saw leaving with the kid. Well, what are you worried about? The count's on his way back up there. Don't nail him. That's what I'm afraid of. Marion, I don't get it. First you rap the count. Now you're worried about him getting nailed. I don't care about him. I care about me. You don't think I trust that old stew bum, do you? All they got to do is take away his bottle for five hours and he'll tell him everything. Answer the phone! Okay. Hello? Yeah, hello, Count. Yeah, I know. Marion heard it on the radio. Well, that's fine. But don't worry about it, Count. It's the best news I had all day. Go on. Yeah, right. Told you. You had nothing to worry about. That was the Count. Yes. Yeah. Well, where was he? Well, I don't know, but he wasn't with no cops. We got no trouble. Why not? He ain't got the kid anymore. He lost him. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Last year on this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society offered members of the audience a special fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. It sounds interesting. Can you still get one? Yes, Fred. A new and enlarged fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers has just been published. I have one here. Well, just what's it all about, anyway? Fred, it answers a question every man who loves his family ought to ask himself. That question is, if I should die, how much money would it take to keep my family well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? You know, that thought has worried me for years. Well, that worry is over now, Fred. With this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Now, just a second, Mr. Keating. What do you mean, critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Okay, I don't need to know any more. Where do I get one of these fact-finding charts, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Mercenary Mother. There are no readily available statistics on the number of decent families in the United States who, for one reason or another, would like to adopt a child and to accept the many responsibilities that go with the raising of that child. Such an adoption is possible today through the offices of many reputable organizations. Organizations which take great care to see that the new parents are fit people financially, physically, and morally. But sometimes that procedure takes a period of many months. Months of waiting and hoping and waiting again. Not every family is willing to go through that period. And so they seek their relief through one of many unmoral baby brokers. And buy their child over the counter. Buy him as if he were a puppy in a window. Buy him in one of the last remnants of wartime life. The baby black market. <laughs> Tonight's file continues one hour later in the apartment of Pete and Marion Sheridan. Ain't you going to tell me to answer the door? Go ahead! Okay. Hello, Peter? Count, what are you doing here? I just naturally gravitated. May I come in? Yeah, come ahead. It's a count, Marion. What do you want? Just returning to home base. This ain't home base. What happened to the kid? I told Peter on the phone I lost him. Where? 
in a saloon. Naturally. How could you lose a kid in a saloon? Well, I was standing at the bar when I saw a friend passing by outside. I, I left the little tyke by a pretzel bowl. When I returned, he was gone. You mean the kid met a friend, too? Don't be absurd. The cops are looking all over town for your boat. Yes, yes, sir, I've heard. That's why I came here. I need your assistance. Since you were the cause of my uh, present troubles, I feel it no more than right that you should uh, finance a trip out of town. What? It might prove awkward for both of you if I were to be arrested. What are you driving at? I need about a thousand dollars. You won't get it here. Get out the way you got in. Hey, wait, Marion. I think we ought to give the cat some dough. Where are you going to get it? Well, Joe Green told me he could get three kids. I'll go get them, and you sell them. Jim, I've got some good news. The Price baby's been found. That's fine. Where? At a place called the Three Star Saloon. Who found him? The cab driver went into the saloon for a beer. Saw the baby in a cardboard box. Have you spoken to the cab driver, Ray? Yes, he says that when the bartender said he didn't know whose baby it was, he suddenly remembered the story of the kidnapping in the papers. I see. How long ago did all this happen? Over an hour ago. One of our squad cars picked up the baby and took it back to Mrs. Price. Had the child been harmed? No, no. One of our doctors examined it. It's all right. Just a little hungry. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Mrs. Price since the baby was returned to her? Yeah, I just came from there. And? She admitted under questioning she thought she knew who took the youngster. Well, what did she think it was? It seems that a man whose name she doesn't know came to her and offered her $150 for her child. A man she doesn't know did that? Huh? Well, she says she's seen him around the three-star saloon a couple of times, but she doesn't know his name. At the same place the baby was found? Yeah, that's right. Did you give her any description of this man at all? Yes, but I'm afraid it's too sketchy to do us any good. Now, she turned the man's offer down, as she claims. How does she account for the baby's disappearance? Well, she says that at first she accepted the offer. Then, after thinking it over, she told the man she wasn't going through with the deal. She sounds like a fine mother. Yeah. Look, will you have these prints run through your ident section, Jim? Sure, sure. Where are they from? There was a rattle in the cardboard box with the youngster that Mrs. Price fortunately hadn't touched. They got these prints of it, but we don't have anything in our files that matches. I'll send them down right now, Ray. You get any other leads? Yes, there's a pink blanket in this package here. Pink blanket? Yeah. The baby was wrapped in it when he was returned. It's not his blanket. Okay, I'll have the lab check it for laundry marks and anything else they find. Thanks, Jim. As soon as I get any report back, Ray, I'll call you. Do you mind if I have another drink, Marion? Go ahead. Thank you. Shall I mix one for you? No, thanks. Ah, I do hope Peter is able to do business with his friends. He shouldn't have too much trouble. The kids are for sale. A toast to your attitude, Marion. It's so realistic. You want me to be a sentimental slob and cry like I was their mother? Marion, I'm sure that not even your worst enemy could accuse you of being sentimental. Hello, Peter. How did you make out? I saw the kids. They're real scrawny. How much can we get them for? Including a hundred for Joe. All three kids have cost us four fifty. Uh, sounds like a rare bargain. Be quiet, will you? I told Joe I'd call him if you wanted a kid. He can pick them up and deliver them. Uh, I think I'll go down and get another bottle of whiskey while we're waiting. No, you don't, Count. I don't want you getting picked up. Pete. Huh? Go in and call Joe. And tell him to get those kids up here as soon as he can. <laughs> message when I came back from dinner. What's up? I have a report from the ident section on that rattle. Oh, good. What did it show? Those prints belong to a woman named Marion Sheridan. Marion Sheridan? Mm. I don't think I know that name. Well, there's no reason why you should, Ray. I don't think she's ever worked around here before. I see. But we've been looking for her and her husband, Pete Sheridan, for some time now. Oh, what for? A swindling charge down south. I guess Pete Sheridan is the one who made the offer to the infant's mother. No, no, Ray, he's not. I got his picture out of our files and went up to show it to Mrs. Price. She claims that the tall man she told us about doesn't look anything like Sheridan. You think she's telling the truth? Well, I don't know why she should start telling the truth now, but somehow I think she is. The odd thing about all this is that a study of Marion and Peter Sheridan's records show that they never worked with anyone else. It's always been just the two of them. There's nothing at all in either record that would supply a clue on the tall man? Uh, nothing that I could find. Oh, how about the blanket, Jim? Any report on that? Yeah, that came in, too. There's no laundry marks of any kind on it. Oh, that's too bad. And it's such an ordinary type of blanket. I checked, and it's sold in over 150 stores right here in town. That takes care of the blanket, then. 
Except for one thing. What's that? Well, the blanket was rather liberally stained. The lab is analyzing the stains now. Well, have you sent out any alarm on the Sheridans yet? No. No, Ray, I'd rather not send one out if we can help it. So far as we know now, they don't have the slightest idea that we're looking for them. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yeah. Uh, just a minute, will you? I want to get a pencil. Okay, go ahead. Potassium citrate. Aspirin. Acacia. And all it. Syrup of orange? Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. Bye. That was a lab, Ray. Here's a breakdown on the stains around the blanket. Take a look. That's quick work, Jim. Well, those fellas in the lab are wonderful. They break open more cases than they get credit for. I think maybe they're giving us the lead we want on this one, too. Let's make some phone calls and find out. Well, that's not bad, Count. Two phone calls. Two customers, two baby souls. <laughs> Peter, you're a veritable tycoon. Jay, thanks. Pete. Pete. What do you want? The cops found the price kid and returned it. I just heard it on the radio. Well? I don't like it. Why not? It takes the heat off us. It might not. Uh, Marion, uh, now that you've gotten some cash, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea if, if I... If you uh... went under for a while... That'd be a great idea. Exactly what I was about to say. Now, if you'd be kind enough to advance me, let us say... Save uh, it, Count. You're not getting any dough. Hey, but, Marion, if he gets picked up, it might be trouble. He's right. There is always the chance that the police might make me talk. Don't worry. Hey, Marion. What's with the gun? What are you thinking? Now, now, now Marion, put that thing away. It, it might go off. Uh, it's going to count. Uh, but you, you you can't get away with this. Oh, you... no. Drop that gun, Mr. Sheriff. Huh? You heard what he said. Drop it. Now, walk over to that wall. Go on, all of you. The police, I presume. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Of course, you realize I have nothing to do with these people. I merely stopped by here for a drink. He's I... lying. I think we can let a judge decide that. Now, come on, let's get out of here. The Count, whose real name was George Bedford, together with Peter and Marion Sheridan, were turned over to local authorities for prosecution on charges of obtaining under false pretenses and conspiracy to violate the state kidnapping laws. They were each sentenced to ten years in the state penitentiary. And thus, another evil combination of criminals was broken up by the combined efforts of a local police department and your FBI. Special Agent Taylor was able to find these criminals because the pink baby blanket had a number of stains on it. Stains which the FBI laboratory analyzed and found to be a prescribed baby remedy. All drugstores in the neighborhood where the baby was found were checked. And the records of one revealed that such a prescription had been filled for Mrs. Sheridan. And so... With such a slender lead as the stains on a baby's blanket, your FBI was able to close another case and to close it with one word written across the file. The word, convicted. moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one more point about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Believe me, Mr. Keating, that chart is just what the doctor ordered for a man like me. From now on, I'm through guessing. I'll know what my wife and kids will need, and once I really know, I'll do something about it. So just let me get my hand on one of these charts. Well, Fred, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case revealing the operations of a transatlantic criminal. Its subject, crime on the high seas. Its title... The Round Trip Murder. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Round Trip Murder on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society have been busy ringing people on the phone, telling their friends about the important announcement that is coming on this program tonight. How are you tonight, Earl? Why, hello. I'm fine. Well, Earl, I just called up to tell you that the Equitable Society has some good news in the middle commercial of This Is Your FBI. Equitable has just put out a new and enlarged edition of their famous fact-finding charts for fathers and mothers. If you listen to that middle commercial, you'll find out how to get a copy of the new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Round Trip Murder. the decent, law-abiding citizen, all criminals fall into the same category, a contemptible, greed-infested mob of corrupt, immoral thieves about whom the police should do something. But to the criminal, other criminals are divided into sharp and distinct classes. For some, he has only the loathing disdain that everyone else feels. They are the dregs of that distorted social order people used to call the underworld. For others, he has some regard, because they make their illicit living in the same manner he does, and he watches them to see whether there is anything he can learn about the business of crime. His regard for them ends when they are apprehended by the police, for that to him indicates that they were clumsy, and he cannot forgive clumsiness. But there is one criminal to whom all others look with respect, even after he is caught and convicted, because he is the white-collar worker among the criminals. His is the crime they aspire to commit. He is the swindler. Next file opens in the first-class cabin of an American transatlantic liner. The cabin is occupied by a tall, mustached gentleman who is obviously enjoying the luxury of the trip. Then there is a knock at the door. Come in. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Spencer. Shall I mix your drink, sir? Yes, please. They went on the soda. Okay. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, I packed your bag this afternoon, sir. So I noticed. Thank you, sir. Will there be anything else? Not right now. It's been a fine trip, hasn't it? Yes. I guess you're anxious to get home again, eh, Mr. Lemoyne? 
What? Oh, 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 yes. Very anxious. That's what I always say. You never know how much you miss the good old USA until you take a trip like this. Now, that's true. I uh, packed your bags before any of the others. Thank you, Spencer. I did it for a special reason. Oh? What was that? I was looking for something. What? I was looking for your passport. Well, I admire your frankness. And I admire your courage. What are you talking about? I found the passport. It told me what I wanted to know. What is this? Your passport is in the name of George Lemoyne. That's right. A man named George Lemoyne was a passenger on this ship about two months ago. I was his steward. And this is his passport, not yours. Look, I've heard enough of this. I'm only beginning. Get out of here. And go to the captain? He'd be real interested in this, you know. Shall I see him? What do you want? Money. How much? Enough to make me forget. Name a figure. Well, suppose you tell me what your angle is, and I'll know how much to The angle is my business. How about a thousand? Pounds or dollars? Dollars. Not enough. That's as far as I can go. Make it five. I haven't got five. Split the difference. Only five hundred. That's right. Yeah, get me my traveler's checks. Where are they? You know where they are. You can throw my luggage. Oh, yeah. They were in this bag. And that's where they're going to stay. The next morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Pascal approaches. Oh, hello, Dick. Hello, Jim. When did you get back in town? Last night, huh? I just handed in my report and the boss asked me to check with you. What's this one about? Well, we got an inquiry from Scotland Yard in the mail. What kind of a crime? A man was murdered in London. They couldn't find any identification in his room or in his bag, so. But they found an American flag tattooed on his left arm and the letters USN tattooed underneath the flag. Sounds like a Navy man. Yes, he was. I had the prints checked in the service files and turned out to be a veteran named George Lemoyne. Have you notified Scotland Yard yet? Yes, the boss cabled them as soon as I didn't give us the report. What's the case, then? We got another cable back from them, telling us that some other prints were found on the Moines' room. Do they know whose prints they are? No, they checked through their files, and they didn't have them, so they're sending them along to us, Air Mail. Oh, they should be in tomorrow morning, then. Mm Mm-hmm, that's right. Who was George Lemoyne, Jim? Well, as far as I can gather, Dick, he was a legitimate businessman. Well, he couldn't have been very old if he was a veteran. No, no, he was 36. He'd done a four-year hitch in the Navy... Had a very good war record. What was he doing in England? Apparently, he went over there on business. What kind of business was he in? Men's clothes. From what I can gather, he went to England to make a deal for some British woolens. I see. He'd been stationed there during the war for a while, and I imagine he'd made himself some friends. Any obvious motive for his murder? None that we can find over here, or that Scotland Yard can find over there. Well, he wouldn't be carrying any large amount of cash on a business trip. No, he'd arranged for credit with a bank over here for his purchases. You think there's anything we can do until we get those other prints in the mail? I don't know, Dick. Well, let's go out and see if there's anything else we can find out about Lemoyne. Nobody gets murdered without a motive. If we can find that, maybe it can help find the killer. Come in. Charlie. Charlie Norwood. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll be... <laughs> what are you doing here? Came to see you. I, I mean, what are you doing in this country? Where'd you get back? I just got off the boat this morning. No, but I thought... I, I heard you were in a jug in Paris for a real long stretch. I was. But there are ways of getting out of those places, then. Oh, sure, sure. Well, you look like you've been doing fine. Oh, I've been breaking even. Oh, that's fair enough. Uh, why'd you come back, Johnny? I want to see somebody. Who? Oh, Eloise. Oh, oh, uh, have you seen her? No, I can't find her. Have you seen her, then? No, Johnny, no. I haven't laid eyes on her since she went away. She's got all my dough. She was supposed to send it to me. Are you sure you ain't seen her? Oh, 
Charlie. Would I lie to you? I didn't say you were lying. I'll try someplace else. Come on, Danny. We had on George Lemoyne. Oh, did you find anything? No. It's an apartment house, and apparently Lemoyne took only those clothes he'd need on the trip. Mm. Dick, was he married? No, he lived alone. Oh, I got a call while you were out. I had to go over to Pier 38. On this case? Mm. Seems that there was a steward on the ship that came in from England this morning who had been assaulted and left in a closet in one of the cabins. Whose cabin was it? According to the passenger list, it was George Lemoyne's. What? Mm. I guess whoever murdered Lemoyne stole his passport and then booked passage immediately. Did you get any description of the man who called himself Lemoyne? Yes, but it wasn't too good. When was the steward attacked? Night before the ship landed. Well, that makes it a crime on the high seas. That's right, Dick. It's our jurisdiction. Were there, um, were there any prints in the cabin? Yes, there were a couple on a highball glass. And, well, then there were some others scattered around the cabin. No ident on them? Not yet. I sent them through as soon as I got back. How about those prints that Scotland Yard was airmailing? They come in? Yes, I sent them along at the same time. Did you uh, get to talk to the steward? Mm-hmm. He had just come to when I got to the boat. What was his story? Well, he said that he delivered a highball to Mr. Lemoyne's cabin, and that Lemoyne hit him on the head. He doesn't remember anything after that. Who is the steward? What's his name? Alvin Spencer. Oh, I've checked. He has no criminal record. But why would the murderer, and I assume that's who was using the passport, want to knock out the steward? Well, it's barely possible that Spencer found out that he wasn't Lemoyne. That's true. Spencer says, incidentally, that he had no conversation with the passenger at all. That's a little hard to believe, Jim. Yeah. You know, Dick, I think maybe we'd better keep an eye on Spencer. Sounds like a good idea. Meantime, we'll just wait for that report from my dent. It should tell us who Mr. Lemoyne's killer was. <laughs> Honey. I got some bad news. Oh, what's the matter? Charlie just left here. Charlie? Charlie Norwood? What other Charlie would be bad news? But he's supposed to be in Paris. Yeah, he's right here. It's both dark this morning. But I thought he was in jail over there. Yeah, he must have busted out. Oh. You think he knows anything? I'm not sure. He didn't say anything. He just asked me where you were. What did you tell him? I told him I didn't know. Look, are you all packed? Oh, no, I... I sent for my bags about ten minutes ago, but I didn't think we were going to go away until tonight. That was when we were gone for a weekend. This time we'd better go for good. Where will we go? I don't know, but any place will do. Any place but here. Whatever you say. Okay. Get your stuff packed. I'll pick you up in about an hour. I'll come up when I... Oh, hold it a second, honey. Uh, Just a minute. The boy's at the door in the other room with my bags. I'll see you in an hour. Okay. Bye, baby. Goodbye. Come in, it's open. Is that the boy with the bag? Uh-huh. Oh, oh, well, thanks. Uh, just put them down. Uh, and is it is it still raining out? Yep. Think I'll be able to get a cab? Uh, I'll need one in about an hour. Where are you going? Charlie. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Earl, you're a regular listener to this program. You've heard me mention the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, yes. Uh, Just last week I was telling my wife we ought to get one of those fact-finding charts for fathers and mothers and see what it's all about. Well, Earl, it's made to order for a man in your situation. Like millions of other fathers, you've probably worried over the thought of what would happen to your wife and children if you should die. What income would they need to keep well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Where's that income coming from? Mr. Keating, as many a night I've lain awake thinking just that. Well, after you get this Equitable Society chart, you can forget those worries. In five minutes flat, this fact-finding chart shows you how much money your family would need. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you finish, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. What years are they, Miss Keating? 
The critical years are the ones before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Yes, I get you. Uh, where can I buy one of these fact-finding charts? Oh, you don't buy it. It's free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation. And get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Round Trip Murder. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI amply illustrates one important fact about the behavior of criminals, and that is that they are prepared, once they have committed their first crime, to stop at nothing in their effort to live the easy life. The accompanying fact that they must be stopped before it is too late is obvious to anyone who has made a study of the figures on our current crime wave. A large western city... In a period of one week this month, January 1948, saw 976 crimes committed. Crimes which ranged from auto theft to kidnapping and murder. It is not impossible to stop the crime wave. One Midwestern city, for instance, imprisoned more people in the past year than it had in any of the past 20 years. But that is only a start in the war on crime. A war which cannot be fought exclusively by your local police or by your FBI. This is a war in which you are involved because you are the criminal's victim. And the only way in which it will be won is with your incessant, painstaking cooperation. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Oh, thanks, Dick. I think these are just what we've been waiting for. Let's hope so. Oh, let's see. Yeah, here, Dick, take a look at this. What? The prints I found on the cabin on the boat and the prints that Scotland Yard sent us match up. Whose are they? Charles Norwood. I remember him. Yeah, they sent his record along with the prints, too. He's received quite a lot of publicity in the course of his career. He should have. Here, look at the jobs he's done. Let's see. He's just about the cleverest swindler in the business. Hmm. Forty thousand, sixty thousand. He certainly doesn't swindle anyone for peanuts. No. But somehow I thought he was still in jail. Yeah, so did I. But according to this record, he was released several months ago. And he immediately went to Europe. Oh? There's a notice here from the French police that he was picked up on a swindling charge in Paris, sentenced to a long prison term there. He must have gotten out of that somehow. Mm -hmm. Then he went to London and killed Lemoyne. That seems to be it. Dick, we've got a picture of Norwood in our files. It's on a wanted notice that we sent out on him. I remember it. Why don't you get it and go down and see the steward? Find out if he recognizes Norwood as the man who slugged him. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to send out some feelers and see if I can locate anybody else who's seen Norwood. I'll meet you back here at the office in an hour. Surprised to see me, Eloise? Oh, gee. Yes, Charlie. You figured I'd stay overseas, huh? Well, I... I didn't know. When did you get back? Early this morning. I've been looking for you ever since. I went to three different places. You left no forwarding address. Well, you found me now. That's all that matters. Come here, honey. Well? Let me hold you. Oh, you don't know how much I've missed you. How much I've missed holding you like this. I saw Danny this afternoon. Danny who? Danny Phillips. Huh? Where'd you run into him? At the place where he's always lived. I went there to get your address. Huh? Oh. I haven't seen Danny in months. Quit liar. <laughs> got the whole rundown on you two. You've been going around with him ever since I left. That's not true. I saw your picture in his room. I don't know where he got it, Charlie. You gave it to him. I saw the autograph. But you don't know. I know plenty. In fact, I know that Danny Boy's on his way over here right now to meet you. 
Who told you that? I was outside your door when he called you. He never called me. Stop lying, I said. I know he called you. I'm going to wait right here for him to show up. What's the matter, Dick? You look kind of down. I am, Jim. I can't make any theory stand up in this case. Why? What's wrong now? I just came back from seeing the steward, and he positively identified the picture of Norwood as being the man who slugged him. Well, at least we know that much for certain now. Yes, but I also checked on the steward, and he's in the clear. If he's hiding anything, he's hiding it very well. Well, I think our job in this case is clear enough, though, Dick. All we've got to do is find a girl named Eloise. How does she fit in? Well, I've been doing some work myself while you were checking on the steward. Who is Eloise? Norwood's old girlfriend. Her name at one time was Eloise Williams. What do you mean, at one time? Well, I found the cab driver Norwood used when he left the pier after the boat landed. Where did he take him? Two or three different rooming houses. Norwood isn't the kind to stop at a rooming house, is he, Jim? No. No, he was looking for this Eloise. She used a different last name at each place. But he had a picture of her, and the landlady at each of the three places said that she had lived there, but had moved. What happened to the third place? Why did he stop there? He came to a dead end. The third landlady had no forwarding address. She's probably using still another last name now. Yeah, I would assume so. You know, I'm afraid it's going to be difficult to find her. Have you sent out any alarm? Yes, I asked the local police to check rooming houses and hotels. But I'm afraid we won't have time enough for them to check all of them. Why? Dick Norwood committed that murder because he wanted to get back here for something. And I don't think he's going to wait too long to get what he came for. Where did the cab driver take him after the third rooming house, Jim? To, uh... Let's see, where is it? Oh, here it is. To 73rd Street and 2nd Avenue. He says he drove away without seeing which building he entered. Well, there are a lot of apartment houses around there. I know, but I found one on 73rd Street that might do us some good. Which one is that? Well, according to his record, the last time Norwood was arrested, the arrest was made at the apartment of a friend of his named uh, Danny Phillips. I called the superintendent of the building, but he was out. He'll be back in about 15 minutes. Well, why don't we run up there and talk to him? Fine. But first, let's pick up a search warrant for Phillips' apartment. <laughs> That must be your friend, Danny. Well, go let him in. Charlie, you're not going let to... Let him in, I said. Very well. Hello, honey. Come in, Danny. I got here as soon as I... Hi, Danny. Charlie, we've been waiting for you. You... You, you found her, huh? Stop the routines. I know the score. Look, Charlie, I can explain. You don't have to. You're welcome to her. I don't want any part of it. You mean you're not sore? I just came here for one thing. Eloise, I gave you 45 G's when I left. Where is it? I haven't got it. Now, don't give me that. I spent it, Charlie. I didn't think you'd come back, so I spent it. You didn't spend 45 G's. Not living in cheap rooming houses. Yes, I did, Charlie. Honest. Danny, if I were you, I'd advise her to tell the truth. It would come out a lot better for both of you. Well, Charlie, she I is... got a gun here, kid. Wouldn't bother me a bit to use it. Eloise, you better level with him. How much you got left? About 25000 Where is it? In the hotel safe downstairs. Hey, call and have him send it up. All of it? Do like he says, honey. Danny, we won't have any money to get married on. Just get that dough up here. <laughs> Danny Phillips lives in apartment 417, Dick. It should be down this way. Did you get the key from the superintendent, Jim? Mm. By the way, I learned just before we left the office that the loot on Norwood's last job never turned up. What? Obviously, that's what he came back to this country for. Yes, must be. Oh, here we are. Does it? Come on, Dick. Right. We just had this one room. Let's take a look around, huh? Mm. Uh, did you say that the superintendent definitely identified Norwood's picture? Yes, he was standing in front of the building this morning when Norwood came in. Anything on the desk, Dick? Mm, just some unpaid bills. You know, it's too bad to have a self-service elevator in the building, eh? Why? I'd like to know how long Norwood stayed here. With 
also be a help to know where Danny Phillips is now. Yeah. Yeah, he could give it. Hey, wait a minute. What is it, Jim? All right, Dick, look at this. What? It's a photograph of a girl. It's signed to Danny with all my love. Eloise. That's the name of the girl that Norwood was looking That's for. That's it. But it's autographed to Danny Phillips, and very affectionately, too. Dick, this is beginning to piece itself together. Come on, we got some work to do. <laughs> Taking this hotel for somebody to come up here with a package. How do I know? You heard her make the call, Charlie. What more do you want? I want that dough. They said they were going to send it up. Oh, that must be someone with the money. Oh, wait a minute. Well? I'm putting this gun away. Remember, it's right here in my pocket. Now open the door. Miss West? Yes? Yeah. I asked Mr. Dest to bring this package up here. Come in. Thank you. Let me have that package. I was told to deliver it to Miss West. Uh, something else for you, Norwood. He's got a gun. Who is this guy? I never saw him before in my life. He's telling the truth, Norwood. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? What? I came here to bring you all back to our office. Now, come on. I think we have a good many things to talk over. <laughs> Charles Norwood was extradited to England to be tried for murder. His erstwhile confederate, Danny Phillips, and the woman called Eloise, received a sentence of five years each in federal prison for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. And so, by tireless, sometimes apparently fruitless investigation, your FBI was able to apprehend a dangerous criminal who was wanted by the police of two continents. The clue which led the two special agents to the apartment hotel where Miss Williams was residing was a photograph of her which they found while searching Danny Phillips' apartment. Because her dress was cut to conform to the current new look, your FBI knew that it was a recent photograph, and a check at the photographer's gave them Miss Williams' current name and address. Tonight's file is another example of the swift execution of detail that has won for the Federal Bureau of Investigation the enviable international reputation it now holds. A reputation as an arm of justice which is intolerant of only one thing, the freedom of criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, Earl, I understand you have one more question about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, yes, Mr. Keating, it's this. If I ask my Equitable Society representative for a copy of this chart, does that obligate me in any way? Absolutely not, Earl. This chart was originally planned as a special service for members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Then it was extended to the audience of this program. It's free, regardless of whether you belong to the Equitable Society or not. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to supply you with a chart. What you do after that is strictly your own business. So make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of a criminal who sought escape by means of altering his appearance. Its subject, flight to avoid prosecution. Its title, The Plastic Profile. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious... And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
The Plastic Profile on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. hundreds of people all over the country receive phone calls from their Equitable Society representatives. Phone calls like this one. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is your Equitable representative. Oh, hello. What's new? Well, Jack, I thought you and your wife might be interested in getting a copy of a new chart just published by the Equitable Society. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I might be. What's it all about? Well, tonight on This Is Your FBI... You'll hear exactly what the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers is all about. So, be sure to listen to the middle commercial. Yes, in about 15 minutes, Dad and Mother, it will pay you to hear all the facts about the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Plastic Profile. Eight years ago, in 1940, the number of crimes committed in this country was far below the number now being committed by America's huge army of criminals. With the larger number of crimes has come a greater number of convictions, a greater number of people being sent to prison. And yet, back in 1940, when the last United States census was taken, the number of our fellow citizens who gave their residence as prison was appallingly large. More than 317,000. If that number does not sufficiently impress you, then perhaps you should consider that in these 48 states, with a population of more than 130 million, there were only 25 cities housing more people than are currently held in our prisons. Tonight's file opens in a cell in a small prison located in the town in one of our northwestern states. It is early morning, and through the bars can be seen a heavy snowstorm. There are two men in the cell, and one of them is just waking up. Hello there. Mm-hmm. Well, when did you come in? Last night. Must have been after I went to sleep. It was. Hey, don't I know you from someplace? I don't believe so. You live around here? No, no. Just passing through. Somehow I know I've seen you kissing before. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Now I know. There's a picture of you on a circular in the post office. I've seen it last week. Huh. Funny I should remember. Just seeing it once like that. Everybody does. Especially the police. That's why I'm here. My name's Joe Crawford. Hello, Joe. I'm Slim Baldwin. What are you in for? They're holding me for the FBI. Wow, that's bad. What's that? Quiet. Give me that stick. Yeah. Who are you talking to? A friend of mine. Ox Putman. Sends very well. You can understand this? Of course. He just asked us at a time for busting out of here. That's right. Would uh, Mr. Ox Putnam object to company? Not if the company kept his mouth shut. <laughs> One of my specialties. Okay. Then we all go tonight. <laughs> Next morning, at the local railroad station, 
Special Agent Jim Taylor is met by Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Hello. Hello, Jim. Hello. How are you? Okay, guy. Well, looks like you've had some typical weather. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the weatherman says it really hasn't stopped snowing yet. He thinks it'll start again in about an hour. Well, I'll be gone by then, I hope. Well, I don't think so, Jim. I got some bad news. Why, what's wrong, Jim? Well, the man he came up to get broke out of jail last night. What? Hey, he broke out with two others. One of them was caught here at the railroad station. The other, a man named Joe Crawford, still missing. Then he and Baldwin might be together, huh? Yeah, maybe. Let's get going, huh? Okay. Jeff, how'd they get out? Uh, Crawford told the guard he wanted to see the warden. Uh-huh. When the guard opened the door, Crawford grabbed his arm, knocked him down, took his keys. Once they got those, they were as good as out. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I remember that cracker box jail you had here. Hey, I thought they were going to build you a new jailhouse. Well, there was a referendum at the last election. People voted against it. Doesn't make much sense to have a good police force and a bad jail. <laughs> That's what we tried to tell everybody. Now, here we are, Jim. This is the car. Thank you. Let's head back to the office and see if there's been any word. Is the hideout very far now? No, no. It's that cabin down at the end of the road. See the smoke coming out of the chimney? Hmm, someone there? Yeah, Aunt Mary. Your aunt? No, no, she runs the hideaway. Uh-huh. You can hold up there as long as you want. Well, I won't be staying long. I've got to get back to Seattle. Got a dame there? No. Got some money stashed there. Well, you better not make your move too soon. They'll be throwing plenty of pictures of you around. You know how that kisser of yours stays with people. Uh, that's true. Hey. What is it? Yeah, I got a great idea for you, Slim. Why don't you get a new face? Well, I've considered that, but I never had the time. Well, you'll have the time now. And Aunt Mary knows a guy who does the best plastic work in the whole state. A legitimate doctor? Well, he was once. He knows all the angles. Why don't you give him a try, huh? Uh, I'll think it over. Okay. Well, here we are. Is this Aunt Mary's? Yeah. Oh, boy. (sighs) You'll have to plow through the snow a little. That's all right. Can you make it okay? Sure. Sure. You suppose she's home? Oh, sure, sure. She's always home. Hello, Aunt Mary. You, Crawford. <laughs> That's come right. In, come in, Joe. Yeah, go ahead, Slim. Out of the way. Oh, it's got a fire in here. Yeah, Ooh, feels good. Aunt Mary, this is Slim Baldwin. Well, how do you do, Slim? Hello, Aunt Mary. We, uh, we just busted out of jail. You did? Yeah. Well, bless you both. Let me fix you a nice hot meal. Is he Aunt Mary? Oh, no. Come in, Joe. I thought you went in to take a nap. Oh, I'm not tired. Oh, where's your friend, Slim? Oh, he's sleeping. He was knocked out. Oh, poor boy. Is he an old friend, Joe? No, nah, no. Nah, I never seen him till yesterday. He was being held for the FBI. They had circulars on him all over town. Well, my, I'm flattered to have a celebrity in the house. He's too much celebrity. That's his trouble. What do you mean? Everybody knows his kisser. That's why he got picked up. Oh, what a shame. Say, Aunt Mary, is that plastic doc that you used to know still around? No, you mean Doc Smith? Yeah, that's a guy. No, he died a few months ago. Oh, that's too bad. I had a chance for us to make a real good commission. How's that? Well, I talked to Slim on the way out about having his kisser fixed. And a few minutes ago, I started on him again. Yes? He finally decided to have it done. I said you could get Doc Smith for the job. I, uh, said it would cost him five Gs. What did he say to that? (laughs) He said he'd pay it. He did? Yeah, yeah, he's got some dough stashed up in Seattle. Well, Joseph, we... We can't let money like that slip through our fingers. Oh, what can you do? I know another doctor. Huh? I'll have him here tonight. Jeff, how did you get Baldwin? Oh, we just recognized him from the wanted circular and picked him up. What was his specialty, anyway? Jewel theft. A lot of women thought he was attractive. That's the way he earned his money. Oh, I see. On his last job, he picked up a woman on a train. 
She was a maid. He talked her into lifting her boss's jewelry. On the train? That's right. Huh. Hey, who is this uh, Joe Crawford that he escaped with? Well, he's wanted for murder. He uh, shot a cashier in a local factory. Got about 30000 in cash. But fortunately, he had it all on him when he was arrested. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Robert speaking. Yes? They did. Robert speaking. Well, when? Oh, I see. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, what was that number again? Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, I got it. Thanks a lot. We got a break, Jim. That was a farmer named Gordon. Baldwin and Crawford knocked him out and stole his car early this morning. How come he didn't report it until now? But he just came to. Oh. Well, let's get a good description of the car and send an alarm right away. Right. And, Jeff, I think I'll go out and have a talk with Mr. Gordon. <laughs> Here, here's some more wood for the fire, Aunt Mary. Oh, aren't you the good boy, Joe? <laughs> Say, is uh, Slim still sleeping? No, he's been in here visiting with me. I-, I just sent him back to his room. Get ready for the doctor. Oh, when's he coming? He should be here any minute. Did you, uh, did you talk to Slim about the dough? Yes, I, I told him I arranged everything with the doctor. Told him that he didn't have to pay till he got back to Seattle. Did you tell him that we'd go up with him to collect? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> swell, swell. Well, there. How's that for a fire, huh? Oh, that's beautiful. You know, it reminds me of a building my departed husband once set fire to. <laughs> yeah, Mary, you killed me. Oh, that's probably the doctor now. Let him in. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Mary. Well, come in, won't you? Yeah, thank you. Uh. Joe, this is Dr. Montgomery. Oh? Uh, Doc, this is Joe Crawford. Are you, Doc? Fine, fine. Well, let me have your coat. Uh, sure. There we are. Sure. Goodness, where are your records? Huh? I must have forgot them. This the patient? No, he's in his bedroom. Do you think you can do the job tonight, Doc? Sure, no trouble at all. Got all the instruments in my little black bag. What kind of a face are you going to give the guy? What kind would he like? What kind you got? All kinds. He can look like E.H. Southern, Robert Mantell. Oh, how glamorous. Who are them guys? Oh, they're very handsome men. Uh, but, Doctor, why don't you talk to the patient? After all, he's the one who'll have to make the choice. He's in his bedroom, Doctor. You go right in. Very well. Very well. Hey, Aunt Mary. Yes, Joseph? Uh, this may not be the right thing to ask, but has the doctor been drinking? Of course. But how can he operate? Operate? Well, the only time he's used a knife in his life is to put butter on his bread. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Jack, with those youngsters of yours growing as fast as they are, here's something you'll want to see. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Fact-finding chart? How's that going to help me? It'll help you, Jack, because you're the kind of man who isn't afraid to face facts squarely. For example, what would happen to your wife and children if you should die unexpectedly? Would they be able to make out all right? Would they have enough money to keep well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? When you put it that way, Mr. Keating, I couldn't say. But that fact-finding chart sounds kind of complicated. Not a bit, Jack. It's the simplest thing in the world. With the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart, you'll have your answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished... You'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Hold your horses, Mr. Keating. What do you mean, critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. I see what you mean, Mr. Keating. I guess I ought to get this stack-finding chart. How much do they charge for it? Jack, it doesn't cost you a single cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with them, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone in tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. 
Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Plastic Profile. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI lays bare the primary emotion of every criminal, the desire to get his hands on what belongs to someone else. No matter what the cost in physical pain or mental torture might be to the victim. When we in this nation reach a point where every person in every section is truly a civilized human being, then there will be no more crime waves, nor any criminals. Because the true stamp of civilization is a deep compassion for your fellow human beings. But until we reach that utopian day, it is our bounden duty to cooperate at every turn with our local police and with every other law enforcement agency to see to it that the war against crime is waged successfully. Tonight's file continues in the small office of Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Jeff, Jeff, can I come in? Oh, come ahead, Jeff. Did you get to see Mr. Gordon? Yes. Yes, he had a pretty nasty blow on the head. Well, could he give you anything? Yes, I showed him Baldwin's picture on the wanted circular and that picture of Crawford that you had. Uh-huh. He identified both as the men who stole his car. Well, at least we're sure of that much. Well, if they stay on any main highway, they should be picked up pretty soon, huh? I would think so, Jim. That alarm has been on the local radio station every 15 minutes since this morning. Uh-huh. No problem, Robert speaking. Huh? Yes, Mr. Atkinson. When? You're sure? Yes, I see. All right. Thank you very much. I was a Mr. Atkinson, Jim. He just heard the alarm on the radio. And he saw the car? Yeah. When? This afternoon. It went past his house up Nine Mile Hill. Where's that? Oh, about 35 miles from here. Mm-hmm. He also said that he noticed the car because it was the only one that went past his house today. We might be able to follow the tracks, then, if it doesn't snow again. Yes, we can get out there first thing in the morning. We don't have to go by car, Jim. We've got a helicopter. I'll fly us out there as soon as it gets light. Hey, Aunt Mary. What is it, Joe? Slim ain't dead, is he? What makes you think that? Well, I just looked in that room where he is. He, he's out cold. Well, naturally. Oh, is that... Is, is, is he supposed to be that way? The doctor was very generous with the chloroform. Oh. How long will he be out? About another hour. Then can he take off those bandages? No, son. They won't come off for a few weeks yet. What? But I don't want to wait here that long. He won't have to. He can travel as soon as he regains consciousness. With his head all bandaged like that? Well, of course. I'll get him a cap with the earmuffs, and with his coat collar turned up, no one will notice him. Uh, I hope that car we picked up holds together until we get to Seattle. Oh, we're not using that car. Hmm? Might be hot. Uh, we'll use Doc Montgomery's. What about the doctor's dough? He's already gotten everything he's going to get. You, you paid him? Gave him two bottles of whiskey. That should keep him very happy. Suppose the doctor gets in touch with Slim and asks for his dough. How's he going to do that? Well, I saw Slim write down his address on a pad for the doc. As soon as he has a couple more drinks, get it back from him. <laughs> right. Now, give me a hand here. I'm looking for something. What, Aunt Mary? My best shawl. Got to dress up if we're going to Seattle. <laughs> Jim, we should be over Nine Mile Hill in a couple of minutes now. How low can we fly this thing? Oh, well, fly it as low as we have to. We can land any place. I've never been in one of these before. They're great for up in this country, Jim. Things certainly do look beautiful from up here. <laughs> Looks like a Christmas card. Yeah. Jeff, is that Nine Mile Hill straight ahead there? Yeah, that's it. Be over it in a few seconds now. Atkinson was right. 
There's only one set of tire tracks going up it. Well, let's follow the road. Well, there's still only one set of tracks. Well, lucky it didn't start to snow again. Jeff, look. The tracks are turning off the road. Where? On the left there, the trees. Oh, yes, I see it. There's a car down there, right next to that cabin. Yeah. I'll drop down. Sedan, Jeff. Yeah. Looks like a Buick. Left rear fender's done it. I was in the description. I'd say that was the car that was stolen from Mr. Gordon. I'm going to land in that clearing in back of the house. You warm enough, Aunt Mary? Oh, certainly. I love this weather. How about you, Slim? I just hope this face of mine turns out all right. Oh, Slim, it's going to be beautiful. How do you know? Well, the doctor showed me your face before he put the bandages on. Huh? What do I look like? Like a Greek god. Yeah, I was pretty worried about how it would turn out. Why? Well, I smelled whiskey on the doctor's breath just before I took the, the anesthetic. Oh, he just had one little nip. Uh-huh. Really drunk when we left. Well, he wanted to relax after such a difficult operation. Now be a good boy and stop worrying, Slim. You're going to look fine. Aunt Mary, how long since you've been to Seattle? Oh, seven, not three years. Oh, well, this will be like a vacation for you then, huh? Mm-hmm, you should say so. First thing I'm going to do is go to a department store and do some shopping. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, oh, gee, that's just like a dame. Spending all your money on clothes. Money? Gracious, Joe, I didn't say I was going to buy them. Huh? You're much too young to remember, but in my day, I was the best shoplifter west of the Mississippi. <laughs> Jeff, keep your gun drawn. Cover me. I'll throw them in the front door. Okay. Here we go. I'm going in, Jeff. I'm right with you. Someone in the next room. Come on, Jeff. Let's take a look. I have here a little bottle of wonder syrup. It's nectar of the gods. Hello, Doc. Huh? Come on, Doc. Get with it. What are you doing here? I know you from some place. Can't place the face. I arrested you for selling snake oil last year, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right, you did. Who is he, Jeff? Wonderful. Old medicine showman. Calls himself a doctor, more or less the town drunk. What would he be doing here? I don't know. Look, let's show him the pictures of Crawford and Grove and see what he can tell us, huh? Good idea. Oh, a doctor. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Take a look at these pictures, will you? Fine pictures, fine pictures. Yes, we know they're fine pictures. These men were here. Where are they now? Gone. Gone. Oh, gone. They yeah. were very rude. I don't think he's going to Let be much help to us, Jim. Goodbye. We'd better look around the rest of the place and see if we can get a lead. But I know where they went. You do where? Yeah. Come on, Montgomery. Make some sense. They went to Seattle. Fellow gave me his address. You want it? Yes, of course I want it. Uh, it's... Huh? Oh, it's on a little pad. Must be in the other room. Hey, Jim, I noticed that pad on the table in there. Come on. All right. Here it is, Jim. Yeah, but there's nothing on the pad. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, Jeff. There's some indentations. Yeah, but they're not deep enough to read. You got a flashlight? Uh-huh. Turn it on. Hold it parallel to the sheet of paper, will you? Okay. This way? That's it. There. See how that accents the indentations? Yeah. Looks like an address there, Jeff. Uh-huh. I can make it out. 4411 Canal Street, Seattle. You know, the doc could be telling the truth, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I know. I wish I could go with you, but that's across the state line and out of my territory. Well, let's fly back to the airport. I'll catch the first plane to Seattle. <laughs> nice apartment. Well, thank you, Aunt Mary. Let's see now, can I get you anything? Well, if it wouldn't seem too rude, you could get us the money. Money? Yeah, yeah, the five G's. For the dock. Oh, of course. I'll get it right now. Gee, you keep that much cash here? 
This wall safe is pretty well concealed. Mercy, I'd be afraid to see you. <laughs> I think they extend professional courtesy. Here we are. He's got a gun. That's right, Joe. Slim, you, you put that away. You, you'll hurt somebody now. I will if you two don't get out of here. What is this? Pretty apparent, isn't it? I'm saving myself $5,000. Young man, this is most unethical. It's just good business, that's all. Look, Slim, what are we going to tell the doc? Don't give me that. You had no intention of pain. But you got a new kiss there. You're wrong, Joe. What? He's still got the same face under those bandages. What are you talking about? That man wasn't a doctor. He didn't touch your face. If you're lying, I can, I can feel it. What you feel is plain plaster. If you don't believe me, take off the bandages. See for yourself. Go ahead, take them off. I will. Is that the truth, Aunt Mary? Yes, Joe. You'll find out when he looks at himself in that mirror. Wait. You dirty... Get his gun, Joe. Right. Let it go. Oh, no. Now we take over. Good work, Joseph. Now take a look and see what Mr. Baldwin really has in that wall safe. Very well. Huh? A cop. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Well, you just arrived in time, young man. That fellow there with his face half covered with bandages is a criminal. I want you too, Mrs. Dawson. <laughs> And I'm taking these two to a jail they won't break out of. Slim Baldwin was sentenced to 20 years for theft from an interstate shipment. Joe Crawford was given two years and turned back to the local authorities for prosecution for murder. Mary Dawson received two years and a $1,000 fine, and the bogus doctor's probation was revoked, and he was returned to jail for one year. And thus, once more did cooperation between a local police officer and a special agent of your FBI result in the successful pursuit of a group of criminals. The method of reading indented writing, which led Special Agent Taylor to the address in Seattle, is only one of many skills in scientific crime investigation which form a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes a duly authorized and qualified member of your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. <laughs> My friend Jack Stone says he has one more question about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. What is it, Jack? Well, you say this chart is free, Mr. Keating, but there must be some strings attached to it. No, Jack, not one. This chart was originally created as a helpful service to members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Now it's being offered to the audience of this program. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to supply you with a chart. What you do after that is strictly your own business. So, make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A revealing account of the activities of two teenage lawbreakers. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Eager Ensign. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for The Eager Ensigns on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars to you and your family. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Jewel-Laden Jockey. Those among us who see stories in their daily newspapers about new crimes which have just been committed and who conveniently skip over those items because crime is unpleasant and affords them no escape from reality. It is not important that you read every article about every criminal, but it is important that you, as a citizen, be cognizant of the current situation, that you be acquainted with some of the shocking facts about the crime wave. Those facts, like the one which tells you that there are 36 murders committed every day in this country, are vital to you because if enough of your fellow citizens learn them, they will act. They will see to it that your local police force is given the weapons it needs to fight the crime wave and to fight it to a successful and speedy conclusion. Tonight's file opens at a small half-mile racetrack in a Midwestern state. Pop Campbell, one of the trainers, is standing at the rail with his daughter Betty. It is 6.30 in the morning, just getting light, but already there are horses on the track getting their morning workout. That's Jupiter's boy, isn't it, Pop? Yeah. I caught him in 52 flat. Ah, uh, he's the one to beat this afternoon. Nah, we can beat him if Scotty gets here to ride. Wonder what happened to Scotty. He's never done this before. He knew Black World was going today. Hmm, Pop. Hmm? Whitey's waiting for you. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, Whitey! Let him run! He's letting him out. Yeah, honey, I, I, I told him to. Doesn't look like that ankle's bothering him at all. No. No, I think it's going to be okay. I hope so. Excuse me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah? You, Pop Campbell? Uh-huh. I'm a friend of Scotty's. Well, uh... He ain't around. Yeah, yeah, I know. You brought his tack bag here, didn't you? Well, yeah, that's right. He wants me to pick it up. What for? I don't know what for. He just said he wanted me to pick up his tack bag from Pop Campbell. Where is Scotty? In town. Did he give you a note? He said I wouldn't need a note. You do before you get the bag from me. Now, uh, look, Pop. Go away, mister. Go away. I'm busy. I'm busy. Okay. I'll go. But I'll be back. <laughs> Hmm? He just worked in 51-4, breathing. Yeah. Well, aren't you pleased? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, honey. I've just been thinking about something else. That man who wanted Scotty's bag? Yeah. I was just wondering what could be in that bag that made him want it so much. <laughs> Later that morning, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bruce Bedford. Hi, Bruce. Oh, hello, Jim. Boss just called, said I should check with you. Yeah, he wants us to work together on this case that just came in. Hmm? What is it? Well, so far as we know, it's murder. Where did it happen? On the train from Chicago sometime last night. Hmm. How much do we know? Oh, enough to start on, but not enough to get very far away. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah. Who was killed? A man named Richard Scott. He was a jockey. At one time, he rode at some of the big tracks, but he's ridden mostly at county fairs and half-mile tracks around this part of the country. I see. Whoever killed him probably used a silencer on his gun because the porter claims he never heard any shot fired. Mm -hmm. When was the body discovered? This morning in his compartment. It's a little odd for a small-time jockey like that to travel in a compartment. Scott liked to live as well as he could, according to what I found out so far. Well, why was this office given the case? Because Scott was en route to the city. Oh, probably to ride out of Whitman Park. Racing starts out there today. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's probably where he was headed. Anything else in the report on Scott? Yes, his bag was rifled and his clothes were scattered all over the compartment. There was an address book found in Scott's clothes that may prove to be an interesting collection of names. Why? Well, two of the names were people here in town, and both of them are suspected by the police of being fences with stolen jewelry. Oh, how about the other names from out of town? They're being checked now. Mm-hmm. How about the bullet that killed Scott? It was shot from a thirty-eight. It's being checked at the unidentified ammunition file right now. Rose, as soon as we get a report from either source, we'll go to work. <laughs> Quiet, boy. Quiet now. Come on. Come on. Stand still. <laughs> he hates to be combed. If he only knew how pretty it made him. Well, I hope he looks this pretty this afternoon. Ah, he will, Pop. He's going to win us a nice purse. Aren't you, boy? <laughs> Golden image goes tomorrow. How far? Six. You don't seem to like to win at six. Oh, I think maybe against these horses down here. She'll, she'll do better. If we win a purse, maybe we can claim another horse, huh? Well, honey, we can't carry more than two in the van unless we move our stuff out. I'd like to claim Jupiter's boy. I think we could do something with that horse. Well, Radford knows his business, honey. If he's dropping his horse in that kind of a race, he... Say, that's Golden Image. What's the matter with her? Well, it sounds like there's somebody in a stall. Somebody she don't know. I'll go see. Well, wait, I'll come with you. Yeah. I'm going after him. No, 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 Betty. Come back here. But, Pop, maybe he stole something. I don't care if he did. I don't want you getting hurt. Now, come on back here. Oh, oh, steady. Come on. Steady now. Steady. Come on. Steady, boy. Uh, well, don't look like he harmed Golden Image. None anyway. Oh, take it easy. Pop, look. Huh? In the corner. Scotty's tax bag. Yeah. Stuff spread all over the floor. Uh, let's tell the police about this. Yeah. yeah. I think I will. Jim, uh, did you get anything back yet on your queries? Yes, I just got the report back on Scott's address book. Oh, uh, what about those names of Martha's huh? Almost every one of them is a suspected fence. Mm. Sounds like Scott was mixed up in something more than horse racing. Mm. In fact, we know he was. One of the suspected fences admitted that Scott worked with him. And what was his job? Well, Scott used to be the messenger for a whole flock of dealers in stolen jewelry. It was easy for him to carry it without suspicion. Well, that establishes the motive for the murder, then. Yeah, the killer undoubtedly knew that Scott was carrying some jewelry to deliver to someone here in the city. Uh, how about checking those two names that were in the book from here in town? Oh, I just finished talking to them. Huh? They both admitted knowing Scott, but denied that they were expecting him to bring anything to them. Mm-hmm. Scott was traveling with only one bag. I, I wonder where the rest of his stuff is. Oh, I called the Ritchie State Fairgrounds where Scott rode last week. They checked on that for me. Uh, what'd they find? Well, Scott ordinarily traveled with a man named Pop Campbell and his daughter Betty. Yeah, who are they? Campbell's what they call a gypsy around the racetracks. He owns two horses, trains them himself, hmm. and lives on whatever the horses win. I see. Now, Scott was his jockey. Ordinarily, the three of them travel together right with the horses. Well, this time, Scott came by train. I wonder why. I don't know, Bruce. But we can find that out easily enough. Let's go out to Whitman Park and talk to Pop Campbell. <laughs> Pretty interesting back here. I've never been behind the scenes at a racetrack. See those horses that are walking around? Yeah. They're cooling them off. They've already raced this afternoon. (laughs) Kind of like unwinding them? That's about it. Oh, that's stable 423 over there, Jim, where that girl is standing. Oh, yeah. Hello there. Hello. My name is Taylor. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. This is Special Agent Bedford. I'm Betty Campbell. How do you do? You're Pop Campbell's daughter? That's right. Is your father here? No, he's not. Uh, do you know where we might reach him? No, he went into town. I expect him back soon, though, if you want to stick around. Well? Is it about that man this morning? What man, Miss Campbell? The man who tried to steal something from the stable. 
No, no. As a matter of fact, we didn't know anything about that. We wanted to ask him a few questions about a jockey named Richard Scott. Uh, maybe you can help us, Miss Campbell. Sure, I'll try. I know Scotty pretty well. Is he in trouble? He was killed last night. What? I'm... I'm sorry to have to break the news to you this way. How did it happen? We don't know all the details yet ourselves, Miss Campbell. How can we help you, Mr. Taylor? Well, the first thing Mr. Bedford and I would like to do is take a look at that tack bag that Scotty shipped down here in your van. Sure. It's right inside that door. That's what the man who broke in was looking through, and we scared him away. Oh? Here you are, Mr. Taylor. The bag is... Well, what's the matter, Miss Campbell? The bag? Yes. It's gone. Is Scotty here? You, Pop Campbell? Yeah, that's right. I got his message asking me to come by here. Come on in. Thank you. He'll be with you in a minute. Tell him I'm in a hurry. I got to get back to the track. Hello, Pop. Hmm? I said hello. Hey, you're the man who was at the track this morning. Yeah, that's right. What do you do it here? I live here. But I got a message from Scotty to bring his tech bag here. Me and my partner here left that message for you. Oh, I get it. Well, I still ain't giving you this bag. We don't want it anymore. We've already gone through the bag, Pop. So you're the one who was at the stable this morning? Yeah. We didn't find what we wanted. That's why we had you come here. What were you looking for? Scotty had a package in that bag, and we think you know where it is. I never looked in Scotty's tack bag in my life. How would I know? Look, Pop, uh, take my advice, huh? You'd better tell us what we want to know. It'll work out nicer for you. How can I tell you what I don't know myself? Now, look, Pop, Johnny. Look. Let me handle this. Where's the package, Pop? I told you, I don't know. You're a liar. Let him get up by himself, Johnny. Maybe now he'll remember. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now an important message about social security, your social security. Do you know how to get the most out of it? Do you know what steps you should take to safeguard your rights? A great many people don't. That's why the Equitable Society offers all listeners to this program without charge a special service on social security consisting of three steps. First step, full information. When you have a question about Social Security, put it up to your Equitable Society representative. He knows the answer. For instance, you may be surprised to learn that a person doesn't have to be 65 to be eligible for benefits, or that your rights under Social Security may be worth from twelve to $18,000, depending on your age, salary, and other factors. Why be ill-informed or misinformed about such a valuable asset? Get all the facts. See your Equitable representative. Second step. An immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. In any account, there's always danger of mistakes being made, and some of them cannot be corrected after four years. To protect your rights, the Social Security Administration advises you to make regular checkups on your account. The simple way to do this is to get a special form from your equitable representative, a form approved by the Social Security Administration. This checkup is doubly important because after you've made it, you're ready to profit from the final step of this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no charge for this service, so see your Equitable Society representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, 
The Jewel-Laden Jockey. With a murder taking place every half hour, day and night, throughout the year, there are of necessity a variety of motives which lead to the crime. Some murders are committed because of an overwhelming desire for revenge, or a temporary emotional instability, or sheer unadulterated hatred of people. None of those murders can be condoned. But of the different classifications, the most socially reprehensible is the venal murder, the killing of a fellow man for profit, such as the murder in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Those murders are the most difficult to solve because they are usually committed by professional criminals who take pains to cover up their tracks. Sometimes they cover up so well that it seems for a while that they will be successful, as if they will escape without paying their just debt to society. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Bruce, we got a break on that Scott murder while you were on. Oh, good. What happened? The Chicago police picked up a jewel thief named Paul Harrison. Eric, how does he fit into this picture, Jim? Well, he was supposed to meet Scott yesterday at the railroad station in Chicago and give him some jewelry to bring here. Oh. But Harrison missed the train. And the Chicago police picked him up? Yeah, that's right. Now, Scott stayed on the train when he left the station, undoubtedly thinking that Harrison was aboard. Mm-hmm. Then, when he heard a knock on his compartment door, he probably opened it, thinking that it was Harrison. Yes, that sounds like what happened, Jim. Whoever it was who killed Scott certainly knew in advance he was supposed to be carrying those jewels. Yeah. Yeah, this was a double cross of some kind, I think. It was all the jewelry recovered with Harrison's arrest. Yes, every bit of it. But that doesn't end our job in this case, Bruce. Even though Scott was mixed up in crime, we've still got to find his killer. Pop. Pop. He's out, Al. He ain't gonna stay out. Give me that glass of water on the table. Yeah. Uh, come on, Pop. Come around. Uh, huh? Get with it, will you? Al, let me take over for a while, huh? Uh, okay. Pop. Pop, are you waking up now to hear me? Uh, yeah. Then listen to me, huh? I don't like to see Al keep hitting you. But we got to find out where that package is. I've told you, ask Scotty. He'll tell you he never gave me any package. We can't ask Scotty, Pop. He's dead. What? He had an accident on the train. What happened to him? Take one guess. Oh. Now, you wouldn't want the same thing to happen to you, would you? No, no. Now, look, Pop. You train horses for a living, right? Yeah. Okay, we do this for a living. You don't like your job to be any tougher than it has to be, so neither do we. Now, why don't you stop all this and tell us where the package is? I don't know. Why do you keep saying I don't know? Because cause it's true. Look, Johnny, let me start again. It's up to you, Pop. Do you want him to? How can I tell you what I don't know? Okay, I'll go to work again. <laughs> I just finished making a half a dozen phone calls trying to find some of Scott's close friends. Good. Maybe we can get a lead from one of them. Oh, Miss Campbell's on her way in here. Maybe she's got some news. What's she doing here? I don't know, Bruce. The receptionist just called in, asked if it was all right to send her in. I think we ought to go back to the track, Jim. Why? You got some kind of a lead out there? No, but maybe some of those jockeys can give us some dope on Scott, huh? Yeah. I don't seem to be able to locate anybody who knows much about him. May I well, if we... Mr. Taylor? Oh, yes, Miss Campbell, please. Oh, hello don't. there. Hi. Mr. Taylor... I think Pop's in trouble. Why? What's happened? Black World, one of our horses, was in the fourth race, and Pop didn't show up. Oh. After the race, I went looking for him. Does he always stay at the track during the races? Sure, when we have a horse running, he does. I looked all over for him, and finally, in the kitchen, where all the horse people eat, I got Pop's message. What message was that? He told the man behind the counter to tell me that he'd be back in time for the race. That was after we spoke to you, wasn't it? That's right. Well, he might have just been delayed someplace. I wouldn't be too concerned. But the counter man told me that Pop said he was going to meet Scotty. He what? You see? He didn't know that Scotty had been killed. 
Bruce, it sounds like a trap to get him into town. Yeah. Miss Campbell, do you have any idea where he might have gone when he left the trap? Yes, he got a lift with George Barrow. Who? He's a trainer. He's got a public stable. Oh, I see. And did uh, Barrow return to the track? Yes. I asked him where Pop was, and he said that he let him out at Main and 7th, and that Pop said he was going to catch a streetcar from there. Yeah, but Barrow didn't see what streetcar your father took, did he? No. Seems to me the first thing we've got to do is find out who we're looking for. Bruce, yeah. suppose you take Miss Campbell with you and go on down to police headquarters. Right. Well, what for, Mr. Taylor? Oh, Mr. Bedford will help you look through their file of pictures and see if you can pick out the man who came to see you. Uh, I'm going out to the track, Bruce. I'll meet the two of you out there. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Bruce. Where's Miss Campbell? She's pretty shaken, Jim, so I took her over to their van. She promised she'd try to get a little rest. No, I swear. She identified the man who came out here this morning. Oh, no, who is it? Al Edwards. Edwards, Edwards. I remember him, but I thought he was doing time. So did the police, but we checked, and he's out on parole. Oh. Another one of those, huh? Yeah. How did you make out? Well, I'm waiting now to talk to that counterman that Miss Campbell told us about. The one who knew Pop was going to meet Scully. Yeah, that's him. He's coming down to see me as soon as they can locate him. Bruce. Hmm? Miss Campbell made a positive identification on Edwards, didn't she? I mean, there's no chance of her being wrong. None at all, Jim. Miss Taylor? Yes, that's right. I'm the counterman that Pop Campbell talked to. Oh, good. Uh, did you hear him say where he was going by any chance? Oh, he said he was going to meet Scotty. Hmm? Where? Well, I think I heard him say uh, 7-Eleven, Wyoming. 7-Eleven, Wyoming. Yeah, I remember the number because it's so easy. Yeah, well, you wouldn't remember whether that was Wyoming Avenue or Wyoming Street, would you? No, sir, that's that's all I remember. There's also a Wyoming place up on the north side, Jim. Well, that's right, there is. The well, only thing we can do is check all three. Oh, thanks very much, sir. You're welcome. Come on, Bruce, let's go. Well, check this one off, Bruce. No luck, huh? No, Dr. Logan lives in this house. Suppose we try 7-Eleven Wyoming Street now. That's right in the neighborhood, isn't it? That's right. Okay, let's go. Wyoming Street isn't the answer either, Bruce. Who lives in this house? Twenty women. It's a girls' boarding house. Well, that doesn't leave us much choice. That's right. Wyoming Place is the only other possibility. Come on. Bruce, this can't be the right place either. It's a minister's home. Well, it's not Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, or Wyoming Place. But it has to be an address, doesn't it, Jim? Yes, I should think so. Hey, wait a minute, Bruce. Why didn't we think of this before? Head back into town. <laughs> Suppose I should bring the old guy around again, Johnny? Oh, just let him stay where he is. But he can't tell us nothing while he's out. I don't think he knows, Al. I think he's leveling with us. If he knew, he'd have talked by now. You mean we did all this for nothing? Well, well, that's the way it goes. You win one, you lose one. I ain't win one in six months now. Don't let it get you down. We'll get lucky with something else. What do we do now? Blow? Not yet. Why not? We can't just walk out and leave the old guy the way he is. He won't come to for a couple of hours yet. But when he does, he goes right to the cops. So what? We'll be gone by then. I, uh, just as soon we had more start than that. Oh. I took the silencer off my gun. Put it back on. It's Jan. And forget the silencer. They'll hear it all over the hotel. In this trap, Al, it'll sound like sweet music. Uh, just look out in the hall. See if it's empty. Okay. Well, stay right where you are. Uh, Drop that gun, Edwards. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here. You better call the doctor, Bruce. Campbell looks like he's taking a bad beating. Okay, Jim. Well, we'll take these two downtown and put them. You got nothing on us? Nothing but the murder of Richard Scott. They're just guessing, Al. The porter on the train that Scott was killed on can identify both of you. When he does, you take another train ride. This time, the government will buy your tickets. <laughs> Edwards and his companion, Johnny Russell, were convicted in federal court for theft from interstate shipment. They were given long prison sentences, then turned over to a local court for prosecution for the murder of Richard Scott.
The idea which came to Special Agent Taylor after he and Agent Bedford had failed to locate the wanted criminals at Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, and Wyoming Place was that there was a Wyoming hotel and that 7-Eleven Wyoming could mean room 7-Eleven. When that proved to be correct, the case was closed. And thus, another murder was prevented by the quick, thorough work of your FBI. This case was opened and closed within a period of 15 hours, from 9 o'clock one morning to midnight that evening. Some cases work out that way. Others drag on, and the development of clues sometimes takes months and even years. But no matter how long a period elapses, your FBI stays on the job until a clerk in the records section takes a rubber stamp and marks the file. Marks it convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with the special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of this special service offered without charge by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A behind-the-scenes glimpse into the home life of a hold-up man. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Henpecked Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpeck Hijacker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial due in just 14 minutes to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, Operation Ransom. The 
motives which lie behind the more than one and a half million major crimes committed every year in this country are as varied as the types of crimes themselves. Some criminals engage in illegal activities because of the temptation for so-called easy money. Others commit crimes out of passion or because of a craving for revenge. But whatever the motive, every criminal believes that he will succeed without paying for his crime. He is sure that circumstances will conspire to make his capture impossible because, as he sees it, he has every advantage on his side. Not only must he be captured, but he must then be proven guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt. What he does not realize is that actually there are no advantages on his side, except for one. That single asset which always belongs to the criminal is the element of time. For he alone is the one who decides when the crime is to take place. He alone is the one who decides which is the proper moment for him to strike. Tonight's file opens near a bridle path on a large park in a Midwestern city. Two men are strolling along a gravel path. Take it easy, Harry. Hmm? Huh? Don't walk so fast. We're not going any further. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's a lovely spring morning, Harry. Mm-hmm. Man doesn't get enough of these. Yeah. Look around you, Harry. Isn't it glorious? George, we didn't come out to admire the scenery. I know, Harry. We've got work to do. You can still enjoy nature. Just look at that grass sprout. The tiny green buds of the trees. Why, a man... George, there she goes. I see her. Yeah, right on time again. She's been on time. It'll be day now for a week. So she has, Harry. Well, ain't it about time we made our move? We're not ready yet. What you've been saying all week. You ain't ready now, we'll never be. Harry, I've told you before, the success of any venture rests on the planning. We got plans. But we haven't insured them yet. When will that be? When we know everything there is to know about Alice Woods. Every habit she has, every friend she has, even every hat she wears. Those things take time, Harry, but they reduce the risk. That's the important thing. Mm, I know, I know. We'll be ready soon. When we are, the young lady will be kidnapped. days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor has just entered the office of Agent in Charge, Evans. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jim. Sit down. Thank you. Here's the name and address of a woman who just called me. I'd like you to go over and see her. All right, sir. This is Martha Woods, 720 North 50th Street, huh? Mrs. Woods said that her daughter is missing. How did she happen to call here? She called the local police and they suggested that she get in touch with us. Oh, I see. There's a suspicion of kidnapping, and that's why we're in it. Oh? Now, it may or uh, may not be the reason she's missing, but we're better off playing it safe and getting in at the start. I see, sir. Um, did Mrs. Woods tell you anything? Yeah, she said that she got a phone call from a girl named Rosemary Rice, who's a friend of her daughter's. Oh, what's her daughter's name? Alice Woods. Mm-hmm. Uh, the girlfriend said that she was riding a horse in the park this morning, some hundred yards or so behind Miss Woods, and she saw the missing girl stop and dismount. Where was that, sir? Near 53rd Street entrance to the park. She Mm -hmm. walked over to talk to a man who had called her while she was riding. Miss uh, Rice didn't recognize this man, did you? I don't know, Jim. At any rate, the man walked the girl over to a car that was parked at the roadside. There, they met another man, and the three of them spoke for a few seconds. I see. Then Miss Woods was forced into the car, and it drove off. Any description on the car? Yes, it is a 1947 Buick sedan, color black. Any license plate number? No, but it was an out-of-state license. Out-of-state. Go up and see if you can get a picture of Alice Woods from her mother. If you can, have some copies made. All right, sir. Uh, I'm also putting Bob Clinton on this case to work with you, Jim. Fine. As soon as you get back, we can have a meeting and decide which move to make first. Who's that? Me? Oh. Always everything. The young girl's asleep. I was just in there. Did she wake up at all? No. The pills really put her away. I wish I'd taken some. What do you mean? Well, I couldn't hear that music. What are they playing on? Washboards? <laughs> Harry, you just aren't a music lover. 
That's music. Customers think so. You ought to go downstairs and see the business that joins to No, 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 thanks. Bad enough up here. I just sent the note to Jocko. Oh? What'd you ask for? 25000 I wonder if he'll go for it. Got to. This is his daughter. He loves the kid. $25,000 is a lot of moolah. Not to Jocko. I say, suppose he goes to the cops. Harry, bookmaker can't go to the cops. That's why we picked the guy. Uh-huh. That's one of the things I was trying to explain to you when I told you about calculated risk. Uh, I, I know. I remember. Now, what's our next move? Well, we wait for Jocko to answer the note with the ad in the paper. Then we tell him where to plant the dough. Now, how long do you figure that'll be? If all goes well, about another day. How many times a day do they play that music down there? From nine to closing, about six hours. Uh, I'll just about make it. <laughs> Yes, Jim. I got Alice Wood's photograph from the mother. Good. Have you ordered any copies? Yes, sir. Oh, I found out something about the girl that might give us the motive for the kidnapping. What's that, Jim? Her father is Jocko Morgan. The bookmaker? That's right, sir. How'd you find that out? Well, Mrs. Woods told me that she'd received a phone call from her ex-husband. He said that he'd gotten a ransom note and wanted to know whether or not the girl really had been kidnapped. And Jocko Morgan is her ex-husband? That's it, sir. They've been divorced for 15 years, and Mrs. Woods has resumed her maiden name. Oh, incidentally, she told me that her daughter believes that her father is dead. Have you been to see Morgan? Yes, sir. I went over to his apartment. Did he give you the note? No, not at first. In fact, he denied any knowledge of it. He was probably going to pay the money and not say anything to the police. I imagine so, yes. But he finally agreed to talk about it. In fact, he wound up begging us to help him find his daughter. That's a bit ironical. A man like Morgan asking the law to help him. Yes, isn't it? Well, we have to give the same cooperation we to any other citizen? I realize that, sir. So I advised Morgan to follow the kidnapper's instructions and place the ad in tomorrow morning's papers. Where's the ransom note? I have it right here, sir. Uh, send it down to the lab for a check against the paper and typewriting standards. All right, sir. Mr. Evans. Oh, come in, Bob. Yes, sir. Hello, Jim. Hi, Bob. I uh, just interviewed the Rice girl, sir. Alice Wood's girlfriend? Yes, sir. She told me she could recognize one of the men if she saw him again. Did she describe him to you? Oh, no, not very well. But I'm going to meet her tomorrow morning at police headquarters and have her go over some pictures for us. Uh, Jim. Sir. You take Bob out to your desk and bring him up to date on the new elements in this case. And when you're finished, check back here with me. Sleep, didn't you? Where am I? In a room. I mean, where? What is this place? It's a building. I want to go home. I don't blame you. Why are you keeping me here? It's a matter of money. What do you mean? We're holding you here till your old man pays off. My father? Yeah, that's right. But my father's dead. Since when? He died when I was a little girl. Oh, <laughs> had me scared for a minute. <laughs> so you won't be collecting from him? Oh, yes, we will. How? He ain't dead. What? I just seen him last week. My, my father? Yes, your old man is Jocko Morgan. What? The biggest bookmaker in town. But if you think he's dead, you can get three to one from him personally that he ain't. You're, you're lying. Well, now, look, I can prove it to you. <laughs> hey, who's that? I'll be right with you. But wait a minute. See you later. The girl awake? Yeah. Wake and crying. What's she crying about? I don't know. I just told her old man was a bookmaker and she bust into tears. <laughs> sure wouldn't make me cry if my old man was a bookmaker. Yeah, look at this. What is it? Jocko ran the ad, see it? Oh, yeah. Huh. When do we get the door? You go in for it tonight. Well, come in, Jim. Well, the ransom money has been planted. Good. We went to the vacant lot where it was supposed to be left. Morgan put the package beside the big rock with a white cross on it. Clinton stayed up there? Yes, sir, he did. He has a good vantage point. He'll call in just as soon as the money is picked up. Fine. Oh, did uh, anything come back from the lab on that ransom note, sir? 
Yes, but it wasn't much help. Hmm? The paper is a cheap, common brand, and the typing was done in a typewriter without too many distinguishing marks. Uh, pardon me, Jim. Certainly. Evans talking. Hello, sir. This is Clinton. Yes, Bob. What have you got? The money was just picked up. Who is it? Nobody tells you. Nope, nope. Nobody tells me. The last five miles, I was the only car on the road. Uh, want me to help you? How? Count the money. I can do it. <laughs> All that green stuff. And it's real. And it's ours. Uh, it's beautiful, beautiful. Now, all we got to do is return the girl and the job's over. Well, I forgot to tell you, we're not returning them. Really? Why not? Well, I had a talk with her. It seems she's not willing just to go home and forget all about this. Oh, she says she's going to the police and tell them that we did the job. She don't know who we are. No, she knows what we look like. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, uh, what are we going to do with it? You're going to take her partway back to town to the Smith Park Bridge. Then what? Then you get rid of her. Oh, now, look, Harry, I... all I said in the note was that when we got the money, we'd release her. Well, when you get to the bridge, release her into the river. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now a timely announcement on social security. Equitable Life Assurance Society surveys indicate that most people know little about their rights under social security. To correct this situation, the Equitable Society offers listeners a special service consisting of three steps. First step, full information. Your Equitable Society representative is an expert on social security. He's qualified to answer such puzzling questions as... Suppose a widow waits three years after her husband's death before making a claim for Social Security. Can she collect all the back payments she might have received? The answer is no. Your equitable representative will explain why. Does a man automatically start to receive Social Security benefits on his 65th birthday? Again, the answer is no. Your equitable representative will explain why. The second step in this equitable service is an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. Since some errors cannot be corrected after four years, the Social Security Administration advises you to protect yourself by checking up regularly. Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and show you what to do with it. Then you're ready for the final step. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no obligation whatsoever. So, see your Equitable Society representative. Or... Right care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Operation Ransom. Those who have made the field of crime their life work, who study constantly in an effort to understand the mind of the criminal and the forces which impel him to break the law, have agreed that there is no common prototype among the seven and a half million persons with arrest records in the United States. Some dress well, some dress badly. Some are well educated, some are totally unschooled. Some are tall, some are short. The various discrepancies between any two criminals can be as wide as those between any two law-abiding citizens. And yet, they do have their common bond, 
The things which make every criminal kin to every other criminal. One of those things, and this applies to those who commit crimes against property or crimes against the person, is that he is insulated against any feeling of compassion for his fellow man. To him, to the true criminal, the world exists so that he may live. And the easier that living comes, the better he likes it. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. What time is it, Jim? I have, uh, 12.23, sir. So have I. I thought my watch that... I hope nothing has gone wrong. So do I, Jim. The girls should have been released by now unless they've been holding her an awful long way from town. Yes, I know. How long do you think we ought to wait, sir, before we start searching? If we don't hear anything by one o'clock, we'll go into action. Have we got the serial numbers on the bills that Morgan used to pay the ransom with? Yes, the stenographic section is making copies of the list now. As soon as it's prepared, we'll start printing the ransom list for distribution. Yes, sir. At one o'clock, we'll send a copy to each of the newspapers... Has been to print it. You know, it's too bad we can't mark the money in cases like this. Yes, it is, but we don't dare gamble with the victim's life. I know, sir. Mr. Evans, can I come in? Uh, yes, Bob, what have you got? Alice Woods has been found. Where? When? She ran up to the toll gate at the Smith Park Bridge a few minutes ago. Is she all right, Bob? Well, she was exhausted and suffering from shock. Where's she now? At the Memorial Hospital, sir. Jim, you and Bob get over there at once. <laughs> What are you calling up for? We uh, got trouble, George. Why? What happened? Well, I, I broke the bricks, like you said. Yeah? And I, I, I stopped the car and opened the back door. Go on. When I, when I opened the door, she ran out the other side of the car. Well, how could she do that? She was tied up, wasn't well, she? Yeah, but I, I guess she must have worked herself loose. Well, did you catch her? No. No, I couldn't. Why? Hey, it was dark. She got away. You stupid fool. I planned everything well, perfectly. I'm sorry, George. A lot of good that'll do us. There's no telling how much she knows about where she was being held. She could lead the cops right back here. No, 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 she can't. Uh, she was still blindfolded just before I stopped her. George, what should I do now? Come on back here as fast as you can. Miss Wood, do you feel up to talking about your experience now? Yes, Mr. Taylor. I'll tell you whatever I can remember. That's fine, thanks. Now, first, we'd like to know how the kidnappers approached you. Well, I was riding in the park when a man standing on the side of the bridle path called after me. Did he know your name, Miss Woods? Yes, Mr. Clinton, he did. That's why I stopped. I see. I rode back to where he was standing and said that I had to come with him right away. My mother had been in a serious accident. He didn't say where, did he? No, sir, he didn't. Well, what happened then? I dismounted and... The man led me to a car. When I got there, I saw another man. This uh, second man, was he behind the driver's wheel? Yes, that's right. I asked what kind of an accident Mother had had. The man said she'd been driving her car down Oak Avenue and hit by a truck. Mm, I see. Go on. I knew then that they were lying to me because Mother doesn't drive. I started to scream, but the man who called me clapped his hand over my mouth and threw me into the car. And that's when they drove away with you? Yes, sir. Uh, what did they do once they had you in the car, Miss Woods? The man in back with me blindfolded me and put a gag in my mouth. Then he covered me with a blanket. Uh-huh, I see. And did both men drive you back to the Smith Park Bridge tonight? No, sir, only one of them. That's how I was able to escape. I heard them planning to kill me, so when I got in the car, I used all my strength and finally I got my hands loose. Were you gagged and blindfolded on the return trip, too? Yes, sir, until I got my hands loose and... That wasn't until just before we got to the cliff, by the bridge. Mm. Miss Wood, you don't know where you were held, do you? No, sir. I haven't the faintest idea. Well, is there anything you can tell us about the ride after you got in the car in the park? Did you hear any odd sounds or any conversation between the men? Well, let me think. Sure. Oh, a, a little while after we started, one of the men asked the other one for a quarter for the bridge. It must be the Smith Park Bridge at all there's a quarter for mm-hmm. Miss Woods, would you know which way you turned when you got off the bridge? No, I don't. But 
But I remember after we rode a while, I heard some planes warming up, as if they were about to take off. You were sure they weren't flying above you? Oh, no, sir. I've done some flying, and I can tell the difference. Good. Now, is there anything else? Oh, yes. A little bit after that, we went past what sounded like a waterfall. A waterfall? Yes. Jim, there there are no waterfalls in this section. That's what it sounded like to me, Mr. Clinton. I'm sorry. Please go on. Well, let's see. We rode for a little while more, and and then we got on a bumpy road. Do you remember which way you turned to get onto this bumpy road? I don't remember turning. Oh, We only went a very short way on it, though, before we stopped. and I was carried into a building and taken upstairs. Still blindfolded? Yes. Now, did you hear anything in this building? Well, not then, but but later on, after they fed me my dinner, I heard some music. Do you remember where it came from, Miss Woods? It seemed to come from underneath where I was. First, I thought it was just a radio, but they played so badly, I decided it was real music. Miss Woods, can you describe these two men to us? Yes, surely. Good. Suppose you start right now. Uh, yes, Jim. Alice Woods identified the two pictures I brought her as the men who kidnapped her. Oh, good. Who are they? One of them is uh, George Payne. The other is Harry Rollins. Here's some copies of the pictures. Oh, fine. Now our job is to find out where they took the girl. Oh, I picked up that map you wanted. Swell. That's it? Mm-hmm. Now, here's where the trip started. Uh-huh. And this is the exit they used to leave the park. Right. Then they went up the drive to the Smith Park Bridge. Yeah. Now... The problem is, which way did they turn when they got off the bridge? Oh, well, we know they went past an airport mm-hmm. very soon after they left the bridge. Uh, look, there's Hurley Field. Right. They'd have gone by that if they turned left. But Jim, if they turned right, they'd have gone by Western Airport. Oh, yeah. So they could have gone either way. Yeah, that's right. Now, the next thing Miss Woods remembered was that waterfall. That's a real baffler. I know that section. There is no waterfall. The only... Bob, I know what it was. What? It was the Barrel Point Dam. I remember seeing a story in the paper this week that they opened the sluice gates on the dam because the water got too high. Well, then they must have turned right off the bridge. Check. And the next thing is that bumpy road. If we find that, we can find out where she was held. Let's see. She said they only went a short way on it. Mm-hmm. Bob, I know that highway. There are no side roads on it. And I drove it last summer. It's as smooth as glass. I should... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Got an idea, Bob. Let's get to a phone. <laughs> Sorry, didn't I? It doesn't make up for your mistake. There was nothing I could do. You could have seen to it that she didn't get away. You need brains in this business, Harry. I've and Look, told you... George, I know how smart you are, but I'm kind of tired of hearing about it. Suppose you give me my money and we'll call it quits, huh? What money? My cut. You better forget that. Huh? You're not getting anything. That's a joke I ain't laughing. I'm dead serious. George, you can't do this to me. Harry, I have a gun here that permits me to do anything. No. <laughs> Who's that? All right, step back. Hey, hey what you. do you say? The FBI. You let him tell you back here. No, he didn't. All right, come on, you two. Yeah, but we did... We're not going to blindfold you like you blindfolded Miss Woods. Now, we're going to let you see where you're going. And I have a hunch you'll recognize the jail when we get there. <laughs> George Payne and Harry Rollins were tried, convicted, and sentenced to serve 50-year terms in a federal prison for kidnapping. Your FBI was led to the roadhouse where Miss Woods had been held captive because every clue, no matter how slim it appeared, was followed to its conclusion. One of those clues was that Miss Woods remembered that she had been driven by the kidnappers over a bumpy road and that the car had stopped shortly afterwards. A check with the State Highway Commission showed that there was a part of the highway under repair, but open to traffic. The roadhouse was situated beside that section of the highway. And so your FBI was able to close another file, to close it the way almost every kidnapping file has been closed, with the word convicted stamped across it. In just a 
a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a quick review of the three-point Social Security service offered by your Equitable Society representative. First, it gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position. Third, he shows you how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Take advantage of this special service offered without charge by your Equitable Representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of the operation of a stolen car ring. Its subject, Interstate Theft. Its title, The Unwilling Partner. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The unwilling partner on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, you in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Unwilling Partner. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, today made available the latest figures on America's current crime wave. This study contains the newest facts known to your FBI about the substance and the quantity of crimes committed in the United States in the past 12 months. The truly shocking news about the war against crime is that instead of progress, it must be reported more persons were arrested in the past year than in any other year on record. The arrests of men increased 14%, and the arrests of women rose almost 10%. Nowhere in the land is there a community which does not know crime. And in very few places is any ground being gained in the constant battle against our army of criminals. A battle which must be won and won soon, unless we wish to leave the generations which follow a heritage of lawlessness. Tonight's file opens at the spring training camp of a minor league baseball team in a Midwestern town. It is early afternoon, and scattered around the ballpark are several dozen players. Some of them are shagging flies in the outfield, some are having pepper practice, and a few of the pitchers, like Red Martin, are warming up with a catcher. Say, 
Take it easy, Red. Still three weeks to opening day. I know. I just felt like cutting loose. You don't have to prove anything. Just get in shape and you'll work the opening. Okay. Quit in a little while. Take a shower. Thanks. Just a couple more, huh, Charlie? Hello, Red. Hi, son. Can I have your autograph in this ball, Red? Sure, kid. As soon as I finish working. Well, no, sir. We just made up a Red Martin club. Did you? Yeah. We're going to come out and see you every time you pick. How many of you in the club? Four of us so far. I'm the president. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you some passes for the opening game, huh? Honor? Oh, sure. What's your name? Herbie Jackson. Okay, Herbie. They'll be at the pass gate. Gee, thanks, Red. Forget it. Okay, Charlie, that's all for me. See you later, Herbie. I'm going to take a shower. Okay. Huh? Red, I want to see you a minute. Don't you remember me? Vince Green. Oh, yeah. You were a friend of Joe Jenkins. Yeah, that's right. Met you in St. Louis. Uh-huh. Been a lot of places since then. What are you doing here? I came to see you. About what? Business proposition, Red. I got a business, Vince. I'm a ball player. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't going to be a ball player all your life. This is a chance for you to hook into something nice. I'm busy, Vince. I got to get in and take a shower before I cool off. Well, look, why don't you meet me after you get through with your shower? I'll wait for you outside the clubhouse, huh? Is that you, Red? Mm-hmm. Well, where have you been this long? At the ballpark. Until 7 o'clock? Yeah. Red, you knew I was going to have dinner ready early. Honey, I'm sorry. I met some guy who wanted to talk to me. That's why I'm late. Oh. Well, who was he? A guy named Vince Green. Do I know him? No. He was a friend of Joe Jenkins. I met him when I used to room with Joe. Oh. Whenever the ball club got to Joe's hometown, this guy used to throw a party for us. Mm-hmm. Well, what's he doing here? Now he wants to go in business with me. What kind of a business? Use car lot, using my name on it. What do you put up? Nothing. What do you get out of it? Well, he wants to give me 25% of the business. Oh. Well, that sounds wonderful, honey. I told him I wasn't interested. What? I turned the deal down. Are you out of your mind? I don't like it. Well, why not? Helen, why should he cut me in like that? Because you're a big name in this town, that's why. This is a good move on his part. And it would be a good move for you. I don't know, honey. Well, I do. You call him up right now and tell him you've thought it over and you want to take up his proposition. But, Helen... Look... Do you think I want to go on for the rest of my life worrying about whether you'll get a sore arm or whether some kid is going to get a lucky base hit off you and win a ball game? This way, you're in business. If your arm goes bad, the business keeps going. Don't you understand? Okay, I'll call him after dinner. I'm here in the shack, Vince. Oh. <laughs> Sign looks good. Yeah. Any sales today? Three sedans and a convertible. Not bad. We're open a week and that makes 38 customers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that Red Martin's name really hustles business. I told you it would. You only got six cars left? I want to call Pete. Tell him to send down another shipment. Well, okay. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, Red was in here this morning. What do you want? Well, you just wanted to see how things were going. He asked me where we got all the cars. What'd you tell him? They said we had contacts back east that bought the cars for us and shipped here. Good. We'll pull out if he ever knows those cars are hot. Well, what would his beef be? Yeah, the poor sucker happens to be honest. Yeah, but he gets 25% of all this. For nothing. For your information, he only gets 25% of the profit. Well, even that runs into a real good chunk. George... With me keeping the books, there is no profit. In a nearby city, a combination warehouse and garage is on fire. It is a three-alarm blaze. FBI Special Agent Taylor is standing just inside the fire line. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Randy. Sorry I had to call you at this hour of the night. That's all right. 
I've just been watching a lot of evidence being burned up in there. Evidence on what? You know that list of stolen cars we were working on down at the office? Uh-huh. Well, when this fire broke out, the fireman went into this garage and discovered a secret wall in the back. That's where the fire started. I see. Part of the wall worked on an electric switch. You pressed a certain button, that part of the wall swung out, and you could drive a car through. You do a concealed part of the garage? That's it. That's what they used to fix up the stolen cars and paint them. As a matter of fact, it was the paint that made this blaze spread so fast. How'd you find all that out, Jim? Well, when the firemen first discovered the secret wall, they found a car back there and drove it out. That's it, parked down there, down the street. Uh, the gray convertible? Yeah, that's right. I guess the gang didn't have time to change the motor number on it because it hadn't been filed off as yet. Uh, it's one of the cars on our list? That's right. Has anybody been caught, Jim? Any of the people from the garage, I mean? Yeah, the night manager is down at headquarters now. And there was a body farm, but so far it's been unidentified. I see. You know, Randy, this could be the break we've been looking for in this used car rent. I know. Well, we'll know more as soon as we can examine this place. How soon do you think that'll be? About an hour from what the fire chief told me. Randy, look, why don't you stay here and go through the place as soon as you can? Huh? All right. You going back to the office? No, I'm going down to headquarters and see that night manager. Find out how much he knows. You home, Red? In the living room. Well, I, I didn't see any lights on. Well, why are you sitting here in the dark? I've been thinking. Well, suppose you try thinking with the lights on. Okay. What's the matter with you? When I got home here this afternoon, there was a letter for me. Who from? Joe Jenkins. Well, what do you want? I wrote to him about this new partner of mine, Vince Green. Well? Joe says in his letter that Green is no good. But he once tried to get Joe to throw a ball game for him so he could win a bet. Joe never reported it because he couldn't prove it. Oh, well, honey, that that might be just a story. You know the way Joe used to make up things. Oh, it ain't a story. Joe also says he checked on Green after that. Found he was mixed up in a lot of rackets. Oh. I told you I never liked this deal, Helen. Right from the very beginning. Now I'm going to get out of it. Red, wait. Find more out about him first. Oh, I know enough right now. But what about the money you're making? Helen, for all we know, those cars may even be stolen. I don't want that kind of money. But, Red... I'm going down to see Green and call off this whole deal. Well, Jim, that fire finally cooled down enough for us to explore the ruins. Get anything, Randy? Yes, I found evidence that an outfit called the A&B Trucking Company has hauled a shipment of automobiles for them. Well, they're a legitimate outfit, aren't they? I know. I called them to see where they'd ship the cars. They're checking it. We should hear from them any minute now. Oh, fine. Uh, what did you get from that night manager? Plenty. He told me there were three accomplices. Police picked them all up, questioned them. They all claimed they'd never seen the man who ran the business. Who gave them their orders? A man named Tom Chase. At least he paid them. He was the only one who dealt directly with the boss. It seems this boss traveled around quite a bit, setting up used car lots in different cities. Did you find out where to pick this Tom Chase up? He was the unidentified body in the garage. Oh, fine. The only one who can lead us. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, yes. Yes. Just a moment, please, while I copy that down. Okay, go ahead. 4418. Main Street. Bay City. Got it. Yes, thanks very much. Bye. That was the A&B Trucking Company, Randy. Is that the address they shipped those cars to? Yes. I think the best thing to do is call the Bay City Police. This might tie in with something they're working on. George, I got some bad news. What? The garage burned down last night. The whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Tommy burned to death and the others got nailed by the cops. Hey, that ain't good. This could be real trouble. Especially if anybody talks. Well, they don't know much. They know enough to make it hot. What are we going to do? Low. What, 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 what? Leave this? This is a gold mine. There'll be others. How many cars we got left? Two? Close our bank account this afternoon. Get all our dough right here in my kick. Good. Now, look, as soon as we get organized... We'll... Who's that? Hello, fellas. Hello. 
Hi, you Red. What brings you around? I had to see you right away. Well, what about? I got a letter from Joe Jenkins this afternoon. Oh. How is Joe? He told me some things about you. Things I didn't like. What is this? He said you tried to get him to throw a ball game once, Vince. But you're a racket guy. Joe said that about me? Yeah. I don't want to be mixed up with anyone like that. You want to quit, is that it? Yeah. Okay, we quit. You mean it? Sure, I mean it. All right. How many cars have you sold here so far? Oh, I don't know. How many, George? Forty-six. Why? I want the names of the people who bought them. What for? I want to call them. Check the motor numbers on their cars. Now, what's the idea then? I want to make sure that none of those cars were stolen. Wait a minute. Let me have those names. We ain't got them. What? Well, we lost them. Don't give me that. Look, Red. My advice to you is to forget all about this. Oh, no. I've got a reputation in this town. Oh! Him and his reputation. You think we didn't have one ourselves? <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now a word about social security. Mr. Williams, I understand you have a question. Oh, yes, Mr. Keating, I have. When I get to be 65 and start collecting social security benefits, can I take a part-time job? I'd be pretty well fixed if I could do that. But probably not, Mr. Williams. If you worked in covered employment and earned more than $14.99 per month, you wouldn't get anything from Social Security. Before you make any further plans, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Ask him about the Equitable Society's three-step service on Social Security. The first step is full information. The answers to how Social Security applies to you personally. I see. What's the second step? An immediate checkup on your position under Social Security to make sure all the money you've paid in is properly credited to your account. Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and will show you what to do with it. This checkup makes possible the last step in this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. What is that? After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no charge for this service, no obligation whatsoever. So, see your Equitable Society representative immediately, or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I, T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Unwilling Partner. You rarely see an item in your newspaper or hear a story on a radio newscast about a stolen automobile. Because the value of any single car is not likely to be large enough to make it newsworthy. However, it is newsworthy when you learn that many of those cars which are stolen all over the nation find their way into a pool which filters them to various exchanges throughout the country where they are altered in every respect and then resold. Those exchanges are big business today when the supply of automobiles is still seriously short of the demand. To give you some idea of how big those centers are, it is necessary only to tell you that in the last year, more than $61 million worth of cars have been stolen. That is more than $5 million worth every month. And the truly solemn fact about those figures is that they are increasing. The next file continues at the local FBI field office. Randy, I've just come in to see the boss. About this used car ring? Yes, I told him what had happened so far, and he agreed that we might be getting pretty close to the core of it. 
He said that we were to work on this case exclusively for the next few days. Well, that's fine. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Chief. You have? Mm-hmm. Closed down, huh? Yeah, I remember him. Oh, I see. All right, thanks, Chief. But... Yes. Yes, we will. Yeah. Why? I was the chief of police on a Bay City, Randy. Did he check that used car lot already? Yes, it was being run by three men. One of them, who seemed to be the boss, was Vince Green. Well, I know Green, Jim. He could be the boss of that whole operation. Yeah. The second one was a George Damon, and the third man was the one in whose name the lot was operated. Red Martin, a ball player. Red Martin? Mm-hmm. I saw him pitch a two-hitter a couple of years ago, Jim. I met him after the game. Oh. He didn't seem to be that kind who'd get mixed up in this sort of racket. Huh? Well, the lot was deserted when the chief checked. There were no cars there, and everybody had vanished. Did he know where they all lived? Yes, Green and Damon lived at a hotel. They'd already checked out. Green had also withdrawn all his money from the Bay City Bank. How about Red Martin? Well, his wife claims that she hadn't seen him since early evening. Randy, I think we ought to get down to Bay City right away. This is pretty good heat. Glad we didn't sell it. You know, it'd have been funny if we had to go out and buy a car from some legit. Times ain't never gonna get that tough. Ever taken this highway before? Uh, not that I know of, why? Whenever I ride on it, it makes me feel kind of funny. What for? Remember Chick Patterson? Yeah. He's part of it. I don't get it. Chick got in trouble when they were building this thing. North Side Mob took him for a ride, put him in one of those road mixes. Oh. Tell me about the new garage. I bought it about a year ago. I had a lot of cash and looked like good investment. Is it laid out good for you? Yeah. We can set up a phony wall just like any other place. Swell. Hey, Chick Patterson is getting kind of bumpy. <laughs> Outside. Oh, fine, Randy. Ask her to come in, will you? Sure. Uh, please come in. Thank you. This is Special Agent Taylor, Mrs. Martin. Well, how do you do, Mr. Taylor? Hello, Mrs. Martin. Won't you sit down, please? Thank you. Uh, Jim, I'm going in to talk with the chief of police. Right, Randy. See you later. Mr. Taylor, have you heard anything about my husband? No, not yet. We've got an alarm out on his car, and that's about all we can do at the moment. You're sure you have no idea where he is? No. No, but I- I'm certain he's not hiding from the police. He's looking for those two men. Well, Mr. Martin, tell me, what made him go into a deal like this in the first place? Well, I, I'm afraid I, I made him do it. Hmm. I, I wanted things he couldn't afford to buy me anymore. So this chance to get some money, so, so I made him take it. I see. You said over the telephone before that he decided last night that he didn't want to be in business with them any longer. Yes, yes, that's right, Mr. Taylor. He got a letter from a man who used to be his roommate. The letter said that Vince Green was a crook. And your husband told you that he was going down to the used car lot and break up the partnership. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Taylor, Red is an honest man. Oh, he he may not be young anymore and he may not be able to pitch as good, but, but he's still dead honest. Mrs. Martin, he didn't phone you or get in touch with you in any way after he left the house, did he? No, no, he didn't. Uh, pardon me, Jim, but we may have a break. About my husband? What is it, Randy? A youngster in one of the city schools went to his teacher and told her that he saw Red Martin last night at the used car lot. I told you he went there. Where's the youngster now? He's on his way over here. Oh, good. Well, Mrs. Martin. Yes? You may go home now, and as soon as we have anything, we'll call you. Jim, you want to see him now? Yes, Randy, please. All right, Herbie, come on in. Jim, this is Herbie Jackson. Hello, Herbie. My name is Jim Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Herbie, I understand that you uh, saw Mr. Martin last night. Yeah. 
I'm president of the Red Martin Band Club. Oh? And I went over to get his autograph for a new member. I see. Uh, what time was that, Herbie? It was right after my dinner. About half past eight. I see. And he was there when you got to the lot? Yes, sir. He was on the floor hurt. What? He was hurt bad. How do you know that, Herbie? His head was bleeding. Was he conscious? Oh, yes. He spoke to me. What did he say, Herbie? He told me he got beaten up by his partner. Did he tell you where he was going? Yes. He was going after his partners. He wanted to catch them. And he said he knew where they went. Well, did he mention any city to you? No, sir, he didn't. You sure? No, sir. I know he didn't. I remember if he did. Well, tell me, Herbie, did he say anything else to you? Yes. He said for me not to worry, that he wouldn't get in any trouble. I wonder why he was so sure of that. He said because he had a lot of relatives at one place he was going. A lot of his relatives? Yes, sir. He said it was always a cousin town for him. Uh, Jim, let's get hold of Mrs. Martin and see where his cousins live. I don't think we have to do that, Randy. Let's call the office of the ball club. I think they'll be more help. <laughs> This is a real good layout. Yeah. We got room for two paint shops here. We can turn out a car every day. I talked to some boys in the east this morning. Oh? They said if we pay cash, we can have as many hots as we want. How much cash? Yard and a half a car. Delivered? Yeah. Well, that ain't bad. Oh, it should be a big help. Huh? That should give you enough to open up another lot. Ah. Look who's here. Honest Red. That's right. What are you doing here? What do you think? How'd you know we were here? You got a call last night at the shack, just after I came to. It was one of your stooges. He said he was expecting you up here to a garage. Took me a little time to find the right one. You're a sucker for punishment, ain't you? What do you mean? Coming back for another treatment? I came to get the money you stole from my friend. That ain't what you're gonna get. George, let's continue this in the back room, huh? We'll talk right here. I got a gun here, chum. Let's do it our way. Oh, let's do it our uh, way. Huh? Drop that gun. Go on. Jim, Jim. Come on, you two. I'm Who are you? Oh, no, wait a minute. The FBI. You better get home and get some rest, Red. Old town will be out to see you pitch that opening game. Everybody except those two. I got a hunch they're going to be tied up elsewhere. <laughs> Vince Green and George Damon were tried, convicted, and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for a violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. The word cousins is a baseball expression meaning an opponent who is easy to defeat. And a check at the baseball team's office showed which club had never beaten Red Martin. On the same phone call, Special Agent Taylor learned the name of the hotel at which the ball club stopped when they visited that city. It proved a simple matter to learn that Martin had checked in at the hotel and to trail him until he led the two agents to the men who had attacked him. Men who were engaged in operating a stolen car ring and a string of used car lots. The fact that these men were thieves and in the used car business is not a reflection on this business as a whole. The overwhelming majority of used car dealers are capable, honest businessmen. The only important thing for you, the law-abiding citizen, to remember is to check on every stranger with whom you do business. In that way, you protect yourself and you do your part in fighting America's incessant battle, the war against crime. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point Social Security service offered by your Equitable Society representative. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position. Third, He shows you how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Take advantage of the special service offered without charge by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, in addition to presenting another dramatic case, you will hear J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation 
with a message of importance to all of you. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Runaway Racketeers on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Later on in tonight's program, it will be our pleasure to present Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Are you covered by Social Security? Then would it surprise you to know that your rights under Social Security can be equivalent to twelve, fifteen, even eighteen thousand dollars, depending on your age, salary, and family situation? Rights worth that much are worth knowing about, worth safeguarding. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial due in just fourteen minutes to information on Social Security. Information which may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Racketeers. There are many serious problems facing every law enforcement agency today. But perhaps the most important one is juvenile delinquency. Because unless that problem is at least partially solved, there is no hope that the crime wave will recede. If the juvenile delinquency problem is attacked intelligently, then the constant flow of recruits to the army of criminals will be impeded. And then progress can be made in stifling the activities of our adult criminals. Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, will speak to you later in the program about this matter of vital concern to every one of you, whether you are a parent or not. It has been a mistake made by many people in the past that juvenile delinquency was no concern of theirs if they themselves did not have children whose lives they might guide. Nothing could be further from the truth. The problem that confronts your FBI and every other law enforcement agency in the nation also concerns you. Tonight's file opens late one afternoon on the edge of a river which flows through a large eastern city. A boy is walking along a dock that juts into the stream. He nears a group of youngsters who are swimming below. Hey, Finny! Oh, hey, swim over the ladder, will you? Come on up. I want to talk to you. What do you want? Well, I ain't going to yell down there. Come on up. Okay. What's in your mind, Rico? Hey, come on over here. Okay. Hey, throw me Eddie's shirt, will you? I want to wipe off. Okay. Get another butt? Mm, sure. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Where'd you get a full pack? I bought it. And that ain't all I can buy. With what? With this. Hey, how much you got there? Twenty-five bucks, and it's mine. 
Where'd you get it? Yeah, me and Charlie did a job. What'd you do, roll a drunk? Nah. Roll a stick-up? I figured out something that's better than a stick-up. Now I can't work it no more. Why not? Eh, yeah, Charlie got sick. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He's in a hospital. That's what I want to talk to you. Why? I want to work the same thing over again. I need another guy. You want to work with me? Yeah. What kind of a job is it? Chris, you tell me if you're in or not, huh? Do I get that kind of dough? Hmm, maybe more. Charlie gonna be sore at me? I told you, it's my idea. I'll take care of it, Charlie. Okay, I'm in. Swell. Get your clothes and let's get back to the club. Right now? Yeah. We gotta find a doctor to call. What's the matter? You sick too? No, I ain't sick. That's part of the job. The first thing we gotta do is call a doctor. <laughs> Shouldn't the doc be here by now? He'll show. Is this the place you and Charlie use? Nah, you think I'm that stupid? Well, I was just asking. You sure you gave the doctor the right address? It's just like you told me. Okay, okay. Now look, when he rings the bell, you answer the door and look real sad. Okay. Let him in and remember, open the door real wide so we don't see me standing behind. I will. And I'll take care of the rest. Hope it works. It worked the other day with Charlie and me, didn't it? Yeah. Then um... quit worrying as long as... That's him now. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Fulton? That's right, son. My mother's in that room there. Thank you. Okay, Vinny, let's roll him and get out of here. Next morning in the gymnasium of the local boys' club, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is visiting an old friend. All right, now, Rick, watch your man there. Play heads up ball, Red. You watch your man. Oh, Paul. Right. Hey, Paul. Oh, hi there, Jim. Uh, right with you. Okay. Go ahead, keep practicing, boys. Well, Jim, how's it going? Hey, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Working. Uh-oh. Hope none of my boys are in trouble with the FBI. I hope not by myself, Paul. That's what I came here to check on, though. Oh, uh-huh. Yes, a doctor named Fulton paid a professional call to a flat around the corner last night and was knocked out by two youngsters. Yes? They robbed him after they knocked him out. Oh, Jim, I'm certain none of my boys would do a thing like that. Well, Paul, maybe you can help me find the two who did, huh? How much do you know so far? Well, early this morning, Dr. Fulton's wife called the police. I see. She said the doctor hadn't been home all night. His nurse reported that he'd made his last call last evening at an address in this neighborhood. The police checked and found him there. He wasn't dead, was he? No, but he'd received a very nasty skull wound. He regained consciousness for a few minutes and told the police he'd been assaulted by two youngsters. Then he passed out again. Well, how does the FBI get into the case, Jim? Well, after the doctor was robbed, the youngsters took his car up to Clayland Park. One of the tires went flat, so they abandoned it. Well, Clayland Park, as you know, is just across the state line. Yes, I know. Well, what can I do to help, Jim? When Dr. Fulton comes to at the hospital, I'm going to get a full description of the boys, Paul. Then, if they're from this neighborhood, maybe you can tell me who they are. I'll certainly try. Fine. I'm going back up to the hospital now. I'll see you later. Three to two, no nine. Who's with me, huh? Three to two, no nine. Come on, who's on a boat? Let's go. Rico. Rico. Rick. Huh? Oh, hiya, Benny. You in the game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I see you for just a minute? Well, what about? I'm the rest of the stuff from last night's job. Did you sell it? Uh, not all of it. Why not? You look stupid. This is no place to talk business. But I thought you said Come on over here. Oh, I sold everything except this ring and a wristwatch. Couldn't you get nothing for him? I'm keeping the watch. You get the ring. Oh, let's have it, huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey, it's got my initial on Hey, look, Benny, I got to get back to the game, okay? Hey, wait, I forgot to tell you something. Well? I seen Pete Paxton today. He said hello to me. So what? Well, I guess the big guy's got the word how we've been operating. Maybe Pete could use us, huh? Look, if we keep going like this, Pete will be working for us. <laughs> Some joke. Yeah, I mean it. When do we do another job, Rick? Tomorrow night. On who? I don't know yet. The phone book is full of doctors. Hey, 
Is he, Paul? Oh, come on in, Jim. Pull up a chair. Oh, thanks. I'm trying to lay out the strongest possible batting order for a game we're playing tomorrow. No? Need a good left-handed second baseman? <laughs> Need a whole infield. No. Oh, by the way, did you talk to the doctor? Yes. Yes, he couldn't give us much of a description on either one of the boys. But he guessed them to be around 16 years old. I see. However, he did give me a list of possessions which were taken from him and a description of each article. Hey, Paul, take a look at this. Right. That list also contains the things that were stolen from another doctor who was assaulted last week. By the same boy? Well, we don't know that yet. Well, I guess the doctor couldn't give much of a description either. No. No, he couldn't. But because both assaults took place in this neighborhood, I was hoping maybe you'd spot some of the things on some of the boys who come in here. Well, Jim, we're, we're not getting many boys here these days. Kids want stuff to play with when they come here, and they've learned that we just don't have it. We got one pair of boxing gloves, for instance. What? Yes, and the baseball season is getting started, and we got one bat, two old baseballs, and both of them taped up. Oh, I don't understand, Paul. How come you haven't got more equipment than that? Well, it takes money, Jim, and people aren't contributing it. They'll spend $50,000 to build a statue of a man on a horse, but they won't spend a dime for a kid on a sidewalk. Now, where do the kids go if they don't come here? Well, this time of the year, they go swimming off the docks down by the river. Mm. A couple of them get drowned every season, but they're poor kids, so no one cares except their families. That's about it. Well, what can be done? A place like this ought to be a big help in fighting delinquency. Well, it can't be, Jim, unless we get kids to come in. If we had some equipment and a swimming pool, why, why I could break up half the gangs in the neighborhood. Are there many of them? Dozens. Mm. And every one of them has rented a cellar. Running their own clubs, you can imagine what they are. Mm, yeah. But I'm still trying, Jim. In fact, I'm going out this afternoon to make the rounds of the cellar clubs and talk to every boy I find and see if I can't get them to come here. Oh, Paul, if you spot any of the items on that list I gave you, let me know. Give me the chalk, Rico. Okay. Uh, let's see. Seven ball cross side. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't leave myself in no good position. Uh, let's see what I can do now. Hey, I forgot to tell you. I picked out a doctor for tonight. Who is he? A right, guy over on Walton Avenue. Oh. Think I can make that combo? Hmm? Try it and see. Well, I wonder if... See who that is. Okay. Hello, Vinny. Oh, hello. Can I come in? Well, okay. Hello, Rocco. Hi. I came to see if I could get you boys to come over to the club and play on our ball team. That's for kids. Well, we're playing a team from the North End tomorrow, and we sure could use you. How much a man are you playing for? We don't play for money. Mm, well, we ain't interested. Hey, make a shot, will you, Vinny? Yeah, okay. Let's see now. I think I will try that combo. Vinny. What? what? Where'd you get that ring? Huh? The ring you're wearing. Where'd you get it? Hey, sister bought it for me. Yeah, for, for my birthday. May I see it? What for? Well, I, I hate to say this, but it looks like a ring that was stolen from a doctor last night. Hey, you're crazy. I have a list here with a description of that ring, and I... Now, look, Mr. Crawford, yeah, I'll handle you got this, no... Vinny. You got any questions, Crawford? Ask them from me. Very well. Where'd you get that watch you're wearing? Huh? If I'm not mistaken, that's one of the stolen articles. Uh, this is my old man's watch. He lets me wear it. Sorry, but I don't believe either one of you. Now, look, I'm I... afraid I'm going to have to report you both to the police. Rico, what do we do? I'll show you. Oh. Rico, you shouldn't have done that. Well, he was going to the cops. What do we do now? Well, as long as he's out, let's roll him. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Mr. Wilson, I believe you have a question. Yes, Mr. Keating. My wife is 35 years old. We've got three kids. Two, eight, and 11 years old. If I die, does she get Social Security benefits for the rest of her life? No. They stop after the youngest child reaches the age of 18 and are not resumed until your wife is 65 years old. As a matter of fact, if you want to get a clear picture of Social Security, 
Why not get in touch with your Equitable Society representative? Full information is the first step in the Equitable Society's three-step service on Social Security. The second step is an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. What's that for? To make sure all the money you've paid in is properly credited to your account. Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and will show you what to do with it. This checkup makes possible the last step in this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. What is that? After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will be able to show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. In other words... He'll give you an analysis to show how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future of financial independence, of complete freedom from money worries. There's no charge for this service, no obligation whatsoever. See your Equitable Society representative immediately, or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Racketeers. Tonight's case illustrates how a young boy who travels in bad company can become involved in a life of crime. It also shows that the commission of any later crime after the first one has been committed is almost a natural reflex. That is the reason why juvenile delinquency in any section is everyone's concern. Because from the youngsters who go wrong today will come the super criminals, the Dillingers, the Capones, the Carpuses of tomorrow. But that need not be their destiny. There are ways of fighting delinquency, and those ways are successful. They do take money and they take people. But when a community proves that it is willing to provide boys' clubs and other clean places where youngsters can spend some hours of decent enjoyment, it has made headway. It takes two things. First, the financial ability to provide those places with equipment they need. Second, and more important, it takes long hours of hard work by people who must prove to the children that they understand their problems and are willing to help them solve those problems. That is the main ingredient in any recipe for fighting juvenile delinquency. That single, inexpensive quality, understanding. Tonight's file continues shortly after the attack on Paul Crawford. Rico and Vinny are walking along a neighborhood street. Rick, I still say you shouldn't have done that. Will you stop? We'll get in trouble on account of that. How are we going to get in trouble? Mr. Crawford knows where we live. Yeah, so what? Well, he'll have us arrested. He's got to find us first, don't he? Well, that's easy. All he does is go to my house and to your place. We ain't going to be there. Why not? Where are we going to be? I don't know yet, but we're blowing. Where are we going to go? I told you, I don't know yet. I don't want to run away, Rick. You want to wait for the cops? No, but... All right, then you better come along with me. But you don't know where you're going. We go to the bus station and we grab the first bus out. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Jim. This is Paul. Paul who? Paul Crawford. Oh, it doesn't sound like you, Paul. It doesn't feel like me either. I just came to. What do you mean? I found those kids for you, Jim, but they knocked me out. When did that happen? About an hour ago. Who are they? One of them is a kid named Rico Anderson. The other is Vinnie Franklin. How did you know they were the kids we were looking for? Franklin has the ring with the big letter F on it. The other one was wearing Dr. Fulton's wristwatch. Uh-huh. You know where they live, Paul? Yes, Anderson Boyle lives at 58 West Adams Street. Oh, hold it, Paul. I'm going to write that down. All right. 58 West Adams. Okay, go ahead. And the other one lives at 118 West Jefferson. 118 West Jefferson. That's uh, Vinnie Franklin's address? Right. Got it. What did the doctor say about you, Paul? 
Oh, I haven't been to see you, Dr. Jim. Got to this phone booth as soon as I came to. Well, you'd better get over to a doctor's office as soon as you can. I'll go to these two addresses and see if I can pick up the two youngsters. When I'm finished, I'll check with you down at the boys' club. <laughs> Paul? Oh, yes, Jim. Well, what would the doctor say? I just have a new bump on my head, that's all. Oh, have you been to see those kids? Yes, I went by before I came down here. Neither one of them were home for dinner. Well, if they ran away, they can't get too far. I only had about a dollar and a half on them. Oh, I got pictures of each of them. Yeah. Take a look at these, will you, Paul? Mm, sure. Which ones are the good likenesses? I don't know. This one's a pretty good of Rico, Jim. Mm. I'd say, uh, yes. This is the best picture you've got of Vinny. That's well, thanks. What are you going to do with them? Well, my hunch is they left town. I see. And if they did, maybe whoever sold them their tickets will remember where they went. I'm going to make the rounds of all the transportation terminals and show everybody these pictures. Mind if I come along? No, if you feel well enough, come on. <laughs> Rico. Eh, yeah, what? When does this bus get to Boston? Yeah, about another hour. Do you know anything about Boston? Sure. What? Well, it, uh, they finished third last year. Huh? Third in the American League. Oh. What I meant was, do you know your way around? Have you ever been there before? No, but we'll make out. I still wish this bus was going the other way. Ah, what's the matter with you? This is big action. Not for me. What? As soon as we get off the bus, we'll head right for a hotel. You ever been in one? Just the downstairs part. Yeah, you ain't seen nothing. In the rooms, they got soft beds, stuff like that. Uh-huh. And when you get hungry, if you like, you can have your meals right in your room. Sound like something to you, huh? Yeah, sleeping and eating. And I like it better at home. Now, you ain't going home till we make a few scores. There's plenty of doctors in Boston. When we clip them, then we go home. Not before. Any luck here, Jim? Yes, Paul. Oh, where'd they go? They were sold two tickets on a bus for Boston. Ticket agent just gave you that? Yeah, the boys walked in and Rico asked him for two tickets on the first bus that was going out. Hmm. I'm surprised he didn't call the police seeing two kids act like that. Oh, I checked that. He said the bus company was sued last year for aiding in a false arrest. Since then, he's been instructed not to do anything but sell tickets. Jim, is there any chance of stopping that bus before it gets to Boston? No, it arrived there a couple of hours ago. That's too bad. What are you going to do now? Call the Boston office and have them send out an alarm on the boys. I see. I've got to go up there tomorrow on another case. While I'm there, I'll see what I can do. Boston's a big city, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I know, Paul. But if they're still there, I've got an idea on how I might find them. Rico. Yeah, what is it? I don't feel so good. What's the matter? I wish I was home. Oh, quit beefing, will you? What time did the doctor say he'd be? As soon as he could. I told him to hurry. Yeah. Rico. What? Take it easy when you slug him, will you? Why? Well, you can kill a guy hitting him over the head. Yeah, not this way. Well, I don't want to get mixed up in nothing where a guy gets killed. Will you shut up? But, Rico, I... I'm glad. Wait till I get behind the door before you open it. Okay. I'm coming. <laughs> Dr. Chancimino? No, I'm not Dr. Chancimino, Vinny. Huh? How do you know my name? Because I've been looking for you. For your friend, too. Come on out from behind the door, Rico. Okay, then I'll close it. Hey, what's the idea? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? How did you know he was here? You were traced to Boston. I had a hunch you'd try the same thing here, so I had every doctor alerted. Told him to call our office if he got a phone call late at night from someone who wasn't a regular patient. You're real smart, ain't you? No, Rico. But I am smart enough to know that you two are headed in the wrong direction. Now you're going to come back home with me.
Rico Anderson was sentenced to a reformatory to remain there until he is 21 years old. Because his companion, Vinnie Franklin, was greatly influenced in participating in the crime, he was paroled in the custody of his parents. And now we switch to Washington, D.C., in order that you may hear a vital message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover. Good citizens develop. So do criminals. Each is the product of training, opportunity, and surroundings. Both have one thing in common. Their early years foretell their future. Youth is a time to prepare for the full life in the future. Study, work, and recreation with the aid of a good home which earnestly seeks spiritual as well as mental and physical development of its children leads to good citizenship. These are the forces that create a feeling of personal responsibility and equip youth to face the future with confidence and courage. This nation's responsibility to its youth is increasing. It must, because of the facts that are stark and revealing. The crime problem in this nation almost exceeds imagination, as 190 major offenses occur somewhere in our country every hour, day and night. Its toll in monetary terms, if diverted, could retire our national debt in less than a generation. Add to that another great menace, the failure of citizenship. And we have a major domestic problem. The call of citizenship today has never before been so clear. Criminals who would rob us of our lives and property, and godless communists who would rob us of liberty and freedom by their deception, present a challenge that calls for action. I know of no better way to prepare for the future of America than to provide now for the future of our youth. The Boys Clubs of America have accepted this challenge. 300 Boys Clubs throughout the nation are providing wholesome recreation and constructive activities for boys who are learning and practicing self-reliance, tolerance, and fair play. America needs young people like these. It needs youthful viewpoints and youthful hopes. It needs boys who will bring vitality to the homes, the schools, the churches, and in short, to every arena of human endeavor. It needs future citizens who believe in God and who recognize the need for moral stability. It wants clean, healthy boys who are ready at all times to fight, if need be, for American principles. These ideals are the foundation of the spirit of the Boys Clubs of America. If this splendid organization is to expand and continue to help build the citizens of tomorrow, it merits the wholehearted support of serious-minded Americans today. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, it gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of the special service offered without charge by your Equitable Representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of the manipulations of a hardened hijacker. Its subject, theft from interstate shipment. Its title, The Easy Marksman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Easy Marksman on... This is your FBI. 
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight you have a chance to do one of your friends a real favor. If you know someone who needs an ideal home mortgage, why not phone him and tell him to listen to this program for an important message coming in about 14 minutes. The Equitable Society will give complete details on their assured home ownership plan. This famous Equitable plan is a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver, because it combines a low interest rate mortgage with special life insurance protection, all in one package. It's America's finest plan for home ownership, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Lonesome Lannister. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI demonstrates that for the most part, criminals are primarily opportunists. Not many of them plan carefully to commit their first crime. That happens because circumstances present them with an opportunity for illegal gain. And either their weakness or their greed overpowers their sense of right and wrong, and they plunge into a criminal career. It does little good to attempt to impress upon those people the irrefutable fact that crime can never possibly be made to pay. Because even if they accept that fact, it would not prevent them from the commission of that first crime. When circumstances conspire to present them with that opportunity to gain something without earning it, they are so overcome by the temptation that they do not stop to think. They grab automatically... For in that moment, when they make that decision, they adopt for themselves the motto of the criminal. The motto of every criminal throughout the world. To take first and ask questions later. Tonight's file opens in the dimly lit hallway of a walk-up tenement in a large Midwestern city. A man and woman are standing outside an apartment door. Well... Thanks for bringing me home, Mr. Snyder. Well, that's all right. I'd ask you in, but the place is a mess. Oh. Well, I have some errands to do anyway. Okay. Uh, wait. Yeah? Are you going to be busy later on? I don't know. Why? I thought... I don't want you to think I'm being fresh or anything. I thought maybe we could go to a movie. Swell. Well, then you'll go? Sure. Where do you want me to meet you? Well, will here be all right? Sure. I'll pick you up then in about an hour. Fine. See you later. All right. Sally. Oh, you're home, huh? Who's the guy? His name is Snyder. I mean, where'd he come from? He's a customer at the restaurant. He's got a pretty nice car. How do you know? I made you out the window. Oh, well. He dresses pretty good, too. I didn't notice. Throwing you... Little romance, is it? He's a lonesome guy. Now drop it. I went to Bentley's today during lunch. Saw a real nice dress. It was too much dough, but I went for it. Mm-hmm. I won't get it till tomorrow. I'm having it altered. Seems I'm having measurement trouble. They had to let it out about two you know, inches. There's something funny about him. About who? A friend. Al, are you still? I'm trying to figure him out. Get his ankle. Look, why does there always have to be an angle with everybody? Because there always is. Oh. Now look, why would a guy with nice clothes and a good car eat at that hash house of yours? How do I know? You know, the bum must be one of them suburban cheats. He'd probably get a nice home, nice little wife who don't understand him, and he comes to town once a week to let off steam. He told me he's single. 
Guys have been handing that line out since before Simon Pitch. Well, I believe him. Okay, all right, all right. You know, I heard him say he was going to pick you up in an hour. That's right. Where are you going? To the movies. Do you mind? No. In fact, I'm glad you're going. Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is working on a file as Agent Vince Cameron approaches. Jim. Oh, yes, Vince. I came over to say goodbye for a couple of days. I'm off for the hospital. Why? What's wrong? I gotta have my tonsils out. Hey, that's too bad. I wish you were gonna be with me on this Stevens case. He was the teller at the National Security Bank who disappeared suddenly last May. Oh, I wasn't with this office then. Oh? Well, the story is, when the bank examiners came in to check the books, they found that Stevens was $62,000 short. He got quite a bit of publicity. I imagine. And as I say, he just disappeared, but completely. How come we're suddenly getting active on the case again? There's been a new development. Mr. Woods at the bank called and said he had some information about Stevens. I see. It seems that a depositor is a friend who took a cruise to South America some six months ago. He showed some movies that he took on the trip. Oh? And the depositor recognized a man who was standing in the background. It was Stevens. Oh. So he called Mr. Woods at the bank, and he definitely identified Stevens. That was six months ago, Jim. He could have covered a lot of territory in that time. Maybe he has, Vince, but at least we're six months closer to him. Have you spoken to the man with the pictures yet? I'm going over to meet him now. Hey, when do you do at the hospital? In an hour. Well, I'll take care of the legwork on the Stevens case. You just worry about taking care of yourself. <laughs> What is it, hon? How do you like it? Like what? My new dress. Oh, oh. It's okay. Well, thanks. How'd you uh, like the movie last night, huh? Not bad. Hey, did you like that part about the fight in the mountain cabin? Yeah, I thought... Have you seen the picture? Uh huh. When? Last night. Huh? I was sitting right behind you. Oh, now, look. I wanted to follow your friend, find out where he lives. Al, I wish you... He lives alone at the Kenmore Apartments. I went back to the place this morning. He was out, so I let myself in. To his apartment? Uh-huh. I got a pass key. Al, why? Told you I wanted to find out about him. I cased the whole joint. All I could find was a social security card and a driver's license. You know, there's something phony about that guy. What do you mean? Well, according to the license and the Social Security, his name ain't Snyder. They were made out in the name of Harold Stevens in Cleveland. Maybe they belong to a friend. Uh-uh. The description on the driver's license fits him too good. Well, what do you make of it, then? I think that guy is a Lannister. Oh. That timid little character? Yeah, I'm going to find out. How? Got me a friend in Cleveland. I'm writing him a letter. I'll just ask him to dig around on anybody named Harold Stevens. Hi, Jim. Hey, Vince. Good to see you. Thanks. How come they let you out of the hospital so soon? I was too healthy. Well, you look fine. I feel good. What's new in the Stevens case? Plenty. I went over and looked at those movies and interviewed the man who owned them, a man named Baker. Did he remember Stevens from the trip? Yes, he said he'd gotten quite friendly with him. Fine. Stevens boarded the boat in Rio and went all the way to New Orleans. He said he was going to stay there for a couple of weeks and invited Baker to have dinner with him. I don't know of a better place to get a dinner invitation. Yes, but Baker wasn't sticking around New Orleans that long, so he had to pass it up. I wired the New Orleans office, asked them to check the hotels and see if they could get any lead on Stevens. Any luck? Yes, they found he'd registered at one of the hotels... But he stayed two weeks and left. Any forwarding address? Yes, a whole series of them. Here's the list. From New Orleans, he went to San Antonio, San Antonio to the Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon to Los Angeles. Really seeing the world. From Los Angeles to San Francisco, San Francisco to Yellowstone Park, Yellowstone Park to Bay City. He couldn't have gone to any more places if he joined the Navy. No. <laughs> well, the trail ends at Bay City, and it looks like a dead end. How come? He checked out of the hotel in Bay City, and at that place, he left no forwarding address. I see. He used several different names on the journey, but they weren't too difficult to trace because every one of them were with his real initials. Have the Bay City police been notified? Yeah, they're making a check on him now. You know, Vince, I've got an idea he's still up there. Why? Every place that he did leave, he left a forwarding address. 
Now, here at the transportation desk, get his tickets, too. In Bay City, he just checked out. No forwarding address, no tickets, no nothing. Vince, tell me, do you feel well enough to do some traveling? Sure. Then let's take a trip to Bay City. Baby, we got our answer. Answer? From what? The guy I wrote to in Cleveland about your friend Snyder. Oh. You know what? Mr. Snyder, or to use his real name, Mr. Stevens, clipped a bank for 62 beautiful G's. Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, honey, honey. I talked to my boy on the phone. Told me the whole story. Well, what do you know? Uh, Wonder what made him do it. 62 G's. Look, baby, what do we care what made him do it? We know he's the guy. That's all that counts. Al. If he stole $62,000 from a bank, he's too big for us. No, not if he's got any of that dough left, he ain't. Well, you just can't go in and, and, and stick him up. Uh-uh. I don't figure on doing it that way. Well, what are you going to do? You just get him up here. I'll show you. Oh, baby, baby, this is the big one. Let's hook him while we got the chance. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mr. Snyder. Hello, Sally. Come on in. Thanks. I, uh, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Oh, I didn't mean to break in while you had company. That's all right. Mr. Snyder, this is Mr. Adams. It's very nice to meet you. Ah, oh, same here. I'm sorry to be late, Sally. I'd have been here sooner, but there was such a crowd at the station. What station? Uh, the railroad station. I went down to check my bags. You going someplace? Yes, I wanted to come by here before I left. I'd have come down even if you hadn't called me. You see, I, I wanted to thank you. Thank me? For what? For being being such pleasant company. Or well, being nice to me like you have. Uh, where are you going, Mr. Snyder? Well, I'm... I'm going east. Oh, and I guess we better get right down to business, huh? What do you mean? Well... <laughs> I'd done something a few days ago which wasn't exactly ethical, Mr. Snyder. I busted into your apartment. What? You don't leave much around for a guy to look at, but I did find a social security card and a driver's license. They were made out to a Harold Stevens. Look, mister, you had no right... Let me finish, huh? The description on the license fits you real good. The hometown on it was Cleveland, so I wrote to a friend of mine there. I don't want to hear any more about this. Just stay put, brother. I... Heard from my friend in Cleveland today. Now I know why you changed your name. That's quite a job you did. 62 thou is a real good score. Mr. Snyder, are you really that guy? Yes, sir. Well, that saves us time. Mr. Snyder, we got a deal all figured out for you. What are you talking about? Well, we think you're a nice guy, so we ain't gonna blow a whistle. All you gotta do is cut us in. I don't understand. Give us a piece of the 62 G's and we say nothing to the cops. I'm afraid you're too late with that, Mr. Adams. What? I've already decided to give myself up to the police. What? I'm on my way back to Cleveland now. You must be off your rocker. No, no. But I was when I stole the money. I've been miserable ever since, knowing that they were looking for me, afraid of every stranger, every knock on the door. Are you really going to turn yourself in? Yes. I've got $40,000 left. I'm going to give that much back to them and ask for mercy. So, you see, Mr. Adams, whatever your idea was, it won't work. Sit down. What? I said sit down. You got 40 J's, mister. You ain't going no place. return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection to make sure that some sad day you won't have to turn to your wife and say, it's no use, dear. I can't borrow another cent. All those doctor and hospital bills last winter and then losing my job this spring. Now they're going to foreclose the mortgage. We're going to lose our home. When a man has worked and saved for a home of his own, it's pretty hard to lose it. And that's why the Equitable Society created its Assured Home Ownership Plan. 
This money-saving, home-saving plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance to give you twofold protection against the two greatest dangers in home mortgages. The first danger is hard times. In the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, a special cash fund is built up during the owner's lifetime. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. The second hazard in home mortgages is the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage if the owner dies. It's paid off in full. And what's more... Every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%. And there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, his home, and his location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. To find out if you qualify, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Lonesome Lannister. planet. According to the best available figures, it consists of more than 51 million square miles and is inhabited by more than 2 billion people. But with all of that, it can still be very small when you are the object of an intensive manhunt. Nowhere is there an island of utter safety for you. Nowhere are you absolutely free of the fear that the next person you meet will not be the one to recognize you nor even that the next knock on the door will not be the police who have at long last caught up with you. Living under those conditions, there is constant terror. Sleep becomes a terrible memory. You stay awake night after night planning your next move, planning which retreat to use until finally you weary of the constant pressure. You weary because you are sure of one thing. You are not sleeping. And you know there are others who are not sleeping. Others who are searching for you. Others like your FBI. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters in Bay City. Well, Vince, I went by the Central Hotel. That's the place Stephen stayed when he first got to Bay City. Anybody there remember him? No, but we checked back through the reservations. His name was there. Well, that doesn't tell us anything we didn't know before. Except that I learned that he checked out at 322. How does that help, Jim? Well, I figured there was a chance he might have taken a taxi from in front of the hotel because he did have some baggage with him. I see. Now, this box here is full of taxi trip records. Every cab ride that was taken on the afternoon of the 7th is in this box. We've got to go through every one of them? Well, that's already been done. I... Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. You have? That's fine. Just a moment, please. Okay, go ahead. 814 West Jefferson Street. I've got it. Yes, thanks very much, Captain. Vince, that was Captain Lane up at the 2nd Precinct. A taxi trip record led one of his men to Stevens' apartment. Let's get a search warrant and get up there. Snyder, I'm going to ask you once more, where is the money? I can't tell you. You want me to go to work on you again? Oh, let me try. Mr. Snyder, or whatever your name is, please tell him where you got the money. I can't, Sally. It's the bank's money, and I'm going to return it to them. Your friend here can hit me all at once. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got an idea. What is it? Look, he told us he checked his bags. He's probably got the dough in one of those bags. Yeah, well, Frisco, stand up, you. No, I said so. Leave me alone. Oh, you have no right Let's to see what we. Easy, Mr. Leave me alone. Wait a minute. Here they are. Look, there's two claim checks. Sally, take these and get those bags. Go 
Go ahead, Vince. Thanks. Well, this is the closest we've been to Stevens. This place looks like it's been cleaned out, Jim. Yeah, the superintendent said it was bare. Any point now looking around? I want to examine that wastebasket. Super said it was full of torn letters, all kinds of papers. All right. I wonder what made Stevens leave. No telling. I doubt that he could have known we were closing in. No. Hey, Vince. What? Here, look at this. Is it from the basket? Yeah, it's part of a letter. Look at what's written on this piece here. W-O-O, and then here on this one, D-S. Woods. Mm Mm-hmm. Isn't that the president of that bank? That's right. Vince, will you take Stephen's picture down to the railroad station? Sure. See if anybody can recognize him. All right, where will I meet you? Back at headquarters. I haven't worked on a jigsaw puzzle in years, but I'm going to try to piece this letter together. It might help us. That you, Sally? Yeah. Thought you were never coming back. And these things are heavy. Take them, will you? All right, all right. Oh, hmm. Clear that table off, will you? I'll throw this one right up there. All right. Oh, you tied him up, huh? Yeah. Now oh, the bag's locked. Yeah, let me try this key. Head in his pocket. Hey. Al. Look at all that green stuff. Oh, baby. It's all ours. Hey, what happens to him now? What do you mean? Well, he'll go to the cops as soon as we let him free. We ought to blow him. No, no. We can't just sit here. Honey, take a little deal, a little square, everything. How'd you make out at the railroad station, Vince? Nobody recognized the picture, but that doesn't make any difference now. Oh, why not? Stevens is in a cell down the hall. He's what? He was brought in about 15 minutes ago by a young girl and her boyfriend. The girl works in a restaurant as a cashier, and Stevens came in for dinner. She recognized him from a picture in a detective magazine. One of those wanted pictures? Yes. Mm -hmm. Said she called her boyfriend because she was afraid she wouldn't be able to handle Stevens alone. Vince, have you seen Stevens? Yes, I went down and had a talk with him. He's got a story. Oh, what kind? He stated that this young couple stole $40,000 from him. He also claimed he was about to make partial restitution when they took the money. I see. Oh, I couldn't piece those bits of that letter together, so I sent them over to the lab. We shouldn't need them now, Jim. Well, I'll see what the report is on it anyway. Vince, I think I'll go down and talk to Stephen. Soda, honey? Yeah. Yeah? You know... I'm going to call that hash house tomorrow. Tell him I quit. <laughs> I'm going to call that hash house tomorrow. Tell him I quit. <laughs> I'm going to stay in bed till noon. Oh, that's well. When do we collect the reward? Well, pretty soon, I think. <laughs> what a head for larceny. I never would have thought of it. You're a girl. You're not supposed to have brains. <laughs> you say the nicest thing. Who that? Don't know. Should I answer? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, coming. Miss Sherman? That's right. Who is it, baby? I'm finding out. I'm a special agent of the FBI, Miss Sherman. Oh? Here are my credentials. Yeah. He's from the FBI, Al. All right, bring him in. Uh, come in. Thank you. Oh, hey. Suppose he'd come to ask me some more questions about that guy, Stevens, huh? Yes, yes, I have. Well, there was no hero stuff in the deal. As soon as I see who he was, I know there's only one thing to do. Call the cops. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes? What happens with the reward? When do we get it? Well, I have sort of a presentation to make to you both right now. Oh? These warrants are for your arrest. What is this? I had a talk with Mr. Stevens. He said he was about to surrender voluntarily and return $40,000 out of that money that he'd stolen. He's a liar. I don't think so. You see, we found some torn pieces of paper in the wastebasket in his apartment. They proved to us he was telling the truth. Look, Mr. Taylor. The laboratory pieced them together. They proved to be a letter that Stevens wrote to the bank he used to work for. It said that he was returning to Cleveland and was bringing back $40,000. He didn't have a dime on him when we caught him. That's the truth. I'd save that story for a judge if I were you. And I'd make up another one, too. 
What do you mean? To explain what those two bags are doing in that corner over there with the initials H.S. on them. I believe they belong to Stephen. We brought them here before we took them to the police station. I believe that. I also believe you took his money. But now, we... before we go, are you going to give me that money, or do I have to look around and find it myself? <laughs> Herbert Snyder was sentenced to 10 years for bank embezzlement. Al Adams and his girlfriend Sally also received 10-year sentences for receiving stolen property. And thus, once more, did the laboratory of your FBI furnish the proof which was needed by a special agent in order to close a case successfully. The lab, as it is called, does not perform dramatic miracles but it does do a thorough, impartial job of helping to investigate crime scientifically. Sixteen years ago, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Laboratory started with one man and one microscope. Today, there are 300 trained scientists at work examining evidence of crimes committed in every state. Last year, more than 100,000 such pieces were examined. And in every instance, the lab was not looking for evidence to convict. It was looking for the result of a scientific investigation. And science knows no master. It will prove innocence as well as guilt. And for that reason, the laboratory of your FBI functions the way every other branch of the Bureau does. As an impartial protector of you, the citizens of America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low interest rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The case that describes the calloused operations of a hired assassin. Its subject... Parole violation. Its title, The Big Guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The big guy on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before we hear tonight's file... I have a special request for our boy and girl listeners. 
If your dad or mother is not near the radio now, please tell them that in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has an important announcement about home mortgages. Yes, the Equitable Society is going to give full details on their assured home ownership plan. It's a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver. So, will you do that, boys and girls? Tell Dad and Mother to listen 14 minutes from now for the important information on the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Guy. History has a way of repeating itself, of forming a pattern which recurs at almost regular intervals. For that reason, anyone studying the field of crime today must go back and study the happenings after World War I. There began a rising tide of crime with the coming of peace in 1918, even as there is a rising crime wave today. Criminals banded together and formed what used to be called gangs. The men were identified by the now almost outworded gangsters. But if the word is outmoded, the methods of operation are not. And today, one of the biggest problems facing every law enforcement agency like your FBI is the potential return of the mobs. The crime wave can be fought, and fought successfully if the formation of new interlocking groups of criminals can be prevented. Once the ranks are formed... Fighting the war against criminals is more difficult because arresting an underling does not impair the effectiveness of the mob, does not destroy the leader, the man on top. Tonight's file opens in a small apartment in the midtown section of a large eastern city. A short, stubby man is removing his shirt as he talks to a newly arrived visitor. Sorry you had to wait for me, Charlie. I had to go down to the drugstore to get this stuff. What is it? It's for mosquito bites. I'm covered with them. Yeah, I can see them. Y- you want to rub some of the stuff on my back, Charlie? Sure. Oh, I hope it works. Stitch is driving me crazy. How's that feel? Oh, great. Uh, get some on my neck, will you? Okay. How'd a trip go? Well, can't you see the condition I'm in? What a trip. Brother, that's the last time I leave this town. Yeah, here. Little right yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, right there. The first thing is the train. It's old, it's hot, and it's dirty. Hmm. Then to make it worse, I draw an old guy sitting next to me who beefs to the conductor when I light a cigar. Can't smoke all the way up. Oh, fine. Then I get up there, walk three miles to the river. I find a spot behind some weeds in a little clearing. Mm-hmm. For three and a half hours I wait, just sitting there. It was chewed by mosquitoes, bees, and every other bug in the book. Yeah. I guess that does it. Oh. Thanks. Lou show up? Yeah, finally. What happened? Came down the river in a canoe. When he was maybe 15 feet away, I let go with both barrels. He's dead? Natch. I'll tell George. You'll be glad Mr. Lou Dillon is out of the way. Look, when you see George, tell him any time he wants somebody else knocked off, he should please make it indoors. <laughs> Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing in front of the teletype machines reading an incoming message when Agent Don Conway approaches. Jim. Hmm? Oh, hello, Don. I knew you'd come up. There's a girl named Ann Whitman waiting for you at your desk. You talked to her? No, she said she wanted to see you. I called her the other day about Lou Dillon. He's the fellow who violated his federal parole. Oh. She's his girl. Did she know where Dillon was? No, not specifically. She said that he'd gone hunting someplace upstate. How long ago? Last week. She said she'd get in touch with us if she heard from him. Maybe she has some information now. Hmm, could be. Come on. Uh, Dylan's the man who was sent away for being a lookout on a bank robbery, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. With his first conviction, and from what he said, his first crime. Yeah. You made the arrest, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. I thought at the time that Dylan was a nice young fellow who had gone wrong because of circumstances. I remember your report. He had a good record in prison. 
Still and all, after his good record, he's run away. Oh, Don, you'd better stick around while I talk to Miss Whitman, huh? Okay. Miss Whitman, sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Taylor. This is Mr. Conway. We met unofficially a few minutes ago. Oh, yes, hello. Have you heard from Lou Dillon, Miss Whitman? No, sir, but... I had a call about an hour ago from the chief of police of a town upstate named Centerville. What did he want? Well, he he said that one of his men found a canoe in an upstate park. There was a hole in the bottom of it that looked like a shotgun hole. They identified the canoe as one that Lou had been using on his hunting trip. And was there any trace of Dillon? No, sir. They... They're afraid something's happened. Something serious. How did the police happen to call you? Well, they said Lou was staying at a lodge, and and when he was reported missing, they went there and looked through his papers. They found my name on a letter. I I thought you told me you didn't know where Dylan went. Well, this wasn't a letter I wrote to him, Mr. Taylor. This was one he was going to send to me. Oh. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Do you think that that something serious has happened to him, Mr. Taylor? Well, Miss Whitman, that's difficult to judge. Tell me, do you... Do you know of any enemies he had? Anyone who might want to harm him? Well, no. It might be one of the men he was in prison with, Jim. That's possible, Don. Miss Whitman, did the police tell you where the canoe was found? Yes, I think they said Franklin National Park. If they did, then that's our case, Jim. That's right. Don, I think we'd better start an investigation on this right away. Yes? Mr. Blair to see you. Uh, send him right in. Yes, sir. Oh, and Miss Williams, hold all calls for the next ten minutes. I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Medford. Oh, come in, Charlie. Okay. Well, glad to see you back. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be back, Charlie. How was the trip? Very tiring. I covered ten cities in ten days. Hey, did you do any good? Well, some things were accomplished, but they didn't come easy. You know, Charlie, I wish that some of the people who think that criminal activities are a soft touch could work alongside of me for a week. I think that they'd have found out that those of us who deal in larceny have to work twice as hard for our illicit dollars. Hmm. You can say that again. I've been tempted many times myself to turn legit. Yeah. Afraid to get back? Yeah, I came in yesterday covered with mosquito bites. <laughs> he was really steamed about being sent to the country. Was he successful? Oh, yeah. Everything went fine. I'm almost sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, you're the one who wanted Lou Dillon knocked off. Yes, yes, I know. But I was rather fond of that young man. Then why did you want to see him get it? For business reasons. He could have gotten us in trouble. How? Well, when he was released from prison, he decided to go straight. That made him too big a risk. He knew too much about us. Oh. Didn't I hear that he planned to get married? Yeah. Next month. Uh, probably be quite a blow to the girl... Do you know her, Charlie? No. Freddie does. Hmm. Well, have Freddie pay a call on her and, you know, bring her some cash. That might make things a bit easier. Okay. Oh, and uh, tell Freddie that he's got a bonus coming for killing Dylan. A bonus? Yeah. Two weeks in the country. <laughs> 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 Oh, brother, that's a slow train from Centerville. I know. Did you see the chief of police? Yes, by the time I got there, he'd already had part of the river dragged. Find anything? Well, no trace of Dillon's body, if that's what you mean. How about anything else? Oh, well, they found Dillon's rifle, and it hadn't been fired. Well, that removes any question of suicide. Now, we knew before we found the rifle that it wasn't suicide, then. How? Well, the canoe was found downstream. So? An examination of it showed that the blast which ripped a hole through it had been fired from the outside. It still could have been an accident. Oh, this wasn't any accident, Don. Well, how do you know? Well, we've got evidence. Along the bank of the river, at approximately the same place Dylan's gun was picked up, there were indications that someone may have been lying in wait for him. Hmm. There was a small area of beaten down grass where someone had been sitting, and sitting quite a long time, too. There were 17 cigarette butts strewn around. We also found footprints leading to this spot and away from it. I hope they were good enough for impressions. Yes, yes, they were. The lab ought to be able to give us some help on this one. Well, I sent in the cigarette butts and the footprint data on the way up here. Any idea when we'll get a report? Well, we went right to work on it. Jim, does Lou Dillon's girl know about these latest developments? Yes, I notified her. You know, this case started out to be a simple federal parole violation, Don. Yeah. 
And the way it looks now, it's murder. Just a moment. Hello, Ann. Oh, hello, Fred. Uh, can I come in? Yes, come ahead. I, uh... I hope you don't mind my dropping by like this. Why, no. I had a reason for coming. I just don't know how to say it, I guess. About Lou, you mean? Yeah, I just heard about it. It's real tough, Ann. Lou was a great little guy. Fred, please don't say was. There's still hope that he'll be found. Oh, sure, sure. What I meant was, well, everybody liked the guy. I know. You and him were, I mean, uh, planning to get married, right? Yes. Well, uh, I got something for you. It's sort of like a wedding present, I guess. Uh, here, you, you take it, Ann. Fred, what is this? You take it. But I... Honey, it's dough, a real nice bundle of dough. What? Here, look. What? I don't understand. Fred, why should you give I me ain't a... giving it to you. It's from a guy me and Lou both have worked for. Who is he? Well, he don't want his name brought in. Uh, just compliments of a friend. Fred, I can't take this. Huh? I sound ungrateful, I know, and I'm sure the man means well, but I can't possibly accept it. Honey, that's 500 bucks. Just take it back, Fred, and tell the man thanks. Well, okay. And thanks to you, too, for stopping by. Oh, don't mention it. I'll be seeing you, honey. Get back in, sir. Huh? You heard me. No. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens in American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan which not only safeguards the homeowner during his lifetime, but also continues to protect his widow if he should die. Here is what happens. It's the Equitable Society representative holding an envelope in his hand. He says, Good morning, Mrs. Rogers. I thought I'd bring these over personally. Here's the canceled mortgage on your home, all paid up. And here's a check from the Equitable Society. It covers all the payments your husband made to reduce the principal of the mortgage during his lifetime. Sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? But this is exactly what happens in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, which combines a low-cost first mortgage with special life insurance protection. Under this plan, the widow doesn't inherit a mortgage. She inherits a home that's hers free and clear. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the mortgage is returned to her. If the plan has been in operation for a number of years, this payment will amount to a very considerable sum of money. In addition, this equitable plan protects the home against another great hazard, hard times. The Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan accomplishes this through a special cash fund which is built up during the owner's lifetime. This fund is always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That, that's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> And now back to tonight's FBI file, The Big Guy. One of the many shocking things about the tremendous segment of our population confined in the prisons of the nation 
is that more than 50% of those persons are in prison for at least the second time. Some of them have been returned more than a dozen times. Somewhere there is an answer to why there is more than an even chance that anyone who is sentenced to prison for the first time will ultimately be returned to prison after his release. Possibly part of the answer lies in the fact that the public will not accept an ex-convict into its midst. There are many firms which will not hire a man who has done time. There are some communities which will not allow him to live within their confines. Not every ex-convict wants to lead a perfectly law-abiding life after his release from prison. Some of them are bitter at their treatment by society and want only to inflict revenge. But there are some who honestly want to lead a normal, useful life and to forget the past. It is our duty, the duty of every one of us, to make those men welcome in our ranks and to give them a chance to prove themselves useful members of society. Tonight's file continues at the apartment of Ann Whitman. Lou. Oh, Lou, darling, this is so wonderful. I just can't believe it. I, I can't believe you really. I'm here, honey. Lou, everybody <laughs> thought you were dead. Lou, where were you? What happened? It's kind of a long story. Look, I know you two want to be alone. I've now, wait here. a minute. I want you to hear the story, too. But I have to get back Sit to... down. Listen. Okay. What did you hear about me, Ann? What story did you get? Well, your canoe was found, and there was a shotgun hole in it. The local police reported you missing. Uh Uh-huh. And then the FBI investigated. They found evidence that someone was waiting for you, that it wasn't an accident, that someone had shot and killed you. They were right, Ann. All but the part about being killed. Someone did shoot you? Yeah. Who? You want to answer that, Freddy? Huh? Do you want to tell her who shot me? How would I know? I saw you through the weeds, just before you pulled the trigger. Me? Uh-huh. I don't know what you're talking about. Come on, Lou! I see it! Did you pick up his gun, honey? Yes, sure. You got anything we can use to tie him up? Well, I don't have any rope. Can I use that extension cord? Oh, sure. I want to be sure we keep him here after he comes to Lou, did Freddy really try to kill you? Yeah. But why? You were friends. He was just taking orders. From who? The big guy. Who's he? The guy I used to work for. But why should he I'm to... playing it straight, honey. I guess the big guy didn't like that. So he tried to take care of me. How awful. He almost did it, too. What did happen, Lou? Well, I saw Fred just as he was going to shoot, and I ducked away a little. Only got hit in the shoulder. Oh, the canoe went over, and I went underwater and came up some distance downstream. I guess Fred figured he'd really finished me. Well, why didn't you go back to your lodge? I knew they'd come after me again. I went to a cabin downstream. An old trapper lived in it. He took care of me until I felt well enough to leave. <coughs> there, that ought to hold him. You better keep that gun on him anyway, though, just in case. Well, where are you going? I got a call to make. To the police? No, not yet. I've got to see the big guy first. When I see the police... I want him to be with me. Special Agent Conway speaking. Hello, Don. Oh, Jim. Where are you? I'm up in Centerville. I've got some good news, Don. Lou Dillon is still alive. What? How do you know? I just interviewed an old trapper who has a cabin about five miles downstream from where the accident occurred. He said that Dylan stayed with him after he'd been shot. Well, why didn't he notify the police? Well, Dylan asked him not to. He claimed it was just a hunting accident. Where's Dylan now? He left there earlier today. Any idea where he's headed? The trapper believes he said something about going to see his girl. Oh, this was early today? That's right. Well, if that's his destination, he should be at her place by now. Just about. Oh, Don, has anything come in from the lab yet? They just called. They'll have all the information for us in about an hour. Good. Now, look, I'm flying down. I'll go right to Miss Whitman's from the airport. I'll meet you there. Just a minute. Oh, hello, Mr. Taylor. Come in. Thanks. 
Mr. Conway just got here. He's with Fred Hall. Fred Hall? Hello, Jim. Oh, hi, Don. This is Fred Hall, Jim. And according to Miss Whitman, Hall is the one who shot Dylan. Lou got here just in time to catch him and tie him up. I see. And where is Dylan? Miss Whitman said he went to see someone called the big guy. Hmm? He believes he's the person who ordered Hall to shoot him. Who is the big guy, Hall? I don't know what she's talking about. You don't know anybody called the big guy? Never heard of him. Lou said he wanted to get him and bring him into the police. Well, that was foolish. Don, let's take Hall down to the office. We'll question him there. Hello, Mr. Medford. Lou. Lou Dillon. That's right. I didn't bother to announce myself. Do you mind? Well, where did you come from? I thought... I know. You thought I was dead. I'm afraid Fred gave you a bum steer. Fred? Well, what do you mean? Ah, oh, look, don't go into any act. I know the whole deal. Lou, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Fred Hall tried to kill me, Mr. Medford. And you ordered the job. I know this because I just left Fred. But, but I haven't seen Fred Hall in six months, Lou. Suppose you tell that to the cops, huh? Cops? That's what I came here for, to bring you to headquarters. Uh, Lou, uh, I, I honestly don't know what this is all about. Obviously, you're under a strain of some sort. It appears to have stimulated your imagination. <laughs> now, look, now, why don't you be a good boy and go home and get some rest? I'm huh? not leaving here without you. That's what you think, kid. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Hall, the last time you were arrested, you were picked up with a man named Charlie Blair. Is Blair the big guy? I don't know anybody by that name. Don, I think we've got some ammunition now to use on Mr. Hall. Did you get something in the lab? Yes. Hall, listen to this report. It should interest you. Item one. There were 17 cigarette butts found in one spot on the bank of the river where Dylan was shot. What's that got to do with me? Well, the laboratory says that the person who smoked those cigarettes has type AB blood. They determined this by analyzing the saliva. The blood test you took a little while ago showed your type matches this. What does that prove? AB is a reasonably rare type of blood. Still don't prove I shot Dylan, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Item two. The lab states that footprints found at this ambush were made by a man approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing about 170 pounds. You get that kind of stuff from a footprint? That's right. Once the laboratory knows how long a stride that person takes and how deep his footprint went... That still don't prove I did it. Granted. Item three. Item three was a sample of ground at the scene of the crime. This was analyzed by the lab. From it, they could tell you were there. How? Recognize these shoes, huh? Yeah, they're mine. Where'd you get them? We got a search warrant. We found them in your apartment. Have they been to the lab yet, Jim? Yes. And the report shows that the sample of earth I brought in matches the mud on these shoes. So what? A lot of guys have shoes with mud on them. Not that mud, Hall. There isn't another place where you'd find dirt of this exact composition. I'd say that report proves that you were by the river. Hall, we've got enough here to have a federal attorney get a conviction. An attempted murder is the same as actual murder. Now, do you want to take this all alone? Do you want to go to jail for life? Do you want to let the man who gave you the orders go free? Start talking. He's out, Mr. Medford. Real cold. Good. What are we going to do with him? <laughs> That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. And this time you'd better take care of him yourself. Okay. But not in here. It's too messy. How about the garage? Well, I'd just as soon he didn't turn up for a while, Charlie. Suppose I drop him in the river. Fine. Shall I move him now? Yes, take him away. I've got some work to finish. Okay. <clears throat> Use your freight elevator, huh? Yes. It's kind of heavy. Would you open the door? Oh, sure. Put him down, Blair. What? What? Go ahead, Jim. I've got them both covered. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI, Medford. We came here for you and Blair. 
Dylan's unconscious, Jim, but still breathing. That's good, but it still doesn't change the charge. You two are still being arrested for attempted murder. Charles Blair, George Medford, and Fred Hall were tried in a federal court for attempted murder on government reservation. All three men were sentenced to life imprisonment. And thus, a vicious machine of crime and corruption was broken up by your FBI. It is true that two special agents made the actual arrests in tonight's case. But the evidence from which the convictions were obtained came from the laboratory of your FBI. The laboratory which serves as the unsung hero in a great percentage of cases. As recently as 1932, there was one man in the FBI lab, and he had one microscope with which to work. Today, there are more than 300 trained scientists who examine evidence, who last year examined more than 104,000 pieces of evidence. Those reports helped your FBI to prove the guilt of a great many criminals, and thus helped the Federal Bureau of Investigation protect its employer, you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest-rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So, contact your Equitable Society representative without delay, or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another exciting case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of a manhunt through a flaming forest. Its subject, a prison break. Its title, The Curious Prospectors. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Prospectors on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Perhaps you are one of the thousands of men and women who has recently received a postcard or a telephone call from your Equitable Society representative. 
please be sure to listen to the middle commercial on the Equitable program Friday night, your Equitable representative told you. It's an important message for men and women who want to continue to be self-supporting after they're 60 years old. That's why the Equitable Life Assurance Society calls it the Independent 60s Plan. I'll give you further information in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Hollywood Horseman. In at least one respect, nations are like children, for the growth of either depends on a combination of things. Ours is a young, growing country, but its continued growth may very well be dependent upon our conquering the crime wave. In the minds of many who have studied our social structure, there is grave doubt that a nation can long continue healthy, which sees a major crime committed within its borders every 18 and 9 tenth seconds. Every hour throughout the past year has seen the commission of crime after crime until, at the year's end, the total showed that an average of 12 felonious assaults or murders took place every 60 minutes. Those are figures to give pause to the most carefree among us. For if it was true when Abraham Lincoln said that this nation could not long exist part slave and part free, then it is even truer today that we cannot long continue with the army of criminals growing larger every hour. Tonight's file opens high in one of the mountains that have run through our western states. A young man and woman are riding horseback along a lonely trail as storm clouds gather threateningly overhead. Looks to me like it's fixing the rain, ma'am. I hope it does. Why's that? Maybe then the clouds will go away and we'll get that real western sunshine. I just can't go home without a tan. Well, if it starts to rain, ma'am, it'll rain hard. Oh, out there. Reckon maybe we better head back to the ranch. Oh, no, Earl, please, let's not go back. I want to see this country. We don't have anything like this back east. Don't reckon you do. Earl, how long have you been working at the dude ranch? A couple months. You wouldn't know my friend, Sonny Collier. She stayed there last summer. No, ma'am, I wouldn't. That's how we happened to hear about the place. Well, I'm mighty happy you did, ma'am. Speak to you there, boy. Huh. Hey, I think I just felt a drop of rain. Yeah, I reckon it's not going to hold off no longer. Should we ride through it? No, there's a cave a little yonder. We can take shelter there. Well, can't we just we... stay there till it stops raining. Now, come on, get up, boy. Come on. Horses in with us. Here's Anthony's right here. Call me, ma'am. All right. Kill it here. Well, this is it. Gosh, it's a scary looking place. We won't have to stay in here long. That rain will quit real soon, and we'll get going. You're not going any place. Huh? Put up your hands, both of you. Later that day, in a state police barracks, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is greeted by Sergeant Howard Woods. Jim, I didn't expect to be seeing you this soon. I made a lucky plane connection, Howard. Your wire said that you spotted one of those draft evaders we have listed in the circular. Uh Uh-huh. Charlie Baker. We're looking for his brother Pete, too, you know. I know. But they weren't in town together. Charlie Baker was spotted by the marshal yesterday coming out of a liquor store. Baker pulled a gun, shot the marshal, and fled into the hills. Was the marshal badly wounded? No, he'll be okay. You're sure of the ident? Yes, the marshal was positive. I see. We chased him as long as we could, but we had to stop when it got dark. Yeah. It's hard enough finding somebody in these woods when it's light, Jim. And at night, it's just about impossible. Was the search resumed this morning? Yes, every trooper we could spare is out, but there are not enough manpower for a job like this, I'm afraid. 
Have you been with the searchers, Howard? Yes, until about noon today. Then I had to go over to a place called the Bar EZ Dude Ranch. They reported that a young girl who's staying there and one of the hired hands are both missing. So I had to set up a searching party for them. <laughs> Looks like you're in the searching party business. <laughs> I think it's all right. Howard, do you suppose the Baker brothers have been hiding up in those hills since the middle of the war? Mm, could have been. Boy, that's a long time to stay in those woods. Well, if they had enough ammo, they could get plenty of food to keep them going. Uh, that's true. Oh, excuse me. Sergeant Wood speaking. Hey, yes, Clayton. You have? Where? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. Keep searching and report back in an hour. That was one of our men, Jim. He's found the missing ranch girl's purse in a cave up in the mountains. No. He also reported there were signs of a struggle inside the cave. No trace of the girl? No. Well, Howard, if she was with one of the hired hands... I'm not worrying about him, Jim. My concern is that the cave is in the direction that Charlie Baker took after shooting the marshal. Come on, Charlie, wake up. Come on, boy, come on. Get up. Come on. What time is it? Four o'clock. In the morning? No. The afternoon. Got it. When'd you get home? Oh, sometime last night. I had trouble. Somebody see you? Uh-huh. Where? In town. When? Yesterday afternoon. I told you never to go into town during the day. I needed whiskey. You could have waited. I was thirsty. What happened? Cop spotted me. I shot him. Kill him? I don't know. I think so. If you didn't, they'll be looking for us real good. Where's the whiskey? Left it in the cave. After all that trouble? I didn't mean to get into trouble, Pete. Uh, you never mean it. And there's something else. What? I brought back some folks. Huh? A guy in a dame. You brought him here? Yeah. Why? Well, I get chased out of town. I really dig for it. I headed for one of the caves on Pine Slope. I was hiding there, and they come in. I thought they were the law, so I stuck them up. But why did you bring them back here? Well, I couldn't let them go, could I? Why'd you kill them? I was afraid it'd make too much noise. Oh. Where are they? Out in the shed. And they're tied up. You know who they are? Well, I didn't ask them. Should I kill them now? No. Let's eat something first. Earl? Hmm? If you could untie my hand, then I could let you lose. Can't move my fingers that much, ma'am. Well, where's your knife? I reckon I don't have one. I never heard of a cowboy without a knife. You have now, ma'am. Look, how would this work? When that man comes back, I'll get him over on one side of the room, and you could sneak up behind him and knock him down. That man carries a gun, ma'am. I'd always heard cowboys weren't afraid of guns. You heard wrong, ma'am. But you could even... Look, I ain't a hankering to get my brains beat out, and I, uh... Oh... I guess I might as well drop it. What? This act. I'm no cowboy. Huh? I'm a movie cowboy. What? What are you talking about? I'm an actor. All this shucks, ma'am, and I reckon that's all phony. I never talked like that till I got to Gower Street in Hollywood. You mean that you were just a cowboy in the movies? Mm-hmm. I was in 11 of those outdoor epics. Oh. You never heard of me. I wasn't a star. I was just the guy who said they went that away, Cheryl. But, well, how come you're working at the dude ranch? It's a job. I wasn't going any place in pictures, and I'm not getting any younger, so I decided to see if I could sell my acting experience to people like you who wouldn't know the difference between me and a real cowboy. That's just dandy. I'm sorry. No, I guess we'll have to stay here forever. No, we'll get out. How? I don't think this guy is as tough as he pretends to be. How do you know? It's a matter of typecasting. 
He looks too much like the villain. Oh, look, Earl. This is real life, not Hollywood. I think... Wait. Well, have you come to let us out? No. Just just want to see if you're still tied up. We are. I'll see for myself. Look, when are you going to let us out of here? I can't rightly say. I'd be willing to pay you if you let us go. I'd be willing to give you a hundred dollars. I have to talk to my brother about that. Well, when will you talk to your brother? That's my business. I'll see you later. Jim, ever since we found that empty whiskey bottle up at the cave, I had the feeling Baker might have killed a couple. Well, the friends on the bottle might not be Baker's. No, that Bagley's brew is an unusual brand, Jim. Come on. That's the kind the liquor store man said Baker bought. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, it seems to me that if Baker was going to kill him, he'd have done it at the cave. Maybe. Come on, Lolly. Hey, tell me. Could we spot anything in these woods from the air? No, not very much. I flew over this part with a forest service ranger a couple of weeks ago. All you can see is the tops of trees. Huh? They picked a real cozy hideout for themselves. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All right. Isn't it logical to assume that anybody building a cabin or a shack in these woods would build it near the trail? Yeah, that's right. Well, then maybe we could send one man up each of the trails. See if we could get a lead that way. We're riding on the only trail there is. Uh (laughs) Well, that takes care of that idea. Hey, maybe this is a way. We're right in the middle of the hunting season, aren't we? Uh Uh-huh. Well, can anybody hunt here or do you have to get a license? Uh, It'll cost you two dollars down at the county courthouse. Well, suppose we ask every hunter who gets a license to keep an eye out for the bakers or for the missing couple. They'll all be armed. It won't be like asking somebody to take a chance without a gun. That might be a help, Jim. Well, it's the best I can come up with at the moment. Get here, boys. As soon as we get back to town, let's stop by the courthouse. You think the man's ever coming back? Sure. He'll let us out, too. I wish I felt that confident. You would if you worked in as many pictures as I did. These Western things always have a happy ending. You just wait and see. Here he is. Uh, This here is my brother. Oh. Hello. Hello. Well, did you talk to him? Uh-huh. Did you tell him I'd pay $100? Uh-huh. Well, will he let us go? Uh-huh. What did I tell you, miss? Oh. My brother wants to talk. You go ahead, Pete. You say you give $100 if we let you go? That's right. Well, if you can pay 100 you can pay a lot more. Oh, she can't. Shut up. We want to get out of here, too. We need some money to get where we want to go. Well, I'll give it to you. We want $3,000. What? You heard him. But look, I haven't got that much money. Then think of where you can get it. You better think fast, too, Lee. Look, why don't you two jokers stop? You're just like the villains in a bad B picture. I've been in movies where they throw you two bums out for being hammy. Now, come on. Untie these ropes. This ain't no movie, mister. We mean business. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Uh, Independent 60s? What does that mean? It's very simple, Bob. You're 60 years old or 65. You've retired and you're completely self-supporting, 100% independent. That's the goal of every self-respecting American, Bob. After all, 
Who wants to spend the end of his life as a dependent on relatives or charity? I certainly don't. To one man, independent 60s means boarding a train every November and heading for the sunny south. No more long, cold winters for us, Margaret. To another, independent 60s means catching up with all the fishing he missed in his busy years. Yes, every man has his own dream. And Bob, whatever yours may be, don't just trust to luck to make that dream come true. Start right now by investigating the famous independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, what's the good of investigating something I probably can't afford? I'm not made of money, you know. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Bob, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Hollywood Horseman. in helping to bring you this series of radio programs hopes that through them you may learn something of the habits, the morals, and the behavior patterns of criminals. For this is a crime prevention program and the only way to have you help prevent crime is to make you so familiar with criminals that you will not only abhor them, you will understand their sometimes complex mechanisms. The criminals you see in tonight's FBI file have one thing in common with most other lawbreakers... And that is a contempt for the moral standards by which most of us live. To them, the commandment which says that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor anything that is thy neighbor's, means less than nothing. Criminals do not break the Ten Commandments, because for the most part, they do not even recognize the existence of those rules for decent living. If they did recognize the code, they would not so often break the simple, unadorned commandment, Thou shalt not kill... Tonight's file continues early the next morning at the office of Sergeant Woods. All right, I stopped by the courthouse on the way, and we've got three volunteer deputies already. Oh, good. Have been any other word? Not a thing. We resume searching at dawn, but nobody's reported in with a single lead. Mm-hmm. You know, after seeing those hills again, I think the only chance we've got of finding them is getting a lucky break. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Oh, uh, Mr. Phillips is giving every applicant for a hunting license a set of pictures of the Baker brothers. Good. Maybe we'll get a lead that way. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Sergeant Woods speaking. Yes. You have? Well, bring him back here immediately. That was one of our men, Jim. He's out at the dude ranch. Earl Douglas, the missing hired hand, just rode in a couple of minutes ago. Alone. Later, this Charlie and his brother came in to see us. They said they were in trouble. They wanted three thousand dollars to let them said to go. They crossed the state line. That's kidnapping, Jim. That's right, Harden. Well, go on, please. I told them not to pay, and they slugged me. And they weren't so anxious to fight when they were drafted. The Sedgwick promised to pay them, so this morning they blindfolded me, and Charlie led me and my horse part way down the mountain. Then he took off the blindfold and told me to go ahead. Where to? Back to the dude ranch to get the money from Miss Sedgwick's parents. I see. Then I'm supposed to meet Charlie tonight the fork in the trail near the cave. Was well, that all? No, sir. I heard them say last night that they weren't going to release Miss Sedgwick. They're just going to take the money and run. You say you couldn't lead us back up to that cabin? No, sir, I couldn't. I was blindfolded when we got there and blindfolded when I left. Uh-huh. Have you spoken to the girl's parents yet? No, sir. As soon as I got back to the ranch, a trooper got me and brought me in here. I see. Howard, the first thing we've got to do is see Miss Sedgwick's parents. All right, Jim. We can't make a move now without their permission. 
They have to be advised of everything we know, and then they've got to make up their minds about the ransom. But even if they pay, the Sedgwick won't be returned. We'll tell that to them and see what they say. Now, come on. Let's get out there and find out what they want us to do. I just was in to see the girl. Well? Well, she's beefing. About what? Not eating. That's too bad. She said she ain't had nothing since yesterday morning. She'll live. I should have told that guy to bring me back a bottle of whiskey. When you get the cash, we'll get whiskey. If we get the cash. We'll get it. That guy might not come back. He'll be there. Maybe he never went back to the ranch. I tell you, he'll be there. Well, suppose he ain't. You come back here, we'll take off anyway. What about her? I got that figured, too. We'll kill her. Oh, I just spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Sedgwick. She's in pretty bad shape. I can understand that. The doctor had to give her something to put her to sleep. Mr. Sedgwick said for us to do whatever we thought was best. Is he willing to pay the money, Mr. Taylor? Yes, Earl. I explained the whole thing to him. I told him the FBI policy was to ensure the safety of the victim before trying to arrest the kidnappers. I also told him what you told us. You mean about them not releasing her even after they got the money? That's right. Mr. Sedgwick wanted us to make all decisions. Now, all we can do now is keep him posted on development. What do we do, Jim? You got any notions? I don't know how well it'll work, but I've got an idea. Earl, where are you supposed to meet Baker? In the meadow, just beyond the cave he was hiding in. When? At nine tonight. We can surround that meadow at night, Jim, and Baker never know it. I know, Howard, but that wouldn't get Miss Sedgwick back. That's our main objective right now. Earl, you go out and meet Baker tonight. Now, I never saw you in a movie, so I don't know how you were, but this is going to be the biggest role you ever had, and if you're good at it, you can save Miss Sedgwick's life. Matter. Are you scared? I didn't know you were here. Now, Pete told me to leave the horse a little way up the trail, just in case you'd come with a cop. Where's the money? I haven't got it. You... Pete told you what had happened to the girl if you didn't bring the dough. I know, but her family don't believe she's still alive. Sure she's alive. I seen her myself just before I left. They want some proof. How are we going to prove she's alive without me bringing her back? They want a letter from her. In her handwriting. And then they'll pay? Uh-huh. Pete ain't gonna like this. I can't get the money for you without the letter. What happens after you get the letter? I come down, give it to Mr. Sedgwick, and get the money. That means I gotta come down here again? Tomorrow? To meet you? They said to tell you either you do it this way or you get nothing. Pete told me to get the money and bring it back to the house. Now you ain't got the money. I guess I gotta bring you back. Go ahead. Hey, Pete. Pete. Okay, Charlie. Now let me take that blindfold off. I didn't think you'd be. Hey, what's he doing here? I didn't bring the money. Why not? They want she should write a letter saying how she's okay. They don't believe she's alive. Didn't you tell them she was? I didn't know whether you'd killed her after I left or not. Well, we got to wait another whole day. Do I get the letter or do I go back and say she can't write? I don't like this. I told you Pete wouldn't like it, didn't I? Shut up a minute, Charlie. Try to figure out what kind of a game this guy's playing. What's the answer, huh? I'm not playing any game. You're a liar. If my... Now, what is it? If my hands weren't tied, I'll let you... 
lift them up, Charlie. I'm going to work this hard. Hold it, both of them, huh? Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. I'll get warrants here for your arrest. You stupid dope. You let him tail you here. Nobody tailed him. He's right, Baker. We didn't tail you. We didn't have to. Charles and Peter Baker were convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison for draft evasion and violation of the Federal Kidnapping Act. Special Agent Jim Taylor was able to follow the trail of Charlie Baker and Earl Douglas because as that pair made their way up the mountain to the cabin, Douglas dropped bits of phosphorescent paper which had been given to him by Taylor. Upon reaching the cabin, they found the Sedgwick girl unharmed. And thus, your FBI was able to close another file, a file which had been on the books for five long years. While it is the hope of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to close every case as soon as possible, time is never the deciding factor. Every file remains open as long as the criminal remains free, even if that period stretches, as it did once, to 16 years. There are still more criminals at large this very evening who have violated some federal statute under FBI jurisdiction. But wherever they may be, they can be certain of one thing. Your FBI is still searching for them. And before too long a time elapses, there will be a knock on the door... A knock which every criminal has learned to fear. The knock of an FBI special agent with a warrant for arrest. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Well, Mr. Keating, I'm 26 years old. Shouldn't I wait a few years before I start one of these plans? Your Equitable representative will tell you that the sooner you start, the lower the yearly cost will be. Being young gives you an advantage. Well, what about life insurance I already have? Your Equitable representative will explain exactly how it fits in. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story describing the relentless pursuit of two professional gun runners. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, The Curious Cargo. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cargo on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, Uncle Sam's letter carriers have been delivering thousands of postcards mailed by Equitable Society representatives. Friday night on This Is Your FBI, these postcards say... 
the Equitable Life Assurance Society is going to give eye-opening information about its famous Independent 60s plan. That's a practical, workable plan for men and women who want to be financially independent after reaching the age of 60. So listen carefully when I give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Cargo. There are qualitative differences between criminals. Some of them are important from the point of view of society's fight against crime... And some of them are harmless irritants. But perhaps the greatest criminal of them all is the man who schemes to send people, other people, into war. For him, there are no words to describe the depths of his conscience. Indeed, the probability is that he has no such thing. For no man with a semblance of human charity could plan to inflict bloodshed upon others for his own personal profit. And yet there are such people. To name Hitler would be to name the obvious. But there are others. Others who do not regard themselves as leaders or statesmen. But who are interested in the carnage they cause because to them, the bigger the battle, the bigger the profit. They can see in a war only the long rows of dollar signs and never the even longer rows of plain white wooden crosses. Tonight's file opens in a neat waterfront cottage located in a small fishing village along the southern California coast. An elderly woman is tidying the living room as the front door opens. Rings on my fingers. Wayne, Bells is that you? My toes, elephants to ride upon. Wayne, what my in the world? Little Irish rose. Wayne, put me down. <laughs> Stop this nonsense. Have you been drinking? Drinking? Not a drop. Then what's got into you? I got a ship, Mary. What? I got me a ship. Oh, that's wonderful, Wayne. <laughs> tell me all about it. It happened all of a sudden, Mary. Oh, tell me. Uh, well, I uh, went down to the wharf this morning, like usual. Yes. Sat around a while. Then I went over to Ned's lunchroom for a bowl of soup. Yes. There was a fella there. Uh, Ned introduced me. Said he was looking for a skipper. Uh-huh. I talked to him. He hired. Oh, goodness. My regular pay, too. Have you seen the boat? No, he's taken me to see her this afternoon. But from his description, it's just like the old Mary Ann. Mm. Who is this man who hired you? Her name's uh, Finney. Joe Finney. Never seen him before. Well, when does he want to ship out? Soon as she's fit. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Finney said if the trip was successful, he'd guarantee me $300 extra. Oh, my. When I get that money... We'll pay the back rent. Then we'll be even with the world. Oh, Wayne, I can't believe it. Say, dinner ready yet? Oh, well, just about. Well, let's go in and sit down at the captain's table. Joe? Yeah. Where have you been? I bought the supplies. All of them? Uh Uh-huh. When are they going to deliver them to the boat? They're on the boat already. That's what kept me. Oh. I got something else done, Pete. What? I got us a captain. Who is he? An old guy named Stevens. Any good? Well, I asked around about him. Nobody put in a knock. Well, that sounds all right. When's he coming down to the boat? Four o'clock. I want to be there. Sure. What did you tell him the boat was used for? Fishing. Did he believe it? Yeah. (laughs) Sounds like we're in business. In 
in a nearby city at the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing by the teletype machines as Agent Mark Butler approaches. Catching up on news, Jim? Hmm? Oh, I'm right. Sorry. Well, the San Francisco office is going to try to pick up the last member of that Jackson gang today, and I was just wondering whether anything came in on it. Did it? No, not yet. Are you going back to your office now? Mm-hmm. Why? I was just in to see the boss. He told me to work with you on the government property case. Oh, fine. Fine, I can use the help. What's the story on it? Well, come on, I'll show you the files. Good. I'll tell you as much of it as I can remember. There's been a series of thefts from a bonded warehouse here in town. You've probably heard about it. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's some reason to believe that they're all the work of the same persons. Why is that, Jim? Well, everything they've stolen has disappeared. Mm-hmm. Now, the way I figure, if this were the work of a large organized mob, they'd steal the stuff and get rid of it. None of this stuff has ever turned up. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Thanks. Has anybody seen the thieves, Jim? Well, we have a report that two men were seen leaving the warehouse one night last week, but before they could be identified, they ran. Oh. Let's see, uh... Oh, here it is. Here's the file on it. It mainly contains evidence against the one known suspect in the case, a watchman at the warehouse named Dillon. Well, how did he come into the case? Well, in a couple of instances, it appeared as if the thieves had been led into the building. No marks indicating forcible entrance were ever found. Uh, you interviewed Dylan? Yeah, I had a long talk with him three days ago. He protested his innocence, told me a long story to prove that he had nothing to do with the thefts. Well, how did the story stand up? It didn't. I checked the facts and found a number of instances where Dylan simply hadn't told the truth. Have you questioned him since? Well, I went to his rooming house this morning to talk to him. What did he say? Nothing. He was dead. Oh. What happened? He committed suicide. Hmm. Huh. Any repenting notes? No. No, but I'd say a suicide amounts to a confession. More than likely. I did find something in his room that has me puzzled, though, Mark. What was that, Jim? Oh, it was a notebook with a lot of phone numbers. No names, just phone numbers. I'm having the switchboard get me a name and address on every number now. Oh, that should give us some kind of a lead. Yeah. As soon as I get the list back, Mark, we'll split it up and go to work. Which boat is it, Joe? Uh, our next one down. I can't tell one from the other. They all look alike. And they all smell alike, too. You know, Peter, we're traveling a thousand miles in that sky. We ought to have it perfumed or something. I think that we... Hey. What? Somebody's on our boat. Come on. How do we get on it? Just jump down. Oh, okay. Uh. All right, there. Oh. Oh, it's him. Who? The captain I hired. Hello, Mr. Finney. Hi. I got here early. Thought I'd look around. Uh, captain, this is Mr. Jones, my partner. Hello, Mr. Jones. Hello, Captain. Well, how do you like the boat? Looks mighty trim. How much of it did you see? Just above decks. Haven't been below yet. Oh. Uh, uh, Mr. Jones, I told the captain we wanted to go out when the rest of the fishing boats do. Good. If it's Albacore you're after, they'll be running real soon. You, uh, know this coast good, do you, Captain? Like the palm of my hand. <laughs> fine. Oh, uh, Miss Finney. Yeah. I hate to start in running up expenses, but some of that rigging should be replaced. Okay. How much of it cost? Oh, just the price of new lines. Can you fix this soon? Right away. Huh? Here. Get some dough for the stuff. Why... This is a $50 bill. Yeah, that's right. Did you ever see one before? Not for a long time. Well, I think I'll take a look around below. Uh, no, never mind that. Huh? Just go get those new lines so we'll be ready to go real quick. Huh? Well, I... We'll meet you back here tomorrow morning. All right. Be here at 7. Yes, sir. So long, Captain. Goodbye, gentlemen. Uh, goodbye, Captain. Why did you get rid of them? Because the hole is full of supplies. Forgot to lock him up. If he saw him, he gets suspicious. Oh. I figured, let him think we're going on a fishing trip until we get started. Uh huh. Well, we'd better get back up to the city and get those guns. Special Agent Butler. Hello, Mark. This is Jim. I've got 
got something. So have I. What? One of those phone numbers on my list turned out to be a place that rents trucks. Well, that's probably where they got their transportation. Yeah. I checked the rental records on the dates that things were reported stolen, and the same man rented a truck every one of those days. Uh, what's his name? He ran it in the name of Joe Brunswick, but the address he gave turned out to be a department store in Bay Harbor. The oh, name must be a fake, too, then. That's my guess. However, I did get a description on the man, and I'm having it checked against the files. What was the description, Mark? 28 to 30 years old, Caucasian, 5 feet 9 or 10 inches tall, about 155 pounds, good shoulders, slight limp in left leg. Yeah, I saw that man a couple of minutes ago. What? Yes, one of the phone numbers on my half of the list turned out to be a warehouse. Oh? So I came over here to check. I saw a man answering that description enter the place just a couple of minutes ago. Where are you calling from? Candy store across the street from the warehouse. It's at uh, 719 West Montgomery Street. I'll be there as soon as I can, Jim. Okay, Mark. I'm going in now. That you, Pete? No. No, it isn't. Huh? What have you got in those cases? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? This is a legitimate place. I didn't say it wasn't. I've got a search warrant here, and I asked you a question. What's in those cases? It's canned food. I don't know what kind. It ain't my job. Look, if you'll come back in the morning, the office can tell you. I got this warrant because I didn't want to wait until tomorrow morning. Now, are you going to open one of those cases, or do you want me to? I, I can't open anything here. I lose my job. Okay, then I'll open one. Oh, stay away from the crowbar. I'll pick it up myself. Look, I'll get fired for this, mister. You'll get more than that. You're under arrest. For what? This crate is full of guns. Guns? That's right. Mister, look, I only work here. I don't own that stuff. You think I open every crate that comes in here? I'd save that story if I were you, Brunswick. My name ain't Brunswick. I know. That's the name you used when you rented the truck. What truck? Oh, look, we can go into all this when we get downtown. Now, come on. Nice going, Pete. Let's move this stuff out of here. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Did you say independent 60s? Yes, Harry. It means complete financial independence after you're 60 years old. Sure, your children would take care of you, but isn't it better to be your own boss for life? You bet it is. To one man, independent 60s means carefree days in the great outdoors, listening to the sweetest music in the world, the whirl of a fishing reel after a big one is struck. To another man, is getting in a family car and starting off on that long-awaited trip. Think of it, Madge. Yellowstone Park, the Grand Canyon, then Mexico. But whatever dream you may have of your independent 60s, remember this. Dreaming won't make it come true. After all, this matter is your job, and nobody else's. So, why not do something about it right now? Start by investigating the famous Independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I always thought that a plan like that would run into more money than I could afford. So if that's all that's holding you back, Harry, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between age 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. (laughs) 
Now back to tonight's file, The Curious Cargo. The various crimes committed by the criminals in tonight's case should constitute a warning to all of us. For these are men who have banded together for the express purpose of breaking the law. One man, the watchman, has already taken his own life. Because when the pressure came, he found that he was on his own. That the loyalty he expected from his fellow criminals was not forthcoming. But although it is important for you to know that there is no such thing as loyalty among thieves, that is not the message your FBI wishes you to take away from this radio program. All over the nation, even as you are listening to this, there are men meeting and planning some illegal enterprise. For this is the time in history, this is the post-war period when gangsterism flourishes. Your FBI is fighting these gangsters and will continue to fight them, but it needs your help. You must see to it that your local police is a politically unhampered organization. And you must see to it that they are strong enough to meet the challenge. A challenge that must be met if we are to win the war against crime. Tonight's file continues in the emergency room of a local hospital. Well, Jim, how do you feel? Mm. Oh. oh, hello, Mark. You any better? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's laying here trying to piece this thing together. How did I get here? Well, when I got to the warehouse, I found you on the floor. Oh. You remember anything that happened, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I was just arresting that man I'd followed into the warehouse. One with a limp when somebody came up behind me. Knocked me out. <laughs> we had them, Mark. Uh, I let them get away. Oh, don't take it so hard. We'll catch up to them again. Yeah. Any new leads? Oh, well, not so far. But the office is working on the real estate records to see who owns that warehouse we found you in. Mm-hmm. Maybe that'll give us something to go on. Yeah. Mark, will you call the doctor? i got to get out of here. I can't stay here in bed. I've you. already talked to that doctor, and you're to stay in bed. No, I don't get it. He said the pictures showed no fracture and no concussion, but you need rest. Oh, that's fine. I'm going back down to the office now, Jim. See if they've got anything on the owner of the warehouse. Now, look, Mark... I'll stop by here to see you this evening. Well, that you, Wayne? Yes, Mary. Well, you've been down to see the boat? Yes, well, for a man who's gone back to sea, you don't look very happy. I'm trying to make up my mind, Mary. About what? Whether to take this job or not. Why, what's the matter? Well. What is it, Wayne? I want to take the job, Mary, but there's a problem. Well, what is it? Well, I've come to the conclusion that they're not going fishing. But it is a fishing boat. What else would they want it for? I don't know. But when I went back aboard her this afternoon, I saw something I didn't like. Well, what was that? They had enough supplies on the boat to feed us for a month. We're supposed to go out for albacore. When they're running, you you can fill a boat like that in two days. Oh. Another thing, I needed some money for repairs. One of the owners gave me a $50 bill. That reminded me too much of the men who used to come around here trying to rent boats during Prohibition. Well, you do whatever you like about it, Wayne. This may be my last chance for a boat, Mary. Wayne, if you're talking this over with me to get my advice, I'd say tell them you don't want the boat. Thank you, Mary. When I see them tomorrow morning, I'm saying I quit. Special Agent Butler speaking. Hello, Mark. This is Jim. Jim? I'm just about to leave the hospital. You're what? I'm getting out of here. Oh, look. Now, look, I'm all right now. What did you find out on the warehouse? Well, the reports show that it was leased in the dead watchman's name. Oh, great. That puts us right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. You know, while I was getting dressed, I kept thinking about that fake address in Bay Harbor given by the man who rented the truck. Well, what about it? Well, there's just a chance that he and his confederate are really in Bay Harbor. 
Mark, the office hasn't taken me off this case because of the accident, has it? No. Oh, that's fine. And there are a couple things I'd like you to do for me. Name them. Will you get two John Doe warrants? Okay. And will you call the local police at Bay Harbor, tell them what's happened, and give them a description, too? Right. We'll get down to Bay Harbor first thing in the morning and look around. <laughs> Well, Joe, we've got everything in the hold now. I thought we'd never get finished. What time is that captain coming? Ought to be here any time now. Why? Well, we want to get out of here with the rest of the boats, and they're getting ready to leave at noon. Look, why do we want to leave with the rest of the boats? Nobody will notice us. So when we get outside the harbor, we can start south. How long will it take us to get there, Pete? Oh, uh, about two weeks in this thing. Oh, yeah. Hmm? Oh. Hi, Captain. Come on board. I'm coming. Here. Well, you ready to go, Captain? No, I'm not. Well, how soon can you be? Well, I've been thinking about this. And I know I promised you I'd skip the boat, but I'm afraid you'll have to count me out. What? Well, now, wait a minute. It's a little late for that. You can get another captain. In fact, old Cap Warwick has no ship. We want you. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but I've already made up my mind. So have I. What are you doing with that gun? Take one guess. Now, are you going with us or not? I'm not. Take him below, Joe. When he comes to, he'll change his mind. It was a good hunch you had, Jim, going to the lunchroom. Well, at least we know that the man with the limp has been in town and that he talked to Captain Stevens. I hope Stevens is at home. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be a tough boat to find, Jim. Did you see how many there were in the harbor? Yeah, and they all look the same. Well, I guess that's the Stevens shack right here on the left. Yeah, it looks like the place was described to us. You go ahead, Mark. I'll slide out on your side. Okay, Jim. Make it? Yeah, that's fine. You suppose that woman hanging laundry out there is Mrs. Stevens? Well, let's find out, huh? Pardon me. Are you Mrs. Stevens? Well, yes, I am. Oh, we're special agents of the FBI, Mrs. Stevens. Here are my credentials. This is Agent Butler. Uh, what do you want? Oh, we came to see your husband. Is he at home? Uh, no, he's not. He went down to see two men who wanted him to work on their boat. Uh, did one of the men have a slight limp in one leg? Well, yes, I believe Wayne did mention that. Do you know the name of the boat, Mrs. Stevens? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but if you wait, the captain will be back soon. He went down to tell the two men that he didn't want to work for them. You see, he was suspicious of them. What was he suspicious of? Well, he didn't think they were really going fishing. Well, he's right. The whole of that boat is full of stolen goods. Oh, yes. well, captain Stevens told them his suspicions. There might be trouble, Jim. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Mark. Oh. Mrs. Stevens, is it true that all the boats are going out at noon? Yes. A word came in that there's a run the Albacore, and they'll all go out with the tide. Well, that throws out the possibility of searching every boat. There just wouldn't be time, even with a dozen men. But they won't be back for three days. Tell me, is that all the time that any of the boats stay out? When the Albacore are running, yes. Have you phoned Mrs. Stevens? No, we haven't. I see. Well, if you'll excuse us, we'll go into the village and find one. Come on, Mark. I've got an idea. Oh, yeah, he's coming out of us. We'll keep working on him. we got to get started pretty soon. Uh-huh. Hey. Come on, come on. Come on. Uh-huh. Here. Throw this water in his kisser. Maybe that'll help. Okay. <laughs> oh. Come on, come on, Cap. Get with it, will you? Come on. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Yes. Those cases over there are full of guns. And we've got to get them out of here. You said you knew the water's down south. Well, you're going to get a chance to prove it. I'm not going. Mister, we'd be crazy to let you walk off this boat alive. We're not going to. But you can't. Why not? Who's going to stop us? Where are you? Huh? Yeah. Hold it. What? Just both of them, Mark. Right, Jim. Take the cops. Special agents, the FBI. We got warrants here for the arrest of both of them. Okay, Mark, take them above. Right. All right, you do. Up you go. All right. All right. 
I didn't have anything to do with those guns. Well, we know that, Captain Stevens. How do you know my name? Oh, we've been to your house. We saw Mrs. Stevens. She doesn't know it yet, but she's the one who sent us down here. But she didn't even know the name of the boat, did she? No, but she knew enough to tell us that the rest of those boats would only be out three or four days. So I checked the supply stores. This boat took on enough supplies for a month. That's when I knew this had to be the boat we wanted. Now, come on up on deck with me, Captain Stevens. We're taking those men into custody. Joe Finney and Pete Jones were sentenced to ten years each for theft of government property. And so your FBI was able to prevent the crime of stealing government property from being compounded by the two criminals in tonight's case. For it was their intention to sell those guns to insurrectionists in a Latin American country that men they never saw would die because of their sale of those stolen goods meant nothing to this pair. In fact, it never entered their minds. For the attitude of criminals towards others is what must have inspired the phrase man's inhumanity to man. Thus, once again, your FBI closed the careers of a pair of sadistic lawbreakers and not only protected the security of you, the American people, but also the security of people in a distant foreign land. On such protection as that is founded the reputation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation of your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Are these plans flexible, Mr. Keating? Can the amount be increased if my income goes up in the next five years? It certainly can. Your Equitable Society representative will tell you that many successful men have done exactly that. What about my present life insurance? Your Equitable representative will show you how your present insurance gives you a head start on this plan. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story of the short criminal career of two youthful female bandits. Its subject, Juvenile Delinquency. Its title, The Phantom Bandit. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson and Special Agent Taylor, was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bantam Bandits on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Following program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, in every city, town, and county, representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society have been sending postcards to people in their neighborhood. The purpose of these postcards from Equitable Society representatives was to urge their neighbors to listen to the main commercial in tonight's Equitable broadcast. It's addressed to men and women who want to be self-supporting and independent after they're 60 years old. If that's the way you feel, 
you'll be interested in the independent 60s plan worked out by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I'll give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Crime in the United States is an established business, and unfortunately, that business is very good. You read a note in your newspaper about a robbery or a holdup, or you hear about one on your favorite radio news program, and you are likely to forget it quickly because few holdups are dramatic enough to impress themselves upon you. But do not be under the mistaken belief that those thefts are isolated and the result of any accident. The majority of them are well planned, and more than that, Many of them are the result of work by groups of tightly knit gangs. That those gangs enjoyed a banner year in the past 12 months is shown by the figures recently gathered by your FBI in a nationwide survey into the field of crime. The value of property stolen last year in the United States totaled more than $113 million, or an average of $2.5 million a week. That figure should impress you law-abiding citizens because that $113 million was your money. Tonight's file opens in the lavishly furnished apartment of Alice and George Hopkins. It is mid-afternoon, and George has just come in. George? Yeah? What are you doing home so early? I don't feel well. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Can I get you something? No, I don't want anything. What's the matter? I just wanted to see Dr. Elliot. He, uh, he examined me with a fluoroscope. What's that? Well, it's, uh, it's like an x-ray machine, only you get the pictures right there without waiting. What did he say? I've got an ulcer. You've got it. A... I've got to take it easy. Oh, George, that's awful. Well, I don't like to be an I told you so, but I've been telling you right along you've been working too hard. I know, and you've told me to take it easy. But how can I? I run a one-man business. The cemeteries are full of people who ran a one-man business. What else did the doctor say? Oh, I've got to give up work for a while. Go away. But, George, that's wonderful. You haven't had a vacation in years. I know, but I don't think I should take one. Why not? Well, who will run my business? Oh, now, George. No, I mean it. Well, there must be somebody to take over while you're gone. Who? Who can I trust? Well, h- how about Bob Nelson? Well, I, I, I thought of him. And? I'm not sure he's had enough experience. But George, he's been with you a long time. Alice, Alice, you must realize that length of service is no barometer for talent. But he's very clever at stealing things. You told me that. There's a great deal of difference between being a thief and a fence. My business is receiving stolen goods. But he's been helping you. I know. Well, then why don't you give him a chance? Oh, now, look, honey, well, I... I'm only suggesting it so that you can get away. I realize that, but... Oh, now, look, look, this isn't good for my ulcer. Get, get me some water. I've got to take some pills. We'll talk this over later. Who is it? Oh. Hi, baby. Hi. Got any whiskey in the house? Sure. And mix us some drinks. We got something to celebrate. What? George saw a doctor this afternoon. He's sick. No kid. Yeah. The doc says he's got to go away. Is he going? Yeah. Is that what we're celebrating? No. This drink will be to you. I don't get it. You're the new head man. Huh? George had to get somebody to run the business while he's gone. I sold him on you. Well, thanks, baby. Here. He's going to call you later. What's the matter with him? Oh, he claims he's got an ulcer, but you know the way he belly aches all the time. He won't be happy till they name a new disease after him. How long is he going to be gone? Six months. That should give you all the time you need. For what? To take his business over. Permanently. Oh. Did you drink to that? Sure, baby. There's only one thing to remember. What? 
I go with the job. You think I'd want to forget that? No. How about another drink? Not now. I've got to hurry back to the house. After all, I'm George's ever-loving, dutiful wife. Until he leaves town. Come in. It's open. Hello, doll. Oh, Bob, honey. I didn't expect you here tonight, sugar. Honey, I just came by to tell you that you get ready to move out of this crumb hotel. Why? George Hopkins got sick and he's got to get out of town. Well, how does that make me move out of here? I'm going to take over his business while he's gone. Oh. Don't you realize what that means, honey? All those things I promised you, you can have every one of them. Even the mink coat? Two mink coats. One for when it rains. Oh, well, that's wonderful, Bob. Hey, I thought you and George didn't get along too good. Uh, he didn't pick me for the job. His wife did. Oh? Oh, now, don't get mad, honey. She don't mean anything to me. Well, why did she pick you then? She stuck on me. Oh, Bob. Well, look, I can't help it. Well, you must have encouraged her. I didn't, honey, honest. But we'll have to be careful for a little while. Where we go together and, and, and things like that. Why? Because she thinks I'm stuck on her. That I'm going to cut up the business with her as soon as George leaves town. But as soon as I take over, baby. It's just you and me. <laughs> Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Agent Ike Woodford. Hello, Ike. Hey, when did you get back? Just this morning, Jim. You're a great guy. Hey, must have been a good vacation. Oh, it was wonderful. Plenty of sunshine, plenty of fishing. Hey, what'd you catch? Speckled trout. Huh? Now, I know this is an old cliche, Jim, but one got away that must have weighed at least... Ike, I'll bet it wasn't as heavy as this case you've been assigned to. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is the case, Jim? Hijacking. Nothing's changed much since I left. I think maybe we got a break on this case, though. Well, that's good. We found one of the trucks out on Highway 37. Abandoned? Yeah. Nothing new about that, Jim. We found trucks before. But this one was still loaded. And stolen goods. Oh? Uh-huh. Truck hit a soft shoulder on the road, ran off into a ditch. I see. It was filled with about $11,000 worth of stolen drugs and headed for here. Well, how do you know that, Jim? Well, we found a note in the cab of the truck saying that the shipment was due to be delivered to the warehouse here. No other address on the note, huh? No. Police over at Madison are checking up on the truck now. Well, the driver just took off, I assume. That's right. I got to thinking about it, though, after I saw the truck, and I figured that maybe he was injured when he went off the road. So I checked with all the hospitals around Madison. Sure enough, the guy came in with a dislocated shoulder to be treated. Did they have his name? Well, they had a name, but it wasn't the right one. He also gave him a phony address. I see. That's why I said we may have one break, though. The man who was treated for the dislocated shoulder left his shirt and undershirt at the hospital after they put on the cast. Well, let's hope we can get something from the laundry marks. The lab is working on that now, Ike. As soon as they give us the word, we'll start moving. Alice, get me a glass of water, will you? Are you going to take some more of those pills? So quick? My stomach is killing me. What time is it? Ten after ten. Oh, where is Bob Nelson? He should have been here ten minutes ago. Oh, I didn't know you called him. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, I don't know what's what's in that medicine, but it, it sure helps. Maybe you better get an extra box for while you're gone. Oh, I've already ordered a whole case. Good. Oh, that must be Nelson now. Go let him in, will you? Okay. Hello, Mrs. Hopkins. Please come in. Oh, thank you. Hello, Nelson. Hello, George. Sorry to hear about your health. Yeah, it's awful, just awful. The doctor told me this is the worst ulcer he's seen in 35 years of practice. Well, you're going to take care of it, George. No, I'm going to. I'm leaving town in an hour. Hey, go, go sit down and let's get right down to business, huh? Can I get anything for you, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, no, thanks. Hey, you better sit down, too, Alice. All right, all right. Now, uh, this, uh, this list here, Bob, uh, this is our list of contacts. They all ship stuff to the warehouse. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Now, this, uh, this list here, yeah, this... These are the people who get rid of the stuff for you, depending on what kind of stuff it is. I see. And here, um, yeah, here's the lease on the warehouse. It's made out in the name of the ABC Corporation. Well, that's you. No, no, that's you. It's whoever runs the warehouse. There is no ABC Corporation, really. Oh, I get it. 
the names marked with the stars on that second sheet, Mr. Nelson, that means they can only be contacted at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to tell you that. They're supposed to be legitimate people, so don't bother them during the day. Okay. Uh, what else? I'll be back here in six months, Bob. Just see that nobody gets out of line with you. If you do that, the place will run itself. I'll be tough. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you get stuck on anything, just, uh, just ask Alice. <laughs> she knows as much about the business as I do. Fine. Thanks. Then after a few weeks, when she's sure you got everything running smooth, she's, uh, she's going to come out and, uh, and join me. Uh, you won't mind if I come for you for some advice from time to time, will you, Mrs. Hutt? No, no, not at all. In fact, I'd like you to call on me. That way I'll be sure to protect George's interests. Any word from the police? No, not yet, Jim. They checked that laundry over an hour ago, and it was the right place. That's good. Maybe they've set up a surveillance at the driver's house. Probably. Well, there's nothing any of us can do now but wait until he comes home. I hope they get more from him than I got from the owner of that truck. Oh, I didn't know you saw him. Oh, that's that's right. You were in with the boss when that call came in from the Madison police. I thought that was a stolen truck, Jim. Yeah, so did I, but it wasn't. Well, I wonder why the driver took the trouble to remove the license plates then. Oh, he must have forgotten in his panic that we could check the motor and serial numbers. At any rate, the owner turned out to be a man named Joe Spencer. Yeah, never heard of him. Well, he's not a local. He's from over in Madison. Police had no trouble in picking him up. Did he admit owning the truck? Yes, but he claims he had no idea what was in it. He says he only uses the truck during the day and that his driver must have loaded it with the stolen drugs. <laughs> That's a likely story. He made it even more implausible by saying that he had just hired the driver. Didn't even have his name or address on record. Well, he certainly sounds like he's mixed up in this thing. Oh, up to his ears. Jim. Oh, yes, Carl. This teletype just came in from police headquarters for you. Oh, well. Thanks, Carl. Is uh, that about the driver? Yeah. Mm-hmm. His name is Eddie Leslie, Ike. Hey, he's told the police his whole story. Including the location of the warehouse here in town? Yes, it's at 989 Franklin Avenue. The police are on their way there now. I'd better go over there and meet them. <laughs> What's the matter with you? What did you take me for? A square, a chump, an out-of-the-town Elmer? You know I've got a good mind to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's this all about? Great little deal you had at me. What are you talking about? I just went by the warehouse. The joint is crawling with cops. What? They're all over the place. And every one of them is looking for me. Bob. Uh, You and that husband of yours tried to frame me, didn't you? Don't I take the rap for your phony deal? Oh, Bob, why would I frame you? I made George go away so we could be together. Ah, don't give me that. Well, it's the truth. I swear it is. Well, then George framed both of us. What do you mean? Take a look at this note. I just picked it up in my apartment. Who's it from? My girl, Helen. You've got a girl? I did have a girl. She's just run away with your husband, George. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Uh, what do you mean, independent 60s? It means that you're not accepting one cent of charity after you're 60 years old. You don't have to live in someone else's house. You're still enjoying life. To one man, independent 60s means a home of his own in the country. Yes, eggs from your own chickens, fruit from your own orchard, vegetables from your own garden. Or, to another man, independent 60s means travel, going south for the winter. But whatever independent 60s means to you, the thing to do is to stop wishing and hoping for it and start doing something about it right now. Start by investigating the independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, sounds fine if a man can afford it. But what am I going to use for money? Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Tom, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this Equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures on the Equitable Independent 60s plan. Get in touch with him soon. 
or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI graphically illustrates one important point, and that is that in the mind of the typical criminal, loyalty is a word which means being friendly with the winner. Past friendships, marital ties, alleged love, none of those count for anything in the torturously warped brain of anyone who tries to make his livelihood outside the law. The files of every large law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is liberally studded with cases in which brother has turned on brother, in which child has turned on parent. The only things which govern a criminal's behavior are what's in it for me and who can I frame. As Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has pointed out, one of the reasons for the present-day high crime rates is the failure on the part of too many citizens to assume the responsibilities of citizenship. Part of your job as a citizen is to see to it that your local police department is well enough manned and financed so that it can do the job it wants to do, so that it can help drive the criminal out of business. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. You look disappointed, Jim. I am. I thought we were going to close this case when we located that warehouse. Did you find anything there? No, when we got there, the place was empty. Doesn't sound like the truck driver told the truth. No, I think he's leveling with us, Ike. Oh, but it doesn't make sense that a drop as big as that one could be empty at any time. Not unless somebody just emptied it. Well, the only reason for doing that would be because the owner knew we were on his trail. Maybe he did. Or maybe he guessed that his driver would talk. I checked at the Hall of Records on the place, Jim, and that's not much help either. Who's on record as being the owner of the place? An outfit named the ABC Corporation is the lessee of the property, Mm -hmm. and the lease is signed by a G.E. Robertson as president. Have you contacted Robertson? Well, there is no such person. It's a fake name. Another one, huh? Well, maybe the watchman was right. He told me a man named Bob Nelson had been there earlier and said that he was the new boss. I know that name, Jim. Uh, So do I. I'm having the record section send us everything they've got on him. Maybe we can get a lead from that. The owner of the property that the warehouse stands on is the Don Allen Company. Don Allen Company? They're a legitimate outfit. How did they get mixed up with this? I don't know. Neither did they. They said that they were paid rent every month by the ABC Corporation and never investigated what was going on at the warehouse. It's too bad. If they had, maybe we could have broken this ring a lot sooner. Jim? Oh, yes, Carl. What is it? From the record section. Oh, thanks, Carl. Let's hope this is it. Mm Mm-hmm. It looks like Bob Nelson has a pretty long record. Yeah, he sure has. Hey, Ike, mm-hmm. take a look at this. Uh, right there. Uh, there's an arrest for selling stolen goods. Sounds like he could be our man. Let's send out an alarm on Nelson right away. <laughs> Yes, Helen. Ain't you coming in the pool again, sugar? No, I've had enough of the day, honey. This, oh. uh, this desert air starts to get chilly. All right. Well, I'll come out, too, then. Oh, I'll give you a hand. Oh, oh thanks. Whew. Uh, join me off, will you? Oh, sure. Uh, I wonder what time it is. Oh, it's five... Tr- hey. What? You forgot to remind me to take my pills. No, I didn't. Well, where are they? I haven't got them. Well, did you leave them in the cottage? No, I threw them away. Threw them away? Yes, I got sick and tired of playing second fiddle to an ulcer. Oh, but Helen, I... You brought me here for a vacation, sugar, not a rest cure. But I need those pills. Oh, Georgie, that's just your imagination. If you take pills, you think you're sick. If you think you're sick, we don't go out. We came to the desert to have fun. Honey, we've been having fun. We swim every day. You go shopping for clothes. You... No, well, I want nighttime fun. I want to ride out in the desert, visit the sheik. <laughs> honey, want... honey, there are no sheiks in Arizona. Well, then take me dancing. Aren't there places for that? All right, honey. We'll go dancing tonight. <laughs> Jim, yeah? uh, we've got Bob Nelson and the watchman from that warehouse outside. Oh, good. 
Ike, will you send Nelson in, please? Right. Oh, and Ike, while I'm interviewing him, why don't you see what you can find out from the watchman? Then we can compare stories later on, oh, okay. huh? Okay. All right, Nelson, this way. Here he is, Jim. Thanks, Ike. Sit down, Nelson. Okay. I'm telling you right now, you guys have got nothing on me. That remains to be seen. I'd like to ask you a few questions, Nelson. Go ahead, ask me anything. Why did you tell the watchman at the warehouse that you were the new boss? I didn't tell him that. I told him I was running things while the boss was away. You were working for somebody else? That's right. Who? George Hopkins. If you ask me where he is, I'll tell you. I don't know. He said he was sick, had to go away. So he went away with my girl. Was he sick? I don't think so. But he was always used to make out he was dying. He had pills to take care of everything. How about that list of contacts the police found in your hotel? Hopkins gave them to me. They were even in his handwriting. Then you knew the warehouse was a drop. Sure, I knew it. I ain't claiming I'm a lily. But you guys got no rap on me because I never operated the warehouse. Ask the watchman if you don't believe me. I will. I... Yes, Jim. Did you ask the watchman how long Nelson had been running a place? Yes, I did. He said he never actually ran it, that we moved in before he had a chance. There, you see? Did the watchman know where Hopkins had gone? No. No, he didn't, Jim. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can find out from his wife. No? Where is she? Uh, We've got an apartment at 108 West Owens Avenue. Okay. All right, Nelson. We're going to hold you for further questioning. How long? Until we can locate the commissioner and arraign you. In the meantime, Mike, let's get a warrant. Go over and talk to Mrs. Hopkins. Nothing in this closet, Jim. They certainly emptied every room thoroughly. Yeah, they sure did. I wonder how Ms. Hopkins found out where her husband was. I don't know. All she told him down at the desk is that she was going to visit him. Maybe she was running away. Yeah, could be. She left this morning, huh? Well, that's what they said. They said she seemed to be in a big hurry, too. I guess maybe we better get back to the office, Jim, and just chalk this visit off as a loss. Yeah, looks that way. What do you got there? Hmm? Oh, here's some health pamphlets I found on the desk over there. Hmm? Listen to this, will you? You can be healthy at 90. Hmm. Life begins at 55, too. And, uh, oh, listen to this one. Bad eaters die young. <laughs> He sounds like a worse hypochondriac than we thought he was. Oh, he certainly does. He sounds like the kind of a... Ike, hey, that might be the answer. What's that? Well, we know he's a hypochondriac, which means he must have a nice, large collection of pills and medicines. That's right. All right, where do you buy pills and medicines? In a drugstore. Right, come on, let's check every drugstore in this neighborhood. <laughs> Georgie, Sugar, you're a wonderful dancer. Ah, uh, thanks. Now, aren't you glad you did this? Yeah. You know, I bet you forgot all about your ulcer, too. Well, Helen, to tell you the truth... May I, I cut in? Huh? Alice. What's the matter? Aren't you glad to see your own wife? Helen, why did you throw away those pills? What are you doing here? How did you know where he was? I called his tailor. I knew he couldn't go anywhere without letting him know where to send his clothes. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, young lady, running off with my husband? Oh, stop with that stuff. What about you and Bob Nelson? I got the whole rundown on that one. We're all finished. So are we. Oh, no, we're not. I want $25,000 or I go to the cops. Shh, people are looking. I don't care. Besides, it's impolite to discuss money matters in public. Alice, Alice, walk around the floor to our table, huh? We'll dance over to meet you. Wow. All right. Come on, Helen. Sugar, you're not really going to give her 25000 are you? Of course not. Well, then why did you... I'm going to gonna have her come down to the cottage with us. When we get her there, we'll, uh, we'll lock her in the closet and blow. Oh, but what... Shh, quiet. Well, what do we do now? We'll get down to our cottage and talk, Alice. First, though, I've got to pay our check. Waiter! Oh, waiter! Better call for huh? a lawyer, too, Mr. Hopkins. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got a warrant here for the arrest of all three of you. George, I guess I shouldn't have thrown away those pills. George Hopkins received a 20-year sentence for theft from an interstate shipment. Robert Nelson was sentenced to 10 years and the two women to five years each under the same statute. 
The clue which led your FBI to George Hopkins came after a check of the drugstores in Hopkins' neighborhood. One of them revealed that he had just ordered a refill on several prescriptions written by a Dr. Elliot. Locating the doctor was a simple matter, and since every hypochondriac notifies his doctor of his every move, the two special agents were able to find out where Hopkins had gone. A quick trip to the resort brought the results you have already seen, the arrest and subsequent conviction of all the criminals involved. When your FBI closes a file like this, a file that has been a major irritant for some time, there is the very human temptation to relax and to enjoy the fruits of victory. But every special agent has been trained to realize that relaxation is not a part of law enforcement. Stop fighting crime for one day, and the crime wave will wash away the hard-won victories of a month. It may be true that there is no rest for the weary, but it is even truer that there is no rest for the members of your FBI, special agents who have learned that the price of successful law enforcement is the same as the price of liberty, eternal vigilance. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Uh, Mr. Keating... I'm 28 years old. Is that too young to start one of these plans? Your equitable representative will tell you that the sooner you start, the less the plan will cost you each year. But what about the life insurance I already have? Your equitable representative will show you how to integrate it into your plan. Well, what income will it give me in my 60s? Your equitable society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A telling story that underlines the nation's number one law enforcement problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Remorseful Runaway. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Remorseful Runaway on This Is Your FBI. The hungry people of Europe must be fed. You can help feed them. Send $10 to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Do it today. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.